will stay home every time you call to say you dreamt. And the advice you give that takes us further. We say thank you. We say thank you. Well, still plus politics. Now, Christians and Muslims clashed violently in Lori Kwara State over the raging hijab controversy as the state government reopened the 10 affected schools for academic activities. Um, well, we're having, apologies, we are having a difficulty with connecting with our guests, but we did have this similar conversation on February the 23rd on the same hijab crisis. We'll bring you that particular conversation. Hopefully, we can get our guests to join us later on as the conversation continues, stay with us. The Muslim rights concern group, Murik, has warned that it would not fold its hands to watch Muslim students being prosecuted in Kwara State. The group was reacting to the hijab imbroglio going on in the state, wherein some public school teachers were said to have forced female Muslim students to remove their hijab within the school premises. Meanwhile, Christians in Kwara State are making some key demands, which include the return of schools and no use of hijab, and the, that CAN does not want the schools to lose the identity of being built and owned by churches. Well, joining us to have this conversation, we have Abdullahi Ibrahim, former Secretary General of Islamic Missionaries Association, Iman, and Reverend Joseph Hayab, Vice Chairman of the Christian Association of Nigeria, Northern States. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you and good evening. All right. Well, I'm going to start with you, um, Reverend Hayab. Ken has chosen the option to pray to God about this situation as uh, a way to get a peaceful solution to the matter. But is prayer really what we need now or dialogue of some sorts? Well, when in the Christian faith we say we pray, we are simply saying that we don't want to use our human wisdom to address the matter. We need God's guidance. We need God's direction. He's not saying that uh, we are not going to dialogue. He's not saying that we are not having a discussion or conversation. He's simply saying that we need God's direction. Because this matter in question was actually there in 2008. Those who are familiar with Quara story will know that during the uh, Bukola Saraki era, this matter came up. A committee was set up. The committee came up with some understanding, probably because uh, the governor then was a cosmopolitan uh, person uh, who looked at things from a different uh, perspective and chose to find a, very, a simple way of uh, addressing it. Uh, somehow, to the best of my knowledge, I know that about six groups of church uh, of schools uh, exist in Kwara State. One, the schools that are completely government-owned schools. So in such schools, you don't have any say. It is what government wants you to do. Then we have also the Islamic school, the schools set up by Islamic uh, uh, groups or mosques. And the third one is schools set up by Christian missionaries or churches. And then we have also individuals who open their own schools. So at each of these schools, and then there are also schools that are quite Islamic teaching schools and uh, community schools where community made up of Christians and Muslims come together to build a school. Each of these group of schools we are allowed a particular way they can dress so that people will be, you see, but I, I, something is happening in our country that any tiny thing, people just want to come and eat it up and eat it up. When I read this press statement by uh, Mori, I cannot even understand what is going on in this country. Is it everything we must eat it up? When we go to, okay, you don't do these or other things, but when you want to go to a school in the U.S., there are certain procedure and provision about that school, you are going to obey it. When you go to the U.K. and you want to enroll in their school, there are certain provisions and also requirements that you are going to accept it. But when we come here, we just politicize everything, hit up a whole sentiment into a matter that can easily be resolved. This is where I find it really sad. Okay. Uh, let me go to uh, Ibrahim Abdullahi. Um, Ibrahim, there have been riots on this particular issue that we're discussing this evening. What is the state government's position on this? And is it the position 
the position that Murik has taken, is that the best way to go about it? Asking that businesses and schools that are missionary uh, in nature go back to River State. You didn't even say anywhere else. You said River State. Does that not seem like a hate speech of sort or a statement that could, you know, cause problems for not just your people, but of course the whole state in general? Thank you very much. I thought you asked me the background to the crisis of uh, hijab or ownership of school in Kwara State, and that would have been proper place to start. Well, that's, that's, the, that's supposedly a public started, information. That's public. That's already public, and, and that's the basis for this conversation. No, we don't take it from the bottom. We don't take it from the top. We take it from the bottom. I thought you were going to ask me, what happened that led to the closure of 10 secondary schools in Kwara State? I'll give you the details because that is where I live. Okay. It all started in 2012 during the governor, during the regime of Alaji Abdul Fattah Ahmed. The Christian missions went to the governor that they want their schools returned to them. Otherwise, the government should compensate them. Incidentally, the governor himself schooled in Kaduna, and he told them that the schools were asked to be returned to you. Are they the school taken over since 1976, 45 years ago? They said yes. It happened in Kaduna and all over the country. Muslims handed over their schools to the government. Christians handed over their schools to the government. Then the governor told them that he was in the secondary school, Kaduna at that time, St. John's College, 1976. All schools were taken over by the state government. It was a military regime because the government at that time wanted to standardize education. As said by Reverend Joseph Ayab, we have three categories of schools. Schools established by the state government, schools established by religious organizations, and schools established by various communities. Government was seen that all of these schools, generally the government schools that have the type of quality they wanted. Mm -hmm. And since education is for all, quality education must be for all. Okay. They now told mission schools, both Christian and Muslims, that if they wanted their school handed over to them, they should write formally. And all the proprietors of these schools, both Muslims and Christians, wrote in 1970s, 74, 76. All right. And the, the schools were later taken over in 1976. Community schools were also taken right. over. We, we do so not have enough time. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Abdullahi, we do not have too much time. You are raising I, about handing over schools. I'm sorry, Mr. Abdullahi. We do not have yes. time for the history class. It's very good okay. that you've given us a basis, but okay, please answer the, the question. Okay. The governor, the former governor said the schools belong to the government. And the Christian missions, I mean, the Christian missionaries demanding for return of their schools said, no, the school belong to them. And the governor said he will not hand over the schools to them. This argument continued between 2012 to 2013. It was then the Christians threatened that if the schools are not handed over to them, they will go to court. And in 2013, they filed a case against the state government in Ilorin High Court. And after three years of legal proceedings, the Ilorin High Court ruled that all the schools taken over belong to the state government and can never be returned All right, you, to them. You still that haven't the answered my question. Mr. Abdullahi, when, you still haven't yes. answered my question. We do not have time and we're running out of time. I'm going to ask you another question since you're yet to answer that question. Is a school I'm giving you the background. Yeah, Whatever we do not have time. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We okay. do not have time. Is a school a place for um, an exhibition of your religious outfits? Because I'm asking this question because we had a similar situation in Oshun State um, I think in 2008, where yeah. every student decided to show up in their different churches or whatever yeah, yeah. outfits. The traditionalists also had their children. It became a jamboree and a show of shame. 
Is this what we should be doing in a school where there's a uniform that is acceptable across boards? Is this what should be happening in a school? Should we be politicizing issues such as wearing a school uniform? I'm not sure you are aware of the current situation about uniform in Nigeria. If you are aware, I give you the example of the federal government colleges and federal government guest colleges across the whole country. In line with the religious teachings of every religion, and in line with the permission given to everybody to practice his faith, the issue of hijab for female matured students who are females is that they should use hijab. And more than 10 years ago, Federal Ministry of Education had issued circular informing all the secondary schools across the whole country that those who want to put hijab on their uniform, they are permitted. So over 100 or 200 federal government colleges across the country, they put hijab on their uniform, the same uniform put by others. If that has happened at the federal level, they are respecting the provision in Section 38 of the Nigerian Constitution, okay. which is also uh, spoken about in the National Policy on Education. All Putting right. on hijab does not distort uniform worn okay. by students. All right, quickly, um, Reverend Hayat, we have just a few minutes to go now. In fact, we have a minute. Um, he's made a case that this is part of the Constitution. Now, missionary schools obviously fall on, under the law in this country. What do we need to do to not have these kind of issues come up again and again, which could cause some form of, I mean, right now, the, the, the BURIC is threatening these missionary schools to leave the state because they call Kwara state uh, um, an Islamic state. But I, the last time I checked, I think Nigeria is a secular state, but that's fine. What should you do, um, ask Ken, to Thank you. resolve this issue quickly? We have less than a minute. Yeah, you know, when people come out in public and make claims using our constitution, and you ask yourself whether the constitution they are reading is the same constitution you are reading. Let's not forget, as you cited the example of Washington State, when some drama happened, are you saying that the constitution do not exist because we have not changed our constitution? So which constitution and which of the federal, you are even giving us a figure of federal government colleges in Nigeria that do not exist. So these are many others are the kind of confusion we are having. The truth about it is that our children left home to go and study. Our emphasis is not about the knowledge they acquire. Our emphasis is not the way they have been trained. Our emphasis is not about how they are prepared to be something in the future. Our emphasis is just a dress code. And we just make the entire educational system a mockery of it. And we are hiding and saying it's a constitutional thing. Please, can you reach your constitution again and see whether the constitution said that? But don't also forget, if the constitution gives you right to hijab, the constitution also gives me right to other things that are different. So do I just wear also a okay. choir robe and walk into school? We will just set confusion. School's uniforms are done so that there will be some standard, some po program and po policy and, and, and orderliness in the way children appear in class. In All right. In the way he wants. So we are not okay, to, well, we need to go. Unfortunately, we cannot, we cannot conclude this conversation. But I want to say thank you very much, uh, Reverend Joseph Hayab and, of course, Ibrahim Abdullahi uh, for speaking with us on this issue. Well, we'll take a short break. And when we come back, I'll give you my take. Stay with us. Welcome back. We want to thank you for being part of the conversation this evening. Apologies for the technicalities that we had today. Unable to bring you our guests from Kara State, but it's been an interesting conversation. I am Marianne Quinn. I'll see you tomorrow on Class of Politics. do not understand we will stigmatize. What you can see is the remaining of the tanker that exploded. The suffered equally confessed.
friend there at the collector. We will not talk, then go beat you. Now two to other five and pay. A lot of the jobs that exist today will not exist in the next 10 years. Ten years. When I see people today shouting, we're not too young to run, we are ready to run. Ready to run to where? The people of excellence are, to a certain extent, being held in ransom by idiots and bandits. Once you are in government, you believe everything you do is right. Mm. And once you are in opposition, everything the government does is wrong. So it's time for us to take over power. Oftentimes when we see celebrities either on social media, television or in person, we assume they have it all together, but we forget that they are also human. Well, here are some of the low points of some of your favorite celebrities. I was broke, broke, man. It's not funny. Do you know that? Let me tell you something. Most rich people picking no get money. You know why? Because they don't feel the need to work or aspire or want to be something. You understand? You know, my mom died when I was 11. You know, I'm, I'm the last one of five kids. So from a young age, I knew what I wanted to do. You understand? I fought, to, I fought to do this music. I come from a family where it's school. When you finish school, go and work for Popsy. Do you understand? So it's, this music is something I had to fight for, fight for, and work hard for. So, you know what I'm saying? To become David O wasn't anything like, say, Popsy help me or anything. Of course, my dad has played a very key role in my career, for sure, as a mentor, as a supporter, and everything. But I feel like if you want to, no matter who you are, no matter the background you come from, you have to work. 2013, 2014, when Show Me Rose was like the biggest song in Nigeria, I had an Achilles tendon injury. I couldn't walk for like about six months. You know, I used to go to shows with crushes and before I go on stage, I drop my crushes and jump in. And after that, I keep bleeding after every performance. And at some point, the doctor told me to stay off stage and stay off performing for <laughs> the longest time. And at that time, my record label left me. I was totally alone. Big up my manager at the time, Kolo. He was, you know, right beside me at every point in time. At that point, I wanted to give up, you know? Just a single artist, nobody supporting me, nothing. It was just, you know, you guys, my fans out there, and the few people that kept telling me, yo, your sound is different, you need to keep going, you know? And I kept going, and <laughs> prayers and God, that was all it took, you know? So if I can do it, trust me, don't try to be, don't try to be the next me, because you might not get it right. Just try to be the first you, because that is the only way that you will stand out and be a legend in your own world. So. Saying that, I want you guys to know that life is not as hard as people make it look. Try to live your life like water. No matter how they cut you, they leave no scars, you know. But have no foes, have not too many friends, but believe in those that you believe in because when you believe and share positive energy to the universe, it comes right back to you. It's a funny one though. Um, I remember this one vividly. Uh, I just had uh, flatmates. Back then, not the new flatmates, mm -hmm. like some 15, 16 years ago. After I, I graduated from the University of Lagos, so I went to do my own thing and I started shooting flatmates. But there was no money, no money to even take tapes sometimes to TV stations. Because I'll be the one to shoot sometimes myself, carry the camera, shoot, mm -hmm. write on, on a paper that will all we use only one paper, one paper that you read, okay, but say your line, say your line, say my own, say my own. So we don't even photocopy scripts because there was no money at the initial stage. So 
I remember because I had to deliver a tape to MITV to show their own for the week. Deliver another one to LTV to show their own for the week. Deliver to NTA Channel 2 because the uh, program became so big after the four initial one at STV. So every TV station was asking for it. And I trekked, I remember vividly trekking from MITV in Ikeja to my parents' house in Abesson, Epaja, wow. as in I trekked. Because there was no other way I would be able to get home. From University of Lagos, I managed with the little money I had to get to MITV and LTV to give them the tapes that were wrong. Because if I didn't, then there would be nothing to show. So I had to, and I had to go back home. So I had to trek. I think this will be able to inspire people. When I was starting off, I remember at some point, and when I started working with the radio station, and you know, I wouldn't want to mention the radio station, uh, back in Jaws those days, eh? the station used to be situated at a 12-story building, you know, and our office was on the ninth floor, and the, the office didn't have an elevator. There was no functional elevator, so we used to walk all the way to the ninth floor, and then back, and then my salary then was 4,000 Naira. A month. Wow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough one. Yeah, and that four thousand I used to have one of my colleagues who used to work with me then. So we split it to two thousand every wow. month. And what year was this? It's two thousand and four. Years ago, uh, I had just come to Lagos. Um I'd like to think that I was about twenty two years old at the time. Uh, I was I had I had, I had my break in the industry but it wasn't I was still an up and coming actress. So I think it was a year where my big film came out. So um, yeah, I got roles. I was having offers to work and that I was paid good money. And then I went to see some group of friends that I had on the island and they were like the big girls. So then they were buying, there was somebody who brought bags for sale. The bags were like 350,000 naira each. And I mean, I could, that I couldn't have afforded it at that time. But it, does, it didn't make any sense to me to buy a handbag for 350k when I was doing very okay with my 25,000 naira bags and 15,000 naira bags. And so, because they were, you know, they were like, oh, you need this will look good on you. You need to, you know, now you're a Lagos girl. You know. I'm like, okay. So, out of the pressure, I took two other bags. So, when I got home, I called the girl who sold the bag. I said, look, would it be possible to return these bags? Because I, I don't think I really need them. And she was like, oh, sure, why not? And that's how I returned to the two bags. And um, I didn't take the bag. So I went back to buy my 15,000, 25,000 Naira bag at that point in time because that was what I felt like, um, that was what made sense to me at that time. Now, what is the story, the, the lesson of this story that I just told, what I'm trying to say, in a sense, is that there is time for everything. Take your life one step at a time. Do what you can afford. Do not be pressured because that lifestyle you're looking at today, if you build yourself today, you might just be able to afford even much more than that tomorrow. But the thing is this, you have to start from somewhere. And then not just like you start, you start making money today, you want to have the most elaborate or the most flamboyant things. No, you have to save. It's so important to save. And if you don't save, you can have a financial stable life. Welcome to What Are You Saying? Hashtag Ways, where we talk about topics in the news as it affects us all. I am Osaiwame Sale, and today I'm joined by Isi Ofodile again. Hi, hi. Hello, hello. <laughs> Isi Ofodile is live with me in studio, and Uti Elu has joined us via Zoom. Uti Elu, how are you doing? I'm good. Hi, hi, Oa. Oh, you look so hi, amazing. Uti. Ha, Uti. Uti. <laughs> It's our forty eight. We are not going to hear what though. <laughs> no, not <I'm> chill. <sure. laughs> and you know, like I always say, right? I feel like 
you know, you don't want to look how you feel. There's this meme on social media that says, look good, do your nails, do your hair, because probably I'm not the finish. Like, I'm, I'm so tired. <laughs> I am so, so tired. Like, we have to be extra so that we don't look how you feel. But right now, I feel like I just need to get a call and say, Uti, are you available for the next two weeks? Um, we have an all-expense paid trip to Barbados books for you. That's what that, that's like my dream right now. Like, God, somebody just needs to dial me and say, here's a trip to Barbados. Like, we'll take care of everything. I wish. Just pack your for two weeks. <laughs> And then join the world. I wish. So, Uti, you don't know, understand. Like, I'm just, I I'm just literally, uh, you so know, I chatted you and I was trying to toast Uti to come to the studio today. I would have just escaped. Ah, <laughs> uh, no. Literally, I have eye bags. So, yesterday night, I was going home. Mm -hmm. I felt a bit of chest pain. I didn't, I didn't understand what it was, what it was, you know, and all of that. And I now remember Jimmy, mm -hmm. our, our director that, that just collapsed. I said, ah, by the time you went to the hospital, blood pressure, this, I said, I don't exactly. know. Exactly. So this morning, I, I started exercising again because I think it's been a long time. Yeah, I do my normal walks. I eat healthy and all of that, but it's been long that my, my body actually, you know, emitted sweat, you know, from the sweat yeah. gland, like, you know, you're working out and all of that. So I decided, you know, to, to start the workout. Hopefully, I'll be able to keep it up. I wish I could do that, but I don't know how to do a workout. <laughs> no, I don't work out. I have to. I have I've to. Never out. I just had to. <laughs> but I like flexible exercises like yeah, yoga. Yeah. Yes. All right. So today is um, so today I try to stay calm because we're talking about rape again. Um, the way to go. <laughs> yeah. I try to stay. I will be calm today. I promise to be calm today. <laughs> All right. So, um, but here's what we found as today's quote. If you blame the victim because her clothes were provocative, mm -hmm. you must also blame the bank that was robbed because um, its contents were provocative. You know, um, that's the quote for today. And it's very interesting, you know. Um, Uti, what do you think about the subject of rape before I come to Isi then? So, so for me, Uti, um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you faintly. Okay. So, um, on the issue of rape, sad to say, I, I want to live in utopia, you know, in that dream world where something as barbaric as rape doesn't exist. But sadly, we are still in the world of rape. We're still in the real world. Um, and more painful, I think this quote is very apt, more painful um, are the remarks around... All right, Uti, I'm having a bit of difficulty right. hearing you, but let me just uh, mm -hmm. quickly... You know, on Tuesday, we discussed the story shared by Nollywood actress Yabo Ojo of how she was raped um, five, five times, times and how often um, times you will find, you know, victim-blaming comments that almost look like a justification mm -hmm. for the rape. Now, this discussion isn't over just yet as we got and saw more troubling comments yesterday that we would like to address on tonight's Ladies Night Out. So Uti, Isi, Jennifer is going to join us much later and I will be discussing this as we continue to celebrate strong women this month. But first, let's take a break for what's in the news. The way your baby's presenting, we have to rush you in. And my partner at the time was like, you going to cut her? Are you going to cut her? Is it going to leave a scar? And I said, <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not a belly dancer. What is the problem here? 
No, no, I'm vulnerable about the future of the children, the future of mine and the future of the generation of my children. I want to have nude pictures taken of you, yes, yeah, but without showing my private parts. I, I want yeah, to put it in my front room. Yes. And they said, you can't do that. People yes. will be embarrassed when they came into your house. I said, mm -hmm. well, it's my body and it's my front room. All the things that we do, what is the purpose of it? I just realized that I was more trusting before I was six. So many women, they just feel like I have to cook for my husband, I have to breastfeed my children, I have to pick them from school. Because to, society expects Then you them go to. home and you cry and you stop your career, you can't do anything, then you blame everybody. You took that choice. for upcoming artists to blow in Nigeria. Welcome to Plus Trending. I am Wiki November, your host, saying thank you for joining us on today's episode. Welcome back. It's tea time on Plus TV Africa. Practice makes me perfect. I'm not perfect yet, but I'm a lot better than I used to be. He's a king. He's entitled to marry a hundred if he wants to. Do not understand who was stigmatized. What you can see is the remaining of the tanker that exploded. The suffered equally confessed. A 500 era de coleta. If no talk, then go beat you. Now two to other five and if that cannot be described, care that cannot be quantified. That is what you give without limits. A heart that cannot be hardened, a soul purer than rain. That's who you are and that's who you have made us become. For the love you give that strengthens us, food that compares to none other. For you would give the clothes off your back to see us smile again and we will stay home every time you call to say you dreamt. And the advice you give that takes us further. We say thank you. We say thank you. Thanks for staying with us. Um, I will go with OT first. What did you find for us in the news today? Um, okay, so uh, hang on one second. I need to try to remember what my story was. Uh, give me one second. Maybe you go to Issy. I'll come right back to you. <laughs> today is that day. Today is that day. Forgive me, guys. <laughs> Issy, so what did you find? I don't remember what my headline is. Oh yeah, okay. okay. I remember now. So can you still hear me? Okay, go ahead, Issy. 
So my headline reads, NDLEA seizes illicit drugs worth 60 billion in two months. Now this was, um, uh, this was a comment or declaration made by the retired Brigadier General um, Buba Mawa. And the interesting thing for me about this story really was the fact that where, where, as we know, most of the crime in this country, a lot of the times with the robberies and things like that, you hear that the users were high on some drug or the other. And the fact that he is now saying that if we can prevent people from using drugs, that we would be able to cut criminality um, within the country by 50%. Now, for me, the, 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 the main thing that caught my attention with this um, headline is the fact that we've always had a drug problem, right? We've never ever addressed holistically how these drugs are getting into the country and what is happening. But it's getting worse. You remember back in the day, it used to be um, Ogogoro and Shekbe and all these different things. Now we've moved on. We've banned Codeine after that whole BBC um, expose. But we still, the government is not doing anything holistically about this drug problem. All these people, you know those vendors that sit on the side of the road that sell all sorts of funny, funny mixes. There was another article that I read that talked about how these, these vendors were blending all sorts of drugs into all sorts of different funny names. I think we talked about that at some point last year. And it's the same thing with our government. Every time something comes into the fore, we talk about it for five minutes and then we move on. So the fact that we can still be seasoned in this economy up to 60 billion naira's worth of drugs in just two months. It's scary to tell you what the size of that industry is because you know that this 60 billion that has been seized, it's not even 50% of the industry. So imagine how much is actually truly out there. It's quite a scary thought. Hmm, very scary. And you know, so, I mean, what, hearing you speak, it just occurred to me what I noticed yesterday at the, along the Lekki Ekpe Expressway, yeah. young boys, you know, broad day, like taking, um, what's it called? Um, weed and all of that. Tell me how these people, they will be normal. They can't be normal. We are talking about on a, on a normal day. Even the, the drivers we have that are driving the commercial vehicles, they are All of them. If a one driver, after well, drinking, he well, threw it up, um, from the window. I think they had, a, um, um, uh, what's it called, um, uh, some sort of um, um, evaluation carried out on the drivers recently or some years back and they discovered that 60 percent of or what am i saying about 80 percent of the drivers on the road were all high on one substance or the or other, the other. Yeah. so it's it's something that mm -hmm. we should look into but how is it actually getting into the country oh it is well yes um what did you find for us you see okay um the, my my story is kind of related to um is related to our topic for today and you know in Nigeria, there is no penal, actually there's no penal uh, code for uh, pu of punishment for um, those that rape, uh, or the rapists that actually rape boys or men, mm -hmm. because it's not recognized, okay? But in this case, we have a, a situation where a 40-year-old man was sentenced to life imprisonment for raping a, an 80-year-old boy, mm -hmm. okay? He had, um, he took advantage of this boy in his house and he was discovered by the lesson teacher. But the thing here is not who or how he was discovered. The theme now is that he has been punished. And I don't think that punishment will be enough for what that little boy has encountered or gone through with this man. Because someday somewhere, somebody might grant him some sort of, um, um, what's his name? So you're thinking he should, he should just have sentenced him to death? No, what? I'm saying that he should have been castrated. Okay, we are back to that. Yes. Okay, we'll continue the conversation <laughs> when we start the conversation. <laughs> ah, you see. Hmm. All right, so on those um, House of Assembly member hit by straight bullets. I, I mean, Uti shared this story, and I thought, ah, I put my hand on my head. Hmm. How did it happen? Um, straight bullet at the Lagos Airport. It says a member hmm. of the Ondo State House of Assembly was hit by a stray bullet at the local wing of the Mutala Mohammed Airport in Lagos on Thursday morning. That's this morning. Wow. So the uh, intelligence that gathered that a security detail attached to Brigadier General Buba Marwa, the National Drug Le Law Enforcement um, Agency chairman, mistakenly mm. discharged four bullets while trying to conduct a safety procedure before handing over hmm. his firearms to um, FAN, that's um, the Federal Airport Authority, you know, the security operatives at about 7.30 a.m. this morning. Sources said that the, a bullet shell hit the Ondo State lawmaker on his leg 
while some um, accidentally discharged bullets hit nearby walls and um, chaos within the airport, destroying some properties. Wow. Fortunately, thank God, no life was lost. But I'm, usually <laughs> when you're discharging bullets, aren't you supposed to shoot it into the air? And see, even that bullet into the air, I saw a documentary on, uh, I think I've mentioned this before, a documentary on um, Discovery Channel, that even yes. that bullet in the air is also as dangerous as shooting it, you know, because when Directly. it's coming back down, it comes back down with a lot of um, force. force. I'm just saying wow. that why do we always have these things happening? The, last mm. year, I think it was um, Speaker Guadabia Miller's um, aide that mistakenly was hit. And yes. yeah, he shot somebody, uh, somebody to death, you know, yes. a newspaper he vendor. Died, I think. Yes, that one yes. died. So let's just be careful, please. Exactly. Yeah. All right, so and we'll take a break. Yeah, see, like, the way you said, let's be careful. What did, what, what, this what did is you say? Like we're talking about. Hmm. This is more than be careful. Like, you know, the, that, that's what really got me about the story. Like, let's just, you know, whilst he was carrying out safety procedures, I mean, first of all, why do you have to have a loaded weapon? And then you're not even trained enough to secure your weapon safely to the extent where you discharge four bullets. If those four bullets had hit four people, there'd be four families right now crying. So we can say thank you, thank God that, you know, no lives were lost. But it just goes to show the ridiculousness of what we do in this country. That somebody, and that's probably an automatic rifle. It's not a pistol. Yeah. And you have four bullets in an four. airport. You could have just erased somebody's life like that. I mean, thank God nobody was killed. But it just exactly. happened. Let's just thank God. That's all we can say. Exactly. All right. So we'll take a break. When we return, we're going to be talking about rape, the justification, and the punishment. Stay with us. We'll be right back. We can't talk about education reform if we don't decolonize our education system. What we do not understand, we will stigmatize. Because it's just cultural. It, it's, and I think it's just human nature. They stop paying no salary. I don't like remembering it. I am angry at Nigeria. I'm angry at this government which seems to be letting us down. I'm angry at us as a people. In the process of struggling to free myself from his hand, he tore my pants and jumped um, away. Mm. Yes, I commit the first truly. Young girl, do you know where you are going? I say, I'm going to America. I say, oh. Now, so that they talk, you are going to Libya. Which America? As it then to mark our place, some people they die now. This is PLOS TV Africa. Big stories live here. What we do not understand, we will stigmatize. What you can see is the remaining of the tanker that exploded. It's often equally confessed.
thanks for staying with us. So um, we got some comments from our viewers, and um, we'd like to just read those comments now. From Comment one from an anonymous uh, viewer that sent it, he sent in yesterday. He says, more Nigerians watch porn than other African countries and even co uh, competing with the U.S. We think these things don't have effects, She, We have a pandemic we have refused to address. Um, the Internet is facilitating desires that cannot be controlled, and these triggers explode at the wrong time. There was rape before the internet, but we import a lot of things that we are not built to handle. That's from commentor one. So the comment, the second comment goes, good evening, ladies. I actually want to comment on the issue of castration of men. If caught in the act of rape or if, uh, or if confessed to it, my comment is actually my question. Um, my comment is actually a question. A man as, I'm sorry, as much as I hate to talk about rape because of how despicable the act is, I would like to say that rape should not be expressly attributed to men only. We've had cases of single or group of ladies raping men or having sex with minors as we recently had a case like that in South Africa. My question is, what should be done to a woman's private part? He, if caught raping a man or confessed to it, or if caught having sex with a minor. Ladies, raping is not one, a one-way traffic um, discussion for ladies alone as it affects both sexes. So in as much as I agree that it's more common amongst men against women, um, that's uh, from Enoch. I don't know where IB is, he said, but from IB. So tonight we're asking, if there's a justification for rape and what punishment should be meted on the rapist, um, be it male or female, right? So please let us hear what you have to say, remember, you can join this conversation, tweet at us at WayShowAfrica1 with the hashtag WayShow, or send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 81 803 We're going to open our phone lines much later. But let me come to EC first. You know, I want to hear your initial thoughts on, you know, most times when we post videos, sorry, when you hear videos of people narrating their rape ordeal, the first question that always comes to mind is, what was the person wearing? So is this almost like a justification for the act? Totally no, because let's look at, let's go back to when we were in the 60s when Queen Elizabeth came to Nigeria. People were actually walking along the streets without wearing anything, and nobody was raped. So a situation whereby you have individuals now saying that it was what she was wearing or how she looked. There was even a, st um, I actually checked something uh, out and I, while the cause of prepping up for this, and I discovered that I had to look at the mind of a rapist. One actually said that he was looking at this, um, his victim and he was getting angry because the victim was arousing him sexually. So he needed to pay her back for doing that. Um, so it's not, it's not her fault. She was just busy walking along the road, not even thinking about what he was even, not even, not even no, she didn't even have any idea that there was somebody even looking at her. So a situation whereby that individual now said, okay, because she looks like this and she has aroused me sexually, I will take advantage of her and, and, and assault her. Hmm. So you, the mindset of a rapist hmm. is very complex. It's quite very complex. Warped. So there is, it's no totally, justification. There, there is no justification. All right, let me come so to Uti. Yes. Okay, so um, first of all, Comment number one, this is how we start to justify these things. When we try to directly link one act to another, um, it's like saying because I watch action movies and I watch people shoot guns, I can go out and stab people and shoot people. There's no justification. I don't care what you're watching. I don't care what you're eating. I don't care what you're smoking. I don't care what you're drinking. There's no justification for it. So let's first of all, be clear that one problem has nothing to do with the other problem. Um, for the, the idea in itself um, that we, in this part of the world, let me stick to Nigeria, because the second comment talks about the fact that rape is a two-way street. Now, one of the things I think that is out of date in Nigeria is the definition of rape in itself because um, rape currently, based on um, our laws, talks about um, the assault of a woman. 
by a man, you know, and I, I believe in the North, it, it also um, talks about the same with, you know, age bracket. But two things that stood out to me is, yes, one, it's inadequate because it doesn't speak of rape of minors and of the male gender. Um, and also, it says that a woman cannot be raped if it is done by her husband and she's above age of puberty, which again, a woman has a right to say no, no matter what. Exactly. And it's shocking to me how many people I have met who have that same impression that a man is entitled to have sex with his wife at any time, whether she says yes or no, it is right. So even in our mindset or in our laws around rape, we're still behind the times because there is all sorts of sexual harassment. There is, I mean, there's date rape. There's, there's all sorts of things that come into this massive cater. It doesn't have to come to the culmination of, you know, penetration or whatever before you actually call it rape. Sexual harassment is a huge part of it. And, you know, a lot of the times when you don't address sexual harassment that is being done by people, they eventually progress into full-blown rape. So when we also don't acknowledge that these things are problems, we are also part of the problem in allowing this thing to thrive. I mean, forget the culture of silence, forget the culture of familiarity. You know, shockingly for me, so many conversations that I've had with people who were raised in the 80s when it was so normal to have aunties and uncles and all sorts of people going through your houses. So many people were assaulted as children. Exactly. Whether it's full-on rape or whether it was sexual harassment, it's so prevalent amongst a lot of people that I know. So we have a big problem and we have to start to pick apart those problems, starting first of all with going back to what our law says about rape. Because even when we come to castration, we come to, that's in the extreme. But what about molestation? What about all these other things? We haven't even addressed that. I'm happy you're talking so, about molestation, Utia. And I want to read the third um, picture that we have. That says 97% of young women in the UK have been sexually harassed, right? When this picture was put up, we now got some comments underneath the picture. And somebody says, damn, I thought we got um, them all. Where is that 3% hiding? Oh my goodness. That was one, one person's comment. Um, somebody now says, almost 3% uh, to go, boys. Oh Somebody goodness. says, oh, so there's 3% to go. Another person says, I don't care. I mean, um, I, so someone says, I mean, apparently, whistling is harassment, so whatever. Same for men. They just don't complain about it every five minutes. That's what people are saying. And he says, um, this person, Oli Shepard, says, don't know if I believe it or what uh, are you classing as harassment then? Look at you or something, uh, uh, looking at you or something weirdly. Then somebody says, um, this is clearly nonsense. What a shame. Uh, another person says, must be a clap to be in the other 3%. Um, somebody says, they, as, as they deserve. So they, they are sexually harassed as they deserve. And somebody says, so means that 97% of young men in the UK are all rapists and 80% of adult men in the UK are also rapists. That's what it looks like, um, um, addressing the paper that wrote this. It says, um, so, I, ju so, so just reading through all of these comments, I think there's one again that says the number is so high because nowadays things like man spreading and ma man um, planning or commenting are looking at women as seen as, as um, harassment. So there's a thin line here, because in the UK, I remember my son was telling me that when he, um, in school, mm. that um, now they are said to them that you cannot put your hand over the shoulder of a girl yeah. because it will be considered as sexual har harassment. So there's a thin line between, you know, harassment, you know, and, you know, um, with the intent I don't know how to explain it. There's an intent in the heart where somebody says, you know what, I want to deliberately, you know, abuse you. Exactly. And, you know, so how do we, because it's, it seems like these days, and I, I, can, I can understand the sarcasm of some men, like the one that says, ah, they have 3% to go. You know, because it seems like everything now to a woman is sexual harassment. So did we go overboard with the sexual harassment conversation? Or it is just, um, um, it is just 
what it is, that it is actually sexual harassment. But let me come to Jennifer. I think Jennifer has joined us. Yes. Hi, guys. Hi. Um, I think for when we say, are we going overboard with the sexual harassment conversation, sometimes when you bring up topics like this, you hear men saying, oh, the topic is overflowed, we're talking about it too much, and all of that. And I believe that the reason why the reason why we are talking about this so much now is because in time past, a lot of people have been silent about these things. So now women are saying, no, we don't want to be silent anymore. Men who have been sexually harassed and who have a voice and have found their voice are also saying, no, we don't want to be silent anymore. We need to talk about these things. We actually need to bring it to light. We need to start exposing people. And, you know, there were some things that a lot of people felt like, oh, it's not sexual harassment or oh, i'm not harassing you i'm just asking you if you want to do something or i'm just coercing you and all of that and till now a lot of people still don't know that coercion is actually wrong like you said there is a thin line between asking for something and pressuring somebody to do what they do not want to do I think that, 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 that's, part of what, that's one of the things we actually need to start educating people on. Coercion, what sexual harassment means. And, and there is one thing that I, I found out in recent times. Now, a lot of men who are, um, who are speaking for rape, sexual harassment, who are saying, oh, it is not true, women are overflogging it. Now, guess what? We know that homosexuality is now very prevalent in our society. It is out there. It, you're seeing a lot of people coming out saying, oh, I'm gay, I'm weak. Now, guess what? When a gay man is moving towards a heterosexual man, he finds it offensive. When a gay man tries to talk to a man who is straight, he feels he's sexually harassed. Mm -hmm. it would, they would not even allow him hug him. As, as, as a straight man, a straight man would not allow a gay man hug him because he feels like, oh, what is this guy is trying to touch me? Or what he, he, he's trying to do something to me? Now, if you feel that type of way, then why are you, why are you exempting it to women? Why do you feel like women shouldn't feel that type of way when you're coming onto them so strong? And I like, I like people to, I, I, I would encourage people to try to put themselves in people's shoes most of the time. Because sometimes you don't know how the next person is feeling until you put yourself in their shoes. Until you can actually immerse yourself in their experience, in what they are feeling, in what they are going through. That's the only time or that's the only way you can actually fully understand the, the gravity of these actions. But, but yeah. All right. So let me. I want to talk about the, what she just talked about has given me an idea about um, a research I was conducted, and it, it talked about the types of rapists. Okay, and they said that there, we have the disadvantaged ones, those men or those individuals who feel that oh they haven't been given um, um, was, um, some sort of validation or some sort of. Uh, um, whatever in the society. So they are the downtrodden actually. So they take advantage of those who they think are on top. Then we also have the specialized rapists. The specialized rapists are those that are sexually aroused. They just see the lady and they just all the, the victim and they just want to pounce. And they also have the opportunistic rapist. Mm -hmm. The opportunistic rapist is the individual who believes that I can do this and I can get away with it. So if he has that opportunity or she has that opportunity, she can actually, or he can actually take advantage of the victim. Mm -hmm. Then we have the partner rapist, where um, well, I think Uti said something about it. Husbands. Husbands or spouses mm -hmm. actually or come back yeah. or come back and attack the um, spouse or ex-spouse. Mm -hmm. So we, then finally, we have the high mating effort rapist. And these are individuals who do not, they have a problem with their esteem. They, they, they feel you can't tell me no. So the moment you say no to them, they, they just it's flip. It's trigger. They just flip, hmm. you know. So these individuals, they are different. We need to encourage or en enlighten, let me use that word. Hmm. We need to enlighten 
people on the types of rapists, the signs to look out for, the people or the individuals that can actually take advantage of um, children or women or, or, or young boys in the process. The moment we, they, they, they touch them in a particular way, they, they look at them in a particular way, if for any reason you don't feel comfortable, step back. Absolutely. It's important. Okay, so we're going to just take a very short break. We hope we can open the phone lines today because we're having difficulties, but we'll open the phone lines when we return to continue the conversation. Stay with us. We'll be right back. has helped shape the decision of the polity from conspiracy theories to good old-fashioned comic politics. These are the results of tomorrow's election. Yes. Tomorrow's okay, election. you have it already. I am not hungry. If I need appointment, all I need to do is to start praising government. Plus, politics will fill the polls of the country from friends to frenemies, even strange bedfellows, to clones and stooges. We go beyond the rhetorics and the drama to analyze the story behind the story. Let everybody come and say. The moment we stop having charlatans occupy political offices, we will curtail hate speech. Plus politics, not just another political show. It's about putting you, the citizens, in the know. There has to be a decision point. <laughs> Um, the way your baby is presenting, we have to rush you in. And my partner at the time was like, you going to cut her? Are you going to cut her? Is it going to leave a scar? And I said, oh, I'm a belly dancer. What is the problem here? No, no, I'm vulnerable about the future of the children, the future of mine and the future of the generation of my children. I want to have nude pictures taken. Of you? Yes, yeah, but without showing my private parts. So I, I want yeah, to put it somewhere. in my front room. Yes. And they said, you can't do that. People yes. would be embarrassed when they came into your house. I said, mm -hmm. well, it's my body and it's my front room. All the things that we do, what is the purpose of it? I just realized that I was more trusting before I was six. So many women, they just feel like I have to cook for my husband, I have to breastfeed my children, I have to pick them from school. <laughs> because to, society Then you go to. home and you cry and you stop your career, you can't do anything, then you blame everybody. You took that choice. See, is it for upcoming artists to blow in Nigeria? Welcome to Cross Trending. I am Wiki November, your host, saying thank you for joining us on today's episode. Welcome back. It's tea time on Plus TV Africa. Practice makes perfect. I'm not perfect yet, but I'm a lot better than I used to be. He's a king. He's entitled to marry a hundred if he wants to. We can't talk about education reform if we don't decolonize our education system. What we do not understand, we will stigmatize. 
because it's just cultural. It, it's and I think it's just human nature. They stop paying our salary. I don't like remembering it. I am angry at Nigeria. I'm angry at this government which seems to be letting us down. I'm angry at us as a people. In the process of struggling to free myself from his hand, he tore my pants and jumped um, with me. Yes, I commit the first truly. Young girl, do you know where you are going? Tuning in is our ladies' night out, and we're asking if there can ever be a justification for rape and what should be the punishment for the rapist. Please let us hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join this conversation. Tweet at us at We Show Africa One with the hashtag We Show, or send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081 8038 All right, so um, we'll try to open the phone lines, but we're having a bit of difficulty today. If we can hear you, fine. Um, Uti. We talked about that. I think we've all established that there's no justification for raping. So all those people that keep giving silly excuses like, oh, it was what she was wearing and all of exactly. that. Exactly. They are all thrown in the, in the totally. bin. Totally. No all right, so what should be the punishment? Because now this is a very dicey situation. We are all women. Mm. And we cannot ignore the fact that women actually do commit this crime as well. Totally. You know, raping young boys, raping older, older men, you know, gang raping a man. So women also... Um, um, carry out culprits yes they are well. culprits in the rape transaction mm -hmm. so I um, I am thinking I'm still processing what the punishment should be like for a woman you see now they would not say it is woman matter now I'm laughing <laughs> but before it's a man and my face is strong but I, 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 I want to understand what you think about punishment for both a man you know and if it's in the case of a woman what should that punishment look like you know for cases of rape mm. I want to make something clear, and a lot of people are not going to like me for what I'm about to say. When we talk about the issue of rape, I am not in any way failing to acknowledge the fact that men get raped or women get raped. But it's like taking an ocean, right, and picking out a drop and worrying about the drop. I'm sorry, men, forget it. Look, however you want to swing this conversation, I can't. Yes, men get raped, but in the grand scheme of things, in the problem of rape, I'm sorry, men stand aside. I can't. Let's be clear. When we talk about rape, when we talk about the travesty of rape, we will and continue, whether you like it or not, to focus on the women. Now, should there be consequences across board? Absolutely. Men that rape women, absolutely. Women that rape men, absolutely. Women that sexually harass women, absolutely. But let me be categorically clear. Women lose their lives every day. Girls, children die every day from being raped. How many times do men get raped and die? For a man to actually be able to be raped, he has to have an erection. They, look, I don't even want to have this conversation because it's going to upset me. So let's be clear that when Uti is talking about rape, I'm talking about it from the perspective of a woman. Be, I am biased. Take it however you want to take it, put it in your pocket and walk out. So let me just say that when you are going to talk about prosecution, when you are going to talk about the penalties, let's talk about the penalties for men because there can never be enough. When somebody now tries to tell me that, Uti, when you say you should kill them or you should castrate them, what about the ones that are falsely accused? Excuse me, the statistics I can find, unfortunately, I couldn't find the ones for Nigeria. 200,000 plus cases, almost 300,000 cases. Out of those, how many prosecutions? Less than just over 2,000. How many convictions? About 1,500 from 255,000. Maybe, maybe, if a couple of people, and this is not me saying go and kill people, go and castrate people, but in those percentages there, eh, even probability and statistics allows for error. If one or two get castrated by mistake, they will make sure their younger brother doesn't do it. So you know what? According to me, it's just fine. So let me make it clear because all people that keep saying, oh, men get raped. No, 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 no. It's story. Women are dying out there every day, whether they are wearing hijabs, whether they are wearing shorts, whether they're walking around naked. It's my body. I don't ask you to be indecent. Dress how you want to dress. That's the world we live in today. Don't touch me if I say no. Please, let's be clear. Because all these issues, men will be saying, eh, but this, but that. 
even in common ordinary law that has nothing to do with rape, whether it's stealing, whether it's murder, there is a margin for error. There are a lot of people that are sitting in jail that are there that are innocent. It's not right. But please, when it comes to rape, let's not all sit on our high horses and say, you know what, uh, women accuse men. Somebody did this, somebody did not do that. I don't buy it. Okay, if, so you, Jennifer, if you men are so bothered by it, fix the problem. Jennifer, Uti, they will come for you today. Oh. <laughs> Jennifer, let me hear your thoughts. She's biased. Uh, so she has already said that. it. So we are anybody women. That is coming, no, but the truth is that the <laughs> numbers are there. The statistic is really high. So, yeah, men get, but you know the thing, I was going to say this. Is it mm. possible that over the years, right, Men that get raped, mm -hmm. right? They accepted it. You understand? They, no, they accepted it like a thing of because yes. if they had complained about it that this is painful, this is this, this is that, maybe the way we are fighting for women, we'll be fighting for men because <laughs> my cameraman is looking my, at me. My, Let me come to Jennifer. Me, but men really children, enjoyed it. It's for the children. Uh, the children, the children that have been violated are the ones. See, that actually all the boys that I know, adults, men, they'll tell you it was my house gate that first did it, and, and it was good. They will tell you, so they didn't, they don't consider it as a crime. Yes. So you you cannot help them because they don't even consider it as a crime because they weren't informed. They weren't mm, so now that they, we are knowing, now we are coming, know. we are coming gradually to them. We, we don't have a, a formula yet for women. Mm. But let me come to Jennifer. Uti has said it all, and um, I really find it very problematic when women, when it's, um, it's, when women are talking about their issues, the, the challenges that we face in the society, that's when men decide to compare and contrast. We've been fighting for ourselves for a very long time. So I think that if men want a solution, they should stand up and fight for themselves. They are not fighting for us. We have been fighting for ourselves. We've been fighting for women's rights. We've been fighting for, for, for being safe in the society against domestic violence, against sexual harassment, against rape, against killing us. So if men want something to be done about their fight for yourself. Stop waiting for women to actually fight for you. There should be a, there should actually, I, 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 I I can't count how many cases I've actually heard about rape where the man was actually sent to jail. How many have we seen? The law is not on our side and it is so unfair. And I think we actually need to, actually, we need to fix the justice system. If, if, if a man commits a crime like that, punish him immediately. I don't care what they want to do. Just do something. Make an example of somebody. I heard of the case where a man raped a child. He went to jail for only Two years, and then he came out. Why? Why are you out in society? We don't need you. Sleep there. Spend the rest of your life in jail and stay there. Do not come out because you come out, you're a menace. I don't think when they actually go to jail, they actually learn their lesson. I don't think they do because if you actually learn your lesson, all these things that we're seeing in the society will not be happening every day. It is too bad and it's terrible. They've not learned that lesson. But let me take some comments. Um, Benson says explanation from Jennifer was quite deep and helped. It helps. Um, it helped clarify so much. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, another uh, comment from Rafael Akori from Zaria. He says, "Topic of discourse always bring out the area of strength in life. When rape was mentioned some days ago, um, Sally was very crossed, and her other side became visible. And she is an advocate against rape." Rape must be condemned by all civilized people because it has destroyed many potential mothers in the world. Exactly. We need deep, proper orientation for men mm -hmm. and boy-child boy, on self-control in the face of temptation and impulses. Yes, Raphael, this is very dear to me. I'm trying to hold myself today because everybody mm -hmm. kept saying that you were too, you were too, I mean, I, 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 I exposed my real self on yes. Tuesday, so I'm <laughs> trying to stay calm today so that mm. at least we can have a conversation and help people out there see what we are talking, what about. We're talking about. Yeah, but Isi, quickly take your comments because okay. we're even um, running out of time. My comment, um, this is from Mrs. Banjo. She says, thanks, ladies, for putting your voices on this sensitive issue. She's from Festac. Mm. She said this from Festac. Then we also have Wurola. Wurola said um, individuals must have strength to get away from early signs of bad behavior. Mm. I totally agree with her because it's essential that we understand that when we see the telltale signs, when you already, we have already, I have already given an example of 
the kind of people that are likable to be a rapist. Mm -hmm. So when we see the telltale signs in these individuals or, or people, what we should do is, you know, walk away and we should always do one thing. The earlier we tell our children that these are the kind of people, I'm looking at it from the perspective of children, the earlier we tell our children that these are the kind of people that could take advantage of you. And most times it's even, it could be the ne next door neighbor, it could be your uncle, it could be a close relative. And the moment we advise our children on the little signs that if uncle touches you here, somebody touches you there, know that it is totally uncomfortable, it's a no-no. And the earlier we tell our children this, the better for everybody. Mm -hmm. And the earlier the child will know the difference between right and wrong touch. Mm -hmm. And know that, okay, I'm safe with this person or I'm not safe with this person and be more vocal about I what she is I think it's even more about breaking the silence. More of mm -hmm. talking, more of breaking the silence. I yes. mean, I'm happy about the story I took in the news yesterday of the Covenant University lecturer. Absolutely. Yes, that was arrested and they've mm -hmm. taken him, transferred him to state CID for further in investigation. Mm -hmm. He raped a 17-year-old girl. In fact, yes. uh, what came to my mind, because I was having that conversation with my, my husband, and he was saying, you know, the relationship mm -hmm. the girl must have with her parents must be a good one for exactly. her to have been able to tell to the parents. Because it was the parents, you know, mm -hmm. alongside the girl that went to lodge that complaint. So imagine Fantastic. if she didn't have that explanation kind of backing exactly if she didn't have that backing what? so that's you know mm -hmm. that one tells me also that parents you know mm -hmm. you must build that bond with your your your, your children so mm -hmm. that they are able to talk to you when they have been touched inappropriately and should be able to defend themselves yeah. even when they are not there i'm so apt to, i'm so i'm so concerned about this particular part because i as a child you have a little girl around, of course, and you have individuals who would want to, you know, take advantage of that little girl. So what you should do, what my mom did was very fantastic from day one. And she didn't say it in, nice, in a nice way. She didn't coat it. She gave it to me, a mano a mano, face to face, the way it was. There was no filter. So if I see an uncle or I see an auntie or I see a friend or I see a relative trying to, you know, talk to me in a particular way, and I feel I'm not comfortable with that person. I, I quietly walk away. And that actually guided me. What is, you have met the same rapist now. What, is the, what about the ones that will put a knife to your saying. neck? That's what I'm saying. You look for the telltale uh, signs. Yeah, all right. Those so signs me, will help the child. That's we, what helped me. We thought we had time, but we actually ran out of time. But let me just hear Uti's final comment and Jennifer's final comment on... Um, we haven't. We still did not find the solution to the, the punishment for uh, the rapist. We talked. <laughs> I said castration. Yes, everybody's mentioning castration. And slow, a very slow one, very slow. So they have. I said I was twisted in this aspect. I, I didn't want to talk about it in this context. But the key thing is that it should be very slow. And the earlier you do it, you know, you g make make an example of an individual who, who has put taken, that picture who has taken advantage of a child or has taken Ew. advantage of a woman it's <sighs> essential here mm. nobody deserves to be raped whether it be a child a man or a or a woman mm. it's as simple as all that. right uti your final thoughts please um so if you left it to me if i had to choose punishment I'm sorry, I wouldn't even choose castration. I just hanged you from your ball school, you die. How about we do that? Just kill him. Simple. I'm sorry. You know, when you when you when you when you actually castrate someone, he's still got life. He still might be able to find some joy in life. I don't even think that he, he should get that. How about we just kill you? In a, in you know, I'm I'm with Issy. I don't think they should they should poison you or they should you know just hang you from it till you die so that whilst you're dying you can think about the pain that you put her through but you still get to die so i mean i'm sorry yeah very graphic but that's me mm. jennifer do you agree that was very graphic <laughs> thank you i'm sorry you know i don't know who took up that picture on the, on the screen it was awful. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, actually not the laughing matter, but I actually agree with, with the Jennifer. I feel like, yeah. Well, go ahead. I said, I don't know who put up the picture as well. It was very graphic. <laughs> so, can you hear me? So, what, what's your final take? 
Um, so I, I agree with the castration punishment because I feel like there is there is nothing else that would actually suit that crime aside that. I mean, it's just a lifelong lesson. If you live to tell your story, then you tell them how you don't have your thingy anymore. And that's a good thing. I mean, I think they still gave you life. But if you don't have a life later, sorry about that. But you, you, you took something away from a human being. You took something away from somebody that they would never get back. The trauma is for life. It never actually goes away. And I, 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 I don't know. I, I, just stop ripping, please. Stop it. Let, let, let's just kill it and let it end. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Oh. I don't agree with Iti. If you kill the person, that is fast. It is, in fact, it is merciful. When you castrate the person and you do it slowly, and that person lives with it. That person will, those that are coming behind, will take a look at it and they will never try to do it again. Mm. It's essential. That's so, slow. That's merciful. No. no one says the solution is train the men, have, the, um, have family system, so train the men. Mm. That's what the person is proposing as a solution. That's a long-term solution. We are ah. looking for immediate solution. So this topic of rape is actually quite draining. It is. Um, the damage you do mm. to the psychology of any victim of rape, sometimes it leaves with them for their lifetime. The rest of their lives. You don't yes. want that. You exactly. know. So please, um, I also want the government to be seen to be responsible, taking it seriously. Because I think also, because over the years, there hasn't been serious show of you know, um, punishment for crimes like this and that's why it has escalated and it's gone so bad so um we hope to fight this this menace we hope to fight it exactly all right so thank you ladies thank you so much Can I just thank, say you, something quickly? thank you jennifer um so ways was birthed from the need to inspire inform and influence lives towards action and this year we started our csr focused on curbing unemployment in nigeria if you're a company, please partner with us by allocating internship slots. And if you're a job seeker, keep watching Ways and follow us on all our social media handles, as this will be an all-year-round engagement. So tell your friends to keep all eyes on Ways. In case you missed today's quote, here it is again. That tells you there's no justification. It says, if you blame the rape victim because her clothes were provocative, you must also blame the bank that was robbed because its content was provocative. We'll see you live tomorrow at 8 p.m. as we bring another great conversation to your screen. Enjoy. of women is progress for all of us. The World Trade Organization has appointed a former Nigerian finance minister as the new head of the organization. I'm very proud to be the first African. I'm proud to be the first woman. My guest tonight is a critically acclaimed author from Nigeria whose most recent best-selling... Please welcome Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Giving priority to women is not an option. It is a necessity. So go, girl. Tell that story that has not been told before. Step into that spotlight and shine. Get up, get going. The world is waiting to be wowed by your very existence. Because when you go where no woman has been, you have no idea just how many will follow.
مثلا هكا ازل العراقي ما بان بلكي حاله انتحار بلكي مخو انتحار كربا This is Stuttgart, an industrial city in southwest Germany, a manufacturing hub. The city is home to companies that made Germany famous for its engineering excellence. People say it's the German way of living and thinking. We are here today to see how Germany has put that expertise into practice, not in technology, but in changing lives of a few. We took only those that couldn't be helped there. If they were in a good condition uh, or if their family structure was intact, of course, we said then, stay there. We only took the most severe cases. It's a chilly morning, and at the metro station, we are waiting for Lamia, Lamia Bashar. Lamia is a Yazidi girl whose life changed in August 2014, the day Islamic State militants reached Kocho village in the province of Sinjar what the fate of these Yazidi women and children have been, but to have ISIS actually admit... Lamia had just scene. finished middle school when Islamic State militants threatened to kill everyone unless they convert them. Islamic State was targeting Yazidis in an effort to purge Iraq of all non-Islamic influences. Yazidis are a Kurdish-speaking religious minority with their own faith. We already know of Lamia. She is one of the group of Kocho girls who were taken captive by Islamic State. One girl. In August 2017, we produced a short feature on missing girls. With the help of watercolor paintings, our small story was named The Last Dance of Kocho and Its Missing Girls. Escaping in March. After seeing our story, Yazidi activist and humanitarian Mirza Dinnai called us to say that he knew where the girls were. And he said Lamia was here in Germany. Dinai is something of a hero in these parts. We will come back to him, but now Lamia is here. My excitement at finding Lamia in person is so intense that I cannot focus my camera when she first appears with her brother Wad and friends from Sinjar. She is tiny, beautiful and mature for her age. Life has tested her more than many of her peers. The girls knew they were going to be sold as sex slaves. Lamia just had face surgery. She's ready to talk to us, but only after a week of rest. So total, how many girls you said? One, 1,100 women and children were in there. We used the time to find other missing girls in southwest Germany. Mirza Dinai started a program called Airbridge Iraq, a humanitarian organization to bring Iraqi children and terror victims to Germany. With his help, the Home Ministry of German state of Baden-Württemberg brought more than 1,100 survivors to Germany in the hope of giving them a better life. Some of the IS victim girls from Kocho came to Germany through this program. During our nine-day journey, we meet many girls and families. Each story sounds more horrific than the one before. Salwa Khalaf was just 16 when she was captured by IS militants, also known as Daesh. She remembers exactly. I 
وقتي رجع السي هشت حتى ساعة هشتي سبي ازان فستي ومن ازاني تشوفوا يا ست شاكينا حسياب ومشي معنا وساعة سي شرطة سبيكر وساعة سي دعشات هابي نقول دنيا قرم مو العراقي خلت السر خاني عانتن فيهم السر خاني تنفستي بون الساعة سي بشيف ازبيش مامي مو او تلفونا بابي مقربون قود بون شرة اجبر ام الشنقال ده بون بداية شر الشنقال نبو القندادة ده بون القندادة ده سبيكر وان تلفونا بابي مقربو قد بون شر الفيدري داكو بابي مزاني بس نقود نما ساعة هشتي سبي نوم راب ساعة هشتي سبي كم بخو حسيان تلفونا كي بخو حسيان كوري خالي متلفون كير قد كان هم شدكن ام تشاكينا حسيا بون جي هكا سراب مسر خو بجا قصرا ما وسا دي طابق بو قلك ابلندبو ابلندبو اسراب موسى ملشار عيني ري شارع تجي خلق بو خلق هم بيا بعض الدان هريك بدرك إذا بعض الدا متشك في منات كر أز يعني شو ما الدنيا قاعدة من زاني أو أبدا نحية تام أبو أو. Only Salva can define what is normal for her now. Salva now lives in Freiburg, a beautiful city in southwest Germany. Seeing her confidence in her new life, one might think she has left the past behind. But when she talks about it, it is still. So fresh. I don't want to say that I'm not going to do it. 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 ام گشت نتیامان، ام بدای درکت، پیش مرگانه هیلان، ام درکه من سایت ردانی بود، نه هیلان خالق درکه وی مشکل، اشبر ویکی گلک هات نگرته، یعنی از خود یا که مشبر ویکی صاحب نگرته، نشبر رید کرته، نه نه هیلان درکه من گوتم من یکی دیگه شنو، نه زمان چه، جام مجبور من چون ریاکا دور تر ببین، ما چون ریاکا دیبر، ام گشت نتیا، یعنی ام گشت نلوفا، اد پیشی. گلکی خب سبو، ترمپی لکل شارع ایده خراب بو، او بخو نخراب بو، بس نزد جناره کی ما بو آوشی کی سنیم و و ساکر بو ترامپیل سکنا بو دا ترامپیل دین کار بین تر پاس بن. ام گشت نویدره و سکنی تالی را از بیشم داد عاش بون زانم سی بون بتنه پیا هاتون سلاح و آول دستی وان دبون گوتن گوداون. The same day, IS militants took Salva to Mosul. About 500 girls were gathered in a big hall. After 15 days, she finally understood what was going on. IS militants were coming to buy girls and take them. Almost at the same time, Salina Haji Bashar was being captured with other girls in the small village of Kocho. Salina knew everyone who went to Kocho's school. <laughs> کرد خالد خوا خالد خوام همون نفجاتی تن گنجی دی همون بدی تن. سالینا and other girls were watching from the windows. They saw IS militants take several carloads of men to the pool. و داشی سر حاوی ساکنی بود سلاح هر خوا و همو و پشتیم که محسس سلاح کرد ما هم اکر قوتی ما گز لامات کج. Within moments, hundreds of brothers, fathers. Uncles, husbands, and sons were gone. Khudir Hassan was one of them, down below. Khudir could see everything. One IS militant was filming with a camera, and the others were around. Pishtva ya ki gotida se jara ban kar go Allah ho akbar, hamal pira se jara go Allah ho akbar. ودرا وی دیساوی که گویی الله و اکبر گو ارمی مخالف فرهتایل برده خست او تلقل و اندان بسر مدک هاتن تلقل من نکات جاره بری تلقل من نکات بو پشتی که خلاص کردن پشتی که تلقلی دان هچی حس و وجیه هاد باز عنی بنا هیچی ساقه و وی که گویی دا وی که آمر دای گویی ارمی تا تبوار وری که دل سری وی دا و دهار ویژل من ندا پشتی که چرا کهش با ما دور خاتن وی چوبانه فانی را که قمسلای که کی رساسیل مبو گو یا کی گوتا وی گو گوی های رساسی گو نامریه گوی ساقه نزام مخالفان نزاتشلوس دیتم گوی ساقه اش دور تلقا بردامه یعنی نه تراسری مبردامه اش دور تقریبا مسافه 6 کیلومتره 
بردامه و سال پشت است و چرخی بس نگهشته هستی بس تیر چرخی در کد تدیدن نمادالقا مخوار نلوان جوان کزی مریم نهات بامه While Khudair was still figuring out that he was alive and wondering how to escape, the girls at the nearby school were terrified, not knowing what was going to happen to them. IS militants picked all the girls who did not have children and took them to a park. و باس آنی نب باسید مزن نفرا دتوجی آنی نم کرنیده، هم بر نموسل، هم کاتچک، هم بر اینکه نام مالا کموسل دستی تا وقت مزن بو، هم بر اینکه نیده نکاتچک دیده ای زدی تیرا بو. آوجی کوی ما کوتی چلو نم کرنا بال دو کو وسا او کوتین شیخی وان امیری وان تی آنیف ما کو مات فروشیا هر یکی یا فروشیا یکی، هر یکی یا کی دیده هدیا بیو. Salva was captured with a different group from Salina. Each girl had her own fate. I'm sick. 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 الوی دریم روزه که من و دیسه هات دویان کتکاب کردن و آو یک آلبام بود جلان پرچ از خلقت العزیر بود اشتر ساخ و کشت آلبام رایت دستی خوکت کردن. جلان مقابلی من آرونشتی بود و برای جلان چه خرابی مگوت هوالا خوب مگوت جلان نه طبیعیه. هوالام مگوت گو ام همو تو سانه گو یکیش مهاجی خوری نگو یعنی وی حالی دکیش مهاجی خواهیم. Salva learned that Jilan's sisters had an idea that she could commit suicide, but they didn't stop her. هکش هکا خوشگی توی گودوان اشبر وی که جیلان چی حمامی دام نت هلا خوب کشی. او لحظه کش اذهب بس حمد ریبو وقت جیلان خوب کشی. پشتی جیلان گله کی دیجی محاوله کردن البامة. انهيار البامة شيبو يعني اشتل ام تعبين بانز دروجا هموكي بس كابوس بو ترس دليما هموكا دبو كنجي دورا كيشمت اي هرجار تاعتن هناك تكرين وهرجار اكادي دير كتبان هريكي جي خوشكا كوبي بربون هريكي جي هفالا كوبي بربون ونزاني كنجي دورا وانا ام همو الهيفيا دورا خوبون قلق جارا أم تحبين ما تقولك ها خزي بين مشخورة بين بس مش في حالي خلاص كن أم تحبين منافين بتربي تشتي ببين ما بدس هيك تذكرتن بدس بس هذا السي ما شيء خد تذكرن الدارة المدار الدارة ده السي ما شيء خد تذكرن برامات كيشا يا بشتي جيلان هنا جدي محاولة كن خو بكوشن This is another Jilan. She's 16 now, so she was a child when she was captured four years back. Jilan speaks out for probably the first time, and her story is horrific. But for that, we will have to reach Tübingen, a university town in south of Germany. By this time, Lamia is also ready to talk. Lamia is Salina's sister. They live in the same complex. While Salina is talking to Dakhil, I have a chance to visit Lamia's room and see her picture gallery. 
I do not speak Kurdish, but Lamia makes things clear. This is in Italian. This is father. Brother. Brother. Okay. Kadri. Okay, Kadri. On Almas. So where is Kadri? Here. Okay, she's she's in Germany now. No, uh, this is in. Bomb, bomb. Oh, bomb, she died. Yes. Oh. On Almas. Oh, Almas. Yes. She was with you, right? Yes. She died. Yes. Okay. On father. Father, yeah. On the mother. Where is your mother here? Me. Yeah. Um, Where is she? Yes. Kinna? Yes. Not yet back? Yes. No. Okay. This star. Salina. Oh, Salina, yeah. Bahad. Ah. Yes. And this is uh, my phone. Okay. Yes. Okay. And this is uh, Ish. You? Yes. Oh. Okay. On this is she. Who? Is. Who are you? Yes. Alright. Okay. This is Catherine. Catherine, okay. On this is Almas. Almas. Yes. Okay. On this is my my house. Oh, in in Rukocho? Yes. This is Dalal. Mm -hmm. On this is Samia. On this is Sahandia. On this is uh, Ish. Meanwhile, Salina is telling my colleague Dakhil Shamo how she tried to stop the militants from taking Lamia away from her. Salina stayed at the same place for two days. One evening at 8 p.m., when she was alone at home, she decided to run away. I had to turn off the door. IS militants were watching them. They were captured again and put in jail for nine days in Khaim. Lamia was captured in the same school at Kocho. She said, she said,
A lot of the jobs that exist today will not exist in the next 10 years. Ten years. When I see people today shouting, we're not too young to run, we are ready to run. Ready to run to where? The people of excellence are, to a certain extent, being held in ransom by idiots and bandits. Once you are in government, you believe everything you do is right. Mm. And once you are in opposition, everything the government does is wrong. And so it's time for us to take over power. Politics has helped shape the decision of the polity, from conspiracy theories to good old-fashioned comic politics. These are the results of tomorrow's election. Yes. Tomorrow's okay, election. you have it already. Have it. I am not hungry. If I need appointment, all I need to do is to start praising government. Plus, politics will fill the polls of the country, from friends to frenemies, even strange bedfellows, to clones and stooges. We go beyond the rhetorics and the drama to analyze the story behind the story. Let anybody come and say. The moment we stop having charlatans occupy political offices, we will curtail hate speech. Plus politics, not just another political show. It's about putting you, the citizens, in the know. In recent times, mental health disorders have become a pressing public health issue, depression being one of the most common of them. Depression is a common illness worldwide, with more than 264 million people. According to WHO, projections indicate that depression may be the second leading cause of life lost after heart disease. At its worst, Depression can lead to suicide. Almost one million lives are lost yearly due to suicide, which translates to 3,000 suicide deaths every day. For every person who completes a suicide, 20 or more may attempt to end his or her life. Recently, a young Nigerian known as Ayodele Bandele was reportedly found dead Hours after he was declared missing on Tuesday, January 12th, in Lagos State. Before he was declared missing, he left a disturbing note on his Instagram story where he hinted suicide after opening up on how he battled depression for seven years. This trailed reactions on social media. Depression is real. Anyone can get depressed, even the teenagers. The World Health Organization has it that, globally, depression is one of the leading causes of illness and disabilities among adolescents, and suicide is the third leading cause of death in 15 to 19-year-olds. We spoke to a child and educational psychologist who stressed on the causes of depression among the teenagers. A lot of people believe that depression happens to only adults, but research has proven that teenagers also experience depression. Now, talking about what causes depression in teenagers, there are a whole lot of things that could cause depression um, among teenagers, but it's usually as a result of some kind of exposure to experiencing something different. So for some of them, they might um, experience a failure. Uh, maybe they wrote an examination and they failed. It could cause depression. Sometimes it could be loss of a loved one. Maybe one of the parents um, passed on or even um, a, a situation like a divorce. For some children who have very fragile personality, something like um, a, a sudden change of environment or a sudden change of school, something that is just unpalatable to them can cause depression in teenagers. Here, yeah is a viral video of a mother in Kenya who narrated how she lost her teenage child. And it was a Sunday evening and we had just had supper. And I thought that it was just one of his antics because he was a difficult boy. He became very difficult after he failed his Form 4 exams. And so finally when they, they kept going and coming, going and coming and I was in my room. 
when I went outside, I found my son hanging on my, on my veranda. And the, the most wicked, wicked, wicked sight in my life is to see his tongue hanging almost up till here. <laughs> because he had... What should be done? What are the roles the parents are to play in Corbin this disturbing issue of depression? So the first thing that I would um, say that parents need to do is to realize that this is possible and to wake up from this, um, what I call it, denial that seems to exist in most African families. Um, when parents do these two things, then they become naturally more observant. They begin to look out for the signs in the children. Yes, teenagers have a lot going on for them. They're going through hormonal changes. They're going through um, a lot of physical, psychological changes. And so, yes, they would have mood swings. They'll have high and low days, but it will come and go. But once it lingers, once it lingers for two weeks, they're about Please, please, and please, we need to talk to um, a specialist. We need to talk to a doctor, first of all, because sometimes um, parents do not know how to access um, specialists. So we need to talk to a doctor who will then refer, whether to a child psychologist or to a psychiatrist or whoever they think is best in that situation. It is reported a majority of Nigerians lack awareness about mental health plus non-available mental health services. These barriers have long-lasting consequences as depressed patients who are untreated are more vulnerable to suicidal threats and suicide. There is therefore a need for more mental health practitioners in the country in order to meet the needs of the ever-growing number of people who will need to be treated. The first step towards tackling this issue, however, is raising awareness and talking about it.
Lagos News now tonight. President Buari raises alarm over continuous inflow of illegal arms from Libya. In Tanzania's vice president set to become first female leader after the sudden death of John Magufuli. EU's drug regulator says AstraZeneca vaccine is safe. Well, thanks for joining us on Plus News Now. I am Vivian Oguche. So President Mamadou Buhari says as far as Libya remains unstable, illegal arms will continue to flow into Nigeria. The president's spokesman, Femi Adesino, in a state statement said, President Buhari stated this when he hosted outgoing special representative of the United Nations Secretary General and head of the United Nations Office for West Africa and the Sahel on Thursday at State House in Abuja. He said Mama Gaddafi held a grip on power in Libya for 42 years by recruiting armed guards from different countries who then escaped with their arms when the Libyan strongman was killed. The outgoing special representative thanks the president for the leadership role Nigeria plays on the continent. And from security to health, President Mahmoud Buhari has directed the Minister of Health, Osage Hanire, to ensure effective utilization of the Global Fund's provision of $890 million over the next three years to support Nigeria's fight against HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. The president spoke at the virtual launch of the Grand Four at the period of 2021 to 2023, which will also support the establishment of resilient and sustainable systems for health in the country. Commending the work of Nigeria's country coordinated a mechanism under the leadership of the Minister of Health, President Buhari reaffirmed Nigeria's commitment to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. Also, President Mahmoud Buhari has approved the appointment of Adede Jizak as the Executive Secretary of the National Sugar Development Council, NSDC, for an initial term of four years. President Buhari made the announcement in a statement on Thursday by Director of Information, Office of the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Willy Bassi. According to the statement, the appointment is with effect from the 10th of March. And now, uh, police have killed two suspected bandits in Saminaka town, Liri, local government area, Kaduna State, and recovered five AK-47 rifles from them. The state's police spokesperson, Mohammed Jaligi, confirmed the incident in a statement he issued on Thursday in Kaduna. He said a combined team of security operatives acting on a tip-off traced the suspected bandits to their location where they were planning to launch an attack on law-abiding citizens. The police spokesman added that the two suspects were overpowered, two were killed, while several others escaped into the forest, abandoning their weapons. He urged residents of the area to be vigilant and to report any suspicious persons with injuries to the nearest police formation. Meanwhile, troops attached to the Special Task Force Operation Safe Haven have shot dead an armed robbery suspect at Kutaya Street in Jengri, Basaluka area of Plachi State. The troops were stationed for maintaining peace in the state and some parts of Kaduna as well as Bochi states and were responding to a distress call when it engaged some bandits in a gun duel. Commander of the task force, Major General Dominic Onyemelu, who said two other members of the criminal gang escaped with bullet wounds. He also said one AK-47 rifle, a fabricated rifle, an automatic pistol, among others, were recovered from the scene. Still on security, Anglican bishops from the southeastern part of Nigeria has called on the five governors from the southeast to create a security outfit that will address the issue of insecurity in that zone. The chairman of the Anglican Bishop Southeast Forum, Bishop Emmanuel Chukuma, said that this during a course of visit to Governor Hopu Zodima in the government house, Oweri. I also called the attention of him to mobilize all the governors in the southeast to make sure that there's a security outfit quickly mobilized for security of people in the southeast and also for agricultural and uh, animal husbandry to make sure that we have our own food 
we have our own meat and many other things, and for unemployment to be tackled. And has promised us that that will happen. Majorly, the security of South East and everything is in the hands of our governors. They must do their best to make sure that they do something about it. Why should we put We need our own because we can no more trust the present security. They have failed. So we need our security to such a feel that we'll be able to understand, they know the ground, they know how to tackle the ground, and then face the whole thing thoroughly. So because as far as I'm concerned, if we continue to trust in the police and control, we don't have our own security outfit, then we're in danger. So they think that it is necessary that we have our own security outfit to make sure that at least we'll be able to police ourselves, save ourselves and secure ourselves. I've taken out the advice given to me and I've tried my best to keep to them religiously. And I wish our people, the country, well, I wish the South East well. All over the world, government alone cannot handle security. So when he is calling off the complementary role of the citizens, it's consistent with the global best practice. So I think what we will do here as governors is to really man our different states, man our zones, support what the federal government is doing so that there will be security that will guarantee the lives and properties of our people. Meantime, the area on Okakanfu of Yoruba land, Gani Adams, has expressed worries over the unfolding state of anarchy in the southeast region, which is traceable to the reoccurrence of kidnapping, arson, maiming, destruction of economic facilities, and killings. The Odua People's Congress leader, Gani Adams, while addressing some Yoruba leaders at the Pan Yoruba Congress held at the Mapo Hall in Ibadan, noted with dismay the state of insecurity in Nigeria and the ancestral space of Yoruba land, a situation which he said has compelled a rigorous interrogation of the menace. He also stressed that the present insecurity situation in the country and southwest region calls for unity of people across all divides, including politics, religion, social and economy, warning that when injustice becomes law, resistance will be a duty. With this now, we Yorubas, we understand where we are going, to all to speak in one voice. And you can see we are all speaking in one voice now. And you know very soon we shall get there. We need to work hand to hand. We need to work hand to hand. And we need to, everybody is a police, we need to polarize all our area. We are here today just to make sure that we plan how to protect ourselves, may God protect us. Federal government is not interested in protecting anybody. It's as if nobody is protecting any, uh, anybody. So we have to come together as your urban your, your nation to protect ourselves. I think it's a welcome development. It's a starting point. We'll be working on our people so that more people can join a success train. Uh, we need this kind of meeting because of the security threat and our economy, especially the issue of agriculture. And you can see what everybody has said here today. The communique has been rolled out. We send it to the gentlemen of the press. And uh, you now know what we want to unveil to move your nation forward. In his address at the gathering, the Oyo State Governor, Shei Makinde, solicited the support of the non-state actors to effectively tackle the menace of insecurity and economic flaws in all your states and in the country at large. I will take decision in the best interest of my people. Security and architecture of all your states, we must not incorporate non-state actors. But what we want to achieve is that on your state, and by extension, you are going to see our young people in what you want, where people can go about their lawful businesses without less of interest. He, however, promised that his government will consider the recommendations contained in the communique of the Congress with a view to adopt and implement them. 
a one-day workshop geared at reducing all forms of violence and work with governments and communities to end conflict and insecurity, especially in the Northeast, has uh, taken place in Abuja. The workshop was sponsored by TET Fund in collaboration with the Institute for Peace and Strategic Studies, University of Ibadan. In his welcome address, Professor Tajuddin Akonji, who is the principal investigator and director of the Institute, he gave the project background as increasing interest in conflict prevention and peace building activities, especially in the Northeast. The workshop is part of a 2019 National Research Fund project grant to a research team from the Institute for Peace and Strategic Studies, University of Ibadan. Now, the House of Representatives has adopted a motion calling for a halt on the recurring blockage of highways by articulated tanker drivers and thugs. Aisha to Duku, representing Duku Nafada Federal Constituency of Gombe State, moved the motion on the matter of urgent national importance at plenary. The lawmaker says the continuous blockage of the major highways due to disagreements that occur at scenes of accidents makes travelers suffer undue hardship on the roads as the lawmaker called on the House to take concrete actions to halt the menace and ease the traveling experience of Nigerians. The motion was adopted unanimously by the House. The fact that the malaise of road traffic blockade in this country has become a major threat to road transportation sector, since it is still the most patronized mode of transportation in Nigeria, further disturb that such blockade may cause accidents, health concerns, or even loss of lives or properties. The House resolves to urge the House to set up a committee to investigate all cases of road blockade by articulated trucks in Nigeria. In another matter, the House has passed for second reading the bill that seeks to ensure true accountability of government to the people through their representatives in Parliament. The bill was sponsored by Sajos Ogun when it cited a time the Attorney General of the Federation asserted that the National Assembly has no express power to summon the President to explain national issues. Ogun says the bill seeks in effect to give the needed badge to the National Assembly as well as the State Houses of Assembly to summon the President and for the state houses to summon governors on crucial matters affecting the country and individual states. Basically, Mr. Speaker, what the bill tends to, to amend is that if we have powers to make laws for the Federation and for which we even appropriate monies for, we also think we should have powers to invite or to summon the president, as in the case of the state assemblies, to invite or summon the governor to the house. So that's basically it, Mr. Speaker. The bill was then referred to Special Ad Hoc Committee on the Review of the Constitution. Let's take you to Imo State now, where over 1,000 civil servants blocked the entrance gate to the state's government house in Oweri. The civil servants who arrived at the government house as early as 8 a.m. stopped vehicles from going in and out of the premises. The development caused panic at the government house as security men manning the gate battled in vain to disperse the protesting civil servants carrying their letters of appointments and postings. The resolute civil servants said that they were at the government house to prove to the state's governor, Hope Zadima, that they were not ghost workers. Most of us have been old for a year, some 11 months, some 10 months. Personally, I'm being old for okay, okay, okay. What is the compliance of the state government? There is no compliance from the state. They are always using one trick or the other to overwhelm us from time to time. Initially, they were saying it was a deep BVN account number problem or clash. It has been corrected, and nothing has been done. And even if it is done, they have not been able to go to their data bank to do some level of corrections on it. So all of us have been old. Till now, for somebody to be old for one year, for a year at the month, means we are under suffering. 
We cannot continue like this. We come here today because of unpaid salary of workers of the that have been owned. Many this is no many man. eleven months, many nine months, many people they have been paying them and be skipping and putting more people inside. That is why we are here to declare that we are not a ghost. We are a living. Meanwhile, a federal high court, Abuja, has a joint hearing on the motion filed by the Nigeria police seeking a discontinuance of charges it had filed against the former governor of Imo State, Ikedi Ohihakim. The charges bordered on allegations by Wan Chinyere Amuchingwa that her nude video was photoshopped. The allegation had also prompted another suit brought by barrister Aloy Ejimako on behalf of former governor Hakim. At the hearing, a mild drama ensued with a lawyer from the Office of the Attorney General of the Federation uh, who appeared in court with a letter written to the Nigeria police indicating that the Attorney General of the Federation desires to take over the matter. <laughs> Following the directives of the federal government's COVID-19 containment committee that all frontline workers as well as religious leaders get the first dose of the vaccine, religious leaders in Adama State have okayed the available COVID-19 vaccine and are urging followers to also take the shot. Chairman of the Christian Association of Nigeria, Adama State Chapter at Bishop Stephen Mamza, disclosed this on Thursday shortly after receiving the first dose of the vaccine. Christians, actually, both Christians and Muslims, and as you can see by my right, is the chairman of the Muslim Council. He took it last week and I've taken it this week. So if we, as their leaders, are able to take the vaccines without any doubt, then they should not be afraid. Uh, our lives are also very important, and we know that taking the vaccine is the best for us for now, since there is no cure for COVID-19. So I want to call on all Christians and Muslims and all whoever, those, especially those above the age of 50, as they have said, should avail themselves of the uh, opportunity of having the vaccine. And I'm so happy that uh, almost in every local government, there are centers where the vaccines are, are being given. So people should embrace it. Let us forget about all those things that are going on on social media. You know, people, will, no matter how good something is, no matter the good intention, people will always interpret it in their own way. And the chairman, Muslim Council Gambojika, agreed with the chairman of the CAN in Adama and the federal government that the vaccine is safe and effective. He called on citizens to disregard all rumors that the vaccine can kill. According to him, so far, most of the frontline workers had received their vaccine and nothing had happened. He said they were safe and healthy, hence the need for all to do the needful in order to stay safe. Most of people who don't believe that it is, they don't even believe that the COVID is real. In spite of the fact that you see people dying on the television and everywhere. So uh, it's those people who are now spreading false information, distorting facts and all this. So they are the people who are causing all these problems. But they can see all over the world, people are taking it. And so far, there was no any mass death because of a vaccine or any other serious issue. Uh, so it's, it's, the vaccines, as far as I'm concerned, as based on what the experts say, it's safe and it's... Adama State recently received 59,280 doses from the federal government and so far, governor of the state, commissioners, the state assembly members have all received the first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. Well, over now to Ekiti State, where government says none of the 280 persons that have so far received the AstraZeneca vaccine against COVID-19 in the state show any adverse effect. The Senior Special Assistant SSA to Governor Kayode Fayemi on Public Health made the clarification at a media briefing in Adoikiti on Thursday. The SSA also disclosed that a total of 50,000 persons will be vaccinated in the first phase of the exercise, with frontline medical and public officers benefiting first before people at the local level. Still ahead, 
19 people die of food poisoning in Madagascar. Details when we return. The organizers of the Most Valuable Governor's Wives Awards proudly announces the awards ceremony, Sheraton Hotel Abuja, March 23rd, 2021, 6 p.m. The storm is over. Is it? Is it ever over? Storms are part of life. They come and go. The plan is to build your wealth, to withstand stormy days. And to do that, you need partners. Partners that understand what it means to build wealth that lasts. Merest Ham. Let's grow wealth for you. Welcome back. Other parts of Africa now, Tanzania's leadership on Thursday faced calls for a smooth succession after President John Magufuli, Africa's most famous COVID-19 skeptic, died following an 18-day absence from public life that drew speculation about his health. Tanzania's President John Magufuli has died. It was announced on Wednesday. Speaking on state television, Vice President Samia Saluhu Hassan said Magafuli had died of a heart condition at a hospital in the capital, Dar es Salaam. The 61-year-old, one of Africa's most prominent coronavirus skeptics, had not been seen in public since the end of February. Speculation was rife that he had contracted COVID-19. Magafuli had denounced measures to stop the spread of the virus and labelled vaccines a Western conspiracy. Last week, officials denied he was ill. Government figures also said Magafuli was working normally and that citizens should ignore rumours from outside the country. Tanzanian police have arrested four people since last week for allegedly spreading false information about the health of political leaders. And as a result, Tanzania is set to swear in its first female president. 61-year-old Samia Hassan is a soft-spoken Muslim woman thrust from the obscure role of the vice president to become the country's leader after her principal, John Magufuli's sudden death. Under the constitution, Hassan, the vice president, will serve the remainder of Magufuli's second five-year term, which does not expire until 2025. She'll also become the first female president in East Africa. After consulting with her Chama Chama Pinduzi ruling party, Hassan will propose her possible successor as vice president, with the official appointment being confirmed by the National Assembly via votes of no less than 50% uh, of all the members of parliament. Meanwhile, President Mohamed Buhari on Thursday mourned the late Tanzanian President John Magufuli, who died on Wednesday at 61. President Buhari's condolence message was contained in a statement by his senior special assistant on media and publicity, Garba Shehu. Also, former President Gulag Jonathan has condoled with the government and people of Tanzania over the death of their president. Jonathan, in a statement by his special advisor on media in Abuja on Thursday, described the late Magufuli as a true patriot who did his best to advance his country. Also, South Africa's president, Assyria Ramaphosa, has paid a final tribute to the late Zulu king Goodwill Zweli Thini, who died last week. Zuelitini was buried early Thursday in a private ceremony in the presence of his family and very close friends. He was the longest serving Zulu monarch for more than five decades. The Zulu king died at 72 last week in the eastern city of Durban after weeks of treatment for a diabetes related illness. And now 19 people, nine of them children, have died from food poisoning in Madagascar after eating a turtle. The country's health and food safety control agency said earlier 34 people were hospitalized after eating the protected species, 
10 of them died. Afterwards, the region's governor said nine people, all of them children, died at home after eating meat from the same turtle. Health authorities have warned against eating turtles as well as two dozen species of fish, which feed on alga that can be toxic during the November-March hot season. 16 fatalities were recorded in two incidents in the 2017-2018 hot season. Well, outside Africa now, the EU's drug watchdog says it is still convinced the benefits of AstraZeneca's COVID-19 vaccine outweigh the risks following an investigation into reports of blood clots that prompted more than a dozen nations to suspend its use. The European Medicines Agency's Risk Assessment Committee said the watchdog could definitely rule out a link between blood clot incidents and the vaccine in its investigation into 30 cases of a rare blood clotting condition. This vaccine is safe and effective in preventing COVID-19 and its benefits continue to be far greater than its risks. PROC has found no evidence of a quality or a batch issue. PROC noted that the number of thromboembolic events reported after vaccination is lower than the expected in the general population, and PROC has concluded that there is no increase in the overall risk of blood clots with this vaccine. Moreover, because the vaccine is effective in preventing COVID-19 disease, which in itself is a cause of blood clots, it likely reduces the risks of thrombotic events overall. Meantime, the World Health Organization's European director says the benefits of AstraZeneca's COVID-19 vaccine far outweigh any risks and countries across Europe should continue to use it to help save lives. He noted that Europe's medicines regulators have investigated a small number of cases of blood clots in the region that have prompted around a dozen EU governments to suspend use of the shot. Venous thromboembolism is the third most common cardiovascular disease in the world. It happens in populations regardless of whether you are vaccinated or not. COVID-19 vaccination will not reduce illness or deaths from other causes. As of now, we do not know whether some or all of the conditions have been caused by the vaccine or by other coincidental factors. WHO is assessing the latest safety data and once completed, the findings will be made public. At this point in time, however, the benefits of the AstraZeneca vaccine far outweigh its risk and its use should continue to save lives. We need to keep the confidence. If it's lost, we need to restore it, particularly for AstraZeneca, which is the big supplier to the COVAX facility, which is the only facility which is really looking at a equitable access. So it's about being transparent, showing empathy, and being competent. Also, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson says that the Oxford AstraZeneca and Pfizer COVID-19 vaccines being rolled out in Britain are safe and that he will have his Astra jab on Friday. The Oxford jab is safe and the Pfizer jab is safe. The thing that isn't safe is catching COVID, which is why it's so important that we all get our jabs as soon as our turn comes and as it happens I'm getting mine tomorrow and the centre where I'm getting jabbed is currently using the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine for those receiving their first dose and that is the one I'll be having. We've always said uh, that in a vaccination programme of this pace and this scale some interruptions in supply are inevitable and it is true that in the short term we're receiving fewer vaccines than we had planned for a week ago. Uh, that is because of a delay in a shipment from the Serum Institute uh, who are doing a Herculean job in producing vaccines in such large quantities. Well, still on the pandemic, Japan will leave the COVID-19 state of emergency in Tokyo on Sunday. Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga said this on Thursday, while the capital's governor warned citizens not to let down their guard. Suga said the availability of hospital beds had improved in Tokyo and its three neighboring prefectures, where restrictions have remained since early January. 
While under pressure to bring COVID-19 under control ahead of the postponed 2020 Tokyo Olympics this summer, the government is eager to jumpstart economic activity in the greater Tokyo area, whose 36 million residents account for 30 percent of Japan's population. Well, turning to other stories now, both pressure and diplomatic options are on the table for dealing with North Korea. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said on Thursday, after hours after a senior North Korean diplomat rejected any talks until, until Washington changed its policies. The United States has put both options of pressure and diplomatic talks on the table when it comes to dealing with the increasing threat of North Korea's nuclear program. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken made the announcement in the South Korean capital of Seoul on Thursday hours after a senior North Korean diplomat rejected any talks until Washington changed its policies. President Biden plans to complete a North Korea policy review uh, in the weeks ahead in close coordination and consultation uh, with the Republic of Korea, with Japan, with other key partners, including reviewing pressure options and the potential for future diplomacy. Blinken declined to elaborate when asked what approach the United States would take after the review. He was asked later if President Biden planned to meet with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and said, quote, in a sense, everything is on the table. We have a very open mind about it. The U.S. says its strategy is aimed at not only addressing security concerns, but also the, quote, repressive North Korean government's widespread systematic abuses on its people. Earlier, a senior official from the North accused the U.S. of playing a cheap trick in its attempt to make contact with Pyongyang. During Blinken's first visit to South Korea as Secretary of State, he also blamed China for undermining regional stability on the Korean Peninsula, although those accusations have been rebuked by Beijing. Uh, I would hope that uh, whatever happens going forward, uh, China will use that influence effectively uh, to, uh, to work on uh, moving North Korea to denuclearization. He called for unity among allies, despite Seoul's hesitance to provoke China, its largest economic partner and an ally of North Korea. Accompanying Blinken on the trip was U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, who later visited Seoul's National Cemetery, where he laid a wreath to honor the war dead from past conflicts. Up next, Nigeria's daily oil production increases by 1.42 million barrels. As in business news, such as a short break. Bank of Nigeria and the Nigerian Communications Commission have announced a new charge for mobile banking services in the country in a bid to end a row between banks and telecoms operators. Anita Felix reports on how this might affect USSD usage in Nigeria, financial inclusion, and the dispute between banks and telecommunication operators. Six Naira, 98 Kaba. That's what Nigerians would now be billed when they use USSD codes to transfer money, buy airtime or data, pay subscription fees, among others. Before now, Nigerians paid an unstructured fee per session for USSD usage, but the Central Bank of Nigeria and the Nigerian Communications Commission announced the new fee on March 16th saying it's much cheaper and would enhance financial inclusion. Economic analyst Ayodeji Ebo weighs in on the news. What we used to have before was not standardized. Some would charge you five naira, some would charge you ten naira or more. But now it's already uh, it's been agreed that it will be six naira, 98 kobo, roughly seven naira. But Chief Executive Officer Kauri Assets Management Limited, Johnson Chuku, offers a different perspective on the pros and cons of the new fee and posed the question to the CBN. If it leads to an increase in the cost of uh, enjoying banking services, it could be a disincentive 
to customers to embrace banking services. But if ultimately it is a cheaper cost, then it could actually enhance uh, financial inclusion. But they say previously it was passation. But because most US USSD transactions are on a transaction basis, so I need them to define what do they mean by passation and how much was the charge that we are being deducted. There had been a protracted dispute between banks and the telecommunications operators concerning appropriate pricing for the USSD model. But Ayodeji and Johnson believe the new law is a win-win for banks and telcos. Banks have not been remitting. Nobody has been paying the telcos and other stakeholders that provided that platform, that structure. So now that it's guaranteed that they'll be getting their inflow or getting paid for these services, we'll see more investment into that space. We'll see more innovation within that space. The banks are the ones that will be saved the burden of having to bear this cost. However, users of USSD codes criticize the new fee, online and offline. I cannot be paying for USSD. Um, they should find a way to share the payment. That is um, the network company and then the banks. Before, uh, banking just like a way you can keep money and at the end of the day, you have interest or something will come out. But this time around, bank is where, when you are keeping money there, you believe that at the end of the month, they will be drawing gradually, gradually, gradually on T0 cover. Star three digit number hash. The USSD is arguably the easiest and most convenient way to make payments and conduct financial transactions in Nigeria. But users are now divided over the interpretation of the new CBN directive to charge 6 naira 98 kaba per transaction. While some celebrate it as a reduction in mobile banking cost, others see it as an increase. But whichever way it is, it's now up to Nigeria's Apex Bank to provide more clarity on the new law. Aneta, Felix, Plus TV Africa. And now the need for proper intake of water has been stressed as Prime Foods and Beverages Group launched its newest product on Thursday. Jacinta Biko has more for us. The product, according to the group, is the first of its kind, available in five variants that has more health benefits than ordinary water. This new product called the vitamin water came as a desire to help mankind, the community, Nigeria as a whole, to help our health situation with respect to providing the necessary vitamins, um, daily vitamins needed in our daily food. Sometimes you overcook your vegetables and all that, but you don't get to get the required vitamin, but through our water, you get the daily requirement every day. It's so only vitamin water product in the market. Why? Because our promoter saw a need and decided to meet that need. So this product is not just about going into the market, it's about adding value to the lives and the wellness of Nigerians. All this very dear to our hearts is the integrity of our products. Vitamin water has become increasingly necessary as it contains added vitamins and minerals, according to this health expert. The Omnia vitamin water, specifically because it contains vitamin B, it contains vitamin C, and when we talk about vitamin B, it's a vitamin B complex, you find out that it contributes daily intake of the Omnia vitamin water contributes to the recommended daily consumption of the vitamins it contains. Each bottle of Omnia water has zero calorie. A user of the product shares her experience. It's a product that should be in every home, every home, especially for, for everybody. 
The company further stresses the introduction of the products which they say has the potential of reshaping the non-alcoholic beverage market in the country who are looking for alternatives from high sugar beverages. Jacinta Obiuku reporting for Plus TV Africa. And for more on business news, let's join Osaoge Ogbonwa for more. And now in business, the latest monthly, uh, monthly report of the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, has shown that Nigeria increased its crude oil production to 1.42 million barrels per day in February. The country recorded the biggest increase in crude oil production last month among its peers in OPEC. In its monthly oil market report for March, the country's oil production rose by 63,000 barrels to 1.42 million barrels per day in uh, February, based on direct communication. Nigeria produced 1.49 million barrels per day in February, up by 161,000 barrels from 1.33 million barrels per day in January, according to secondary sources. The Department of Petroleum Resources has identified six key areas of operational excellence for Nigeria's oil and gas industry, urging stakeholders to build a culture in these specific areas. Director of DPR, Sarki Awalu, uh, announced this during his uh, keynote address at the 2021 Oloibiri Lecture Series and Energy Forum. The event was organized by the Society of Petroleum Engineers Nigeria Council. Awalu listed the key areas as health, safety and environment, cost performance and return on capital for all stakeholders across all assets, as well as use of appropriate and consistent standards across the entire business. Also, the DPR has sealed 11 petrol stations in Abuja who are culprits of overpricing, under-dispensing, meter manipulation and diversion of products. DPR swung into action following reports of predatory pricing by some independent marketers who latched onto the unauthorized 212 Naira per litre pricing template released by the Petroleum Products Pricing Regulatory Agency last week to fleece hapless uh, consumers. The DPR Zonal had added that it also conducts instant assessment of uh, the quality of petrol sold to buyers at any filling station visited. He reminded marketers that the government has not approved any price increase for petrol, one in Shylock businessmen to desist from um, hoarding petrol and creating artificial scarcity and panic. The Minister of State for Agriculture and Rural Development, Mustafa Shehuri, has reiterated the federal government's commitment towards the diversification of the economy through agriculture. He stated that the commitment would boost nutrition and food security, increase the local farmer's income and also create more jobs for Nigerian youths. Shehuri said President Buhari is very passionate about the need to grow the agricultural sector so as to de-emphasize unnecessary importation of food, which constitutes a drain on foreign exchange. Speaking during the courtesy call on Governor of Biosa State, Senator Duoyediri, while on a working visit of some facilities of the ministry in the state, Shehuri stated that the ministry is fully aware of the peculiar situation in the state that limits agricultural production by the fact that much of the terrain is often flooded, swampy and ecologically disadvantaged to support crop production to the desired commercial level. In his remarks, the governor of Biosa State, Governor Duye Diri, said that the state has huge potentials in fish farming, properly tapped will feed the state and the entire nation. Also in business, gold deposits have been discovered along the abuja nasarawa axis through the National Integrated Mineral Exploration Project being undertaken by the Federal Ministry of Mines and Steel Development. The Minister of uh, Mines and Steel Development, Olami Lekon Adegbite, announced this while playing host to the Governor of Nasarawa State, Abdullahi Sule, in Abuja. The Minister told his guest that the Ministry would develop the mineral resources in Nasarawa he said his ministry was resolved to avoid a repeat of the Zamfara experience, where bandits were largely in charge of the gold mining in Nasarawa State. And that's all in business. I am Osao Gye Ogbonwa.
And an entertainment music producer, rapper, and fashion mogul, West is, re is the richest African American in the United States. Bloomberg reports that West is officially worth $6.6 .6 billion, making him the richest black man in American history. Around the same time last year, West became a certified billionaire with the help of successfully appeal, apparel and sneaker brand Yeezus and a multi-year contract with Gap. According to Business of Fashion, the Yeezus brand is valued at $3.2 to $4.7 billion. Since West remains the sole owner of the Yeezus company, many of his personal net worth is attributed to his recent business decisions and the $1.7 billion that he pockets from additional assets, including his significant investments into his soon-to-be ex-wife schemes label. Given may have lost out on his first best R&B album Grammy win at Sunday ceremony which happened on the 14th of March, but the nomination alone speaks volume about the noise the newcomers been making over the last few months. But while he didn't go home with a golden gramophone, he's been comforted by news he's receiving other gold in its place. With each passing week, Buzz only seems to amplify around his breakthrough single, Heart Anniversary, already his highest charting Hot 100 entry to date. The song, which hopped to number 52 on this week's updated chart, looks poised to become his first top 40 hit. Ahead of the career first, he's achieved another impressive feat, a gold plaque from the Recording Industry Association of America, RIAA. I Just Want It To Be Over takes on new meaning for R&B diva Keisha Cole. Nearly 17 years after the Grammy-nominated songstress first cracked the pop charts with her introductory hit, I Changed My Mind, she has seemingly changed her mind about wanting to continue pursuing her career in music. Taken to Twitter on Wednesday, March 17, Cole left fans stunning with the announcement she was retiring. The statement was made in response to an encouraging fan who was noting the growing buzz afforded to the singer's latest single, I Don't Want To Be In Love. As news of her announcement made it round, many of her supporters reacted in disbelief. In response, Keisha confirmed the tweets did not come from a hacker, nor was she joking. Days after nabbing a Grammy Award for Best Pop Duo Group Performance, Congratulations are again in order for Lady Gaga and Ariana Grande. For the pair's 2020 chart topper, Rain On Me, has crossed another major milestone. Rain is lifted from Gaga's sixth studio LP, Chromatica, which also topped the charts amongst its release in May 2020. The song remains an almighty bop and drips, with the exact blend of epic one would expect from a diva collaboration of this magnitude. Congratulations to both ladies. And finally in entertainment, a Florida teenager has hacked the Twitter accounts of Kim Kardashian, Kanye West and former U.S. President Barack Obama as part of a cryptocurrency scam and has been sentenced to three years in prison after being caught. Graham Ivan Clark also briefly took over the social media profiles of tech billionaires such as Elon Musk, Bill Gates and Jeff Buzz, as well as then-presidential nominee Joe Biden last July, following on, calling on followers to send payments in Bitcoin, which would be doubled and sent back as part of the celebrity's bid to give back to the community among the covid crisis. The then 17-year-old ended up collecting up to $117,000 from the ploy, but he was soon tracked down by authorities and held in custody. And on Tuesday, he pleaded guilty to 30 counts of communication frauds and other felony crimes. And that is how I wrap up entertainment news today. The best in sports is coming after this. My name remains Ife Omai. And now for sports. Golden Eaglets coach Fatai Amo has appealed to CAF to consider Zambia to host the Under-17 African Cup of Nations. Morocco stepped down from hosting the tournament due to coronavirus concerns with just a few days to the competition. 
However, Zambia has said they are still waiting on CAF as regards to the country's willingness to host the 2021 Under-17 AFCON after the tournament originally to be staged in Morocco was cancelled. Reacting to these developments, Amo urged CAF to allow Zambia to host the competition. Carmel Pillar's French coach, Sokoy Leonel, has resigned from his position as technical director at the club after he alleged the club violated part of his contract. Leonel, who joined Pillars at the start of the season on a year-long deal in October 2020, said he was owed five months' salary to the tune of $25,000 and ticket expenses incurred. He also revealed that the club failed to secure him a residence permit to work freely, a move that has prompted the French embassy to demand for his return back to France as he is an illegal immigrant in Nigeria. The former Black Leopards of South Africa coach also accused the chairman of Canopillars of um, Okay, he wishes the team all the very best for the future and hope they will honor me by paying in full the sum of $25,000 owed by my, on my ticket expenses. Reacting to Lionel's resignation, Pillars media officer Idris Malikawa denied the clubs about treating Lionel or interfering with his job. Three Premier League teams remain in the Champions League ahead of Friday's draw for the quarterfinals and semifinals with Chelsea, Liverpool and Manchester City still dreaming of glory. Friday's Champions League draw will see both the quarterfinal and semifinal fixtures decided, and there are plenty of big teams left. Holders Bayern Munich remain the team to beat, while Real Madrid may not have a vintage squad, but boast plenty of experience and past winners in their ranks. Paris Saint-Germain lost out to Bayern in last year's final, but the dismantling of FC Barcelona suggests they could go on better this year, especially if Kylian Mbappe remains in a scintillating form he showed when he scored a hat-trick at the Camp Nou. Now, with the early Haaland for Borussia Dortmund, last but not least, FC Porto put in an heroic performance to stun Juventus and Cristiano Ronaldo. The Portuguese outfit may seem the team to draw in the last eight, but showed enough quality and heart to prove they are deserved to have gone this deep in the competition. The postponed Spanish Copa del Rey final from last year will be played without fans, the Spanish Football Federation confirmed on Thursday. Reports in Spain had suggested a 20-25% capacity could be allowed for the match in Seville next month between Basque rivals Atletico Bilbao and Real Sociedad. The final was postponed last year because of the coronavirus pandemic and then put off to April 3rd in the hope supporters could attend the much-anticipated derby. But the Federation has said the final will still take place behind closed doors with travel restrictions in Spain ensuring local Bilbao and La Real fans would not be able to go. A statement from the Federation said the regional health ministry in Andalusia had identified a moderate risk if the fixture was opened to the public. Tyson Fury's trainer, Sugar Hill Stewart, has warned that Anthony Joshua will have to train for two different versions of the Gypsy King ahead of the mouth-watering upcoming bouts between the two British heavyweight boxers. Following a huge amount of speculation, Judge's promoter Eddie Hearn announced earlier this week that a two fight contract has been signed by both men and a venue and date for the event is hoped to be confirmed within a month. Fury is the favorite to win the clash with bookmakers and speaking, Sugar Hill stated, is believed that the 32-year-old's unpredictability is what makes him so dangerous to opponents. Nevertheless, Sugar Hill is a big fan of Joshua too and was particularly impressed with the ease at which he defeated Kubrat Pulev last year. And that's all from the world of sports. My name is Wally Scott. Do have yourself a wonderful night rest. Well, thank you, Wally. Uh, before we go now, here's a recap of our major stories. But well, we're told you that President Buhari has again raised alarm over the continuous inflow of illegal arms into Nigeria from Libya. We also told you that Tanzania's vice president is set to become the first female leader after the death of John Magufuli. And we brought you a report that EU's drug regulator says AstraZeneca vaccine is safe. Well, that does it for us tonight. If for more, please follow us at Plus TV Africa and Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel at Plus TV Africa. Well, thank you so much for watching. I am Vivian Oguche. Have a good night.
for upcoming artists to blow in Nigeria. Welcome to Plus Trending. I am Booking November, your host, saying thank you for joining us on today's episode. Welcome back. It's tea time on Plus TV Africa. Practice makes perfect. I'm not perfect yet, but I'm a lot better than I used to be. He's a king. He's entitled to marry a hundred if he wants to. Reading is an essential habit and a culture that must be developed. Nigerians are generally believed to have a poor reading culture. The role of government in promoting reading and equipping reading spaces and libraries in Nigeria cannot be underestimated. But first, we must look at the development of reading habits from the home and the role parents play in encouraging their children. My parents, my mom used to be a teacher, so reading was obviously part of a curriculum. And then my father used to be a professor and is an author. So I started reading very, very early. And I started reading books that were higher than my age grade. Um, I was reading African writer series from age seven, age eight, and reading encyclopedias by that time. So obviously my parents had a huge part and encouraged, encouraged that in me. In the Nigerian book market, there's a high influx of foreign authors writing for children, but very few Nigerian authors telling relatable, homegrown Nigerian stories. If you start out reading stories, even to your baby, even for their one, and then as they get older, buy appropriate uh, materials that are colorful, um, with easy to read words, and read with them. I think that helps. Adi Dotswenyade, a co-founder of Robin Heights, a leading bookstore in Nigeria, has tips for Nigerian authors and how they can improve on their work and get into the hearts of readers. The story has to be good, right? You know, if you're writing, you know, whatever you're writing, if you're writing fiction, if you're writing non-fiction, it has to be like, you know, really, really compelling, you know, one. Uh, next thing would be like in terms of like the packaging, right? You know, um, you know, people have gone past the era where you just take your books with just about any printer to print for you. You know, I think, you know, publishers, um, self-published authors as well, they need to invest in like, you know, ensuring that you know, the quality of the of the book, you know, the final output is one that would, you know, stack up with any any book, you know, published, you know, elsewhere in the world. So that's really important. Then I think, you know, what would be like the most important tip for me uh, to them would be um, just, you know, the need to invest in marketing. The book business, like any other business, is challenging. If you ask anyone who's running the business in Nigeria, they will tell you capital, of course, right? Uh, you know, it's, um, I mean, book selling is also, as, as with any other business, is also quite capital intensive, like, you know, um, getting, getting to pay your rent, um, getting to actually buy the books and stock up, like, your shelves when you have them. Um, uh, you know, hiring good people requires, like, you know, decent amount of capital. So um, I would say it's, it's, it's you know, um, getting the, the startup funds to, you know, to set up something. And then if you're looking to do, do it at scale like we're hoping to do, then it also requires you, like, you know, raising funding, uh, which isn't readily available in commercial banks, right? I don't think a bank would say they want to give you a loan to set up a bookstore. They probably will be skeptical about the number of people who read. Um, so for us, I, I think it's, it's just, um, you know, um, I would say capital is, is, you know, is at the top of the, of the temple. It is commendable that certain individuals and organizations are making concerted efforts to revive the reading culture in the country. The government should also redesign the school curriculum to incorporate more reading activities in primary and secondary schools. Five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they would like. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. What, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. That's it, it, it does. It does. It does. It does. I don't know what we can do 
if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. Hi, long time no see. You're welcome to The Advocate on PLUS TV Africa, where five of us discuss five thought-provoking topics in an atmosphere of seriousness, decisiveness, and a little bit of laughter. However, we do not mince words, and like we say, no holds bad. Today, I'll be speaking about the status quo of the Nigerian leadership and the con constant fight for hope as a Nigerian. Balan is warning traders who blocked food supply, warning, their, warning them that Egungu to be careful. Liberos is advocating deeply on the importance of good governance, while Chuka is asking all Nigerians to condemn both old and new governments. So we have a new, so that we can have a new Nigeria. And finally, Jumoke, well, first let me say, good to meet you, finally, <laughs> and happy birthday. Thank you. So Jumoke is posing a question as she asks, who is Nigeria's next Messiah? So please stay with us, and we'll be right back. Leadership, hope, and the status quo. Well, first let me say that it's great to be back on The Advocate after a long hiatus. Um, now that I'm back, living in Nigeria today takes a special brew of courage, resourcefulness, a little bit of apathy, but plenty spoonfuls of craziness. Indeed, I'm tired, assailed, fatigued by the daily dose of misery and death. I mean, it's, it's a bit like living in a real Mad Max movie set. Yet people like Liberus, he gives me courage, he gives me hope. He keeps talking, challenging the status quo, fighting in the hope that somehow, someday, Nigeria can become great again. It is possible that we may yet pull this nation out of the dark from the abyss. I hope so, for the sake of our children. However, Nigeria is presently constituted and governed stuff. That would require something that even the current political class seem to be greatly deficient in. Which brings me to the main issue that I want to table today. The remarkable absence of hope. The narrative of hope that's missing in all the discourse on a vision for a better Nigeria. It is the business and the trademark indeed, I, I will say, of politicians all over the world to sell to their people a picture of hope and a vision of a better future. I might even add that it is the responsibility of leaders to sell hope However, when listening to the current crop of political leaders lately, all I hear is the raucous noises of cows, death, doom, and despair. And then I've said this before on this platform that I think it bears repeating that any country that fails to present a vision of a better country and instead fashions weapons of war against its young persons clearly has no future. Elected leaders must do their jobs, not only to provide security and welfare, but also to present clear visions of hope and inclusive progress for all citizens and residents. If you listen to the leaders of Dubai, Sheikh Al Maktoum, James talk, you hear about his grand plans for, for his country and the people in terms of the direction where they're going. If you, if you hacking back, you know, 50 years in here, President J the late Kennedy talked about America in the 60s, he painted a vision of, of great American progress, of exceptionalism in science and manufacturing. You don't see good leaders blaming ghosts from the past. In Nigeria, we're consumed instead by talks of cows and herders, which are indeed relics of a past which we, you know, stubbornly hold on to. Same way our politicians who are used to funding adulation of supporters and are not used to any sort of criticisms. So any, any attempt to criticize them, they will consider it disrespect. And in fact, they will say they label you a hater. And some may even go as far as uh, labeling your, your criticism as hate speech. That's the world we live in now. So what vision of Nigeria do we hope to present to this new generation of young people who are not accustomed to the old ways, the old ways of the oversensitive generation, people who have who been nurtured by the internet, yet assaulted by the failures of their own state, people who are accustomed to the ways of decent societies, yet they're living in uh, the stark reality of sc pervasive scarcity and the abundance of opportunities that the world presents. So you can imagine how frustrated some of these young people can be, willing to work hard, yet the opportunities are far in between. 
Some, indeed, they're told to keep quiet, be more respectful, and wait for your turn. Wait for your turn in the raging sea of despair. And sadly, if we go back to the NSAS protests, which took place last October, when millions of young people filled the streets to peacefully protest, calling for an end to police brutality, what they got in return were not words of, of vision of a more just society. Instead, they got even more brutality. And indeed, more threats and actions continue. That tells young persons in no uncertain terms that a vision of a country, a better country they yearn for, is lost. And instead, they should settle for a status quo of injustice and suffering. On October 20th, 2020, that day broke my heart. It broke me in many pieces. It took something from me, something that I doubt I can ever find again. I lost hope. Ah, uh, if people like you would say that they lost hope, I wonder what, um, you know, the everyday, everyday Nigerian would, um, would, would say. Uh, because really, um, I agree with you everything you have said, and there's really nothing to look forward to in terms of hope. But we just can't lose hope. We have to keep hoping. Oh, wow. And for me, in most cases, I think we are the ones that will have to sometime rise and say, you know what, we need to take it back and make it better. Because, like you said, if we keep waiting for them to make it better, it's, it's, it's we'll lose happen. hope, Taya. But we try to paint a picture of how it ought to be. And I try very hard not to compare Nigeria with any other country, be it Western or African country, because we're a continent of our own with over 400 ethnicities. But what is a democracy? It's a government of all of us for all of us. So when we try to paint that picture, like you mentioned in your advocacy, they call you a hater because some few people are paid to not see everything that is going wrong. So you, the one person who is pointing it out, to say you cannot compare human life to the life of a cow, they say you're a hater. <laughs> I'm flabbergasted. Um, October 20 um, was a very sad day in the annals of Nigeria's history. But, but for me, um, along with every other thing that we need to do about the incident of that day, one other thing we must not fail to do is to get more participatory in the process. I have asked myself, the protest, the, the, the police that was at the center of that uh, uh, protest, has it been reformed? Not has yet. anything changed? Not yet, sir. Absolutely nothing has changed. The police remains brutal. They continue to do the same thing they were doing before that time. Chuka. So can we just get more participatory in the process, including this generation? Can we hijack even the, the, the parties, if it is possible? Chuka. You know. but, but really, I'm a near uh, I think I'm maniacally bewildered, <laughs> uh, seriously, that uh, anybody would think that government would do it differently, True. you know, in, during that protest. True. So, Chuka. Yeah, I mean, the government, as we know it, um, is hell-bent on blocking any attempts to modernize the country. So, I think that, you know, the only, the way we could, I don't know, the way we could make, bring back hope for someone like Emeka um, involves quite a lot. I mean, it's something that's close to. And somebody what like I, you too, you know, because uh, to talk about <laughs> <you>. run away. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear? Huh? I said we need to bring hope back to people like you too, because you ran away. <laughs> oh no no no! I am very. I am in Nigeria in spirit, and I shall be back shortly. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> But the Becca is saying, Jessica, but uh, he has moved to Europe in the spirit. spirit. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, it is the failure of Nigeria that is the reason I am here for True. a few months Obviously. of this year. If it wasn't for the failure of the country, after 60 years of independence, I shouldn't be here at all. There's nothing much for me to have been here if everything was working fine. Yeah. So I think it all sort of ties in with what Emeka is saying. Where is the hope? What's going to change? How is it going to change, you know? Well, um, you know, just to round off, I, I, I believe that, as I said in that piece, that 
um, political leaders, in as much as we're grappling with all the challenges, cows, herders, and all the difficulties, I think they should also make an attempt to project a measure of hope, hope. Yeah, especially absolutely. to young people. Very, very. In your speeches, in the, in the things you do, yeah. in your actions, give hope yeah. to the people. And so, I've said my piece. Um, but after this break, uh, Golan is bringing out his egungun as he speaks on the food blockage from the north to the south. So please stay with us. What we do not understand, we will stigmatize. What you can see is the remaining of the tanker that exploded. The suffered equally confessed. from whom all blessings flow. Welcome to your favorite program, The Moment of Truth, brought to you by the Citadel Global Community Church. Our God is a God of salvation, far above all principality and power, and might and dominion, that regardless of what happens in this season, you will escape. Say to your neighbor, there is no peace for the wicked. The special anti-robbery squirt who are now killing innocent citizens instead of dealing with robbers. Your acts will catch up with you. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Moment of Truth with Pastor Tunde Bakari. Sundays, 7 p.m. on PLOS TV Africa. I posted a campaign video from 2015 on Twitter on Tuesday where the actors complained about their neighbor's children being kidnapped and the kidnappers had written them that they were next in line. The campaign was to vote President Buhari rather than President Jonathan, who, as Commander-in-Chief, had claimed he no longer knew what to do. People remembered that video and claimed they were scammed by the campaign, as insecurity and kidnappings are now daily. So this government, they owe you change, but you still voted for next level now. Abi, you are one of those who claim the election was rigged. The Supreme Court doesn't agree with you. Who is Nigeria's next Messiah? I'm a member of a few political groups, not because I have any interest in joining politics, but because of my passion for good governance in Nigeria. So I constantly hear people ask me to come and do it better. I tell them, I criticize not because I can't do it better. I just hold the people who promise to, to their words. That's the job of a journalist anyway, to hold the executive, legislature, and judiciary accountable. That's why we're the fourth estate of the realm in any democracy. I don't take the job of governance for granted. It must be difficult to lead a diverse group who want different things. But in a population of over 200 million, Nigerians can give more people the chance to try, especially people who vouch to have the answers, than perpetrate failures in government. This is my strong belief. We ought to keep voting our failures and never allow them back. We keep recycling the same old rulers, like they will suddenly have answers they didn't have years ago. Someone that didn't do anything to develop themselves in the years they've been out of government, yet you expect them to come back and turn Nigeria to El Dorado? Nigerians are the ones expecting a Messiah instead of coming together to create systems, agree on a working constitution, and stand by it regardless of political affiliations. Any human being can become a tyrant if the system allows. No one is perfect, but here, we have institutions that allow a commander-in-chief to disobey our constitution, and everyone says, yes, sir. People are loyal to the president rather than to the constitution. 
So I get into government, appoint all my friends, competent or not, and even create a new ministry for my mother. Opposition wails. Then they get into power and do even worse. She Nigeria with the last by. Isn't Nigeria collapsing? The current constitution was like a military decree passed down just the way the northern and southern protectorates were forcefully amalgamated in 1914. The 2014 conference was the opportunity we had to break it all down and reconstitute. But again, we allowed politics dictate the deliberations at the national conference. We can't keep doing the same thing and expect different results. Even if the best Nigerian becomes president in 2023, the system may still corrupt them. When are we all going to say enough is enough? Or are we waiting for a Messiah from the South in 2023? No, but I thought you wanted to point us to a, to a Messiah. <laughs> no, Nigerians are always <laughs> expecting a Messiah. Oh, oh, um, but I, I, I agree, like I said also in my advocacy, you know, we want a Messiah, but we will do everything to undermine the process that will lead to us, you know, um, getting that right. Messiah. I, I, and that's why I also, this is destructive, uh, Chuka's advocacy now saying, look, Whatever you are, be the best of that thing. It yeah. is those individual efforts that will bring us together and help us to understand. Because that end SARS protest would not have been defeated if the government did not know that there's a pool of some uneducated people that they can use True. to fight the educated ones. And but so, it's not yet, so. If, we, if we keep, you know, the educated ones, keep advocating for and on behalf of the uneducated ones, and find a way to educate them and bridge that gap. Very soon, these people you call leaders will run away from Nigeria. Um, may I ask a question, though, um, Emeka? Because why would the security man keep on saying, Madam, anything for us? You know, and they I'm drive. I'm supposed to talk on this advocacy. <laughs> I'm asking a question. <laughs> I'm, I'm throwing it open in terms of how does Nigeria get better with the culture of entitlement and getting everything begging, that begging. I can. Yes. I, I think it's it's a it's a symptom or is a, a collapse of a system um, where you know um, there's no trust in authority. There's no trust in the system. Um, there's no dependency. So the only thing that's left to everyone is to feed off one another. Yeah, true. So either, either by force, so if I can take it, I'll take it. If I can con you and take it, with why you or 419 or whatever, I'll take it. Yeah. Um, or I beg you for it. We used to have this joke that the best way to, when you meet a policeman on the road, you know, growing up in the barracks, there was this tendency that you either, you know, those of when we were much younger, we pull rank. Mm. Like, do you, know, you, know you know who I am. You know, we speak in a certain military lingo. And, and it guy, works. And it works. Or if you're cut out, you beg the policeman. There are two ways. So you don't use force to say, you know, who, who are you talking to? And then, you know, use chance him. Or when you get there, he stops you. You say, ah, oh, Ghana, we win now. You know, because <laughs> that is, so there's no, and if you, if you look at that, there's no dependency in a system that functions, yeah. you know, legitimately, and, and, no social and, safety yeah. net. So you see that. So you have to find a way. And that's really what's happening. So whether mm. you see them at the airports, and you know, I don't know, you saw that thing where the Zambians, uh, the yeah. Ugandans were making a jest of us yeah. uh, a few weeks ago. How come into Nigeria? Everybody's begging from the airport. Yes. <laughs> Everybody's begging. Okay, welcome. What's in your brain? Yeah. Uh, Chuka, is, Chuka is, so, sorry, quickly, Chuka. I wanted to find out if. Uh, the, uh, Chuka, yeah, the, in the Queen's country, the, is that the, the way they, they beg in the airport, too? Well, I don't know how we're going to this Messiah matter. It's a very serious question. Um, <laughs> I, I, it ties in again with even what I was saying about glorifying the wrong people and not accepting to judge people. We have to judge people. Let nobody deceive you about well, yeah, what the I Bible says or does not say. We have to judge people properly. And if we know a man to have done something very bad, let's not bring him forward for swear. governor, president, senator, whatever. One governor became a governor through killings. I'm not saying he killed anybody, but there was ruthless killing going on before he could become a governor that perhaps was even rich. Today, what is he doing? He's putting up posters to be president. Mm. Yes. 
It denies that there is COVID. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, Nigerians will in the end vote for this man. And you'll be no. shocked. No, not in 2023. He, I said he wants to be a negotiator in chief. There, 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 <laughs> there, there are some a rather simplistic uh, uh, approach I, I like to put down on this. And it involves numbers. In 2019 presidential election, where you have the total number of votes by PDP and APC being 26 million. million. Meanwhile, the number of people between ages of 18 and 39 are about 60 million people. If you take Lagos, there were over 6 million registered voters, only 1 million plus votes. Where, what were the 5 million other voters doing? On election day. I, I can answer that question Looking for you. Food, though. I can answer that question for you because I was part of that process. You remember when mm. Jega came? Jega said the electoral register was largely flawed and so they needed to clean it up. And so they, what they did was they introduced biometrics for the first Correct. time. Yeah. And you know, after the biometric, a lot of people did multiple registration. And so they introduced automated fingerprint identification system. And so this automated fingerprint identification system will match your biometrics mm -hmm. with your facials and your name. So the moment they did that, the, the, the numbers dropped drastically. Yeah, that and is then, wait, the, now, the now, let me, no, wait, let me That is tell where you are comparing the let registers now, no, of previous wait, year no, no. with 2019. This, no, the current one, let mm. me tell you what that happened. The moment they, that is because it's the same Jagas register that they are still using. So when the numbers dropped, all the governors started complaining. No, 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 you have to leave it as it is because it is the numbers that they used to rig. And that's why when vote counts and you use biometric, Journalists will tell you there was large turnout of voters, but at the end of the day, the actual number of voters, when you put it together, is less than a million. What it means is that our voting strength and our numbers are overrated. Go and check it. You see, compare previous year's voters' register. No, I'm talking about this current so, voters' the, register. The, the current register was based on biometrics. This is, that is the biometric I'm telling exactly. you. Exactly. So after you have the biometric says, there. after the biometric says you have. Five we million shared, or six we million shared voters. voters card. Why we, were people not, not coming out? Do you out know how many voters card are still with? Are we saying in a, in a city of let's, 20 million people, let's not even, it's only one million valid voters let's not, that live there? Let's not yeah, argue about it's numbers. It's not possible. Let's argue. I think what I take from, 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 from Golan's point is, is the fact that there's, a, there's a, a sea change that's about to occur with more people who did not vote before, did not participate coming out to participate. I think that's the point you were trying to make. Well, uh, and can we hold their hands in 2023 and, uh, and drag them to the Drag pool. them there and ensure that they are not voting because based on 2,000 naira for bread or one Mr. Egungun that promised exactly. that he will give them 35% uh, women <laughs> agenda. Yeah. I'm just saying. Time is never our friend on this program. However, the advocacy continues on our social media platforms on Facebook plus TV Africa. The hashtag is AdvocateNG. Or on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa, same hashtag, the Advocate NG. To catch up on previous broadcasts, please go to plustvafrica.com forward slash the Advocate NG. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. Till next week, same time. Oh, it's my birthday. Happy birthday. So we are going to launch. <laughs> <laughs> Till next time. Same time on the station. Let's keep advocating for a better society. See you next week. Bye bye. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed. It's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually worked. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. That's I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you.
Nigeria, by extension, Africa, is faced with a lot of challenges. The growing youth population with little engagement, that is a ticking time mark. We are a blessed people with diverse culture and highly cerebral minds who have a lot to say. And yes, we are talking. It is important we drive the right conversation that informs, inspires, influences thoughts and action. If we say there's beauty in our diversity, then let us embrace our diverse culture. We must continue to courageously be the voice of transformation as we are the hope for the future. Yesterday's conversations shape today. What are you saying to shape your tomorrow? We know you have a lot to say and we are here to hear you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Welcome to your favorite program, The Moment of Truth, brought to you by the Citadel Global Community Church, CGCC, formerly known as the Lateran Assembly. Today, all across the world, there are rumblings. Nations are plagued by perplexing situations. Societies are drowning in unprecedented upheavals. Cities are grappling with complex problems. Families are overwhelmed by seemingly insurmountable challenges, while multitudes in the valley of decision and people are in dire need of hope. At the same time, there is a stirring in the hearts of those who know their God and are said to do exploits, those who understand the times and the seasons and know what their nation ought to do, those with a compelling call to respond to the mandate of God in this decade. Brothers and sisters, this decade is a decade like no other. It's a decade of the designated favor of God upon his people to accurately position ourselves for this current move of God and to be adequately equipped for the call of the hour. We must shape the decade by the word of God, which is why I'm so glad to welcome you to the moment of truth, a life-transforming time in the presence of God 
and under the influence and power of the Holy Spirit, as well as the Word of God. So invite your family, neighbors, and friends as you sit back, relax, and receive the engrafted Word of God, which is able to save your soul. Today is the fourth and the concluding part of our series titled, Fear Not, the age we live in has long ago been framed by the word of God. Say it again to your neighbor this morning, fear not, the age we live in has long ago been framed by the word of God. Would you please turn your Bible with me to the book of Hebrews one more time, chapter 11, and I'll read from verse 1 to verse number 4, especially in the Amplified Version of the Bible. Hebrews 11, 1 to 4. Amplified Version, Hebrews 11, 1 to 4. Now faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for, being the proof of things we do not see, and the conviction of their reality, faith perceiving as real, as real fact, what is not revealed to the senses. For by faith, that is trust and holy favor, born of faith, the man of old and divine, had divine testimony, born to them, and they obtained a good report. By faith, we understand that the words, the ends, the ages, by faith, we understand that the worlds during the successive ages were framed, fashioned, put in order, and equipped for their intended purpose by the word of God, so that what we see was not made out of things which are visible. Verse number four, prompted, actuated by faith, Abel brought God a better and more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, because of which it was testified of him that he was righteous, that he was upright, and right standing with God. Question is, and God bore witness by accepting and acknowledging his gifts. And though he died yet through the incident, he is still speaking. Who told Cain what to give and who told Abel what to give? I've been told repeatedly and I've heard it preached that they must have learned that from their father. That when Adam sinned, God offered a lamb and took his coat and made a an outfit for them with the skin of the animal instead of the fig leaves that soon withered away. It is possible. But I'm not sure, and I've told you before, that it wasn't because he offered fruits to God that God that made God to reject his offering. Because you look in the Bible, there were fruit offerings that God accepted. But he just gave of the fruits, not the first. And if you don't keep God first in life, he can't keep you first too. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things shall be added unto you. But I'm interested in how ages before ours were framed by the word of God so that we can learn also that in our age today is already framed. We just need to locate what is framed. Last Sunday, we saw what God did with the likes of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That long before they got to Babylon, their lives and everything they will encounter and they will face were already framed by the word of God. The prophet came to King Hezekiah and said, what did you just do? Your descendants will be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. And all that you have showed him 
the ambassadors or the envoys from Babylon, they will carry everything away. Did it happen? They did. But I told you that God did not put them in that position to defeat them. He did not put them in that condition in order to derail them or to show sacred their destinies. He put them there so that they might become beacons of hope that regardless of circumstances and situation, what God has framed is able to sustain. I will share four outstanding testimonies with you to prove the point that these young men in their teenage years who got to Babylon and dominated the history of Babylon for another 60 years, that nothing happened to them that was an accident. They were not put in that position so that they would be defeated or they would become uh, just despised. No, because kings testify about their God. God wanted to reach out to Nebuchadnezzar. And he had to look for men who would not be encumbered by emotional feelings for wife, for family, for children. Those who will really be on, uh, 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 I'm not asking you not to marry. In Daniel chapter 2, let's listen to the testimony and let us establish whether they were defeated or disgraced, even in their captivity. Daniel 2, 46 to 49, then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel. Is that disgrace? If this is disgrace, I want this type of disgrace. And commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. He started treating him like God. Why? The magician said, nobody could locate such a secret apart from girls who do not dwell in flesh. The king answered Daniel and said, truly your God is a God of God. Who receives the glory? God, your God is a God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets since you could reveal this secret. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Also, Daniel petitioned the king, and he said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Is this disgrace? Who wants this type of disgrace? If this is disgrace, I want plenty of it. Testimony number two, Daniel chapter three, verse 26 to 30. I want to drum this into your ears and, and put it even it be into your throat without choking you so that you know your present situation will not end in disgrace. <laughs> you did not hear me. That what you have gone through and you are going through, all things are going to line up and work out for your good. Yeah. At the end of the day, you are going to have the last laugh. Yeah. When I surrendered everything that God has spoken to me, to him, is because he's the only one who is able to bring it to pass. Don't try to make it happen. You give back to Ishmael. Daniel 3, 26 to 30. Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. Did they call them servants of the Most High God? Because they said, three Hebrew boys. That's what they called them, despised them. Servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. There was somebody else in the fire, but he didn't know his name. That's what will make hell intolerable for those who will be there. Because the Bible says, if anyone shall call upon the name of the Lord, he shall be saved. And when they are in hell, they will be asking themselves, what is that name? That pastor said, if you can call the name, what did they call the name? Tell me the name. No, they cannot remember that. It's too late. Because it doesn't matter where. If you call upon the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. But they will be insomnia. The name will be locked out of their minds that they cannot remember it. She, I mean, Nebuchadnezzar could not call the name of the fourth man. They have not met. He doesn't know him. And he couldn't call him out of fire because he's still staying in the fire waiting for you to come. Because you go through your own fire. When you pass through the fire, when you pass through the... Don't cry! It will end in promotion. Yeah. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire. 
I love this. And the satraps, administrators, governors, and the kings, everybody who had bowed to gold, counselors gathered together, and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The fire of the enemy has no power over your life, over your body, over all that is yours in the name of Jesus. The hair of their head was not singed. Now were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach. Meshach is the only God of Daniel. <laughs> Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word. Every plan of the enemy, every word, every hex, every curse released against you will be frustrated. In the name of Jesus. It doesn't matter who frustrated, who said it, but it will be frustrated. The word released against my family had just been frustrated. You could see it yourself. And every other word released by axes and curses, none of them will work because there is no curse that is going to work against Jacob. There is no divination against Israel. They have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. If you had stopped there, I would have said that's enough. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, whether they are Yorubers or Fulanis or Igbos, whether they are in the forest or in the palace, I make a decree that any people, nation or language, which speaks anything a miss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be caught in pieces. And their houses shall be made an ash heap. Because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Then the king promoted. Now it was a petition of Daniel that promoted them before. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. You think your position is shaky. You don't know if they can take it away from you. No. Another decree is released this morning. You are promoted and nobody can bring you down. In the mighty name of Jesus. Testimony number three. Daniel chapter four. 34 to 37. And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, this is where he got born again himself, I think. I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. And my understanding returned to me, and I bless the Most High and praise and honor him who lives forever. It would be a big shame for Nebuchadnezzar to be in heaven for you to be in hell. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, no one can restrain him. Can't be all, see? No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? He is the real king. All these ones on the thrones in the different places in our nation, they are just figureheads. The real king is God. Nobody can ask him, what are you doing? And nobody can restrain him. At the same time, my, my reason returned to me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom, and excellence, majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, oh, I love this. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, is like, uh, is like uh, being sworn to office afresh. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his way is justice. And those who walk in pride is able to put down. Wow. Those who walk in pride is able to put down. He's talking from experience. Because he has just been given the heart of a beast to go eat grass for a season. Last testimony. Daniel chapter 6. 24 to 28, this is so powerful. Daniel 6, 24 to 28. And the king gave the command. This was after they have thrown him into the lion's den and brought him out. Last Sunday was in the lion's den. His enemies now visited the lion's den and they were broken in pieces and eaten up. And the king gave the command and they brought those men who had accused Daniel. And they cast them into the den of lions. Them. <laughs> 
their children and their wives. And the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. I love this. Before they ever came to the bottom of the den. That is, they became flying lions to catch them. <laughs> then King Darius wrote to how many people? To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before may, may, may because of you, may kings honor God. Because of you, may they acknowledge that there's no one like the king of glory. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and he walks signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. The Lord will deliver you from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of who? Darius, and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. You recall, it was Cyrus who now was stirred up and gave the command that everything that they took from the temple must be returned there. Daniel had to walk through this to ensure that God's word does not fail. When he looked into the prophecy of Jeremiah, that 70 years were determined, the moment he gained understanding, he stood in the place of prayer and began to push, and angels came and gave him understanding. Today, you are going to receive such understanding concerning your destiny, concerning your purpose, and everything that has been framed for you by God, none of them will fail in Jesus' name. Okay. I need to point two things out. No matter how much I try to restrain myself, I'll still teach you the truth. This is not about me now. For Cyrus to come into manifestation, at least two things must happen. If God had ordained and had framed that it would be Cyrus that will return all those vessels of gold and silver back to the temple. Two things will have to precede it for it to happen. And that's why we must know how to pray in this season. Let me tell you something. It's easy to deal with Nebuchadnezzar. For me, it's not difficult. Because the heart of a beast was given to a man. But when you get to chapter 7, the Bible said the winds of heaven began to stir up the great sea, representing multitudes, peoples, and nations. And four beasts came out. The first beast was given the heart of a man. Which one would you rather deal with? A man that has been given the heart of a beast or a beast that has given the heart of a man and will be acting before you like a man but is a beast. That's what we are dealing with. That's where we are. That's why our intercession must change gear. Yesterday ended last night. You can't deal with kids' glove with a beast who has the heart of a man because you will think he's a man. He's like the lamb that speaks with the voice of the dragon. What are the two things that must precede or that preceded the manifestation of Cyrus? Number one. God frustrated the tokens of liars. He made diviners mad. He turned the counsel of their wise men backwards and made their knowledge foolish. That's the first thing. Because all these beasts with the heart of men are in the grip of marabouts who are telling them what to do, who to kill, what sacrifices to give, and you don't know it. You are fighting like one that beats the air. We're in a serious warfare. 
These are heartless men who could donate their wife, donate their children, donate everyone around them just for them to stay in power. I know what I'm talking about and they know. But listen to me. Except God will frustrate the tokens of liars, make diviners smart, turn the counsel of their wise men backwards, and make their knowledge foolish, number two thing cannot happen. It's after God has frustrated the tokens of liars, made diviners smart, turned the counsel of their wise men backwards, and made their knowledge foolish, that then God will confirm the word of his servant and perform the counsel of his messenger. He had to clear the mess first before he would now begin to confirm. That's why we release everything into his hand because this is the season of frustration. It's the season of restoration for you, but it's a season of frustration for the enemy and all that they depend upon. I guarantee you, you will see when they begin to beg for us to come. You'll be living witnesses because they can't handle what's about to befall them. Give me Isaiah 44, verse 24 to 28. Isaiah 44, 24 to 28. Thus said the Lord, I redeemer, and he that formed you from the womb, I am the Lord that make all things, that stretches for the heavens alone, that spreads abroad the earth by myself. Were you there when it was threatening it for? No. That frustrates the tokens of the liars, make the diviners mad, Turn wise, turn wise men backward and make their knowledge foolish. When he did all that, is to do the next thing that confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers that say to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be inhabited and Nigeria will be rebuilt. And to the cities of Judah, you shall be built. And I will raise up the decayed places thereof. Go on. Thus they said to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up your rivers. That says to, that says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure. Even saying to Jerusalem, that shall be built, and to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. God had framed who will provide for the temple to be built, for all the goods to be returned, and yet he was not born yet. God framed it. Give me Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45, give it to me in the New King James Version. Thank you. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I've held, to subdue nations before him and lose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors, so that the gates will not be short. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight, and I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and call the bars of iron. <laughs> I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, will, who call you by your name, I am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I've even called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. Hello? Do you know there are things God already separated for you, and you don't have clue. When Elder proposed, what did you say to him? No way. Did he say that to you? No way. And he has spelled that no way how many times now? Five times. If you add no and way, how many letters? Five letters. There's no way it cannot happen where you are framed. I say everything that has been framed by God for you, none of them will fail. Amen. But I want you to rise up and pray. Lord, frustrate the tokens of liars. The season of frustration. There will be no restoration if there is no frustration of the wicked. The season of frustration had come. Frustrate the tokens of liars. Make diviners mad. Ha! Turn the wisdom of their wise men backwards. And make their knowledge fully so that you can confirm the word of your servant. And perform the counsel of your messengers. I bless your holy name. Cyrus generation about to come. Restorers are about to come. 
Restorers are about to rise. But if there's no frustration of the wicked, there cannot be restoration of the righteous. We thank you, our Father. We bless your holy name. We give you glory. We give you praise. We give you adoration. In Jesus' mighty name. Please be seated. For the rest of this message, I'm going to go far from the good old days to the last, to the good last days. We are in the end time. Can I hear amen? The last days we now live in was heralded by the birth of Christ and framed by the word of God. The last days we live in was heralded by what? The birth of Christ and framed by the word of God. Long before Mary had the immaculate conception, the prophet had spoken about what will happen. Isaiah chapter number 7, verse number 10. Isaiah 7, 10. Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depth or the height, in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Hear now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, there, virgin. Somebody said there. Yeah. I can't hear you. Yeah. There is a definite article. In your village, you call that the. It's okay. There, virgin, shall conceive. So God had the virgin in mind. Did Mary know? No. I can't hear you. No. Mary was just a young virgin. She did not know. Although betrothed to a man to be her husband, they had never had any intercourse. They had never come near each other. And the angel showed up in a house and said, Hail Mary. You are highly favored. You are blessed. You are going to conceive and have a child. And he shall call his name Jesus. He will save his people from their sin. He said, are you drunk? Angel, you must be in the wrong place. I'm not pregnant. I don't know a man. It has never happened before. What are you trying to say? How shall this be? <laughs> it's not up to you, Mary. The Holy Ghost. Do you know if God wants to remove everyone in power today, it doesn't take him seconds. Who are you talking to? Who, who do you think we are talking about? I said there will be change before 2023. You are saying, how will it happen? How will it happen? How shall this be? Mary said, the Holy Ghost will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And that child you will carry will be called the Son of the Highest. And by the way, I need to help your faith. You remember the prayer you've been praying for cousin Elizabeth. She's now six months pregnant and you are still praying. I'm saying to you, there are prayers you have prayed you have forgotten about. You are going to run up the hill to go find the answers. Because six months ago, God made it happen already. <laughs> The regime change took place six months ago. You are still praying for change. It has taken place already. What your ears have heard, your eyes will see. In the name of Jesus Christ. It's not about me. It's about purpose. It's about destiny. It's about what God wants to do. 200 million people, their life must not be wasted. This country must not become chaotic. The peace of God must return to this land. That's why I'm a watchman. You may be seated. That with the angel spoke, did it come to pass? I can't hear you. Well, you can read the rest of the story I've told you. 
You find it right there in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to 25. The virgin was Mary. She did not know. And if you know the meaning of her name is, is a derivative of Mara, which means bitter. The girl said, I'm going to use you. I don't need your egg. I only need your womb as an incubator. Because if your egg is involved, the Holy One will be contaminated. And that's why you never find Jesus calling me Mary, mother. He said, woman, my time has not come. And when it was time for him to go on the cross, he beckoned to John. Son, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. You are just a supplier of my flesh so that I can dwell here legally. Not only was the birth of Christ foretold and framed even the surrounding circumstances. It was not an accident to God when Herod ordered the children from a two under be killed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was why God gave the name Emmanuel to the child when prophet Isaiah prophesied. But when the angel came, he said, his new name, Jesus. Why? When you are about to run with the child to Egypt, they will be looking for Emmanuel. So when you get there and they ask you what's his name, you say, Jesus. He's divine detail. You don't know why God has kept you in hiding so far. Everything you have desired to do looks impossible. No, delay is not denial. It's because there's something greater than the pay you are hungry for. It's going to give you what will not only satisfy you, but satisfy all around you. In the mighty name of Jesus. Ah, you think God has forgotten you? Ha, ha, ha. I see a hand like a cloud. A letter is coming your way. There's going to be a shower of blessing. Bag, 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 bag. Ah, yagba, yagba. Omioko is coming your way. This is the problem you are going to have. Everyone now will be asking, how did you come by it? And it will be difficult to explain. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So that's why you must choose those you fellowship with. Mary had to get up to run quickly to Elizabeth and was there for three months. It was when Elizabeth was about to deliver that they left to go to another, she left to go to another place because they will see the parabolic tummy. Do you understand me? You must choose those you run with. Don't hang around naysayers. Don't hang around, it cannot happen. Don't let them abort the baby you carry. You will deliver safely. In the mighty name of Jesus. In Jeremiah, chapter 31, you may be seated. Jesus was born, the massacre followed. Men of goodwill rejoice. A threatened king said, the next thing is to kill. But Jeremiah spoke about it. Jeremiah 31, verse number 10. He had the word of the Lord, all nations, and declare it in the isles afar off and say, He who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of one stronger than he. Therefore, they shall come and sing in the height of Zion, streaming live stream. Streaming to the goodness of the Lord for wheat and new wine and oil for the young of the flock and the herd. Their soul shall be like a well-watered garden and they shall sorrow no more at all. Then shall the virgin rejoice and the dance and the young men and the old together. For I will turn their money to joy and will comfort them. Can I hear? Amen. Amen. And make them rejoice rather than sorrow. I will saturate the soul of the priest with abundance. 
With a, and my people shall be satisfied. My goodness, says the Lord. Okay, go on. Thus says the Lord, this is where I'm coming. A voice was heard where? In Rama, in the midst of joy, in the midst of jubilation. A voice was heard in Rama, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Thus says the Lord, refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears. Why? For your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. Oh, oh, there is hope in your future. There is hope in your future. There is hope in your future. And there is future in your hope. There is hope in your future, says the Lord, that your children shall come back to their own border. Honestly, does this make sense? In the midst of joy, turn around circumstances. And then the prophet began to say, Rachel is weeping. Who is Rachel? Where did he meet Rachel? Prophetic things are spoken prophetically. He was looking at the time Jesus will be born and the havoc that Herod we do. Come with me to Matthew chapter 2. <sighs> Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, he was not deceived. He was instructed not to return. He is a deceiver. When he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, he was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then was fulfilled that was that what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet saying, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. This is the problem with prophetic word. Many of them will not understand who will be weeping that day that there is a hope in their future, that everything that is taken away from them will be restored. And another prophet said, and they will come to you and say, your children were gone. Where did you get this one from? They said, I do not even know where they come from. You are going to become mothers of children, fathers of children, grandparents with joy in the mighty name of Jesus. People of God, please know that this, there's another event that's critical. Not only was a birth of Christ, and his surrounding circumstances framed by the word of God, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we all are partakers and beneficiaries of today, was also framed by the word of God. Joel was the one who was prophesying. Ah, be glad then, you children of Zion, for he has given you the former rain moderately, but it's going to give you the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Welcome to the citadel. Right there, you are enjoying both the former and the latter rain, but there is something more than the latter rain, something more than the former rain. They were type and shadow of where you are today. It shall come to pass afterwards. When you have eaten in plenty, when you are satisfied, when you praise the name of the Lord your God, when you are not put to shame, it shall come to pass afterwards, after you have enjoyed the latter rain, after you have enjoyed the former rain, it shall come to pass afterwards, I will pour my spirit upon all flesh. You will no longer be able to say, a woman should not prophesy. A man should not, because I will pour it upon all flesh. Your young men shall see visions. Your old women and old men shall dream dreams. And upon my young men, upon my servants and male and female, I will pour my spirit and they all shall be prophetic people. By these two great events that are rather the last days, the birth, the death, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus Christ, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we now have access to all the events of our lives predestined by God before we were born. You're not hearing me. You need to fellowship more with the Holy Spirit. When I speak about my destiny, do you realize I speak authoritatively? 
Do I speak apologetically? It's because I know. I know the things that have been freely given to me by God. You must know yours. Okay. Please understand that unless our destinies and purposes are revealed to us, we'll continue to grope in the dark and not understand the reason for the season we find ourselves in. Give me some 139, 13 to 17 in the New Living Translation. Psalm 139, 13 to 17. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded where? I can hear you. Nothing happens to a child of God that is neither directed nor permitted by God. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God? They cannot be numbered. Uh, do you understand that everything about your life, including this day, has been written down in his book before you were formed in your mother's womb? Somebody praise the Lord. If that is so, then Romans chapter 8, 28 to 30 will show you that everything predestined about you is known to God, unknown to you. And you must find out. Romans 8, 28 to 30, and we know. What do we do? We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose, uh -huh, for whom he foreknew. That was before your father met your dad, your daddy met your mom, okay? For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. All the knocking you are getting, all the knockdown, all the rise up, all the setbacks, all the disappointments, you are being shaped by God to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. <laughs> Moreover, he whom he predestined, this he also called. It's not the day you say, I want to receive Jesus Christ. That No, your name was written in the book of life, in the book of Lamb, the Lamb book of life, even before you were conceived, sorry. Yes. He had written it there before you were conceived. That's why if you get out of shape and you don't want to line up with him, then he can remove your name. But he paid a price for it. Moreover, whom he predestined them, he also called. Whom he called, this he also justified. Whom he justified, this he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Nobody. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. Now to the million dollar question. I'll close with this. How do we access those things that have been framed by the word of God for our age? How do we access them? I can tell you how. Do you have Babalawa in your village? Go to him. He will take his okbele. And he will be saying, if I'm a pro from you, Or you can go to Cherubim and Cherubim Church. Then Yaelaya will begin to shake. <laughs> and divination will replace revelation. You know where you are coming from, don't you? When you go to Alafa, you are Tayepe. Because you are dust anyway. No! I love it when a vehicle 
is in Waka report, West African Court of Appeal report, when the Google was knocked down by a car and the family said they killed. They said, uh -uh, you cannot kill at our room. You know, they don't die. They, said, you know, they, they threw the case out. Any if you have visited Baba Lawa and see where he's living so dirty, everything just ugly and smelly, and you go there for him to give you fortune, if he had it, the situation would not be like that. How do we access those things that have been framed by the word of God for our age? Number one, we can access all that God has framed for our age by the same word of God he used to frame them. <laughs> this will automatically happen as that word comes into your heart as it did for Moses. Moses was growing up in the palace of Pharaoh. He had become adopted Pharaoh's uh, uh, daughter's son. Do you understand me? And he was growing up, but he has been equipped by his mother to be able to turn to God someday. Because for three months he was hidden, and thereafter he was given to his mother to raise, and he was raised according to the norms of the God of Israel. And one day, at the age of 40, he stepped out to go visit his brethren. Why did he regard them as his brethren? Something had happened to him. Acts of the Apostle, chapter 7, verse number 17. Because the time of the promise had drawn near, what God framed is about to be unframed. Ha. But when the time of the promise drew near with God as one to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. Till another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers. When that oppression was going on, they did not realize that the time of the promise was drawing near. They were complaining. They were groaning. They were weeping. But the time had drawn near. <laughs> Change is coming to Nigeria in 2021. It's not in 2023, it's in 2021. Change is coming. This man dealt treacherously with our people, oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not leave. At this time, Moses was born and was well pleasing to God. What has he done? Nothing. Nothing. He has not done anything. He was a little child. He said he was a proper child. And nothing was well pleasing to God. And he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as our own son. And Moses was learned. Preparation, preparation, preparation. Because it's when preparation will meet, opportunity, that breakthrough will happen. Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now when he was 40 years old, eat. Somebody say eat. What is eat? The force of destiny. What was framed? Eat came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Why? He knew he would be their deliverer. Isn't that eat? You know how you, when you're working on your computer and you, you spot some and you click it, eat came into his heart. What was framed is coming to your heart. You wake up and be a different person. Amen. You will know who to visit and who to avoid. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Answer number two. The Holy Spirit can also enter into your heart and speak to you from inside as it did to Ezekiel. Yes, sir. 
That's why you cannot come here and turn this place into a theater. You must be born again. You must be filled with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Without that power of his resurrection, you are not a Christian yet. You are speaking Christianese. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And then you shall be my witnesses. When the Holy Spirit entered into Ezekiel, he said he stood him up and he who entered into him began to speak into him inside of him. Therefore, the rest of the world will not hear what he has said to you. And don't try to explain to them. It's a frustrating exercise in futility to try to explain what you receive from the Spirit to those who are in the flesh. And you better know that what began in the spirit cannot be finished in the flesh. You will give back to Ishmael. Do you understand this? Another way. Number three. Those things framed by the word of God for our age can also be revealed to us through prophecies, dreams, and visions, as well as angelic encounters. They can be revealed to you through prophecies, dreams, and visions, as well as angelic encounters. When every child was conceived in my home, I would lay hands on them, connecting with them and with their destiny, and I would begin to put these things down that God had said about them. And years later, Dr. Dick Mills came, put each one on his lap, and spoke those things that we already knew. So it doesn't matter what the enemy is trying to do with any of them. We have seen the end from the beginning. It's not going to happen because God will frustrate the tokens of liars and make the diviners mad. You need to know what your children have come here to do. Don't just send them to Babylon to equip them. Jaleosimi. You know what they call Jaleosimi? The children are making noise in the house. They send them to nursery school. And those ones begin to program them without you programming them like Moses' mother did. The enemy will program them for wrong things. You must know those things can be revealed to us by dreams, by visions, by prophecies, and by angelic encounters. There are just too many examples of angelic encounter. Even for Eager, an angel came to tell what manner of man he would be. For Samson, for Zachariah, the father of John the Baptist, for Joseph and Mary, the earthly parents of Jesus. Please note, until those things framed in the past happen, until they happen, you may not know or have an idea what have been framed to happen. So you can begin to curse your blessings. The greatest thing that happened to me in the course of my career was my appointment being terminated two months to my wedding. That day, it was like all hell broke loose. I didn't understand, but he had been framed that you're going to have a chambers. You'll be called Eshadai Chambers. And you will start it when it is illegal to do so. What an amazing time we just had in the presence of God. I hope you are richly blessed. My heartfelt desire is that you may light up your word with the illumination you have just received. May the immeasurable grace of God empower you to act on what you've heard and to walk in the revealed counsel of God. Always remember that it takes a transformed life to transform a family, a society, or a nation. So let God do his work in you so that he can do his work through you. And as you proceed on this journey of destiny, remember that our ultimate destination is God. I pray that God's footprint will become your pathway and that your path will be as a shining light that shines brighter and brighter to a perfect day. Till we meet again next week, remain sandwiched between the peace of God and the God of peace. Have an amazing week. Bye for now. Shalom.
we can't talk about education reform if we don't decolonize our education system. What we do not understand, we will stigmatize. Because it's just cultural. It, it's, and I think it's just human nature. They're stopping our salary. I don't like remembering it. I am angry at Nigeria. I'm angry at this government which seems to be letting us down. I'm angry at us as a people. In the process of struggling to free myself from his hand, he tore my pants and jumped um, away me. Yes, I commit the first truly. Young girl, do you know where you are going? I say, I'm going to America. I say, oh. Now so that they talk, you are going to Libya. Which America? As it then do mark our place, some people will die now. This is PLOS TV Africa. Big stories live here. Politics has helped shape the decision of the polity, from conspiracy theories to good old-fashioned comic politics. These are the results of tomorrow's election. Yes. Okay, yes. you have it already. Have it. I am not hungry. If I need appointment, all I need to do is to start praising government. Plus, politics will fill the polls of the country, from friends to frenemies, even strange bedfellows, to clones and stooges. We go beyond the rhetorics and the drama to analyze the story behind the story. The moment we stop having charlatans occupy political offices, we will curtail hate speech. Plus, politics, not just another political show. It's about putting you, the citizens, in the know. for upcoming artists to blow in Nigeria. Welcome to Plus Trending. I am Bukin Ivanba, your host, saying thank you for joining us on today's episode. Welcome back. It's tea time on Plus TV Africa. Practice makes perfect. I'm not perfect yet, but I'm a lot better than I used to be. He's a king. He's entitled to marry a hundred if he wants to. Contrary to popular belief, Corona is not a hoax. The virus is real. Be responsible. Wear a mask. Wash your hands with soap and water and avoid crowded places. Maintain physical distancing. Be responsible. Together, we can overcome the pandemic. Good morning. Coming up on The Breakfast this morning, $1.5 billion for Port Harcourt Refinery, 2.3.2 million Nigerians out of jobs, and can goes to court over Kama, as well as a wide narrow gauge for the Eastern Rail Line. There's a lot that we, of course, will be sharing with you this morning. The Federal Executive Council has approved $1.5 billion for the rehabilitation of the Port Harcourt refinery. There's also 23.2 million Nigerians out of job, according to the National Bureau of Statistics. That's more than the population of the Republic of Niger, Togo, and Gabon combined. What does this mean for Nigeria, and how can we get jobs for our people? The Christian Association of Nigeria goes to court to get the federal government to interpret the Companies and Allied Matters Act 2020. Can has always been against the revised camera, and we'll have a cleric tell us all about that. And also coming up on the show, once again, we discuss the Eastern Rail Line and why the government has decided to use a narrow gauge line for the Eastern Corridor while the standard gauge is being deployed on other lines in Nigeria's rail network. First, 
we're going to be having an engineer and then a government official will explain, of course, uh, the controversy over the narrow gauge and the standard gauge lines. And of course, we'll be reviewing the papers with Ezekiel Nyeretuk all the way from Akwa Ibom State. Good morning and welcome to The Breakfast on PLUS TV Africa. I am Osao Gie Ogbon. And I am Aneta Felix. So let's go right into our top trending issue this morning. We're looking at $1.5 billion budgeted to fix a Port Harcourt refinery. Oh my. Yeah. What are your thoughts on this? First off, before I, I really say everything that's on my mind regarding this very big issue. Oh, well, my thoughts, well, you know, it sounds like a noble idea. It sounds like, yeah, you know, let's, let's do this. You know, it, it doesn't matter if we're taking loans to... Um, you know, fix refineries to set up, you know, better infrastructure in the country. But, you know, it's, it's, it's similar to the fears that a lot of Nigerians have and the reactions that I've seen from a lot of Nigerians on the same uh, story. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like, oh, once again, you know, we're back here when we've talked about, you know, uh, rehabilitating these refineries for more than a decade now. We never seem to do it. And yes. it seems like, you know, um, and that's what it sounds like, you know, from, you know, the feedback I've gotten from across, you know, the country. Mm -hmm. A lot of people just feel, you know, the government really just, you know, creates these stories, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, sets up a budget every now and then, and the money just, you know, disappears and never, you know, seems to do anything. That is it, really. really. Over the years, millions and millions of dollars are budgeted to fix refineries. And yet, the four refineries we have in Nigeria, all owned by the government, all operating under, you know, below capacity, really. And for this particular Port Harcourt refinery, opened 1989, about 32 years ago, we've been having issues with this. It's the largest refinery in Nigeria. It's supposed to have capacity to produce 120 or 150,000 barrels of oil per day, but we're not, we're not seeing any of that. With all the refineries we have, all the money pumped into, you know, making sure they're up and running. Nigeria still imports majority of our fuel needs. Just it, so sad. It didn't take so long and so much bureaucracy and so much talk, you know, to set up the Dangote refinery to the state that it is now. Mm -hmm. um, we've over time also celebrated that, oh, you know, it's going to be the largest refinery in Africa. Um, and, you know, we're excited about the Dangote refinery. But that, that's mostly a private refinery. What will it really take for Nigeria as a country to invest in you know, building or rehabilitating their own refinery. And mm -hmm. why, and this is what Nigerians, I'm sure, are asking, why should we believe this time that the Port Harcourt refinery I mean, will actually the, be I the Minister of uh, Petroleum Resources yesterday mentioned, he actually admitted, you know, the truth we all know, that... Uh, the operation and maintenance of these refineries are like the biggest challenges. And I don't really understand why, because as I said earlier, millions of dollars have been pumped into this. Uh, and now the, the government is saying this $1.5 billion or about 600 uh, billion naira that will be pumped uh, to rehabilitating this refinery. The money will be coming from the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, NNPC, also coming from uh, internally generated revenue and uh, budgetary provisions and Afrexim Bank. This is not the first time we're hearing this. We really want to find out what really would change this time. The minister is also saying that uh, this rehabilitation would take place in three phases, that when they start, they, you know, they go on for 18 months, there will be 90% completion, then 24 months and 44 months. It seems like a really long time, but really it isn't. And I, I can't wait for us to get to the time where we're able to come back and take a look at the refinery in Port Harcourt to see how far has the government fared and where has our 600 billion naira or 1.5 million dollars actually gone into? Well, we would see how it turns out. Um, if, if they can complete a, um, you know, 90% in 18 months, you know, sounds good. Um, when do they start? Um, you know, and when do we start a countdown, you know, till this you know, actually starts working? With immediate effects. Because, so. you know, it, it, we as, you know, Nigeria as a country needs to be serious. Um, mm -hmm. Nigeria as a country needs to wake up and own, you know, the, these responsibilities that it should have. And we can't, can't keep giving excuses. It's been too long. Um, unfortunately, because of how the, you know, the affairs of government has been, has been run for so long, nobody really even believes these things when they see it. Um, when, when we see the kind of stories on the news, you know, I saw people putting up, you know, laundromat pictures yesterday, you know, to almost mean that, oh, this is another excuse, you know, to once again launder government funds. <laughs> but, you know, I, I will be, you know, I'll try and be positive about it and say, okay, yes, let's see what 18 months brings. Um, can we get the Port Harcourt refinery back, you know, um, um, you know on its, on its uh, foot again? Um, and, 
you know, do we expect that when that happens, we will then, you know, reduce our, you know, interest in sending crude, you know, overseas to get yes. refined and back here Most in importantly, when these refineries are up and running, we really hope that, you know, imports eventually, you know, gets reduced to the barest minimum. We're seeing fuel at a very cheap price. We're seeing that, you know, the fuel subsidy, whole drama and controversy comes to a close. That's just the, the, the goal. That's just the aim. I know you're not so optimistic, but <laughs> we can only just uh, cross our fingers and oh. see. Also, congratulations. Even this is, this is hard for me to say, but congratulations to Chelsea fans yesterday. Um, their match against uh, Atletico Madrid ended, mm -hmm. you know, 2-0. A lot of people didn't expect that they would get that uh, victory, but um, they did. You know, Atletico also got a red card in that game, but two goals were enough to secure that victory, and of course, yes. uh, they will move on to the next stage yes. in the uh, Champions League. The details we have for you is that the Chelsea Football Club has done what many thought they couldn't do. They beat Atletico Madrid to progress to the final eight of the UEFA Champions League. What's more, the Blues did it in style, defeating Atletico at home and abroad without conceding a goal. It gives Chelsea goalkeeper his sixth clean sheet in seven Champions League appearances. The victory is also a real boost for manager Thomas Tuchel, who is yet to lose a match at Chelsea. Do we, do we talk about the coach? Um, yes. Okay. And the reason, you know, is because of the record that he has so far. He's gone, you know, 10, 11. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a Chelsea fan, but, you know, a couple of games, you know, unbeaten, um, which is phenomenal for them, uh, you know, considering where they're coming from, you know, with uh, Frank Lampard, who, you know, a lot of people also expected would be, you know, great success at Chelsea. But, you know, it didn't seem like, you know, that was likely. Thomas Tuchel is coming from PSG. He also had a great run at PSG. And so, you know, it's a huge task he's been given at Chelsea. And you, you know Roman Abramovich doesn't have time to waste. If it doesn't look like you're doing good, you know, they, they start searching for a new coach next week. It doesn't matter how long you've stayed. Even if you spend three days and you don't seem to be working, they uh -huh. kick you out. So um, it, it's a good thing, you know, for the club. I'm mm -hmm. sure that their fans are happy. Uh, and um, let's see how, you know, far they go, you know, in the next stage. You know, I, I'm sure tonight... Um, or by the next round of Champions League games, we'll figure out who they are going to be meeting in the next stage of the Champions League. Yes. Um, I really can't, you know, knock them down because my team is not in the Champions League. So, uh, <laughs> but really, so. kudos, to, kudos to Thomas Tuchel since yes. he took over January 26th. They've considered how many goals? Just two goals in about 13 matches, no, right? No, not a Chelsea fan. All right. Know. Well, I just hope we had, a, we had really a, a Wally Scott here to, to come battle this out with you. But it's good. Now, let's take a break here. Listener. We'll come back uh, with Ezekiel and Yair Talk to uh, make us, uh, help us make sense of the newspapers this morning on Off the Press. Welcome once again to The Breakfast here on PLOS TV Africa. We're going straight into the newspapers and uh, seeing as many of these major stories that we can share with you this morning, would say uh, good morning to our guest who's uh, joining us, uh, Mr. Ezekiel Nyayatok. Good Thank morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Nice to be with you always. Good to see you. All right, let's start with the punch newspapers this morning and see what major stories uh, we can find. Um, the big one there says, uh, experts carpet federal government over 568.5 billion naira vote to, re to repair loss-making Port Harcourt refinery. Uh, project wasteful, senseless. Government beaten a dead horse, 
says uh, Economist. New Peng, Union commend government seek private sector participation. Also, Nigeria's daily oil production rises to 1.42 million barrels. And also a shouting match in the Senate as lawmakers suspend bill to restructure military. Uh, Malabu scam, Nigeria loses $1 billion claim. Italian court acquits ENI and Shell. And also PDP election review panel proposes Northeast, Southeast for 2023 presidency. We also can find this morning uh, the Quara state issues, uh, the hijab violence. Uh, Khan fingers Abdul Razak demands federal government's intervention. OPC members who arrested Wakili charged with murder and arson, says uh, Ghani Adams. And also politicians eyeing 2023 engineering um, violent breakup. I'm not sure what that is about. Southern and Middle Belt leaders are speaking about that. And uh, once um, one more, Southwest ahead as farmers clashes, uh, cases of terrorism, says uh, Yoruba uh, leaders. These are the big ones that we can uh, quickly throw in from the punch this morning. On the Nation newspaper, Oyo, Yobe, others yet to roll out COVID-19 vaccination. Makinde, Wike, Ayade, Diri, Maibuli have not taken vaccine. And now others now say they're unsure how to get the jabs. 2023 president, PDP panel dashes South zoning hope. That's interesting. Tanzania president dies at 61. FECOK's one 1.72 billion naira for road and health contracts. Alleged 900 million naira fraud, ex-JAM registrar detained. Coalition of Yoruba groups form security outfit. Two killed in bandit attack on Emir's convoy. Many injured as pro anti-hijab clash rocks Ilori. Lagos to complete blue red rail lines in Jakonde's honor. Wike Melafia not excited about $1.5 billion, but Harcourt refinery rehabilitation. Well, uh, Pengerson and marketers uh, give it a nod and say it's okay. Those are the stories on The Nation this morning. All right, and of course, uh, still the same uh, big story on the um, uh, Nigerian Tribune this morning. It says federal government to rehabilitate Port Harcourt refinery with $1.5 billion. Yes, on Wicker says, I will not rejoice yet. We've had enough promises. Also, violence in Ilori over hijab, many injured. Government reopens 10 affected schools. And also, labor to federal government. It's not true you subsidize electricity tariff with 50 billion naira monthly. Ladoja asks uh, his only nominee in Makinde's cabinet to join PDP. And uh, we can also find on the Tribune this morning, Song Wolu announces Leadership Academy to immortalize Jakonde. Police nab five more suspected killers of Fasharanti's daughter. And the drama in the Senate as Northern lawmakers frustrate bill for Armed Forces uh, Service Commission. We, okay, we can also find on the Tribune this morning, 2023, PDP committee wants presidential ticket based on merit. Uh, Summit's report on 2019 elections. And, and uh, of course, uh, more of these clashes in Lagos. It says here, 10 injured, 15 arrested as rival courts clash in Lagos. Oh. ICPC, and this is a, an interesting story, ICPC arrest ex-JAM registrar year in day over alleged 900 million naira fraud. That's um, most of the stories that we can find on the Nigerian Tribune this morning. Mm. The Daily Independent is also quite interesting. Forex shortage may grind aviation operations to a halt. Airlines grumble, delay, and cancel flight. Our trade shows federal government $1.5 billion uh, for repairs of Port Harcourt refinery. FECOK is another 3.070 billion naira for NCDC lab equipment. OPL 245 Nigeria kicks as Italian court acquits any in shell. Hijab controversy is big across all newspapers, and we're seeing here that after that clash between pro and anti, uh, you know, uh, people who are basically on the hijab controversy in schools in the state, police has restored normalcy in Ilori. PDP throws uh, presidential tickets open. Rising inflation may continue for a longer time, and that's NECA. The cries increase in unemployment rate. Troops rescue 10 kidnapped victims of Kaduna Airport staff quarters, and the ICPC versus uh, ex-jam registrar's uh, fraud case.
case. Those are the stories on the front page of um, the Daily Independent. All right, let's uh, jump right into it. Uh, Mr. Ayatok would uh, most likely start with the one that has made headlines across uh, all the papers this morning, $1.5 billion for Port Harcourt refinery rehabilitation. What are your thoughts? You know, what, one of the things that somebody said that really, um, I wouldn't say infuriated, but I would say got me not just thinking, but largely unhappy. Was as soon as that came up, he just smiled and said, wow, election is around the corner and there's need for money. And I really felt pained by that. Not because what the person is saying is not factual or doesn't make sense, but I just, I just think that for a nation, why should seeking political office be the most important thing? Is it based on how patriotic that we are that we want to go and serve or how we have just accepted that looting the treasury is the exclusive preserve of these so-called politicians, where everything is about politics. Look at what's going on in the Northeast, but all over Nigeria, especially in the North, and the, 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 the schools. I don't know how many of us have really sat down to really think of the implication of schools being shut down, where children can, are afraid to go to school. I don't know if we've really sat down to think of the larger impact on our country in, in the next 10 years. You know, so you, it bothers so Zayatok, me. You don't, and now you don't the federal government. believe the government is genuine with this rehabilitation? Yeah, they, 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 they see it as a means of generating funds. A contract's got to be awarded. Things have got to be done. They have to bring out the little... There has to be something that will make them bring out humongous amount. Why is it two years to the end of your administration that you want to think of reviving the... the I mean, it doesn't make sense. Number two, please, can somebody tell me... The, the, you know, I've said this before, in uh, maybe about two, three weeks ago. I remember clearly the clay factory, you know, in, in, in Aquaibom. I went with my governor to, to South Africa. And when we read they just did certain strategic analysis, okay? When was it produced? By who? What's the technology? Is it still current? We did, you know, a, a, you know, a risk um, assessment, and we did a, a, a very thorough profiling. At the end, they advised us and said, Your Excellency, you are better off leaving that uh, factory and building something new. Okay? Now, can somebody tell me, can the federal government come up with a very, very, very open, transparent blueprint on number one, why the current technology that is being used there is what is more sustainable, so we need to continue with it. Number two, how it is cheaper for us to continue to build that than if we think it's so viable, why don't we privatize it? Now, labor comes and says, no, you can't do it. We're not talking of labor. We have to sit down and think of this country. As far as I am concerned, the timing is wrong. Okay. The amount of money is humongous. We have too many needs, immediate needs, education, 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 security. That, this is not the time for you to think of such, such humongous amount of money to be thrown into, you know, beating a dead horse, like okay. many people have said. All right. Please start by convincing us that um, this, this exercise is in the larger interest of the nation and know where you can pull out a lot amount of money to execute the election come 2023. All right. Mr. Uh, Ezekiel Liaitouk, let's now turn to education. The ICPC um, has alleged that ex-jam registrar or Jerry Day uh, basically misappropriated 900, billion, 900 million naira. I took a look at the story and the details were quite shocking. They said he basically allocated a large amount of money for the purchase of pencils and eraser. And when the NP N IPCPC did their findings, they found that he had about two filling stations, he had houses in Ghana, so many, you know, story buildings in different parts of the country. He has a learning center. He, he basically has just so much bars and uh, all of that. He has a marble factory in Kwara State. You know, it's just so much. Either, th 
in his name or through his lawyers and people associated with him. This issue, we we'll always talk about, you know, education, education, lack of funding for education, you know, teachers are owed salaries, has to complaining of, you know, the issues they're going through. And we're seeing now that regarding JAM, a foremost, you know, educational uh, exam body in the country, we're seeing that uh, a former registrar has been, you know, it has been detained over 900 million Naira fraud. What are your views on this? It, it, it is a story of our lives, unfortunately. We lack systems and processes that make things transparent and accountable. I had really looked forward to this government coming to, you know, I have said it, the enemy of darkness is light. This question of secrecy has, the day it comes to an end, that day we start to have a nation that is moving in the right direction. For instance, it should be very clear and transparent how much money that JAM gets because everything is done electronically. And it does not have to go through the office of the boss. He could have a terminal where he can actually see what is going on. Number two is that the expenses, the expenditure, how much is one pencil? How many children are taking the exams? How, many, how, how much is needed? These are things that can be done very easily and transparently. And before you can pull out 900 million, and let me even say, when Nigerians say 900 million, just add another 50% to it, because that's the one they can see. And usually, the ones you can't see are always more than the ones you can see, because we've learned the art of covering our lives very well. I think it's very sad. And for JAM in particular, a lot of these institutions where they are making a lot of money. And we still have other bodies, ICPC, uh, you know, and the, and the rest, and how are we monitoring our public office holders? I think that the whole you know, public office administration system needs to be looked into again, and let's deploy technology to be able to take care of these things. Outside of that, we just keep... And again, these people are those that fund elections for the government in power. So the man might even say that out of this 900 million, please, can you remember that I gave you on the other election, I gave you maybe 200 million. So, and these are things that you cannot even say openly. I, I, I listened to, to a, a former public officer saying that they are saying things that they've asked him to write memos, but he cannot write it because they are just saying things that he cannot get himself to put on record openly while he's still alive. Because there's okay. so much rot, there's so much nonsense within the system. Wow. And I think that the time has come when Nigerians should rise and decide to take the destiny of this country in our own hands. All right. Messiah Talk, I, I, um, I think it's also a good time um, to expose or once again bring back the conversation of uh, corruption in MDAs across the country and not just in, in government offices, not just in uh, political offices. You know, it's also a good time to um, talk about how much corruption um, happens in, you know, education, in healthcare. Um, and of course, in every other government parastatal across the country. Um, so should, should we also give kudos to the ICPC for being able to spot this? And you know, how much more of these systems do we need to put in place to ensure that um, we can prevent corruption and stealing on that level, uh, you know, instead of you know, always trying to catch a thief? There are two things. The very first thing is that there are certain systems that the, the system will resist. Because, you know, I'm privileged, I would say, to have a very close relationship with maybe as much as, I don't know what percentage I would put of the people at the top, at the topmost, because this is a season of people in my age bracket. You know, you discover that your classmate is a, a minister here, another one is the head of this section. This is like our time. So I have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a lot of the people in power, okay? Governors, senators, heads of parasitals. And one thing will hit you so hard, so bad. The pressure put on these people to bring money for election is evil. It's satanic. The pressure and the blackmail, we're going to remove you. If you don't do it, you're not loyal, you're disloyal. And you've got to bring the money. So how do you bring the money? 
And when they know you have to bring this money, how are they going to interrogate you? How are they going to put in place systems and processes that will ensure accountability and transparency? We are still bogged by this thing called politics. And I think that the time has come when all men and women and men of conscience must come out and step into politics. Politics is destroying this nation. At the root of all corruption, you will trace it to one thing, politics. Because when you've got to bring out this money, then you also look for a way to also service yourself, okay? And lack of proper reward system. I, I told somebody when I was contesting to be a, go a governor, I said, I'll not pay any of my commissioners a dime short of two million a month. And they were shouting, how can you do that? How can you? And I look at this and I say, look at any commissioner that you know, if you are from a state like us, look at the life they live, look at the houses. Are you telling me that it is coming from their 800,000 or so that they collect monthly? The answer is no. Give that man a reasonable reward that will get the best to you and give him your red eye. You touch a dime of state's resources, I embarrass you openly. So well, we are being penny, uh, we, we also, wise and naira foolish. You know, we, we also wouldn't rule out the presence of greed uh, amongst you know, some of these persons. But let's, you know, quickly move on. We're, of course, uh, dealing with time here. Let's now talk about the issues in Kwara State over um, hijab. Uh, ten schools were initially shot. You know, there were videos yesterday showing some violence. Gunshots were fired, you know, and um, stones and sticks were thrown here and there. Um, what do you think, you know, is going on and, you know, how do you think all of this can be quickly uh, resolved? We need to be transparent and accountable and we need to draw certain lines. What is a private institution? What is a constitutional provision? Where does it apply? What is a public institution? I can choose to run a Muslim school for families that want to have their children brought up within the Muslim culture. I can choose to do that, and it is your choice to come to my school or not to come to my school. I can also choose to run um, a public, uh, no, no, a Christian school, where I say you must pray in the morning, you must go to chapel, you must do it. It's a choice. It's either you want to come or you don't want to come. And then we will now have the public school. That public school will have certain protocols. It is non-religious. It is strictly secular. So you come in, you obey the principles of, you know, uh, best practices. And, for instance, if you want to work in Central Bank, no matter who you are, there's a certain dress code you must have. If you want to work in any of the banks, if you want to work in any, the, the address codes that you put up in public, I don't know how many people dress anyhow to the court, and yet it's a public institution. But they have those public laws that we operate a non-religious, you know, neutral status. When we bring this to schools, we'll be able to bring about sanity. If this, you want your children to go to a Muslim school, you send them to a Muslim school. You want them to go to a Christian school? I decided that all my children would go to Covenant University, excuse me, because I just wanted that background of Christian and trained. It was a personal decision. Going to chapel every morning, I wanted it. It was a personal choice. Another person, and in my office, it's a law, it's mine. Everybody has his own secret. You must pray 10 minutes in the morning. If you don't like it, don't get employed. In my office, you must have that prayer. That's where my strength is. Okay. That's where my secret is. So it's a choice. But in public institutions, there should be a neutrality where you have uniform, everybody abides by it. When you do that, so people now decide they want to go to a Muslim school or they want to go to a Christian school or they want to go to a neutral school. And for each of them, please just obey the rules. All right, All Mr. Right. Ezekiel Iyachok, uh, I want you to address this, this issue. 
There was a shouting match in the Senate yesterday, and it's over a bill to restructure the military. Uh, lawmakers suspended the bill because of the opposition to it. And they, they are saying basically that they want to constitute a, a, an army service commission that would, you know, basically oversee the affairs of uh, the military control the appointment of service chiefs and all other details within the military. Do you think this is the way to go? What upsets me no end is how people get into the National Assembly without understanding why they are there. Well, they, they understand. They went there to make money, a lot of people. Not everybody, but a lot of them went there to make money. So they understand. And for you to make money, you've got to be loyal. And for you to be loyal, you have to be seen to be doing certain things. Mm -hmm. How can, look at the headlines in Delhi Independence. Fear of whitting down Buhari's power. Can you imagine a lawmaker personalizing a law? I mean, it is the height of absurdity. It is the height of, of, of ignorance. I don't, know, I don't know the word to use. How can you think of a law and relate it to an individual? It doesn't make sense. So I think that uh, we, we need to, as, 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 as a people, interrogate our leadership profiling you know, no criteria so that we will be able to do that which is necessary and get into National Assembly. The people that understand that they are coming to make laws that have no eyes and they don't see whether it is north or south, east or west, but what is in the larger interest of the nation. I think that is very important. The oh. moment we do that, then we start to have a national assembly that has a focus and a direction. And not that, oh, we are whittling down a Buhari's power. I I'm a Buhari loyalist. I cannot do that. And you forget that in less than two years, the man is gone. And oh. another man comes in. You may not like that person but you've already given that person that power because you were so short-sighted to think that the world ends at the time junction, and it is very annoying. All right. Uh, we'll uh, end, the, uh, of course, of the press segment here. Uh, big thank you to uh, Zikel Nyayatok. Um, always interested in hearing your perspective on these stories. Uh, of course, uh, have a great uh, day ahead. Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, stay with us, of course, here on The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. We'll take a short break. When we come back, what happened today in history? I'm going back to the year 2018 and sharing with you something in sports with one of the greatest sportsmen uh, to ever live. We can't talk about education reform if we don't decolonize our education system. What we do not understand, we will stigmatize. Because it's just cultural. It, it's... And I think it's just human nature. They stop paying us salary. I don't like remembering it. I am angry at Nigeria. I'm angry at this government which seems to be letting us down. I'm angry at us as a people. In the process of struggling to free myself from his hand, he tore my pants and jumped um, away. Mm. Yes, I commit the first trillion. Young girl, do you know where you are going? I say, I'm going to America. I say, oh. Now that they talk, you are going to Libya, which America? As it then do mark our place, some people they die now. This is PLOS TV Africa. Big stories live here. Now, welcome back to The Breakfast on PLUS TV Africa. Let's now tell you what happened this day in history on March 18th in 2018. On this day, Vladimir Putin is elected to a six, a new six-year term as a president of Russia. He scored or secured 76% of the vote uh, you know, for this term. And his fourth inauguration took place on Monday in May, on May 7th, 2018. And it marks the commencement of the new six-year term of Vladimir Putin as the president of Russia. Now, this presidential election uh, held on 18th uh, March 2018. There were eight candidates who participated in the election, and he had been elected in uh, 2012 and was eligible to run 
again. He had made comments, you know, that uh, didn't give people a clear view of if he was going to step down from the post as president, uh, but he chose to run as an independent. And uh, that inauguration uh, used a publicly, they publicly presented at first time uh, the new Russian-made uh, Oru Senat limousine instead of the current Mercedes-Benz 600 guard Pullman that was used at that time. He delivered a 12-minute inaugural speech address of 1,246 words. Now, this speech was the longest in history, and the previous record was the inaugural speech of Boris Yeltsin in the year 1991. Putin had spoken about tasks that needed to be solved and uh, what he was going to do for the Russian population for decades to come. Basically, he was highly favored by the Russian people uh, for his what they described as his muscular foreign policy. So this day in history, Vladimir Putin was elected to a new six-year term as president of Russia. Um, he, he, you know, of course, like you just mentioned, you know, his foreign policy, I, I think that is one of the things that makes Vladimir Putin one of the most um, uh, respected and uh, feared leaders in the world. Um, yeah, and of course, also respected by his own people, you know, because, you know, he, he has shown, you know, by his actions and by his words and by, you know, what we always call body language, that he's all about the Russian people and um, the greatness of, you know, Russia as a, as a nation. Oh. Um, he's an ex-KGB, no, not KGB now, he's um, an ex, you know, one of those security um, agencies. Um, and um, he, of course, um, you know, became also very, very popular once again during Donald Trump's um, uh -huh. time in the White House because of the allegations of Russian interference in the United States elections. And so, you know, before the elections and after the elections, before and after Donald Trump, he's always been there. A lot of people don't remember Russia, you know, without Vladimir Putin. Um, he's always, you know, been, you know, in, in, in that political space and in that environment. You know, you know, if you go a little further, yes, I remember the era of Boris Yeltsin. Um, and of course, next to, you know, was um, uh, Vladimir Putin. Um, he's also been criticized, you know, because of his, uh, the way that his government has allegedly been um, towards, um, you know, opposition. Um, if you remember the um, guy who, are now Alexei Navalny, mm -hmm. you know, who, of course, has struggled for his life for a bit, um, there were allegations that it was uh, Vladimir Putin's government who poisoned him. And it's not the first one, you know, there's other people who have also, you know, suffered the uh, same. He also was criticized, um, you know, with the uh, Crimea, you know, incident a couple of years ago, uh, where um, the, the, the place was annexed by Russia. Um, but Vladimir Putin, definitely one of the most um, revered uh, leaders in the world. Now, in sports, and this one I'm excited to talk about, I'm going to be speaking about one of the world's greatest sportsmen. He is one name that, for generations to come, um, a lot of people would always remember. He is also one of the most popular names in the world, and it is uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. Um, started at Sporting CP and, of course, moved to Manchester United. Hit his peak at Real Madrid, of course, with the number of goals that he was able to score there. So I'm just going to quickly rush through this one. But Ronaldo has won five Ballon d'Or um, awards and won four European Golden Shoes. He has won 31 major trophies in his career, including seven league titles, five UEFA Champions League, one UEFA, UEFA European Championship, and one UEFA Nations League uh, title. He holds the records for the most goals, 134, and assist uh, 42 in the history of the UEFA Champions League. He's also one of the few recorded players uh, that has scored or uh, made over 1,000 professional career appearances and has scored a record 770 senior career goals and counting for club and country. He's also the second male to score 100 international goals and the first European one to achieve the feat. Um, he really is, you know, one of those people that you would never be able to rule out of um, sports relevance ever, you know, in history. Um, it was on this day in 2018 that he scored his 50th career hat-trick um, for Real Madrid. He, of course, um, over time has now scored about 56 hat-tricks in his career. But on this day, he made it 50 for Real Madrid in their game against uh, Girona, which uh, Real Madrid won six goals to three. Um, if, it, if you talk about goals, he, of course, has, has continued to break records, has continued to add to his tally more than 700 goals. Um, of course, uh, he, is, um, um, he has scored in the time that he, you know, he has been playing football and doesn't seem tired, currently plays for Juventus and you know, has not had as much success as he had during um, his time at Real Madrid, but still is and will forever be my greatest of all time.
Cristiano Ronaldo. <laughs> That's all we have for you today in history. 2018, Cristiano Ronaldo scored his 50th career hat-trick, uh, of course, while playing for Real Madrid. Yes, that's what we have for you in today in history, and we'll be right back after the short break. Welcome back to The Breakfast. And now we move into a conversation on Nigeria's unemployment rate. Uh, as at the end of 2020, it rose to 33.3% from 27.1% recorded as uh, the second quarter of the year 2020. This indicates that 23.2 million Nigerians are un unemployed. This figure is slightly more than the population of the Republic of Venet, Togo and Gabon all combined. Uh, of course, uh, data from the National Bureau of Statistics shows that in the same period, the underemployment rate in Nigeria dropped from 28.6% recorded in the second quarter of 2020 to 22.8% in the fourth quarter. The increase in unemployment rate figures has been attributed to the after effect of the COVID-19 lockdowns. Could there be other reasons? Uh, we have this morning uh, financial analyst and planner Shegun Shele, who's uh, joining us to help uh, answer these questions. Good morning. Thanks for joining us, sir. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Good to see you. Let's start with, you know, answering the first question there. You know that the unemployment uh, rate as it stands uh, can be blamed on COVID-19 and the effects of, uh, of um, you know, that is had with our economy, um, and not just in Nigeria, across the world. Do you agree with that narrative? Of course, um, largely the effect of the pandemic cannot be overemphasized. It's been a tough one, not only for Nigeria, but the entire economy of the world, um, economy, the entire countries of the world actually are going through some bit of pain by reason of the consequences of what the COVID-19 pandemic did bring. But Nigeria's case um, is, is a little different. In as much as the pandemic uh, had its own tool, the economy in itself has been struggling. It's been struggling for a while. It only just started um, looking uh, up a bit late uh, 2019, and everyone was hopeful that by 2020, everything was going to really cascade into something far much better. But of course, the, 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 the pandemic hit us, the entire country was locked down, and then we are here now. But minus COVID, the economy of Nigeria has suffered largely, largely from inadequate infrastructure. That much we own. The economy, every economy, depends on the adequate provision of infrastructure. Be it road network, uh, power, especially power for the manufacturing sector, here, it's been a struggle for a country with, uh, that got independence as far back as 1960, still not being able to effectively generate and distribute adequate power that will be required for the manufacturing sector, all uh, sectors as, as a matter of fact, to be able to do well. Now, the government of the day is trying all that it can to ensure that we have all this infrastructure in place. You can see the massive rail uh, uh, network construction, the road rehabilitations, you know, but that, that is just one of the problems. We also have a largely a workforce, a workforce that is not adequately skilled, adequately trained to be able to handle um, the, the, the dictates of an investor, an entrepreneur, who seeks to establish his firm, either a foreign investor or even a local investor, you have a workforce that is more of 
how much can I get? How much is available now that I can get and put in my pocket? If they cannot earn as much from you, even if where they do, they are still looking for how they will cut corners. You are practically every organization, whether the financial services or even the core manufacturing concerns, even up to the non-profit organizations, especially even the religious organizations, everybody have a tale to tell of how the staff they have have, in one way or the other, I mean, dealt with them, dealt a big blow on them by pilfering what the, the companies are struggling to put together. Now, we also have the, I mean, of late, the Nigerian story. That even started long before the COVID era. We have the level of insecurity. It's now at an alarming rate. Before it was Boko Haram that everybody was really more concerned about. But it's, it's gone beyond that. We are now having all sorts of kidnapping everywhere. There was the farmer headers uh, issue. We are now having the bandits, the called criminal bandits, if that's what you call them. We are making life quite unbearable for the Nigerian investor, the Nigerian entrepreneur. Let's talk of now a foreign investor, a foreign entrepreneur who may want to come and invest in Nigeria. Okay. How would anybody start a future? How would anybody set up a business when you know that your life is at risk in the area of fashion? That, that makes it almost impossible. Okay, and Mr. Yes, we're talking about unemployment. Without, how are they going to be, without companies rather running, established, being set up, how would there be employment? Okay, so Mr. Scheller, basically, you, you've broken, you've broken out down the reasons why you feel we're having unemployment rates in Nigeria. According to you, there's the factor of the COVID-19 pandemic and how lots of companies have shut down. You also mentioned the unskilled part of our labor force, about 23.2 million people, uh, of our uh, that's a third of our labor uh, force population unemployed, and you're saying most of them are unskilled. You also mentioned insecurity and how that might be scaring investors. But really, where do we stand in this situation and what does this rate mean for us, this unemployment rate in the country? It's obvious that um, the economy would bleed by reason of the huge ratio of the unemployment rate. So if you are not doing well economically, then you can know the reasons why. Where is the workforce to get the job done? Where is the business in itself? So we are, we, every, organize, every company, every, rather, every, organize, every country, sorry, actually is measured, the economic fortunes are measured based on the level of their GDP, their gross domestic product. So how much of activity have we generated to the extent where we can be upscaling our GDP? Now, if the companies, both manufacturing concerns, service industry, and even the agricultural industry are not doing that which you're expected to do, then naturally the economy would be the one that will suffer for it. The people who either to were farmers on the farm trying to ensure that they only not produce goods or crops rather for the use for their own immediate family, for the sustenance of the family, but are looking at the possibility of even making sales out of their produce and largely exporting the produce are now being scared away from the, from the, from the farms. So it has a stole and agriculture seem of late to be contributing a larger percentage of Nigeria's GDP. Now, if there is a dwindling fortune in that area, how do you expect the economy to, 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 to upscale? Okay, Mr. Shelley, I wanted Little to draw your attention to, uh, sorry to butt in, but I wanted to draw your attention to the section of Nigeria's population who are highly skilled, well-educated, but still cannot find jobs. Would you blame this on the government? And because they came in promising to provide jobs, you know, infrastructure development. So would you, how would you rate the government in that aspect of its, you know, fulfilling its campaign promises, you know, to match up the population? Because we're one of the fastest growing uh, population in the world. And by 2050, our population is projected to double. So do you think the government in itself is doing enough to provide jobs to match up to our growing population? But you know, that in itself is a misnomer. It is not the job of government to provide jobs. The job of government is to create and, and allow for an enabling environment for in private individuals like you and I to provide jobs. That is when you can be talking of proper efficiency 
and effectiveness of the system. How many people can government employ? What is the business of government setting up businesses that they themselves now create agencies and say they want to try and control? That in itself is, is an aberration. So the best thing for the government to do ordinarily would have to create an empty environment. Now, for the particular group of people who we might say, yes, are skilled, skilled by reason of their education, that's what we we'll call it, the education from the university. Now, these are within the age bracket of 24 to 35. They actually have a larger percentage or form a larger percentage of the people who are regarded as quite to be unemployed or underemployed as are today. This group of people, between you and I, they have just been taught theoretical processes of whatever uh, uh, discipline that they've gone to the university to study. Most of them do not have, they do not have any practical knowledge. Wow. They cannot invent anything. They are, not, they are not creative in their thinking. All that they do is just to read, write an exam, pass the exam, and then they are let out of the university. And by the time you sit with them, I've, I've, I've had an opportunity to sit with a large number of people at interview panels. You know, and then when you ask questions to try and get a sense of practical knowledge out of them, then you find that it, it, okay. it's, it's not there. Mr. Mr. Shelley, now, um, Mr. Shelley system, would, little, would, little, we, would we not little, then tie sorry, this? this Mr. Shelley, would you not then tie this to government failure at the end of the day? Because if we're saying that we have people who went to school but lack the technical knowledge, does this not then relate to failure in terms of education? We have us who, you know, striking here and there saying the government is not providing enough facilities for them to study. And going back to the issue of uh, government creating jobs, I remember when the president was campaigning uh, for 2015, one of his promises was to create 3 million jobs yearly, and he said it was going to create a total of 15 million jobs. So where are the jobs right now where lots of people are home and the MBS has just told us that our unemployment statistics is getting worse? Now, you just, you just said it right. I mean, it's a, it's a campaign promise. It's not like uh, we can just try as much to hold them to their words, but they don't have what it takes to be able to deliver on these promises. Because in the first place, these promises, for some of us who heard it then, we knew, I mean, that, that's a tall one. How do you get 3 million people employed doing what? The best they did with this uh, Ministry of uh, Labor recent uh, uh, local government 774,000 uh, recruitment uh, for, for people to, to be trained, to be, to be trained in specific skills, for them to now be let out to try and set up their own businesses and later employ, could be one of those effects, could actually have one of those effects. And that's what we're talking about. A situation where government in itself can probably create an environment where you can help to skill the people who would start businesses and effectively now employ individuals who, by extension, reduces the unemployment rate. Now, when we talk about the rates, when we talk about the consequence of what the rate in itself has, has, has come to give, we have, a board, we have a group of students, minus what ASU itself has done. We are talking about a curriculum. We are talking about a system of education that is not helping this kind of processes to function well. That's what we are talking about. A system of education that I, has not come to the level at which we can have the students, when they come out, think more of setting up businesses as rather thinking of how they would go and get a job. Now, thinking of getting a job, how much of these job-related skills do they have? You know, even the schools, the universities, let's be specific now, the universities have not trained, and I doubt if they do, train the students on even how to package themselves for a job for a job uh, interview, they don't do that. So there is a there is a disconnect. The students come out thinking that by the time they get to a panel, all they will ask them is the theoretical knowledge that they have. But right. you and I know that there is a departure from the theory you know and the actual job that is required of you to do. Right, so Michelle, when there is such issue, here. it now has a blame. Government is expected to help review the educational system, adjust the curriculum, make it a more creative oriented, practical curriculum, which All will right, engender growth by right, extension of the country on, uh, through economic fortunes and the 
employee and, and, and staff uh, to be employed. All right, Shagun Shale, you know, these, um, you know, factors, you know, you know you've, you've uh, expressed, you know, yourself on numerous uh, plethora of uh, factors that have led us to where we are today. Um, um, I, I asked initially about the, the effect of COVID-19, and from what you're saying, uh, the COVID-19 isn't necessarily just to blame. You know, there's a lot of other factors that have come in uh, that, you know, have kept us where we are today. The current administration also have, has mentioned over time their plans to lift 100 million uh, Nigerians out of poverty. Um, they've also, of course, um, you know, re-energized the NPAR scheme, you know, to put uh, more Nigerians um, uh, to earn something or, or the other. Um, but if you also look at the United States, Donald Trump was praised for reducing the unemployment rate in the U.S. to um, record-breaking figures, you know, in the time that he was uh, president. Um, and it didn't take him, you know, decades to do that. What do you think that the current administration really should be doing, and not just saying, but doing, if we are serious about reducing the level of unemployment in Nigeria? Um, what are the immediate steps that you feel, you feel, you know, must be taken from today to ensure that we at least get more Nigerians out of poverty? Because the effects of this level of unemployment, you know, it's pretty obvious across uh, the country. Beautiful. Now, for government, the first thing is to continue with what they've started with the deployment of infrastructure. We talk about the United States and we're talking about Nigeria. That is a country that is far advanced when it comes to infrastructure deployment. We are having a massive infrastructure deficit, which makes us tag way behind to the United States. Now, to be able to make a change, just like as much as they have commenced in trying to the empower and so many other social schemes, there are numerous social schemes, so many interventions that government itself has even started. Even during the COVID, we saw the, uh, the, the, the level at which the CBA was even directly involved in ensuring that people don't get to close their businesses so that they will not lay off staff and allow the economy in itself to be able to bounce back. We are out of recession by reason of those little activities. It helped. But the holistic thing that will help reverse these rates, these rates are quite alarming. It's the highest in the history of this country. So for us to be able to do that, government should not just continue to pay lip service. Government should be more determined. We don't have the resources the United States have. Otherwise, we would have been able to, yes, within a short space, just like you have seen what uh, the current president, Joe Biden, is even trying to do. He has just signed a package, a one point, what, eight trillion dollars to, to, to be able to revitalize the economy of the United States. Do we have such funds? Do we, can we easily lay hold of one point, even a trillion naira in Nigeria? We have wow. issues that are beyond just uh, monetary. We have the systemic problem, we have the structural problem. There are so many issues. But what government can do is to first and foremost, if anything at all, try and reduce the level, the level of poverty. Trying to right. get 100 million people out of poverty is is rhetoric. Okay, it's just Mr. A tip. Mr. Thank you. Mr. What, at, Mr. What Shelley, are you going to do? Mr. Shelley, what indeed. We, we, need, we need answers, and we do hope the government gives us one soon enough to reverse this ugly unemployment rate. And we also have inflation rate here at over 17% in the country. Well, thank you very much for coming on The Breakfast this morning. Thank you right. so much for having me. Have a great day. Absolutely. Um, once again, you know, not just leap service, but actually action. Um, you know, no matter how many times we have... Um, meetings and we address the press and we speak about lifting 100 million, 100 million Nigerians out of poverty, none of these things will actually happen if we don't start, you know, moving, you know, or making those moves immediately. The environment that, you know, Shagun Shele spoke about, the, 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 the economic environment that we live in, um, electricity, security, um, and of course, uh, how, you know, the ease of doing business, you know, really in Nigeria really is realistically not the ones on paper, not the ones that you see um, in articles. It's, you know, what exactly is the business environment for Nigerians? Um, MSMEs and the ability and, the, you know, the space that they have to grow so that they can employ more people and put food on a lot of other tables. Um, All right. Tell you, really, always, we we, we would definitely to, come back to, to, this, uh, to this conversation, really. Absolutely. Well, let's uh, turn now to discuss religion and state after the break.
we do not understand, we will still matter it. What you can see is the remaining of the tanker that exploded. It's often equally confessed. Welcome back to The Breakfast on PLUS TV Africa. The Christian Association of Nigeria, CAN, has sued the federal government over the implementation of the Companies and Allied Matters Act, CAMA. On August 7th last year, the president signed the bill and uh, the Christian Association are not happy about this. It's generated a lot of controversy and uh, opposition, especially by the Christian body in Nigeria. And to discuss this, we've invited the president of CAN and the Nigerian Baptist Convention, the vice president of Baptist World Alliance, Reverend Dr. Samson Olashupo. Good morning and thanks for joining us. Good morning, thank you. How are you doing? I'm great, thanks for being here. So section 839, one and two of the CAMA Act uh, basically empowers the government and the CAC to take over the uh, function, the running of the church and to uh, basically suspend the trustees of the church. But statesmen from CAN we've seen has described this as a satanic section of the act of an ungodly law. How is this so? Thank you, moderator. The violations of fundamental human rights in Kama is more than section 839. It begins with section 17, in particular, section 17 2A downwards. Okay. It, the section 17 2A says that the association or any individual any group that wants to take the corporate affairs commission to, to court, overcome or any issue, must give 30 days free action notice to corporate affairs commission. An individual cannot go to court directly, we must first of all go to the person that they want to go to take to court to state the cause of action particulars of the claim, name and place of abode of the intending plaintiff, and release of all those provisions are against the constitution of Nigeria. Under the constitution of Nigeria, we, I can sue, any association can sue, and be sued. So if a corporate affairs commission which is operating under the constitution of Nigeria is creating another process of taking people to court, then they have violated the constitution of Nigeria. That is section 72, A, B, C, etc., etc. If you go and read it, up to D, the relief sort must even be stated. I want to take you to court. You say I cannot take you to court unless I have contacted you first. Where is such a law made okay. in the entire world? Reverend Olashipo. It is... It is Reverend Olashipo, yes, I, I want you to clarify why CAN, as a religious body in Nigeria, is so opposed to the bill, saying it's a declaration of war. We also saw one of the of, you know, popular pastors in Nigeria uh, were talking about the presiding bishop of the Living Faith Church Worldwide, David Oedipo, saying, in quote, this can never work. Why the opposition now, to this if, bill? Yeah, yeah, if you go to section 8391, they say the commission may order, may by order suspend the trustees of an association and appoint an interim manager or manager to manage, manage the affairs of an association where it is reasonably, be, um, it, it reasonably believes that there is this, there is that, there is that. The, the reason is satanic, is that number one, the, the church is 
class, classified together with secular associations operating under the same law. Each association has its nature and its mission. The church is essentially secret. It is not like any other business enterprise. And the, of course, the church is not for business. The, the, the church is for the salvation of the souls of men and women. So the, in that law, there must be a, a separation of the church because of its nature and its mission from any other company like uh, Julius Baga, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. I, I'm sorry to mention it. So the, you cannot just say that the, the, the law you are using, the rule you are using for an association, which is a company, a commercial entity, is the same thing you are going to use for the church. It's lack of respect for the nature and the mission of the church in Nigeria. If it is operated elsewhere, where they don't take the sacred aspect of life as important, it cannot operate here in Nigeria. We are our faith in the Lord and the God we serve is so important to us. The church is not a commercial entity. The church is a sacred body. All right. So help help us understand better, you know, why you know the church, you know, finds this satanic. Um, does it in any way take power from religious leaders? Does it take power from the Christian Association of Nigeria uh, to control the religious bodies in the country? And it has deprived the church. It has. The first thing I told you is that the church should be respected for its sacredness. When you take that sacred aspect from the church and classify it as secular, then it is satanic. Okay. All right. Satan does not recognize who God is and the, 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 the unique position of God. The church should be respected for what it is. You okay. cannot classify the church as a commercial organization. Well, it, it, which, 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 pro, which, which good are we producing? Robert, so there I must be respect for the nature and the mission of the church in Nigeria. Reverend Ayokunle, I want to Otherwise, draw your attention to church. something. Um, so Reverend Ayokunle, can you hear me, sir? Are you there? I'm listening. Okay. In the US, in Canada, I'm in Britain, they have laws that are similar to Kama. And I remember that in 2019, the United Kingdom uh, Charities Commission uh, you know, had conducted a five-year investigation into the United Kingdom branch of Christ Embassy. And they found that about 827 million naira had been paid by the church to illegal entities or had been illegally paid to entities and individuals. That was a fraud that they convicted the church of. And that's what Kama Bill is you know, touted to prevent, to prevent fraud in the church, because they found that in the past, churches, charities have been used to launder, for, launder funds. But if the church is supposed to be open, transparent, and accountable, why the objection to Kama? I have told you, I think you are just saying what you want to say. You didn't listen to my explanation. The church is sacred. We are not saying that the church should not be monitored, but the church should be monitored as a sacred organization not as a secular organization. When you apply, uh, you use uh, the, the, the medicine that is supposed to, 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 to be used to kill cancer, you are using it for another disease, then you, it's a misnomer. All right, so, it's so, a wrong step entirely. Reverend we I are not mean... saying that the church will have anything, but the church will not be treated as a commercial entity, for God's sake. By its nature, by its mission, it is sacred. All right. So, Reverend Ayokunle, are you saying that it would be better for the government to create a bill just for the church that does not, you know, put the church and charities in the same, you know, bill? Is that what you? Is that what the church would prefer? That, that is exactly what we are saying. But our our groups with this law is more than just this aspect we are just emphasizing. I said that we have got problems with so many aspects aspect of karma because it, the, the many aspects violate the constitution of Nigeria, especially for the commission to, to tamper with the trusteeship of, of the church 
without the court action. Courts must be the one they will approach. Not that the commission will just, by its whims and caprices, continue to take action, and then the, the court is excluded. Okay. Why is the court there for Nigerians? No organizations could be bigger than the court. Uh, the corporate affairs commission is not bigger than the court in Nigeria. Every action that will lead to conspiracy or any action against any other organization must be given. The order must be given not by the commission but by the court. Okay. All right. Let me. Let's also now talk about the you know the uh, legal aspect of it. The Christian Association of Nigeria uh, apparently has sued the federal government. Um, how do you expect that this will play out? And uh, do you think that the that, that Khan has a strong case to be presented in court um, against Kama and the federal government? We are, by the grace of God, we have done our research. Uh, Kama is about 800 pages uh, uh, long. And uh, many people, Nigerians are very lazy. They wouldn't read it uh, line by line, word, word for word. The, the cry that we are making is not for the, the church alone. It's for you also speaking. Your organization is that law, line for line, word for word. All the, exclus the, 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 the ex exclusiveness of the, of the is a violation of the Constitution of Nigeria. Why, why do you Unless think... that concern is... Reverend Ayokunle, why do you think the president went ahead to sign this into law, uh, regardless of these perspectives that, you, you know, Khan has continuously mentioned? Well, I'm not in government, and I'm not the, the president. I think the, the best thing is to ask him the question, why he has gone ahead to sign such a law with, who, uh, whose uh, many, many parts violate the concern of Nigeria? All right. You know, we, of course, we'll continue to follow up and see where this uh, uh, case goes as uh, Khan, of course, has uh, gone to court. Uh, Aneta would also throw in something okay. before we go. Um, Reverend Ayakunle, I just wanted to throw this out there, right? Proponents of the bill, they point to the Bible and they quote the book of Romans, chapter 13, verse 1 to 6. And uh, permit me to read this. Um, th that part of the Bible says... Uh, that everyone must submit himself to governing authorities. And the verse reads, quote, for there is no authority except that which God has established. Consequently, he who rebels against authority is rebelling against God and rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgments on themselves. So how do you interpret this uh, verse of the Bible, Romans 13, 1 to 6, in light of the camobile? I am I'm afraid you have quoted that passage out of context. It has no relevance to what we are saying. We are not saying that we are not ready to obey the law, but the maker of the law also must not violate the law. If you have violated the law, you have got no right to compel anybody to obey you. The, every law that we make in the land must respect the grand norm, which is the constitution of Nigeria. This is a, a day of enlightenment. It's not a day of ignorance. I know my right. Why do you want to deprive me of my right when the concern does not deprive me of that right? That's what we are saying. And we are fighting for you, not for ourselves alone, for everybody. We are people that should talk. The people that know the law, if they have time to sit with this thing, they have, they, they have been dehumanized by many provisions and sections of this camera. Right. We are ready to obey if it is in consonance with the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria of 1999 as amended. But when it is violating it, then it is they have they have already made it a law that cannot be respected. All right, mm. Reverend Ayatollah, okay. thank you so much for uh, speaking with us this morning, and um, yes, you know, thank with you. all the details and as they emerge, we'll definitely be bringing thank you, you in again much. to clarify uh, thank some you of very all much. the details. Thank you. Have a great day. All right. Uh, good morning to you. We still have a lot uh, to talk about this morning. The East uh, uh, Eastern Corridor and, of course, uh, rail lines that we're coming up next with here on The Breakfast. Don't go anywhere. Good morning once again. A lot of the jobs that exist today will not exist in the next 10 years. 10 years. When I 
see people today shouting, we're not too young to run. We are ready to run. Ready to run to where? The people of excellence are, to a certain extent, being held ransom by idiots and bandits. Once you are in government, you believe everything you do is right. Mm. And once you are in opposition, everything the government does is wrong. And so it's time for us to take over power. Welcome once again. And now moving next to, of course, our conversation on the Eastern Rail Line. The question, of course, uh, Nigerians are asking and of course, uh, that we're bringing up this morning is why the narrow gauge for the Port Harcourt may degree link and, of course, uh, the standard gauge for other rail lines across the country. Uh, we're going to be speaking this morning with uh, engineer Ogolo, uh, of course, uh, who's joining us to quickly share his thoughts on, you know, this conversation. Engineer Fine Chima Ogolo is a representative of Nigerian Institute of Civil Engineers. Good morning. Thanks for joining, uh, joining us, sir. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning to you. All right, so now let's, you know, start morning, with, you know, asking uh, about the difference between, the actual difference between the standard uh, gauge line and, and the narrow gauge, and why this is a problem for the Eastern Corridor. Thank you very much. The railway system was inherited from the British colonialists. And uh, the thing started uh, early 1900s. All right, can you? As we know it in Nigeria, there are various narrow gauges. The narrow gauge, as we know it in Nigeria, is from the inner side of one rail to the other, is one point. 067 meters, 1067 millimeters. That is narrow gauge. Used to be three feet, six inches. That was what the British built for us and built for all their colonies. And we had two lines. The Western line starting from Lagos going all the way to Kaduna, to Unguru in present day Yobe State, with connections to Kanu, and so on. And we have the Eastern Line from Potako to Medugri, passing through Aba, Omoahia, Enugu, Makode, and uh, there was a connection, or there's a connection between the two lines, from Kaduna on the western line to Kafanchan, present-day Kaduna State, on the eastern line. That is what we inherited in 1960, and that was what we had when the Civil War broke out early 1967. But since then, since after the war, there were disruptions and abandonment, vandalization of the lines, and so on, until Obasanjo's uh, administration they started the rehabilitation of the lines. Initially, a contract was awarded to rehabilitate the two lines, the western line and the eastern line. Initially, they were to be rehabilitated as narrow gauge, but then, the very sharp curves were to be straightened. Very high gradients and coming down were to be straightened so that the speeds would improve. Our engineer, that was the initial idea. Yeah. Well, now you've mentioned speed. I think we probably should just get you know, further into it. I, I really want to us to understand better um, why it is a problem and why the... Okay, course, uh, so that was the, what we inherited. Yes. But now, since then, since then, we have had standard gauge throughout since this government came into power, and even before then. We have the Abuja Kaduna line, standard gauge. We have the Lagos Ebado line, standard gauge. We have just awarded the Ebado uh, 
uh, canoe line standard gauge. We, since uh, 1987, we've been building the Ajokuta Itabe, uh, Itabe Ajokuta Ware line, and it was completed by this uh, government, standard gauge. There is promise to extend to Warren Port and to extend it to Abuja, standard gauge. A new, brand new line was awarded from Kanu to Daura to Maradin Niger Republic, standard gauge. So what we have on the ground is everything in Nigeria now is standard gauge. Okay. But they, 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 As I said, the Western line has, is already standard gauge, and then any new construction is standard gauge. But when it came to the Eastern line, we went back to the old argument, oh, money, because standard gauge implies you have to threaten the sharp cost. Yeah, so, so you, you have don't... to threaten the gradients and so on to accommodate more high speeds. And in Angola, so you don't agree with the... the... So you don't agree with the government's narrative that it is you know, going to be more cost effective uh, to do a narrow gauge. No, and of course not, it, what I'm saying, the same could, argument that was put for Eastern gauge was put for Western gauge. But it was now thrown away and everything is standard gauge there. When you come to the uh, Eastern part, you now bring back all money, this, this, and that. Uh, you cannot borrow money, foreign loan, to start doing things that you know will not last, will be thrown away. That's what we are saying. Compatibility is the first ch challenge there. Nigeria as a whole has the challenge of single track everywhere. So if you are in one station, you have to wait for another train to pass from the opposite direction before even you continue your journey. We are saying as engineers, we don't waste money again. By coming to the east, you now say uh, eastern gauge. It uh, should be narrow gauge. When you want to transfer from Kaduna, from Kaduna to Kafanchan, you start offloading from the wagons that are a standard gauge, you start putting into the wagons that are narrow gauge. Okay. It is a completely un uneconomical waste of funds and so on, and will lead to confusion. A Engineer this Wallow. is why we are saying that everything should be standard gauge from now on okay. for better management to save costs and to do everything. Okay. Number two is Number two reason why we should go standard gauge throughout. Number two reason why we should go standard gauge throughout is many countries are phasing out the narrow gauge. Many countries, the only place you can see narrow gauge being used here and there is South Africa. We don't produce these things ourselves here. So in South Africa, you go and line up and book your order, and you wait, the cost, uh, the cost is more because you are waiting. The cost is more, and the special order. Okay, Engineer uh, Golo. From Japan, you can get. Engineer Golo, you can't see, I, I want us to Japan because they are adjustable rails. Okay. And so on. Okay, Engineer Golo. The third for people, is... for um, apologies to button, but for people who don't actually understand what we're talking about, they're hearing standard gauge and narrow gauge. I want you to actually break this down and tell us what are the advantages of using narrow gauge uh, railway and uh, f standard gauge? Because I've, I've read articles that said it's better to use narrow gauge for you know, areas that are hilly, and they say that that's more compatible with the eastern region. So what are the supposed advantages of using the uh, narrow gauge and the disadvantages as well? Yes, the argument that the eastern side is hilly is very faulty. The whole Nigeria, you have hilly area, terrain, you have a, a distance, and you have everything. So every side is the same thing. The argument before was on funding, because for, for standard gauge, you threaten in order to accommodate higher speeds. The curves cannot be too sharp. What we have on the ground now, the curves are very sharp in some areas. There was a job to strengthen the but it wasn't done well. So the present uh, uh, speed can be as low as 50 kilometers per hour to 100 kilometers per hour range. So to do the higher speeds of 150 to 250 kilometers per hour, you go to standard gauge. And as I said, the whole Western Nigeria has gone to standard gauge towards the north. The others that we are is just like Taiwo. You buy new dress for Taiwo. Then when you come to Kenya, you say, Kenya, they use your old dress. It will not work. 
Yeah, but, but so that is the first point. Yeah. The, 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 the first point is the money uh, part of it cannot be an argument. Why is that? There sir? is nothing like hilly side on the east and western side. The whole of Nigeria is the same thing. Now that we've gone to uh, standard gauge on the, on the west, we must do it again in the east for compatibility. Okay. Also, to join from one lane to the other, from Kaduna to Kafanjan, for example, you need to start up offloading what you have to put on the tracks because the rails, the wheels are made to agree with the rails. Do you As agree, I said, the narrow the... gauge is, uh, is uh, 1.067 meters, while the standard gauge is 1.435 meters gauge. So the two uh, coaches can never work. You yes. have to offload let's, from let's, one to the other if you are joining. Yeah, and it's so one thing I was going to bring up, you know, uh, you know, a lot later if we had the time for it. You know, if, if we can connect the standard and the narrow gauge. But that, from what you're saying, it's not uh, possible. Um, but I want you to quickly respond to the minister, Rotimi Amechi, who says that, you know, it's best that we do this now because of the funds that are available. And then we can, you know, later in the future, you know, get, um, you know, a standard gauge running. It says uh, because of the time frame also that we have, to ensure that these things, you know, immediately start running, then let's make do with this first. That's what it sounds like. Um, so do, would you, you know, allow... No, 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 you don't do that. You don't do that. I'm sorry. You don't do that because we are borrowing foreign loan. The repayment is even from oil and gas mainly, gotten from this area that must suffer the narrow gauge, continue with the sharp bends and so on. The oil and gas for repaying these loans are from this area. So that argument does not hold water. As I said, new awards have been on standard gauge. The former narrow gauge on the left had been awarded a standard gauge. So uh, pleading money is no distance. But still, you can take it in stages. You can do what I call Enugu, for example, Enugu, Makodi, and so on. You go in stages as you have money available. But you do not borrow a foreign loan to do something now. Then 30 years' time, when you are still struggling to repay the loan, you say you want to change to standard gauge again. It will not work. For they say there are some other parts that will be standard gauge. And the arrangement for this uh, line is to extend it to Owere, to extend it to Abakliki, to extend it to some other areas, Kalapa, and so on. Then you extend it to Boniport. You are extending the narrow gauge to all these areas. Meanwhile, the western gauge, the western line, is all standard gauge. So the people on the eastern gauge will feel discrimination against them. In fact, the, they are talking of the eastern gauge carrying mainly law gauge. So the one of using it for transportation will not apply. They will not even bother. Okay. Yet, the western side is already enjoying from uh, Lagos to, to uh, Lagos to Ebado. It's already on standard gauge. Okay, Engineer Ogolo. And we have already Engineer Abuja Ogolo. to Kaduna standard gauge. Engineer Ogolo, we understand the grievances of the Nigerian Institution of uh, Civil Engineers. They're saying, you know, for interconnectivity purposes, it's better to use a standard gauge rather than a narrow gauge. But this is what the federal government has decided. So on your part, is the Nigerian Institution of Civil Engineers going to do anything, maybe write petitions to the government for them to change their mind and change the plan so that we have uniformity, uniformity of the rail, railway lines in the country? We believe the federal government was not well advised. So as engineers, we feel we should advise them better. You do not take a foreign loan to build something that is virtually being abandoned everywhere else. Then our children and grandchildren will be paying foreign loan for what we know is not standard enough. I'm saying, is there any fact, official... There is there any official... Is there any official communication with the engineers to the government so that this can be done properly, uh, you know, according to, according to you? Engineer Ogolo. Well, for Patako Branch Nigerian Society of Engineers, we've released a statement uh, stating exactly our views on this and to save money. We've also Nigerian Institution of Civil Engineers, Patako Chapter, we've also released a statement stating the views and advising government that it will be penny wise, pound foolish 
to go on uh, narrow gauge with the foreign loan now. All right, and, and you know, in 20 years' time or so, you think you will uh, start building standard gauge. Do the correct thing now. And so you know, that Gola, frustration and people like this side will feel that you are marginalizing them. Okay. It is not uh, worth it. Absolutely. Politically, you build something for people to appreciate. The people will not appreciate it. They will think you are marginalizing them. Okay. All right. The worst of all is that the money for paying thank back you, thank you is very on much. this side, which you are saying they should manage. They and, should manage narrow gauge. And you know, the Chima Ogola, thank you very much. We would have to end it here. We would have to we'll have to end the conversation here. Um, th this is definitely going to be a you know a conversation that would last for a while, and so we we'll definitely be inviting you again to share your thoughts. You know, when there's feedback from the Nigerian government or from the minister uh, on you know in response to the Nigerian Institution of Civil Engineers. Thank you once again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Absolutely. Uh, the conversation, you know, of course, uh, continues here on The Breakfast and PLOS TV Africa. We're now going to be speaking next with uh, Presidential uh, Senior Special Assistant in Public Affairs, Ajuri Ngalali. Um, also, uh, on the Eastern Corridor and the rail lines, the conversation between a narrow gauge and a standard gauge, um, you know, what exactly are the challenges and, of course, so what does the government really intend to achieve with uh, a narrow gauge? And that comes up right next. for upcoming artists to blow in Nigeria. Welcome to Plus Trending. I am Bukin Vemba, your host, saying thank you for joining us on today's episode. Welcome back. It's tea time on Plus TV Africa. Practice makes perfect. I'm not perfect yet, but I'm a lot better than I used to be. He's a king. He's entitled to marry a hundred if he wants to. Welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. We're now continuing our conversation and debate over the Eastern uh, rail line and the narrow gauge versus the standard gauge. And we're now being joined by the Presidential Senior Special Assistant on Public Affairs, Ajuri Ingilali. Good morning and thanks for joining us. Good morning to you, my dear sister and brother, and thank you for having me. All right. We just had a conversation with a representative of the Nigerian Institution of Civil Engineers, and he explained the concerns of you know, the engineering body in Nigeria as to you know, why the government would pick a narrow gauge over the, Eastern, over the standard gauge. He mentioned a lot of factors, and I wanted to start with uh, the marginalization of the East that he mentioned. According to him, the narrow gauge has been phased out in many parts of the world. He says it's outdated and that there will be issues with interconnectivity, you know, being able to move from the narrow gauge to the standard gauge, there'll be a lot of challenges with that. He also mentioned that if the standard gauge has been, you know, what has been in use in other parts of the country, why the Eastern, why the narrow gauge for the Eastern rail line? And he's asking, would there be any marginalization here? or letting the government know that that could be how it's been perceived. How do you react to that? Thank you very much uh, for all of these uh, legitimate concerns and observations. Uh, I would just start by saying that you can trust Nigerians uh, to uh, attribute uh, some form of political or ethnic dimension to just core infrastructural matters. Uh, let, let me just say very quickly uh, that the way this works, is we're talking about a comparison between the Western Corridor, uh, which is the lagos abeokuta Ibadan line, which is a standard gauge line. Uh, you're talking about under 200 kilometers, there about. Uh, you're now, uh, not you, but people are now comparing that uh, to a 1,400 kilometer line uh, that if you want to do standard gauge all the way through, will cost the nation 14, one, four, 14 billion U.S. dollars uh, at a time when we have a revenue crunch, at a time when we are still trying to deal with how we are going to uh, bridge a 50-year infrastructural deficit across schools, hospitals, airports, seaports, power plants, dams, farms, uh, roads, bridges, and the like. 
uh, $14 billion on one rail line, uh, I think all of us can agree, is a whole lot of money. Uh, so this is a strictly financial matter and what makes the most sense for the country at this moment in time. Now, with that said, uh, you're comparing, uh, that is now being compared with the Western Corridor Line, Lagos to, uh, to uh, uh, Abeokuta, uh, to Ibado. Uh, that is uh, approximately $1.9 billion. Uh, $1.9 billion versus uh, potentially $14 billion. I think, I think uh, Nigerians, uh, we are very... Uh, we are very practical people. We're very pragmatic. I think that the most Nigerians who understand the finances of what I have just mentioned, the Agreed. links that I have just mentioned, will understand why it is that at this moment in time, we could not embark on a standard gauge rail line uh, for Portaco to Medjugorje at this moment. That Ajuri, is not now Ajuri, hold on. be in future plans. But at this moment, we needed that development on the ground. And I think I need to add very quickly, my brother, if you don't mind, that we must also acknowledge the fact that we had done a very extensive economic analysis of the rail lines in this country. We found that the Western Corridor we're talking about, uh, from Lagos to Ibadan to, to Kad, carries about 30 million tons of economic goods and services annually, as against the uh, 11 million uh, tons of the Eastern Corridor, the Potako to Meduguri axis. So what we are saying is that if you have a line that is doing three times uh, the economic value uh, of, of, of the other rail line. It only makes sense to make the, the primary investment in the rail line that is dealing with 75% of the nation's import and export flows. That's just basic economic uh, calculation. So I think anybody attributing the notion of marginalization to this, uh, when we are spending $3 billion on this, on this line, which is even more than the Western Corridor, uh, Lagos... Adjuri, 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 Adjuri th this has been described as... Uh, new rail stations in all capitals of this country. Kindly hold on. Uh, all of that. Adjuri, I think, I think Adjuri, Adjuri, kindly hold on. This has been described as penny-wise, pound-foolish. Um, and regardless of, you know, how much, you know, we're discussing that has been spent on it, you know, because, of, like the minister says, uh, Ratima Mechi said, you know, that, you know, it, it sounds like what he's saying is let's make do with this for now, and later we can then invest, you know, and of course get a standard gauge uh, line. So do doesn't that, you know, isn't it better to make the, the proper investments now and get a standard gauge line running instead of spending $3 billion and then planning that later in the future will then, you know, change to a standard gauge line? No, 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 not at all. Uh, first of all, we have to understand something. Um, we have been searching for the $14 billion. By the way, uh, let me just say it here for those who do not know, right? Uh, when uh, the Minister of Transportation, Rotim Mianechi, approached President Mohamedou Buhari concerning the Portaco to Medjugorje line, it was President Mohamedou Buhari that said, look, I only want a standard gauge. I want a standard gauge. Let us go and find the financing for that $14 billion standard gauge. That is what I want. It was the minister who prevailed on him and said, sir, the reality is we have searched everywhere for where we will get financing of $14 billion for this line. And at this very moment, it is not forthcoming. So it is better for us to get economic activity on that particular rail corridor uh, on a line that will not ever become moribund. See, I want to explain something very quickly. But do you agree? Um, do you agree? Uh, we, we need to work with time, Ajiri. But do you agree that... Um, we are not spending money correctly here because there's also concerns about maintenance. You know, they've said that these um, narrow gate lines have been phased out in, the, you know, in other countries in the world. So if we are doing this, does it you know, also not become a problem that is something that would be difficult for us to maintain, it's difficult for us to get trains for, difficult for us to keep running because no. we, we don't have you know, any of no, these resources not. here? Yes, thank you very much for the question. First of all, uh, that is factually inaccurate. Uh, what that man stated is simply not true. You have, you have countries in, in, in Southeast Asia, as well as uh, other parts of Africa, that are building narrow gauges right now. Uh, so those rail lines still have viability. That is not true at all. Uh, I want to be very clear about the difference in terms of specifications. The narrow gauge that everybody is trying to make, uh, to be, uh, make it out to be that it's very useless. It runs up to 100 kilometers an hour. For comparison, the Abuja Kaduna standard gauge that we all talk about is about 120 kilometers per hour in terms of operate, operating speed. You're talking about a difference of 20 kilometers per hour. And we're making it sound like it's 200 kilometers per hour difference. So that's number one. Number two, President Mohamedou Buhari 
also put in place uh, a mandate that anybody coming to the country to build rail line must now, they have to build railway university. We have two universities coming up, one in River State, one in uh, uh, Katsina State, which is going to transfer the technology so that we can maintain our own narrow gauge and standard gauge rail lines. But I want to emphasize that these, this standard gauge is still going to be moving heavy cargoes through the eastern corridor of this country into the eastern ports. And so it's never going to be useless. Even when we build the standard gauge, that, uh, that uh, narrow gauge is still going to be very useful in terms of moving these large-scale goods, taking them off our roads, and moving them directly into the ports. Okay, even Ajuri, we, have the standard gauge, uh, Ajuri uh, we, we understand your argument here, but just lastly, is there any chance that the government might change its mind? You know, seeing all the opposition to this, people are saying the standard gauge is more durable, it has the capacity to to, you know, take more, more weight, it's even faster and all of that. Is there any possibility that the government might change its mind, backtrack, and then, you know, invest in the standard gauge for durability and, you know, for sustainability in the long term? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit surprised that we feel in this country that we cannot walk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, it is possible for us to build a, a, a narrow gauge line that can deal with the heavy cargoes that can deal with the heavy uh, economic, uh, you know, cargoes that will be coming through uh, that axis, even as we now plan forward toward the standard gauge. I think for us to say that we must only have standard gauge, that is not how it has been done anywhere in the world. Most of these countries, they had their, they, they went through time, they went through a progression where they had the narrow gauge, then they had the standard gauge. Now many of them have even gone beyond the standard gauge into the very, very high speed bullet trades. So, so it's a progression. For us, no line is going to be useless. I've, I've already stated here that the difference is about 20 kilometers okay, per hour. So basically you're saying the speed. government I, is going okay. ahead with the narrow gauge, despite the opposition to it. Absolutely we are. Absolutely we are. Absolutely right. going ahead. And I think the opposition is not much, just in the quarters of those who, did, who had the chance to build these rail lines and absolutely failed. Even narrow gauge, they couldn't do it. Well, um, also to clarify, you know, it, it, it might be stated uh, as maximum speed 100 kilometers per hour, but it doesn't always hit 100 kilometers per hour. You know, it's, it's, it always is around 65 to 70 uh, kilometers per hour. But uh, just to put that out there. Uh, Ajuri, thank you very much for your time this morning. We see thank that you're you. on the road. Um, and, of course, we would like to have another conversation um, about this when we have more time. Uh, good morning once again. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. God bless all of you. Take care. All right. Um, that's, you know, the most that we can share with you this morning. It's been a pretty tense morning uh, mm -hmm. from, of course, uh, reverends to uh, engineers and uh, also economists, you know, a lot earlier. But thanks for, for staying with us. If you missed out on any of it, remember to join us on our social media platforms. It's simply at Plus TV Africa, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Same thing with our YouTube channel. Yes, thank you very much for staying tuned. I am Aneta Felix. The news comes up next. I am Osao Gye Ogbonwa. Bye-bye. an unusual year for us all. We've been forced to learn to adapt to the changes that COVID-19 has brought upon us. However the cards may have been dealt to us this year, we have remained resilient. The Afrima Fashion Show stems from the Afrima Award Show, which is the biggest African award show in the diaspora. Every year we have showcased designers and we bring together people from all over the world. This year, the Afrima Runway is gauged by the top three African designers who have welcomed the challenge of doing a virtual runway show without any physical audience. Don Murphy, Ese Ezanabo, and lastly, Sai Sanko. Let the show begin.
guys, my name is Sai Sanko and I am a luxury resort wear designer and I make the most amazing and fabulous kaftans and everything that you desire for traveling. <laughs> I just really love the way women carried themselves back then, you know, the Marilyn Monroe's, you know. It was it was sexy, but there was still glamour to it, you know, and elegance and sophistication. And I feel that's what my designs are about, you know. I've also been inspired just by my continent, the continent of Africa. Growing up in Sierra Leone, it's just this beautiful, bustling colors, you know, it's so vibrant, the marketplaces, you know, Christmas, it's just, everything about it is just so energetic and it's so powerful and colorful and it just makes me really happy. And so no matter um, what collection I do, it always goes back to that. And so that's why you see all this colorful prints and all these bold colors, you know. Um, I feel women wearing it, it just makes them so extremely happy, you know, and they look absolutely gorgeous in it too. My name is S.A. Grimbowski, and I am the designer and owner for S.A. as an Abor Atelier. My source of inspiration for my designs, number one, to be honest, comes from God because I go to sleep literally and dream about my designs. And that only has to be from God. So I always give credit to him for that. And of course, my culture is very influenced in my design. I've been designing since I was eight years old. Uh, even before that, my mom would tell me wild stories of me taking her fabrics and cutting them into pieces and making a dress or a skirt or, or pants out of her expensive African materials that she had in, a, in our home back in Nigeria when I was growing up. And I draw a lot of inspirations from where I've been uh, and I just try to tie them into uh, modern design mixed with vintage designs, mixed with traditional looks, and just tie it all together in a bowl to create a true essay as an abor uh, couture piece. Oh.
my name is Daniel Mofo. I'm the founder and designer of um, Don Morphy, a men's luxury custom suit uh, clothing in Dallas, Texas. Fashion is um, color. In the past, men were all very scared of you know, the colors. They were used to the blacks, the grays. But now, if you look at um, fashion, men wear almost bold, bolder colors than women. You, know? you see men in, in red suits, men in yellow suits, men in pink suits. So for me, fashion is color.
is expressive. So when I just wake up and have an idea and I create something out of that idea, it's God sure enough. So that's what it is for me. I've always been a little bit shy, but when it comes to fashion, I will wear anything and I will wear it with confidence. And so for me, that is a way of expressing myself, you know? And I feel it also is the same thing for a lot of women. African for me means community, it means um, living together. Um, if you look at Africans, they're all talking about the different countries in Africa, you know, it's all about our community. So for me, Africa means community, it, lives, it means living together. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they would like. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. Hi, long time no see. You're welcome to The Advocate on PLUS TV Africa, where five of us discuss five thought-provoking topics in an atmosphere of seriousness, decisiveness, and a little bit of laughter. However, we do not mince words, and like we say, no holds bad. Today, I'll be speaking about the status quo of the Nigerian leadership and the constant fight for hope as a Nigerian. Balan is warning traders who blocked food supply, warning their Warning them that Egungu to be careful. Liberos is advocating deeply on the importance of good governance, while Chuka is asking all Nigerians to condemn both old and new governments. So we have a new, so that we can have a new Nigeria. And finally, Jimoke, well, first let me say, good to meet you, finally, <laughs> and happy birthday. Thank you. So Jumoke is posing a question as she asks, who is Nigeria's next Messiah? So please stay with us, and we'll be right back. Leadership, hope, and the status quo. Well, first let me say that it's great to be back on The Advocate after a long hiatus. Um, now that I'm back, living in Nigeria today takes a special brew of courage, resourcefulness, a little bit of apathy, but plenty spoonfuls of craziness. Indeed, I'm tired assailed, fatigued by the daily dose of misery and death. I mean, it's, it's a bit like living in a real Mad Max movie set. Yet people like Liberus, he gives me courage, he gives me hope. He keeps talking, challenging the status quo, fighting in the hope that somehow, someday, Nigeria can become great again. It is possible that we may yet pull this nation out of the dark from the abyss. I hope so, for the sake of our children. However, Nigeria is presently constituted and governed stuff. That requires something that even the current political class seem to be greatly deficient in. Which brings me to the main issue that I want to table today. The remarkable absence of hope, the narrative of hope that's missing in all the discourse on a vision for a better Nigeria. It is the business 
and the trademark indeed, I, I will say, of politicians all over the world to sell to their people a picture of hope and a vision of a better future. I might even add that it's the responsibility of leaders to sell hope. However, when listening to the current crop of political leaders lately, all I hear is the raucous noises of cows, death, doom, and despair. Indeed, I've said this before on this platform, that I think it bears repeating that any country that fails to present a vision of a better country and instead fashions weapons of war against its young persons clearly has no future. Elected leaders must do their jobs, not only to provide security and welfare, but also to present clear visions of hope and inclusive progress for all citizens and residents. If you listen to the leaders of Dubai, Sheikh Al Maktoum, James talk, you hear about his grand plans for, for his country and the people in terms of the direction where they're going. If you, if you hacking back, you know, 50 years and hear President J the late Kennedy talked about America in the 60s, he painted a vision of, of great American progress, of exceptionalism in science and manufacturing. You don't see good leaders blaming ghosts from the past. In Nigeria, we're consumed instead by talks of cows and herders, which are indeed relics of a past which we, you know, stubbornly hold on to. Same way our politicians who are used to funding adulation of supporters and are not used to any sort of criticisms. So any, any attempt to criticize them, they'll consider it disrespect. And in fact, they'll say they label you a hater. And some may even go as far as uh, labeling your, your criticism as hate speech. That's the world we live in now. So what vision of Nigeria do we hope to present to this new generation of young people who are not accustomed to the old ways, the old ways of the oversensitive generation, people who have who've been nurtured by the internet, yet assaulted by the failures of their own state, people who are accustomed to the ways of distant societies, yet they're living in uh, the stark reality of sc pervasive scarcity and the abundance of opportunities that the world presents. So you can imagine how frustrated some of these young people can be, willing to work hard, yet the opportunities are far in between. Some, indeed, they're told to keep quiet, be more respectful, and wait for your turn. Wait for your turn in the raging sea of despair. And sadly, if we go back to the NSAS protests, which took place last October, when millions of young people filled the streets to peacefully protest, calling for an end to police brutality, what they got in return we're not words of, of vision of a more just society. Instead, they got even more brutality. And indeed, more threats and actions continue. That tells young persons in no uncertain terms that a vision of a country, a better country they yearn for, is lost. And instead, they should settle for a status quo of injustice and suffering. On October 20th, 2020, that day broke my heart. It broke me in many pieces. It took something from me something that I doubt I can ever find again. I lost hope. Ah, uh, if people like you would say that they lost hope, I wonder what, um, you know, the everyday, everyday Nigerian would, um, would, would say. Uh, because really, um, I agree with you, everything you have said, and there's really nothing to look forward to in terms of hope. But we just can't lose hope. We have to keep hoping. Right. And for me, in most cases, I think we are the ones that will have to sometime rise and say, you know what, we need to take it back and make it better. Because, like you said, if we keep waiting for them to make it better, it's, 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 it's we'll lose happen. hope, Taya. Well, we try to paint a picture of how it ought to be. And I try very hard not to compare Nigeria with any other country, be it Western or African country, because we're a continent of our own with over 400 ethnicities. But what is a democracy? It's a government of all of us for all of us. So when we try to paint that picture, like you mentioned in your advocacy, they call you a hater because some few people are paid to not see everything that is going wrong. So you're the one person who is pointing it out. To say, you cannot compare human life to the life of a cow. They say you're a hater. <laughs> I'm flabbergasted. Um, October 20 um, was a very sad day in the annals of Nigeria's history. But, but for me, um, along with every other thing that we need to do about the incident of that day, one other thing we must not fail to do 
is to get more participatory in the process. I have asked myself, the protest, the, the, the police that was at, at the center of that uh, uh, protest, has it been reformed? Not has yet. anything changed? Not yet, sir. Absolutely nothing has changed. The police remains brutal. They continue to do the same thing they were doing before that time. Sugar. So can we just get more participatory in the process, including this generation? Can we hijack even the, the, the parties, if it is possible? Sugar. You know. but, but really, I'm maniacally, I'm maniacally bewildered, <laughs> uh, seriously, that uh, anybody would think that government would do it differently you know, during that protest. So, Chuka. Yeah, I mean, the government, as we know it, um, is hell bent on blocking any attempt to modernize the country. So, I think that, you know, the only the way we could, I don't know, the way we could make, bring back hope for someone like Emeka um, involves quite a lot. I mean, it's something that's close to. And somebody what like I you too, will, because uh, we talk about <laughs> <later>. run away. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear? Huh? I said we need to bring hope back to people like you too, because you run away. <laughs> oh no no no! I am very. I am in Nigeria in spirit, and I shall be back shortly. Carry on. <laughs> But the beggar is here in Jessica, but uh, he has moved to Europe in spirit. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, it is the failure of Nigeria that is the reason I am here for True. a few months Obviously. of this year. If it wasn't for the failure of the country, after 60 years of independence, I shouldn't be here at all. There's nothing much for me to have been here if everything was working fine. So I think it all sort of ties in with what Emeka is saying. Where is the hope? What's going to change? How is it going to change, you know? Well, um, you know, just to round off, I, I, I believe that, as I said in that piece, that um, political leaders, in as much as we're grappling with all the challenges, cows, herders, and all the difficulties, I think they should also make an attempt to project a measure of hope. hope. Yeah, especially absolutely. to young people, very, very. in your speeches, in the, in the things you do, yeah. in your actions, give hope to the people. And so, I've said my piece, um, but after this break, uh, Golan is bringing out his egungun as he speaks on the food blockage from the north to the south. So please stay with us. We can't talk about education reform if we don't decolonize our education system. What we do not understand, we will stigmatize. Because it's just cultural, it's, and I think it's just human nature. They stop paying no salary. I don't like remembering it. I am angry at Nigeria. I'm angry at this government which seems to be letting us down. I'm angry at us as a people. In the process of struggling to free myself from his hand, he tore my pants and jumped um, away me. Yes, I commit the first training. Children. Do you know where you are going? I say, I'm going to America. I say, oh. Now, so that they talk, you are going to Libya. You to America. As it then do mark our place, some people will die now. This is PLOS TV Africa. Big stories live here. Egogo, be careful. Egogo is a Yoruba word. Uh, or you both call it masquerade. They are supposedly spirits of the dead visiting the living. Since they are supposed to be spirits, Egungun's wear a regalia. Yorubas call it a coup. That shrouds the identity of the wearer. The Egungu is accompanied by a guide called the Atokun. And among other things, it is the role of the Atokun to ensure that the Egungun, having covered its eyes, does not fall into a ditch or any other accident situation. This informed the message of Egungun Be Careful, in which an Egungun was dancing onto the expressway. And the Atokun had to send out the warning, Egungun Be Careful, now express with the go. So, of course, Egungun is not a spirit after all, but a human being in the regalia. If he enters the expressway without looking out for vehicles, he will be dead meat. So when some associations chose to block foodstuff from crossing over to the south, 
because the federal government did not pay them compensation for losses incurred during the NSAS protest, the Egungu Be Careful message becomes instructive. Because in the real sense, the Egungu was dancing onto the expressway in full regalia. First, NSAS losses did not have ethnic coloration. And there is absolutely no basis for a section of the society to think that the federal government should selectively pay them compensation. If anything, don't they know where the seat of the federal government is to go and make their demands? Secondly, who truly do these associations represent? Is it the northern farmer who has a truckload of tomato or pepper to sell? Certainly not. Someone said, but they threatened to take these items to Cameroon and other neighboring countries to sell. Yes, that is possible, but it is still illogical. When a Cameroon market that used to receive one truckload of tomatoes daily suddenly receives four, what will happen to the price? So the idea of taking those produce to create glots in neighboring countries also doesn't add up. Now wash. Another person said, oh, they just want to punish the South. But hey, a whole lot of Northerners here in the South are involved in the retail business of food items. So when you cut off supply, you not only punish Southerners, you're also punishing millions of Northerners whose livelihood depend on retailing these food items. That is to say, even this punishing South story does not make sense. It doesn't make sense that a Nigerian farmer or trader will choose to exclude itself from Lagos the largest market with the highest effective demand in the entire sub-region, and then head for the desert to sell its produce because he feels that some people sitting in Abuja were winning. It defies logic. Dear associations, your economics must be very poor. And obviously, you are neither representing the farmer nor the traders. You are mere rent seekers. If this blockade lingers and the South chooses to replace you as a supply source, you may never recover that market. Remember, there is land, there is water, there is sunshine in the South. So let your egungu be careful because na express you they go so. From the perspective of a hard-working northern farmer or the trader who has bought truck loads of foodstuff, the blockade doesn't make sense. So we must ask those associations in whose interest. I'll give you my thoughts. It is politicians and their greedy rent seeker friends that are playing games. And it was a dangerous game. However, as the truck was approaching this Egungu at high speed, somehow he heard the Atokun's voice and scampered off the expressway. Else, the consequences might have been well above what the little minds of the schemers could have contemplated. I hope the lessons of this event were taken. Ah, well taken, sir. Are you when sure? The, ah, well taken, no bros. No. When the tomatoes no. that you used to sell no. for 12,000 naira no. went to 2,000 naira, no Those one was still buying. Those are not the lessons for me. I must say, those are not the lessons. The lessons have not been taken. The lessons are, you know, when you sit down up north and think that um, you don't need the south, or that you sit down in the south and think you don't need the north. Now, with this, the lesson is that we need each other. True. And, and so this idea of we are better off than these other people, we should drop it. You decide not to sell to the south. And then also, let's not even deceive ourselves. With this, it is obvious that the North need the South even much more than the South need the North. I agree. That we can't hide it away from. I agree. Yes, the South is a supply market. The, like you said, if they decide to replace you, those Cameroon that you take your tomatoes to, some of them were complaining that they got there, they already had these stuffs. And, and so at the end of the day, some of them even ended up giving them away. Yes, yes. I heard they so gave them away. So some traders had to use flight to ferry their goods to the south because they were not part of all of this. Yeah. Now they have graduated, they have called it off, yes. pretending to hold, hold a meeting. Like you said, it is the politicians. And I look at, I saw Yaya Bello, I don't know what to call him, I'm Fanny Kyle, 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 Kyle peace broker. pretending to <laughs> broker peace. And I look at these clouds. Peace between who and who now? Which uh, the, <laughs> the, the headers, 
the tomato sellers and the presidency. It's, it's yes. crazy. I, I think for me, um, the lesson or the sad part of this is just the narrative that we've gotten to the point where over the last four to five years, we've seen the schism, the, 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 the divide within Nigeria has grown. And you were talking within your piece of north, south. I mean, as I, was, as I said during the, before we got on, I grew up in the barracks. There's no north, north south. south, you know. Um, and I, I, I went to command school, you know. There's, it's only in the last couple of years we're beginning to see that divide, you widen. know, grow, widen, and become the edges. It's not just that they, 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 they've grown apart, but they've become sharp, hmm. and very sharp. And that's the problem where we have this narrative of north, south. But like Libero said, clearly we, we, we need each other. Um, both, you know. But I, I think the sum of it for me is that it shows that we're a country of two parts. Obviously. And we're a country of two, two parts at least. And we need to sit down again to, yeah. to have a conversation well, about yeah. how we, we, want, to, we yeah. want to come together. True. True. And not just this force thing where we buy military fiat, by decrees and by constitution, True. which was foisted on us by the, say, this is how we, you know, you hear people, politicians and government people say, um, it, 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 nothing is non-negotiable in Nigeria. I mean, <laughs> even Chuga. in the UK, had, they had referendums yes. and they yeah. had all kinds of things. You can't Chuga. say that. Oh, someone said that the UK that even amalgamated us, <laughs> they have now they Brexited. Have yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, Chuka. I think that the, 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 the North-South divide in Nigeria is, is really not a new thing. Because if I think back to when we were in secondary school, we were in Federal Government College Warri, which was a unity school. Truth is that I remember very carefully that during the elections for the vice secretary of our union, of, of the Students' Council, the winner almost always tended to be from the North. Because the northern students voted on mass for the northern candidate. And it was the only way a southern boy could win that vice secretary was if he was able to key into the northern votes, or there was no northerner that year willing to come forward to compete. I remember it very, very clearly. And, mean, and meanwhile, when it, it didn't work the other way around because when a very brilliant chap called Ibrahim Hadou. Hadou went for it. Out of a thousand votes, he got nine hundred and something because everybody voted for Bradu for Ibrahim Hadou. Because he was and brilliant. So it is the South have been slow in being sectional. Basically, is what I'm saying. Mm. And the, you know, the North. It's like they teach them from a young age sectionalism. Mm. That's the problem. That's a problem we have. Yeah. Well. Liberos is next after the break as it points out the importance of good governance. According to Frank Hubert, good governance never depends upon laws, but upon the personal qualities of those who govern. The important element of governance are followership and the leaders, emphasis mind though. Unfortunately, in Nigeria, the followers are no different from the leaders. Hence, I say, a country wanted. Research revealed that the 10 consistent skills of great leaders are integrity, ability to delegate, communication, like Emeka had talked about, self-awareness, gratitude, learning agility, influence, empathy, courage, and respect. 
Considering the above, who amongst our rulers can we truly call a leader in Nigeria? Starting from our local government to the state assembly, governors, national assembly, and even the president. By the time you find the answer, America or China, go don't go Neptune, come back. The reason good leadership in public sector across board has consistently eluded Nigeria like rain during Hamatan season is because we, the followers, are not different from those leading us. We only mount good leadership, but we do anything to undermine its actualization. Little wonder Professor Lumumba rightly posited that in Japan, a corrupt person kills himself. In China, the government will kill him. In Europe, they jail him. But in Africa, Dito Nigeria, he will present himself for election. And we have so many of them around us. Now you know why some people wonder when those we describe as leaders in Nigeria open their mouth to speak. If they are not negotiating with militants, they are, they've created it that directly or indirectly. They are paying ransom to killers and bandits while the law-abiding citizens are victims are told to be sympathetic to the cause of their killers and tormentors. Unfortunately, the victims will condemn anyone that tries to liberate them and then celebrate the same rulers. And then you hear words like amiable governor, Mr. Wake and Seek governor, energetic governor, Mr. Fix It, Osho Quake, anti corrupt president, my people, my people governor. Very sad. See, as I shame, they catch me for Nigeria. Can you truly call Nigeria a nation with leaders in government or a contraption with scavengers feeding fat on their own destructions, with those being destroyed waiting to destroy others? A country where you can be arrested for criticizing an absentee president, but compensated as a killer, kidnapper, militant, and fraudster, while the victims are mocked and asked not to be coward, can be called a country. A country where governors don't have the faintest idea about security of lives and properties, despite being chief security officers with huge sum as security vote, should bear any other name but a country. A country where senators beg the president to speak to them in time of crisis, where children are being kidnapped like chicken, with a deafening silence from the commander in chief, should know that it's being mocked when called a country. Where councillors only count and share location and local government chairmen can't even share nothing. State assembly members are assembled to genuflect before the emperor, who is the governor. They should go and ask Trump for another name. It shouldn't be called a country. A land where the government will take a loan, backed by sovereign guarantee for infrastructure from China. Yet government, in collaboration with the follower, will give out their in-country services jobs to the same Chinese to do, thereby taking the money back to China. Why the citizens are jobless, hungry, angry, and carrying arms against the state should be called a colony and not a country. A place where those waiting to steal from the system and more than those stealing already will need to break up to be able to make up. If you like, call it restructuring. We are on the same page. We have people who have the solution to the problem of the country everywhere. But during election, these same people will still queue up behind those that have consistently cheated, defrauded, and stolen from us, and in some cases, fighting one another to elect these same people as leaders. Yet we sit down in our comfort zone and take Jerry Rollins or Chief Ghani Fahemi, both of blessed memory, we come in shining armor to liberate us and lie with the lie. If we can't liberate ourselves, nobody will. I will therefore advocate that until we see election, as our way of participating in government and choose our leaders based on their competence and content of their ideas rather than their religion, tribe, ethnicity, gender, or age, would we'll wake up one day and discover that we never had a country. If you like, run away to Europe and America, to Canada, thinking that the problem should be borne by those in Nigeria only. Don't be surprised when someday, after your sojourn, you have nowhere to call home, having acquiesced when you, you should have been consigned. Knowing that leadership shapes nation, community, and even organization, as followers, we should strive to hold our leaders accountable, always irrespective of their tribe or tongue. Not when it favors you, it becomes a blessing, but when it doesn't, it's corruption. Let not only perspire, but be consensus to acquire a country we will all admire. Be the country that you desire. Mm. Let Chuka tell us. Yes. Chuka.
<laughs> well, um, Limbros, um, again, I can see your frustration, which has already been uh, shown by Emeka earlier, uh, in a country that isn't quite working like a country. So I, I quite like when you say we should ask Trump what name we should name ourselves now. I mean, he gave us shithole before. I don't know if there's anything else anybody else wants to give us. Um, but in the spirit of being kind to Nigeria, uh, because we are all Nigerians, um, it would be nice for us to still think that uh, we are just a country in despair. And, you know, let's still assume that we are a country and we can repair it. Mm. I, 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 I was saying that, um, I, you know, um, one of the things I find about elections, you're speaking about elections and how more people should participate, and I think that is a major sub-theme sub of this, is the fact mm. that elections are never really about ideas. That's mm. true. In a climate where a lot of people are ignorant and uneducated. And even in, in very educated countries, you see what's happening in America and you, in the UK where people voted against their own interests, you know, uh, with the Brexit and so on. Mm. Elections, and I think that's how elections are now being fought. People have now realized that elections are all about emotions. It's how people feel. So even if someone is a thief or someone has been, you know, um, has gone through this, yeah, incompetent. But if I feel that he's my own, he's our own, or my brother, or my sister, or my kinsman, it doesn't, you know, you can speak all the grammar, saying this guy is incompetent. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. You know, so I, I think that it now goes back into the system and how political leaders are, sh are, are right. born, are shaped, either by the political parties to help to win, to win the process and say, this is, this is our best person. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, we, we live in a country of compromise mm -hmm. that clearly shuns best practice, shuns, actually militantly says, we don't want the best. Just give us the one that is okay. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and so that's where we are. So I, I find that, you know, um, that's why when I said in my own piece that... You, you lost hope. <laughs> um, no, because that, that incident, the way that it happened, not just that it happened, but that we were being almost like ghastly to say it didn't happen. Exactly. It. You know, Show me. When, when we saw it, we heard it, we, yeah. we, we know people, and then you're telling me nothing happened. Yeah. I should prove it. True, very true. You know, so, so, I, I, I so that, that for me, because people have died before. People died in Odi. Yeah. There was a massacre yeah. in Odi. People died in Zaria. Yeah. People have died in Aba, in Onicha. You know, people have been shot. Peaceful people have been shot. So it's not a new thing. But this is the first time. That they that denied they it ever happened. happened. Yeah, and accusing people who say it happened and, and arresting them for saying it happened. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the one that just... I just like, no. So no. in the days of military, we didn't even have it this no. bad. Yeah. I, I, I think the two advocates, Emeka and, and Liberals, um, have some similar. things in, in common. And my, my, uh, I, I will still lean towards that increased participation in the electoral process. Now, the, the younger generation, whatever that means, are saying, oh, we have uh, a better way to do this. We have new ideas, new agenda. The only way that we know in modern time is still via that electoral process. Registering parties or joining parties, or, it is a way to influence things. We have seen that the streets did not deliver much dividend. It didn't. As a matter of fact, the people in power cowered them mm. into submission. Let's get more involved. Okay. Well, um, well, I agree with you, like you have said, it's good for us to participate more. And so that's why the advocate is better with your participation. It's time to share some of your views on issues discussed here. Responding to the advocacy on who the Nigerian Senate is representing, Olaf for Good says, I keep telling people about the eight Senates that are, they are the best set of senators in the history of the country. But the nine Senates are just too busy to caring for themselves only, not the country or the nation. And then responding to the advocacy on Chinese recognizing Nigeria, the Honey 75 says, we need people with good heads and selflessness in power before things get ugly. And besides, US and the rest of the West are as bad as China. 
um, I might agree with you also. That's why you need to protect yours. You know, and nobody will come and protect and, and protect yours if you can't protect it. Follow us on our social media platform on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag the Advocate NG, or on Twitter and Instagram, at Plus TV Africa. Always remember, hashtag the Advocate NG. And to catch up with previous broadcasts, simply go to plustvafrica.com forward slash the Advocate NG. And after the break, Chuka is speaking on a new Nigeria. Stay with us. What we do not understand, we will stigmatize. What you can see is the remaining of the tanker that exploded. The suffered equally confessed. So today, I'll be talking about a new Nigeria. It's late in the day for General Buhari to make suitable impact in the development trajectory of Nigeria. Six years of his regime has come to not much good for us. So by 2023, nothing would have changed for the good. Promises of a corrupt-free government of national security have come to nothing. Education, health, infrastructure, all stagnant. Human rights is virtually non-existent. And dare I say, even common sense does not prevail in governance. And I mean, the utterances of Lai Mohammed give credence to this. So what do we do now as a nation? The obvious task ahead of us is strengthening our institutions to deal with our errant behavior. At the moment, it's all just a tea party. So a reconfiguration of thought processes will do a lot to help us achieve this. We underestimate Western education. We brag about so-called successful lives achieved without requisite education. But this success is all mediocrity. And what we do is wallow in mediocrity and run a false economy that has no indices for true measurement of growth and productivity. And as soon as we are done with our mediocrity, we hurry off to the West to enjoy a bit of real good life. I'd like Nigerians to collectively condemn all past and then even the present governments. Stop the unintelligent debates about good luck Jonathan or Basenjo or Gawan being better than others. Stop deifying ex-governors just because they built ramshackle schools and clinics. The stories behind their own stories will shock you. Let's judge people properly or you will get governors who have unexplained killings behind them wanting to run for president. Let's stop defending people because they belong to the same tribe. You want an ex-governor whose bank accepted to launder $280 million for a past president to run for your presidency because you are of the same tribe. We are all institutions. So are the corporations and arms of government. So please condemn an information minister who proposes to borrow and spend $500 million on the Nigeria Television Authority. It is daylight robbery in disguise. Do your own work with honesty. Promote high standards within your profession. Society needs you. They do not need you prefixing absurd professions before your name, barrister, architect, and all that. They need your brains. And believe me, when you begin to see things for what they are, you will join me on the way to a progressive nation. Embrace progress, build ranches. Mechanize farming, be methodical with it. Learn to be entrepreneurial, even if you made large sums of money from graft. <laughs> Fantastic. It's a beautiful piece. Brief, straight to yeah. the point and concise. But, um... Embrace. Embrace ranching. <laughs> Embrace mechanized farming. No, but you, you know... The... Nobody needs your barrister, architect, architect engineer. They need your brain. 
Awesome. There, there are Sovio. There yeah. are pharmacists. Yeah. Broadcasters. It is, it, is when, <laughs> it is when you know next to nothing, nothing. that you want that preface. You want people to recognize you with it. Not what you have in your, what Head. you have upstairs. Hmm. And so, oh, let them know that I'm a barrister. Let them know that I'm a doctor. <laughs> but meanwhile, when it comes to doing the job, you are stuttering. True, very true. Second base, um, I'll, I'll, I hope that we all take the lessons from Chuka's advocacy, although it's not the first time that we're hearing it. Um, when it is my brother that is the next in line to mm -hmm. become governor, and the political party chooses him. Yeah, I may just forget yeah. two cars and go KC. But well, that is how it works. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I have real life examples of yeah. a friend whose brother became a senate. And this was someone who has been mm. agitating for transparency in the salaries of this National Assembly people. All of a sudden, he went quiet and believed that after his own what's, brother's session. What's that Kenyan writer that says, um, when there's food, She'll uh, not be talking when there's food. Don't talk when you're eating. You know, but uh, really, uh, but really um, Senator Eina uh, Baribe is a friend. Mm -hmm. But he mm. keeps telling me, liberals keep criticizing us. Mm. Criticize us, if, even if I don't do anything good. I want to hear you someday criticize me. Mm. You, you know, mm. so it, it makes people... You, you put them on their toes. Yes, yeah. because as a leader, you're in the public eye. True. I also, I like the fact that, you know, Chuka is talking about, look, we need to work together. Let, in your own little space, try to be different. And that's the only way, when you get to public space, you would, you know, also want to do it differently. Mm. You won't listen to, imagine, Oshomole, as a governor, you look at the house, the massive house he built in this village, just before the program we we're talking about, your children going to school, and before you know it, They've left you. They are you are alone empty. in that big house. And then your wife is busy chasing Omugwa here and there, you know, grandchildren, and then the house is empty. And that house will be built with two billion naira. It's all of a sudden, that will populate you need hundred million to maintain, maintain it. the house. And so, but you ask yourself, if you had spent that two billion to, to build, build a school, low cost housing, or to finance small uh, industries, cottage industries, and that's your in community. That's your community. And live in that small house. You will have more people to provide security for you. It just reminds okay. me of our Oba who had two, two million dollars in his I house think, in the middle of poverty. I think uh, that your Oba is. Uh, I think that. <laughs> says there's, 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 a, there's a sense. There's a sense. Um, even if I talk, I, as I spoke about hope and giving up hope, and there's a sense that uh, Chuka's advocacy and and getting into the spirit where, even for those of us who are older and we. are you know, we've reached the same level, that younger people must be fed with hope. Younger people must be given a line, mm. um, you know, to see a path. And I think that that, that may be what's the ch challenge. Who, who is to feed them? Because I know, for instance, that our religious homes used to give us hope. But again, they use that to Which indoctrinate hope? us. Which hope? For, for their own gains. Which hope religious? Uh, <laughs> they, 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 they are looking for. They 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 hold you. That's a topic for another day. They hold you <laughs> in captivity, and so consistently fleece you. No, you're, hope, you're no actually hope. I a... bought my fourth jet in yes, COVID. In COVID. <laughs> Can you imagine? Well, um, since we're an era of uh, hope, leadership, and um, you know Messiah, just stay with us after the break. Jumoke is actually seeking for a Nigerian's next Messiah. Don't go anywhere. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Welcome to your favorite program, The Moment of Truth, brought to you by the Citadel Global Community Church. Our God is a God of salvation, far above all principality and power, and might and dominion, that regardless of what happens in this season, you will escape. Say to your neighbor, there is no peace for the wicked. The special anti-robbery squad who are now killing innocent citizens instead of dealing with robbers. Your ass will catch up with you. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Moment of Truth with Pastor Tunde Bakari. Sundays, 7 p.m. on PLOS TV Africa. Nigeria, by extension, Africa is faced with a lot of challenges. The growing youth population with little engagement, that is a ticking time bomb. 
We are a blessed people with diverse culture and highly cerebral minds who have a lot to say. And yes, we are talking. It is important we drive the right conversation that informs, inspires, influences thoughts and action. If we say there's beauty in our diversity, then let us embrace our diverse culture. We must continue to courageously be the voice of transformation as we are the hope for the future. Yesterday's conversations shape today. What are you saying to shape your tomorrow? We know you have a lot to say and we are here to hear you. I posted a campaign video from 2015 on Twitter on Tuesday where the actors complained about their neighbor's children being kidnapped and the kidnappers had written them that they were next in line. The campaign was to vote President Buhari rather than President Jonathan, who as Commander-in-Chief had claimed he no longer knew what to do. People remembered that video and claimed they were scammed by the campaign as insecurity and kidnappings are now daily. So this government, they owe you change, but you still voted for next level now. Abi, you are one of those who claim the election was rigged. The Supreme Court doesn't agree with you. Who is Nigeria's next messiah? I'm a member of a few political groups, not because I have any interest in joining politics, but because of my passion for good governance in Nigeria. So I constantly hear people ask me to come and do it better. I tell them, I criticize not because I can't do it better. I just hold the people who promise to, to their words. That's the job of a journalist anyway, to hold the executive, legislature, and judiciary accountable. That's why we're the fourth estate of the realm in any democracy. I don't take the job of governance for granted. It must be difficult to lead a diverse group who want different things. But in a population of over 200 million, Nigerians can give more people the chance to try, especially people who vouch to have the answers, than perpetrate failures in government. This is my strong belief. We ought to keep voting our failures and never allow them back. We keep recycling the same old rulers, like they will suddenly have answers they didn't have years ago. Someone that didn't do anything to develop themselves in the years they've been out of government, yet you expect them to come back and turn Nigeria to El Dorado? Nigerians are the ones expecting a Messiah instead of coming together to create systems, agree on a working constitution, and stand by it regardless of political affiliations. Any human being can become a tyrant if the system allows. No one is perfect, but here, we have institutions that allow a commander-in-chief to disobey our constitution, and everyone says, yes, sir. People are loyal to the president rather than to the constitution. So I get into government, appoint all my friends, competent or not, and even create a new ministry for my mother. Opposition wills. Then they get into power and do even worse. She Nigeria with the lazident by is in Nigeria collapsing. The current constitution was like a military decree passed down just the way the northern and southern protectorates were forcefully amalgamated in 1914. The 2014 conference was the opportunity we had to break it all down and reconstitute. But again, we allowed politics dictate the deliberations at the national conference. We can't keep doing the same thing and expect different results. Even if the best Nigerian becomes president in 2023, the system may still corrupt them. When are we all going to say enough is enough? Or are we waiting for a messiah from the South in 2023? No, but I thought you wanted to point us to a, to a messiah. <laughs> no, Nigerians are that. always <laughs> expecting a messiah. Oh, oh, um, but I, I, I agree, like I said also in my advocacy, you know, we want a messiah, but we will do everything to undermine the process that will lead to us, you know, um, getting that right. messiah. I, I, and that's why I also, this is instructive, uh, Chuka's advocacy now saying, look, whatever you are, be the best of that thing. It yeah. is 
those individual efforts that will bring us together and Wada. help us to understand. Because that NSAS protest would not have been defeated if the government did not know that there's a pool of some uneducated people that they can use True. to fight the educated ones. And but so, not yet, so. If, we, if we keep, you know, uh, the educated ones, keep advocating for and on behalf of the uneducated ones and find a way to educate them and bridge that gap, very soon, these people you call leaders will run away from Nigeria. Um, may I ask a question, though, um, Emeka? Because why would the security man keep on saying, Madam, anything for us, you know, and they I'm drive... I'm supposed to talk on this advocacy. <laughs> I'm asking a question. <laughs> I'm, I'm throwing it open in terms of how does Nigeria get better with the culture of entitlement and getting everything begging, that I begging. can. Yes. I, I think it's, it's a... It's a symptom or it's a, it's a collapse of a system um, where, you know, um, there's no trust in authority. There's no trust in the system. Um, there's no dependency. So the only <laughs> thing that's left to everyone is to feed off oh, one another. Yeah, true. So either, either by force, so if I can take it, I'll take it. If I can con you and take it with why you or 419 or whatever, I'll take it. Yeah. Um, or I beg you for it. We used to have this joke that the best way to, when you meet a policeman on the road, you know, growing up in the barracks, there was this tendency that you either, you know, those of when we were much younger, we pull rank. Mm -hmm. Like, do you know, you know, you know who I am. You know, we speak in a certain military lingo. And, and it guy, works. And it works. Or if you're cut out, you beg the policeman. There are two ways. So you don't use force to say, you know, who, who are you talking to? And then, you know, use chance him. Or when you get there, it stops you. You say, oh, Ghana, we, we now. You know, because <laughs> that is, so there's no, and if you, if you look at that, there's no dependency in a system that functions, yeah. you know, legitimately and, and. No social and, safety yeah. net. So you see that. So you have to find a way. And that's really what's happening. So whether yeah. you see them at the airports and, you know, I don't know, you saw that thing where the Zambians, uh, the yeah. Ugandans were making a jest of us yeah. uh, a few weeks ago. How come into Nigeria? Everybody's begging from the airport. Yes. <laughs> Everybody's begging. Okay, welcome. What's in your brain? Yeah. Uh, Chuka, is Chuka, is, so, sorry, quickly, Chuka. I wanted to find out if... Uh, the, yeah, Chuka, the, in the Queen's country, the, is that the, the way they the, beg in the airport too? Well, I don't know how we're going to... This Messiah matter is a very serious question. Um, <laughs> I, I, it ties in again with even what I was saying about glorifying the wrong people and not accepting to judge people. We have to judge people. Let nobody deceive you about what the Bible says or does not say. We have to judge people properly. And if we know a man to have done something very bad, let's not bring him forward for governor, president, senator, whatever. One governor became a governor through killings. I'm not saying he killed anybody, but there was ruthless killing going on before he could become a governor that perhaps was even raped. Today, what is he doing? He's putting up posters to be president. Mm. Yes. He and denies that, that there's COVID. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, Nigerians will in the end vote for this man. And you'll be no. shocked. We know, they, not, not, so not, 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 in, not in 2023. Is he, I said is he, is he a negotiator there, in chief? There, 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 <laughs> there, there are some a rather simplistic uh, uh, approach I, I like to put down on this. And it involves numbers. In 2019 presidential election, where you have the total number of votes by PDP and APC being 26 million. million. Meanwhile, the number of people between ages of 18 and 39 are about 60 million people. If you take Lagos, there were over 6 million registered voters, only 1 million plus votes. Where, what were the 5 million other voters doing on election day? I can answer that question Looking for you. Food, though. I can answer that question for you because I was part of that process. You remember when mm. Jega came? Jega said the electoral register was largely flawed, and so they needed to clean it up. And so they, what they did was they introduced biometrics for the first Correct. time. Yeah. And you know, after the biometric, a lot of people did multiple registration. And so they introduced automated fingerprint identification system. And so this automated fingerprint identification system will match your biometrics mm -hmm. with your facials and your name. So the moment they did that, 
the, the, the numbers dropped drastically. Yeah, that and is then, wait, now, now, let me, no, wait, let me That is tell where you are comparing the let registers not, no, of previous wait, year no, no, with 2019. This, no, the current one. Let mm. me tell you what that happened. The moment they... That is because it's the same Jagas register that they are still using. So when the numbers dropped, all the governors started complaining. No, 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 no. You have to leave it as it is because it is the numbers that they used to rig. And that's why when vote counts and you use biometric... Journalists will tell you there was large turnout of voters, but at the end of the day, the actual number of voters, when you put it together, is less than a million. What it means is that our voting strength and our numbers are overrated. Go and check it. You see, compare previous year's voters' register. No, I'm talking about this current so, voters' the, register. The, the current register was based on biometrics. This is, that is the biometric I'm telling exactly. you that so after you have the multiple biometric says, there. After the biometric says you have five we million shared, or six we million shared voters. voters' card. Why we, were people not, not coming out? Do you out know how many voters' cards are still with? Are we saying in a, in a city of less 20 million people, let's not even, it's only one million valid voters let's not, that live there? Let's not yeah, argue no, about it's numbers. It's not possible. Let's argue. I think what I take from, from, <laughs> from, from, from Golan's point is, is the fact that there's a there's a, a sea change that's about to occur with more people who did not vote before, did not participate, coming out to participate. I think that's the point you were trying well, to make. Well, can we hold their hands in 2023 and, and, and drag them to the Drag pool. them there and ensure that they are not voting because based on 2,000 naira for bread or one Mr. Egungun that promised exactly. that he will give them 35% uh, women <laughs> agenda. Yeah. I'm just saying. Time is never our friend on this program. However, the advocacy continues on our social media platforms on Facebook, Plus TV Africa. The hashtag is AdvocateNG. Or on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa, same hashtag, the AdvocateNG. To catch up on previous broadcasts, please go to plustvafrica.com forward slash the AdvocateNG. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. Till next week, same time. Oh, it's my birthday. So, we are going to launch. <laughs> Till next time, same time on the station. Let's keep advocating for a better society. See you next week. Bye-bye. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed. It's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they would like. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. That's it, it does. It does. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you.
this is Tea Time, where we dissect and analyze what's big and popping in the world of entertainment. And if not, it ain't coming out of the slips. I'm definitely not alone. I've got my intelligent co-anchors, Ife Omai, and introducing our guest anchor, Adi Wale. How yeah. are you doing? Hi. I'm good. I'm you good. Good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm yeah, so, so, of of course, I'm so excited to be on Ooh, the Yay! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I should say my name is Wale. W A L A Y. Wale. Mm. Yeah. It's not W H A N. -E. Yeah, no, no, no. No, I had to spell it for them. You know? How about W H A L E Y? Wale. 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 Yeah. All right, so tell us about yourself. What have you been doing? Uh, and yeah. um, introduce yourself to okay, us. Okay, um, Wale is a presenter, mm. a producer. Mm. I create, I create um, content as well, mm. uh, a journalist, mm. and uh, <laughs> I also direct. Mm. Yeah. So. What else do you do aside from you know this media industry? What else is your strength? Uh, I I I listen to music a lot. What type of music do you listen to? Any kinds of music. What's your favorite album at the moment? Album. Uh, still, uh, Pop Smoke. Pop mm. Smoke. What album? What's what album is that? And uh, the album 50 Cent produced for Yeah, him. I know. What's the title? Uh, I, I won't lie to you. I'm not really... Oh, wow. Um, and you love but, that but album. But I love that album because I okay. listen to it. Great. Yeah. Great. So, All right. So um, what's your greatest single, Nigerian single of the moment? A single right now. I think I like um, Lighter. Lighter? Yeah. What song? The one he featured with um, Naira What's Mani. the title of the song? Sure. Are yeah, you sure? sure? Yeah. All right. Great. Are you sure? Yeah. Are you sure? Are you yeah, sure? Yeah. Are you sure? I just saw the video yesterday. Sure? And, uh, are you sure? You saw yeah. who yesterday? I saw the video yesterday. Right. Are you sure? Yeah. It's sure. I'm sure that it it's is sure. sure. The title had to do with sure. Are you sure? Ah, it's okay. sure. Oh, God. But I know it's sure. Are you sure? Are you sure? Huh? Are you sure? That's Am I sure? Are you asking me a question? No. Am I sure? The song. The song. It's what? Don't, don't twist me. The song has to do with sure. Mm. Yes, of course. Yeah, so that's just what I like about it. Are you sure it is sure? I'm sure. You are sure that it is sure? <laughs> yeah. Everything is okay with you. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, anyway, he, that's anyway, it. Like anyways, I, I like, I love um, the song. So, um, okay, so let's talk about your entertainment background. How vast are you in entertainment, you know? Mm, I'm still trying. I won't, I won't say I'm... I'll just say I'm... So what's your forte? Do you think you're the entertainment guy? Do you think you're the political guy or yes? Entertainment. Entertainment? If I'm not entertainment. So who's your biggest... Who's the biggest entertainer in Nigeria at the moment as far as you, uh, in your know, opinion? We all know it's Mr. Bronner now. <laughs> Mr. Bronner. Oh, right. Why? Because he won the Grammy. And of course, because that's what is actually everywhere. Bronner is... that is what makes you the biggest artist in the, in the continent? In the because continent. you won the Grammy. Well, well... As for me, I can't think of anybody right now in Nigeria. You don't think Davido is big enough? You don't think Davido has been putting uh, us on David the map is good. for a long Everybody time? Everybody is good, but, you know, Bona Boy, we know. At least I can't is that your favorite Nigerian artist? No, he's not my favorite Nigerian artist. Who is your funny. favorite Nigerian artist? I, can't, I don't really have a favorite Nigerian artist. Okay, so if you have to pick three artists from Nigeria, who are they? Uh, definitely, I'll go for Bona. Mm. Um, I'll go for Two-Face. Mm. Mm. And then, um, once again... I'll go for to be. I think I'll go for Naira Mali. Nice. Naira Mali. So you like Naira Mali? I like What's Naira What's your Mali. biggest Naira Mali song? It's a kilo day. Wait, now I'm getting to know my guy now. Come on, did I get to know you? What's your biggest Naira Mali song? Ah, uh, Kuleye one. Can you sing like a few lines of Kuleye one? Kuleye one. Kuleye one. Kuleye one. Kuleye one. Come on. I just like I just like the rhythm of that song, you know. It's I'm on the double Oh no. At bad double fish. You know, I you know, you know, know. People like one thing I noticed about Naira Mali <laughs> is that they do, he he sings from whatever is going on mm. around. It's, mm. it's not all about I have to be careful because mm. you know that's why he said his song is not for. I think there was time he said he said his song is not for kids. Mm. Yeah. Because he's deep. Mm. He What's your biggest embarrassing moment? Oh. Uh, when I when I was um, probably shooting, and then um, I discovered that after the shoot, there was no audio, mm. and then I had to. Can you speak up a bit, please? I had to find a way yeah. how to you know communicate with the guest again. That mm. man, it's like 
you will have to come around again. It was very embarrassing to me mm. because it made me look as if when I wasn't professional, I wasn't a professional in what I was doing there. How were we going to be shooting? And um, at the end of the day, though it was a technical, a technical thing, but I just felt embarrassed, you know. Alrighty, welcome to the squad. Mm. So we all have something in common now. At least we have Nayamali in common. Mm -hmm. We have, um, what's it called now, mm. you know? Embarrassing moments mm. in common. So yes, welcome to the squad. Welcome, Adi Wale. Mm. And yes, Adi Wale will be joining us this morning to discuss some of the biggest entertainment stories. And we have something special for you guys. Now we'll be introducing a new segment on the show that you guys never seen before segment. But yes, it's called the Half Hour Hot Topic. So you need to stick around to actually Actually see what's going on with that but moving on the first story of the day is a Nollywood actor Yul Edoche was disagreed with his father Pete Edoche's stance on gifting in-laws the patriarch of the Edoche family in a recent interview said any father who wants to gift his married daughter a car and gives it in a name is destroying the daughter's marriage he advised the father to buy the car in his son in-laws name you disagreed with his father's opinion. He wrote, of course, Chief is entitled to his opinion. And back then, their ways were different. For me, if I buy a car for my daughter as a wedding gift, I'll give it to her to register it in whatever name she likes. If she asks me to do the registration for her, then I'll register it in our name. Do you guys agree or disagree? The heck? Oh. Okay. Like, this type of story just gives you a headache. Um, like... um, first of all, um, I saw that story yesterday, and yeah. it was like, this man again. The truth of the matter is that uh, this is like his second, the second time Peter Duce is actually coming through when mm. it comes to this issue of um, marriage. Mm. And, you know, the, the last one where he was talking about he would, uh, why would a man mm. go on his knees to mm. propose? Mm -hmm. That was the first this one. Actually, no, that's the, the, yeah, that was the yeah. first one. Yes, yeah, that yeah. was the first one. He came with that and you know, and now he's coming again with this. Did you see the one that happened on, I think, on Monday? That broke over the weekend, and then on Monday, we were, it was all over the place. You didn't see anything. The on one Peter about the, the condoms. Chair. About the condoms. Men, okay, saying that... Um, Women should put condoms. Put condoms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was part of the story. It's the same story. video. It's the mm -hmm. same video, yeah. yes. So, uh, to me, I just feel the man is just being... He's been an old school. Mm. Mm. And, you know, sorry, I'm not trying to be tribalistic here, but, you know, you see, this, you see when it comes to Igbo, Mm. You know, they are very, very careful and they are very, very particularly about their, their men, mm. their tribe. Mm. You know, when it comes to, when it comes to a, ma a man, a man heading the family, they don't joke with it. Mm. They don't joke with it, especially they always want that respect. Right. You but know? let's talk about the new generation as well. Do you think that regardless of whether you're Igbo, Aosa, or Yoruba, you know, we should still be all about patriarchal stuff that because you are a man, you have to be the head, you have to be this. Don't you think that at this point in our lives, haven't you had women that you have to share things equally with, especially when it comes to power? Well, this, this, our, generation, this our generation is quite crazy. Mm. It's a very crazy generation. And things have changed. Uh, I feel... All things are passed away. And all things are become new, new, bastard. But we still have some of our, our daddies that still believe that their own time is still, you know, mm. the best right now and all that. But I believe it's just Peter Jesus' uh, opinion. Yeah, and like let's keep it at that. This is mm. not set in stone. It's mm. not a law. But what do you think? I mean, it's, really, it's very ridiculous. This whole thing is very ridiculous. And I'm sorry, but it's beginning to make me even now despise the idea of his son actually being in politics. Um, at first, I, I thought, you know, because if he, if, he, if he respects his father in any way and maybe his father has influence over his life, then I worry for the kind of Nigeria he's planning on building. But he just disagreed with his old father. Yeah, but not really. He still said, well, whatever name she wants to put it in. And I don't know, maybe he's disagreeing with this one, but then are you agreeing, are you agreeing with a lot of other things? I don't know. It just feels like he's the kind of person that I'm like, actively um, fighting against, especially for my country. So I'm on the opposite spectrum of who Peter Doce is and everything that he stands mm. for, right? So I feel like it's a, there's, a, there's a, uh, an intellectual war going on with these kinds of people and my kind of people, right. right? So if his father is, if he's anything like his father, then it worries me that he will even come into politics. Like, I mean, right now, he's just on social media with the camera. It's not harmful. 
But imagine this kind of person ruling. You surely start to see like policies mm. that you know are yeah. trifling women and mm. really boxing women because you can't even imagine women having owning properties. Like you're taking us back. Mm. <laughs> you're taking us back. You're trying to <clears throat> really eradicate all the progress that we've made. So that's really scary for me. Mm. Um, and I, so I wish he condemned this a bit more than just, oh, yeah, whatever my daughter wants, I will put it. So if my daughter says, nah, I can't be the kind of person then that if her daughter, if your daughter said, um, oh, please put it in my husband's name, you'll be the one to ask her that. Are you, are you okay? sure about that? Like, are you okay? Yeah. Uh, why don't you want to own your own properties? Um, so that, that for me is crazy. I mean, I, I remember when we were <clears> talking <throat> about the whole condoms thing. I said it when he was like, if the guy says he wants to marry somebody else, what will you do? What will you do? This man clearly wants women to be unempowered seriously that's seriously that's unempowered that's right. because owning properties gives you empowerment um, um having a house gives you empowerment being able to defend yourself gives you you have to be empowered to be able to do that and he sees no reason why a woman should be empowered and that yeah. is a big turn off for me and you know what it can never happen what can what never, never happen for for a woman, I mean, for a man to want to take over the ocean, this is our generation. It, it can't. Can never, it's too it late, can. sir. It's too late. All right, but, but, but for me, I think I, I agree 100% with you, Ladoche, because I think he actually bashed his father's opinion I, so, by saying that, look, I, well, that's his opinion. His time mm -hmm. has changed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, obviously, I would do the same if I'm to buy a car for my daughter on a wedding day. I'll give her a car that is not registered. Hey, uh Hannah, -huh. who's arguing about that? If it's... Yes, no, but when we're now saying it like, um, it's, it's kind of like in support of his father. I don't that's see not the it. registered point. If you're, if you, if, let me, let me tell you what I'm arguing. You buy a car for your daughter mm. on her wedding day. Are you going to ask her? No, I'm not going what to. What option of name she should put on her thing? No, and it's not even a question that should come up. Exactly. That's what no, I'm, I'm going to give her. No, that's why I said you let those change. So you don't agree 100 percent then, because he said he will ask his daughter the options of what name she wants to put it in. And if she says it's her name, then he'll go ahead and do that. Do you want to bring up the, 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 the thing okay, again? Okay, that was the second part when he said, okay, she asked me to yes. register, I'll ask her what name. And now you could be for, it could be for, oh, put it in my company name. It doesn't yeah. really have to if be the I husband. Don't change the conversation. No, I'm to see, I try to see the bigger is about picture. The, no, don't, don't, don't speak for people who have, not, who have not asked you to. The conversation was about his dad saying. He never saying, asked me to talk about them <laughs> either, but I talk about them. <laughs> his dad said, his dad said he would put it that anyone who buys for his daughter and puts it in her name is trying to re destroy the marriage or whatever to so put it in the husband's name so that's, he's not that's... replying and saying that oh i don't agree to that all i would do the only difference is that not that i wouldn't put it in the man's name is i'll ask first well that's so chief's opinion so i feel uh, you know chief is actually being careful too as a mm. man you know putting the name of the man in whatever you know and maybe he sees it that anything can happen alongside them. Like what? What's your biggest like, fear for women owning like, cars? I'd like to uh, know. Uh, maybe at the end of the day, the woman, I might can't hear you, the, woman the woman, the woman, the woman can decide to say maybe she's no longer interested in the marriage. Oh, uh, and and that's a problem if she has a car. So because she use a car to drive out of your house, so you're worried. Yeah, so you know the man can just you know okay even if she says she wants to go. Everything still belongs to me. Oh, okay, so what's your wow. take on men? Now, there was a video where I went viral, you know, during the Valentine period of a guy who actually went to a restaurant, saw his girlfriend sitting with another man, took his bone straight hair, took her shoes and all of that. What's your opinion about I men who do such things? First of all, that was childish mm. to me. I won't do that. Mm. Though, that's show, it just shows the kind of person that guy is. Mm. Because if he really, really loves her, from his depth of his heart, or he really loves his woman. Okay. I mean, it's, to me, it's just, it's even irritating. Yeah. That no. shows that the So don't you think that when the good gets going and you give the woman anything or she has anything under your name, you shouldn't be worried about when she's leaving and she has to go with those things? I'm sorry, what? When the good is get, mm -hmm. gets going, okay. right? Mm -hmm. And a woman gets whatever it is from you. Do you think when it becomes bad, you're entitled to those things back? No. Because that's exactly... What kind of giving no, are you no, no, no. giving What kind of giving? It's not... It's... I'm are you giving that, or are you doing a contract? Which one? No, you guys are not getting it now. Now, I'm asking this question from the point of, oh, when it gets bad and she wants to leave and she mm -hmm. has to go with the car. And I'm asking that. But in that car, you gave her in good faith because everything was going smoothly. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So when it's not going smoothly mm -hmm. and she needs to walk away, why should we be worried about what she walks with? 
He's still yeah, not getting it. He doesn't have a problem. I don't have a problem with he's that. Just, he, I think he was just trying to explain mm. the idea. Yeah, it's... Yeah, I, don't, I don't think... Are you supporting? Are I'm you not supporting. That? Okay. Why would you collect it back? <laughs> what is... And so why shouldn't we leave it in the woman's name? That's my own question. Are you guys not getting it? Mm. That whatever gift you are giving to your daughter on her wedding day, the, the thought of whatever happens between her and her husband years down the line, or even months or weeks down the line, is actually none of my business. Yeah. I'm actually giving it to my daughter okay. in her name. Mm. Again, this is a strong. This is the reason why I cannot say, "Oh, we don't need feminism in this country." <laughs> Ah, because there's work to be done. There is a lot yeah. of work to be done. Um, if there are men still roaming around that think like this, gifts. it is very alarming no, for the state, no, for no. the protection of women and their futures. If there are women who have also accepted this as their faith, because mm. there's a lot of women that don't know any different, right? They don't have any spirit of empowerment, so they've agreed that, you know, I'm only what, my, only what the man tells me I am. Mm. No, it There's a lot work. of work. There is a lot of work that this, needs to be this, done. This our time. It can't work. And but do you know, sorry, sorry, do you know that also women do that too? Mm. They buy you things and all that, and when you say you're no longer interested, they some of them ask for what they get. So those are two different conversations, right? The yeah. idea of gifting someone mm. your lover. Um, I don't think that, that's a gender conversation. I think it's a personality mm -hmm. thing. If you're petty, you might want your gifts back. If you're not, nobody cares. And you, we end, we end. You move on with all the stuff that you've, I've, you've benefited from me, and I do the same. But now we're talking about the, the conversation of even allowing ownership for women. Mm -hmm. Because that's, that's what he's, mm -hmm. he's, he's talking mm -hmm. about. And you see, that's much deeper than feelings and all of that. That's like, that's like um, entering economics now, mm -hmm. right? Because that's the only way you um, elevate yourself from poverty. Already, already. So, yeah, Already. different conversation. Alrighty, so we need to move on to the next story. Like yeah. I told you guys, yes, we'll be having a, a brand new segment on the show. So um, the next story is an American singer, Demi Lovato, who has revealed that she was sexually assaulted by a drug dealer on the night she overdosed. She will be recalled that three years ago, of course, Demi Lovato, um, you know, overdosed on drugs and the whole world was worried about her and all of that. And um, in the docu series on YouTube, um, yes, um, she, told, she told us about the drug dealer would deliver the, a dangerous cocktail. So Dancing with the Devil is the name of the series. And yes, who delivered a dangerous cocktail of heroin and other drugs on the night she overdosed three years ago. When she woke up in the hospital after the incident, the doctor asked her if she had consensual sex. She said, I remember the line on top of me, so I said yes. It wasn't until maybe a month after my overdose that I realized, hey, you weren't in any state of mind to make it a consensual decision decision, that kind of trauma doesn't go away overnight. Yeah. What's your take on this one? Um, that definitely happens, uh, and which is why the conversation around consent needs to be had mm. a lot more. Um, it's not as simple as she said yes, he said no. Mm. And some people, um, exactly. some people, I, I'm, I'm trying to play devil's advocate here, some people don't, don't genuinely understand that fully well, right? So some people would say, I heard yes, and so it's okay. And I'm not saying that that's an evil thing, but it's wrong. And I think with time, we need to educate people more. That it's not as simple as saying yes. You have to make sure that this person is of the sound mind. The person is, for example, the person is an adult. A young child can say yes, mm -hmm. but you can't sleep with a young child because she doesn't have the audacity or the, or the you know, she she's not capable of giving a full yes because she's underage. Yeah. You know, so there has to be a lot more conversations around consent and how deep it is. And I think this one, this particular one, is very common where you see in Nigeria. I remember Christmas, I, I kept tweeting and saying, please, guys, let's have more conversations around consent this, this um, December period because it's, there's going to be house parties. And that's why you find a lot of rape cases coming out of in Nigeria, especially on Twitter space, is that, you know, she can say yes, but is she intoxicated? Is she drunk? If she is... I don't think you should be having sex with somebody who isn't yeah. in their on sound the, mind. The right yes, because yeah. you can say a lot of things. If you ask me when I'm drunk, if I want to jump um, naked on, around on Todd Milan Bridge, I probably would say yes, but that doesn't mean that I'm saying that with like my full consciousness. So the same applies to um, applies to um, uh, what's it called drugs as well. Yeah. So with this guy now, I don't know because he sells drugs. I have a bias already to his to him. I'm sorry. So Maybe I, even sold the wrong drugs. So exactly. So I know that I, I like to. I, I'm <clears throat> tinting to leaning towards the idea that he knew this woman was intoxicated and deliberately did Took what he did. Over yes. Her. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Because there are some men that don't know that you're drunk. 
There are some men I don't know that like, you're intoxicated. You I've have seen to that be drunk before. all the time for them not to know you. No, friends. like I have a friend where she, I don't know what drug she was on, she was in Australia, and she went to a house party. Now she was a bit like, wooey, like jumpy, jumpy, but nothing too, like it wasn't like she was throwing up or anything like that. And we, we were trying to figure out the whole time if she had had sex with the person that she was hanging around with, mm -hmm. right? So that kind of person now, the man doesn't know that she wasn't of sound mind. Mm -hmm. Or maybe sometimes you yourself, you are too much of out of your own mind mm -hmm. that you don't know. Like, it's very complicated, mm -hmm. but um, it's definitely rape. I've seen people argue on Twitter about this conversation, whether mm -hmm. or not if she was raped. Uh, that's not rape now. It actually is. It is rape. If I didn't give you my consent willingly, mm -hmm. then... Um, if even if you force me, if I'm sober and you force me and I'm like, no, let's do it, let's do it, and I say, oh, like, you know, you're not really giving me a choice. It's still not consensual um, sex mm. as well. So the conversation gets gets deep. Okay. okay. Um. For me, what I feel, first of all, it's it's a very very it's a sad it's a sad one mm. for her. Um, but secondly, this drug dealer or drug thing, is it is it really is it really a must one must have a drug dealer? It's really a must because. I believe, I believe um, one thing about this stage is that we know that, look, for example, look at uh, Michael Jackson, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, at, at the end of the day, uh, what, we, uh, what we heard or what we learned was that mm -hmm. uh, it was the doctor or whoever was properly treating him mm -hmm. or giving, was properly the one that gave him the overdose thing. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I, be, I believe when we have a doctor and you have your own doctor, why would you need a drug dealer again? I don't get that. Like somebody who is probably giving you your medication to use because oh. I guess that's the person. Oh that wait, what, what type of drugs do you think we're talking about? Your yeah, paracetamol? No. I mean, um, <laughs> 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 no. No. Um, okay, no. so Demi Lovato, um, her documentary is actually about her life. She's she's. They a, even mentioned it, heroin. She's a your child doctor star. would not give you heroin. She's a child star. And she's had a very hard time growing up. Like in front of us, she's had like a lot of um, overdoses where we've almost lost her and stuff. So this documentary is supposed to give an, an insight on her struggles okay. and like a very raw, honest truth about her life. So she's actually a drug. She was a drug addict. She was somebody that had serious drug issues. And I'm not talking pain <laughs> for a headache. I mean like you know intoxicating drug <laughs> issues. Energetic. Yeah, so um, this is in her encounter with drugs and her drug dealers, all these bad stuff. What she was then wait, raped, yeah. All right, so what's your take on drug addicts as well? You know, let's talk about that. How do you feel about drug addicts? Uh, well, it's not a good thing. As far as I'm concerned, it's not a good thing. But I, I, it's not, as I said, it's not a good thing. It's mm. not a good thing. But I feel uh, it can be it can be reduced. Mm. Okay, how, how do you think that can be done? Uh, through your therapist, right. Okay, so I mean like, when, when I'm asking you about your take on drug dealers, what's your take on them? Do you think they are the problems? What do yeah. you mean? Uh, yes, yes, they are the problem. The drug dealers themselves. Yeah. Yes, they are the no, problem. No, not the drug dealers, the drug addict. Oh, well. As I said, it's to me, I, I don't really have much to say on that, but I, I But just, you know that addiction is a disease. And we should empathize and sympathize with every addict because it's beyond their control. Do you know that? Yes, I know that. I know it's a disease. I know. Yes. But, but what? Okay. okay well, go which ahead. One, no, you want to say something. You want to say something. You say it's a disease, yes. But is it, are they, isn't that they are, are they born with it? Do you think they are born with They're it? Not born, no. Were you born with cancer? Were people born with cancer? They got cancer. Okay. And we empathize and sympathize with every cancer patient. So why are we not going to sympathize and empathize with every drug addict if it is characterized as a disease? But we need to move on real quick, and we're going on a music break, and this is our throwback music from way back. This is Tea Time on Plus TV Africa. Yes, of course, stay with us. <laughs> Uh-huh. 
Yes, that's a proper throwback. Yes, you still welcome back to um, Tea Time on Plus TV Africa. You know, yeah, we've been, you know, having some bass, booze, booze, bass here and there. Yes, you know, talking about drugs, talking about all the things, and talking about Chief, of course, who, um, you know, had his opinion. And yes, we had, um, you know, we've been able to educate each each one of us on this table. I think we've been able to impact on each other, you know, intellectually. Or am I wrong? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Alrighty, alrighty. So we're moving on to the final story before we go into our brand new segment, which is, yeah, hot topic on tea time, of course. Yeah, so Kanye West's current net worth is approximately $6.6 .6 billion, which largely came from his Yeezy fashion brand. The rapper sneaker and apparel business, now bolstered by Adidas um, and Gap Inc., is valued between $3.2 billion and $4.7 billion by UBS Group AG. According to a media outlet, the father of four has an additional $1.7 billion in assets, $122 million in cash and stock, and $110 million from his music career. He has now been reported to be the richest black man in America. History. Wow. Give it up for Fam. Kanye, man. Like, give Kanye. it up for see, see, eh? You, this is, <laughs> I didn't want, I don't want to say this. I'll probably say this behind the scene. But you know, they say this guy has a problem. <laughs> I want his problems. <laughs> you know, do you understand? I probably can't say what problem this is. I want his problems. So that problem guys. is what is make that. Thank you. That's what brought him to where he is today. Can we now have? So Absolutely. why don't you want this problem? I don't want problem. Like, <laughs> um, hey. like you know, when I saw this, I I thought about Kanye when I was much younger. Mm. Like when Kanye was not this Kanye, like 
from like Jesus walks Kanye. Mm. Like, <laughs> and I'm just thinking, would he have known that he would be the that he richest. would have been the richest man in the history of America? I mean, of America? Are you kidding? You like, like, that's a lot. Of course, I thought he was the richest black artist in America. But no, the richest man. Yeah. Man. man, man, number one, yes, uh, fam. like Oprah. But can, okay. can I say, like though, Oprah. can I say, and I have to say this, and I know you, my I don't know how you respond to this, but do you know do you that know? Kim Kardashian mm. has a whole lot to do with that? I disagree. Don't start. Don't I disagree. Start. If to say a man with I disagree, a lot to do with woman, you, if you will not agree, I disagree, you will not agree. Mm -hmm. Please. Why are you I bringing disagree. Kim Kardashian? Why can't we just be happy for this fact, man? I was, why are we talking about Kim Kardashian now? I don't, I don't now? hate how. I don't hate I don't Kardashian. get it. I don't like, why her. did you have to bring that? Wait, leave this table. <laughs> Stand up and walk Can I please. explain why? Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. They had a, um, when they first got married, mm. there was this thing where they did like a joint mm. fusing, whatever. That's mm. what made him even the richest man mm. above um, Jay-Z. That time, you know, they were, both of them were struggling for a mm. while. She mm. brought all her assets that she had, which is also a very strong mm. um, millionaire as well. Mm. And when they conjoined their assets together, they both became really powerful. And that's how they were able to get to number one. Mm. So for me, so he, she's let me tell you, on let me show, you. sorry, on an offshore. So Kanye is using her grace. Is that what you say? No. Wait, wait, Relax. no, 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 that's no, no, not what no, no, it is. No. But let me. What just... I said is, I said Kim Kardashian is a big contributor mm. to this aspect in terms of their collaboration. Mm. That's all I've said. So now let me tell you what you would have said and how you would have said it if I had said the same thing if it was. Kim Kardashian that was declared the way, and I said, Kanye, you were like, no, so what do you mean? But well, you know so, how that's wait, actually wait. like, I know you're going to say that. So, because, so let what do you, you mean? Let me so are you saying because a woman is smart enough to bring her asset together with a man, and she's not the richest woman, so we think that is a problem. We don't want this woman to I be woke. You. We don't want this woman to be smart. We don't want this woman to be empowered. So because she was smart enough, other women should be smart enough I to do that. You know, that was, you that's were, exactly knew, no, what knew, you would have said. I knew said. you were exactly going to, you know, I knew, I knew you were going to say that. And I researched the thing for you. So if you want to go and quote me wrong, I already I was ready for you. It's not about. I remember I'm saying, when. Why are let you me finish. Bringing that let up me now. finish. Let me finish. When we talked about Kim Kardashian, because she was on a list, and mm. and um, what's it called, Kylie as well. Mm. I said the, you guys said the same thing. Mm. I was going on and on and on about how. Um, She's not self -made. No. Yes. Exactly. I was going on about how those girls were not self, -made, especially Kylie. Kardashian, so Kylie, Gen Kylie so, Jenner, rather. Yeah. And I was saying how like Kylie, Kylie's not self-made, da, da 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 And I remember you brought up, no, maybe it was Elsie that brought it up. Elsie brought it up. And I said, well, I cannot argue with that. So I actually did not do what you're saying. I agreed okay. that there was a contributing factor to that. Do you think that you can be the richest man without having any help or support? Okay. I mean, are you people using yeah, your head okay, on the okay, table? Okay, ha. So ha. Ha. Just, just okay. Kanye okay. West has actually been a unique person right Thank from you. time. Thank you. The Nobody's taking it away. All okay. I said okay. was that there's a contributing factor to that. So, if, you don't okay. think, if you don't even, the guy is unique. It's not just it's not just Kim Kardashian mm, as well. Okay. There are other people that made a huge fact, a, a huge part of his success. Guy, he's, um, Adidas. He's exactly Adidas is a huge one. They backed up this guy's product, used they their gave platform, him loans. gave him serious yeah. loans. So not act like as if no, I've said too much. Well, that's okay. it. That one day, but Kim Kardashian. No, no, that Kim Kardashian. Anyways, anyway, Tea Time continues right after this break. And yes, our topic on Tea Time will be here, you know, brand new. Go nowhere. Stay. Here's to strong women. May we know them, may we be them, and may we raise them. The progress of women is progress for all of us. The World Trade Organization has appointed a former Nigerian finance minister as the new head of the organization. I'm very proud to be the first African. I'm proud to be the first woman. My guest tonight is a critically acclaimed author from Nigeria whose most recent bestseller. Please welcome Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. <laughs> Giving priority to women is not an option, it is a necessity. So go girl, tell that story that has not been told before. Step into that spotlight and shine. Get up, get going. The world is waiting to be wowed by your very existence. Because when you go where no woman has been, you have no idea just how many will follow. There has to be a decision point. <laughs> Um, the way your baby's presenting, we have to rush you in. And my partner at the time was like, you going to cut her? 
are you going to catch it? Is it going to leave a scar? And I said, oh, oh, I, 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 I'm a belly dancer. What is the problem here? No, no, I'm vulnerable about the future of the children, the future of mine and the future of the generation of my children. I want to have nude pictures taken. Of you? Yes, yeah, but without showing my private parts. I, I want yeah, to put it someone. in my front room. Yes. And they said, you can't do that. People yes. will be embarrassed when they came into your house. I said, mm -hmm. well, it's my body and it's my front room. All the things that we do, what is the purpose of it? I just realized that I was more trusting before I was six. So many women, they just feel like I have to cook for my husband, I have to breastfeed my children, I have to pick them from school. <laughs> because society expects Then you go to. home and you cry and you stop your career, you can't do anything, then you blame everybody. You took that choice. Yes, yes, y'all, this is still Tea Time on Plus TV Africa. And of course, we're still having, you know, the amazing time, or as we always do. But now introducing our half hour her topic on Tea Time. And of course, we came with friends. Yay! I got my, I got a friend. You keep thinking you know how to sing, but you I don't. don't. I don't need to know how to sing, but you know the song, so you can just sing along and not hate on a brother. I don't know, it's in my blood, sorry. To hate on me. Yes, yeah, well, so. Thank you. Thank God you said that on live uh, condition. Of course. But so I is think, that something but I said before? Can't sing. I can I have music video. No, 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 no. See, see, I, I, you I, should I increase my views. I have a music video. I've missed yeah. the fire. Really. Oh, oh, fire. Oh, what you can yes, sing. Yeah. Increase my view. I'm sure Maka can relate. And of course, we came with friends. Like I said, my friend is a soul singer of international repute and a real one. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, meet my friend Maka. How you doing, Maka? Hello, everybody. Yeah. Hello. And our other friend, of course, from the On My Corner, mm -hmm. is a corporate executive who made our time to, you know, <laughs> be with us out of a busy schedule of dealing with money. And yes, it is yes, the so. beautiful <laughs> Nancy. Hey. 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 Hi, Nancy. Yeah, Hi, and of Nancy. course, we got Wally with us. Yeah, so for those of you wondering, is he a guest? Yes, he's uh -huh. just a guest anchor with mm -hmm. us today. And yes, probably you see more of Wally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's mm -hmm. get straight to it. The topic for the day is, do you think challenges in Improves a person's character. If possible, let's discuss this with personal experiences. So we're going to be starting with Nancy. Nancy, tell us, do you think so? Hi, Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Nancy. Nancy looks frozen. Maka, are you with us? Yeah. Okay. All right, so Maka, let's start I'm with you. Here. I think Nancy is frozen. I'm Too much money. Yeah. You know, they're okay, frozen so our accounts. I'm, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm obvious. Obviously, of the opinion that um, your challenges uh, help make who you are. So they can make you or they can destroy you. Either way, they contribute to who you become. Mm. And I've had experiences. Being a musician, number one, definitely comes with its own, um, with all these issues and all the the roadblocks anybody can imagine. So that automatically so has contributed to who I am today. It's not easy to, to, to say, oh, I'm going to leave my, my steady income and paying job as a lawyer and, and follow my passion. Mm. True that. True that. Um, become a starving artist. It's not, it's not easy at all. But I had, I had, I had different options. I could have quit, you get, mm. when, when it felt like, oh, oh, it seems like my dreams are never going to become a reality. I could have said, you know what, I'm not doing this thing anymore. But I, but I decided to persevere, and I'm still persevering. It has made me a strong person. Like, there's rarely anything now that will come my way that I won't be able to handle because of all the things I've learned on this journey. You feel me? Yes, yeah, true that, true oh, that, and I totally agree. Yeah, I mean, I like, I, I really like your, the space that you've been able to fill. It's not very common to see people obviously leave a very secure, like the 9 to 5, everybody knows 9 to 5. Even me, so I know 9 to 5 is not a great option, but one of the best advantages of a 9 to 5 is that You're security. Yeah. So for you, for me to meet people like that, that deliberately work out, walk out of a mm, secure um, space Amen. into a non-secure space is very inspiring, especially now when you're not going into the entertainment industry and you being a singer. I mean, obviously, um, 
um, privilege to interview you. So I know that you're an amazing person, but I want to know if there's any story in particular that, like, on top of your mind, you experienced as in give us a backstory, like the guy, you can call him Mr. A or whatever. But I want to know, like, a particular story that has really, you know, it, it's made Remember. a mark. Yeah. Yeah, there are too many to just. Um, what, which one is your favorite? If I had known that I was gonna, if, okay, if, if I had known give you that time. I was gonna share, we can um, give you time to think ahead. about it so yes. that we move to Nancy so huh? she can tell us. We can give you time to think about it so that we move to okay, Nancy okay. and she can share our own thoughts. Right. Then you come back with a story, Absolutely. right? All right. So Nancy, what do you think? Do you think challenges help you know shape the person you become? Definitely, definitely. Um, so for two instances, I think when it comes to finances and mm. relationships, mm. there are situations, if you don't struggle, if you don't have challenges in making money, you would never appreciate the value of money. Thank you. You never appreciate spending and savings. Mm. If you don't have challenges in building your relationships with people, because you need people in life, as mm. hard as people like to take that fact out. If God wants to bless you, he won't, matter won't fall from heaven. He would bring someone to you to help you. So if you, have, if you have challenges building your relationships, in the next relationship, your character will be corrected and Correct. you will act better in your next relationship. Right. Yes. So I've had personal experiences with money too and finances. I mean, I used to be, um, I, I don't want to say it's independent. I used to believe, oh, whenever I have an issue, I just focus on finding a solution and working it out immediately. But then I've been around people where they have issues and I've had to sympathize with them. So the old Nancy would be like, get your ass up and get this done, M get moving. Mm. But now knowing that not everybody's like me, so I have to sympathize with their situation. I have to maybe give right. them words of advice and words of wisdom. They might, not be, they might not be the time to act immediately, but the new Nancy now will try to give advice and try to stay with the person and be like, you know what? Things are going to get better. It's okay to cry. It's okay to feel sad, but mm. don't stay at this point. True. Get up and re-strategize and move forward. True that. So yeah, the old Nancy, yeah. So the old yeah. Nancy might be a bit tough love. So do you do you but uh, then Nancy, do you find it easier now for yourself to even ask for help? Because I mean I know that I, I know what it is like to be like Miss Independent and not if anything, it's just even not that you don't wanna you don't wanna ask for help, but you don't wanna feel like a burden or that you're just capable and able of doing it by yourself. So you do the hard route and just and make it out yourself. But now, obviously, it seems like you've experienced enough to have your mind changed. So is it easier for you now Hello? to like... Oh yeah, my gosh. Right here. Did Can you, you even... Hear us? Yeah, were you there? Hello? Are Where you did there? you start? She frozen again. Yes, yes, I can hear you. It's just, it's just a little break in network. But yes, um, I got your question. Right. In the past, I used to... First of all, I used to have a big problem with the, with the, with the answer no. Mm. So I hate when I ask. And people tell so if, sometimes I don't even want to ask because I'm scared of people telling me no. Mm. But the truth is, if you ask, you might just get a yes. Yeah. Mm. Yes. In most you cases, you would just get a yes. So the way I see it is better you ask than not. Mm. So yes, I've put myself in a situation, even at work when I don't understand some things, or even with family and friends, it's always a best decision to ask. Because mm. you might just get what you're asking for. Absolutely. So yes, I've been able to ask more than not. All righty. All righty. So um, I think I'm next, yes. right? Or if, if this, <laughs> Unless there's something. Maka. Maka, yes, are you going to share your story with us? I agree with everything that Nancy said. Um, mm. Do you have a story she, to share with us now? She made a lot of valid points. And I know that. Thank you. Miss Thank you. Year, when we had this, When we had this conversation, you were looking for some controversial vibes. Like you wanted, <laughs> mm -hmm. you wanted, you wanted this to be very, very, very controversial. Mm -hmm. And you get. But yeah. this topic, to me, it is straightforward. Yeah. It is very straightforward. But guess what? Guess what? Challenges build, build up character. Not for everybody, mm. but um, some people will choose to give up. It's left to you exactly. to decide how you want it to affect you. But, exactly. but challenges and, and, and definitely not... build up character. In my, yes. in my line of work, I've met so many people. I've worked with so many people. I've been privileged to run my own band and I'm the only female there. Mm. And I'm, most of the time I'm the youngest, I'm the youngest in the room, right. but I have to manage, manage these guys. It's not easy. 
But, but it do has. You, do you guys? Uh, do you guys think that they are some? I mean, I think we're all on the I mean, same consensus. We're all nodding yeah. our heads. But, but the, that, there's a, there's a oh, but. Yeah. Um, do you think that there are challenges that you face that just break you? Like there's nothing to. You can't grow, or uh, you, you know, can't be, get out of you it. can't. Yeah, there's just there's just some things that like people would face, just, yeah. and then that's it. You're broken, done. In the moment, it. it will seem like that. Mm. Every time, in the moment, in that real time, it will seem like that. But there is nothing on earth that should have that much power, mm. because everything will pass. To be honest, in that time, you will feel this. Like you, I, I can't go on. Yeah. But when you move on. And you reflect on it to be like, I actually came out stronger. All yeah, right. I agree. Right. So um, it's just me. like sometimes when you have to work out, and after like the first few days of working out, you feel like you know what, I'm not doing this. My body can't take it. Pain. But when you push through, you have that summer body in the end, and you're so grateful that oh wow, I'm glad I continued. You get so yes. Yeah. All right, but Chimo, when I had my first heartbreak, hi Chimo. It was, I felt like I was done. I felt like I was done. But see me now, I'm balling. Shout out to my ex. Hey, <laughs> shout out to the ex, yo. All right, but, but on the real though, I've seen, you know, kids that they have no challenge. Personally, I went to a private university, Babcock. I saw guys that went from private primary school to private secondary school to private universities to their first cars being given to them, to their first millions of naira being wired into their account to start whatever business of their choice. Absolutely. To their first, you, to even the father still investing and buying shares in the mm. company and doing adverts in the company. Mm. And they have, they've, had, they've had life so easy. Mm. And if you see these guys, they're still the ones that you see and they'll be your motivational speakers and you listen. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Now, I think that, um, you know, when you're talking about character, it is something that is imbued. Like they say, a leopard never changes a spot. So regardless of the circumstance, I feel like some people still fall back into their old person. Regardless right. of what they have experienced in life, right. I have seen it not once, not so you're twice. That a challenge does not always be, be what makes your character. Sometimes mm. the type of environment you have grown up in, yourself, the type of people you mingle with, with, actually shapes your character. Now, that is not a challenge. Do you understand? The fact that I have rich parents that help me with everything is that I, I, I want that type of challenge. Uh, okay. uh, but, but, being but, rich is not easy, yo. <laughs> my parents, being rich, see, the parents are the rich ones. Now you're not I getting went, it. We're talking about not... Kanye West. He said you want to have Kanye West problems. Mm. Be careful what you wish for, my, uh, my guy. My bro. Please, can I be the richest black man in Nigeria mm. with problems? Be careful what <laughs> my you guy. wish for. I want because that problem. That comes with his own problems. Absolutely. All righty. <laughs> All right, that, that one D. More money, more problems, isn't it? Yeah. That's what they say. More and money, more I, problems. I like the fact that we're even bringing lyrics into this because I, I, this just took me back to some 50 cent line that said, Joy wouldn't feel so good if it wasn't for pain. Mm -hmm. Yes. If it wasn't for the pain. The song you wouldn't get. feel so good if it wasn't for rain. Do you understand? So yeah. there are things that you actually have to go to to be able to appreciate other things. I totally agree, but mm -hmm. I don't also agree that it is everybody that has to go through a painful challenge to yeah. be loaded. I said that before now that you choose um, you choose the way you, you want yeah, it to yeah. affect Absolutely. you. Yeah. 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 Every and in your hands to and move something or to just die there. Alrighty. And some things are not some things are not just necessarily materialistic. Absolutely. Everybody could some some people could have all the money in the world, and but they, they have, have some issues. personal demons they're exactly. fighting. Exactly. I don't, so I don't, if you I, yeah. have you, you do you do a private jet every weekend? Do you sleep well at night? Yeah, that's the question. Yeah, I'm sorry, so people have private personal jet, battles sleep. they're fighting, yeah. and that, I, I, that's still I, I, a challenge. I, I don't think so there's anyone. So you're able to push through. Yeah. Then kudos to you. Yeah. yeah, I don't think anyone is free of challenges. I don't think so. Yeah, even with true. all the money in yeah. the world, I think challenges just even look, a baby, look different for even different Even babies people. have their challenges, and Absolutely. babies are supposed to be the I most I mean, even innocent. the fact that teeth grows out of your mouth is a challenge it because it hurts. So, um, I, I, I don't think I don't think money is she can secure you from not experiencing or being exposed to challenges. I just mm. think some challenges are more are a bit are more different. Extreme than the yeah, other. more extreme than the other. And depending on the character mm. is how 
that challenge would then impact your life. Like right. some people have been through big things mm -hmm. and they just walked right through it, really um, myopic yeah, and flat, like, and nothing fantastic okay. happened to them. Yeah. And then some people experience one thing, just one thing, one little thing, and then they build their whole persona and create a whole empire based on what they've experienced from that one thing. So, Alrighty. really, but, but let's, we haven't got yeah. any while he's yeah. Um, yeah. First, yeah. Of all, first of all, um, challenges mm. is a must. Mm. If you don't go through challenges in life, you will not be where you are today. True. Even our fathers that are today, that are probably our fathers, the rich ones, yes, I'm sure they will have gone through one challenge or the other. Because if they are rich. If, yes, and we are, we the children are, are the ones probably enjoying it right now. But there's no how, even we as the children, we must go through one challenge or the other. And mm. that is actually what What's makes us. That, that is what makes us. Exactly you can be in the best makes, schools and you are a exactly dumb person. That is what makes us what we are today. Exactly. Yeah. For example, uh, <laughs> I, I, was, I was discussing with, uh, with my brother here, this, uh, with my brother. I was like, even waking up early in the morning is a challenge. Mm. Yeah. Big challenge. Yes. Big ass challenge. Big one. Very big challenge. One. <laughs> so if you understand what I'm saying. See my sleep gang in the yeah. building. We love sleep. So it's just all about you just, just, just training yourself and keep pushing as you said, mm. you know? So it's a... There's, it's, too many, there's too many factors in life that are... That, are, that you can't control. So if and if you can't control every factor of, about life, then you're always going to find a challenge, mm -hmm. right? Because even if you say you have all the money to like get all the robots to give you everything that you need on time, you don't know how your body is going to respond to a cold weather, for example, or that you are inbuilt allergic to dust, or that you can't see well. Like there's going to be something that something. is just. Oh, off. Wait, I, I don't mean to go spiritual yeah. now or you know religious. Do you know that? I, Do you I think actually that have um, actually have some verses in the bible so that thank you my guy you see we're thinking alike well, that's why i brought my friend my co-pastor <laughs> assistant pastor in the that, beauty that challenges improve your your character absolutely yeah. I'm, I'm looking at my bible now so this is um james james chapter one verse two to four count it all joy my brothers when you meet trials of various kinds for you know that the testing of your faith Mm -hmm. produces steadfastness mm. and let steadfastness have its full effect mm. that you may be perfect and complete Hallelujah. okay but can i can i ask something though i mean we're all agreeing sort of to the consensus that that challenge is good for you and that it builds and i think that's just a testimony of our characters mm. but now do you think <laughs> do you think though that there are some challenges that are unfair yes. where you hear Definitely. someone's story mm -hmm. And you just think, wow, that is very unfair. And the person doesn't make it through. And the person, I don't want to say gives up, but the challenge wins over that person's battle. Um, I, 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 do you think that, 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 that there's ever a case or ever a challenge that you could go through that beats you and it's not your fault, really? Do you know, I... That's I, the question. I, I, if that person came to speak to me, eh? mm. the fact that the person is alive means the person is surviving. Because people have have taken their lives because they couldn't yeah. um, take Very it anymore. Genuine. That's yeah. true. So the fact that that person is still there to even tell me, oh, okay, this is what I'm going through. That person is brave enough. And I'll let that person know that you're already winning. The fact that you're still here. This is just real time. You're going to get through this and look back and tell this story and it will end in a different way. Right. Mm, I don't yeah. Know. I mean, definitely, definitely life is unfair, first yeah. of all. And some people are put in situations, some people are born into these situations, in fact. Mm. So let's say a young girl is in a ghetto area and she gets raped mm. and she has to have the baby. Mm. That happens to her. Already, it's not fair, but things, yeah. definitely there's a, light, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. It's always better to push through than, than keep yourself in that dark place. Mm. So definitely some, some situations are not fair, but what can you do? Yeah. It's life, a question. Really. Sure, Maka. Okay. Yeah. So the topic says, do you think that challenges improve a person's character? Okay, so now character, when we hear, oh, this person, this person has character, our mind always goes to it's a it's 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 positive, yeah? Mm. But mm -hmm. can we assume I like where you're improve going, a Maka. person's character can also mean a bad character? Mm. Like true. now, if you're true. in a gang. True. If you're Absolutely. in a gang, they're gonna they're gonna tase you. They're gonna they're gonna haze you, train you, 
to improve your character you get From that yeah. to, 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 that guy. <laughs> to be able to to go through the the, the gang related things mm. like if you're in prison now to survive there you have to go mm. through all the prison mm. challenges to build so that strong character to survive Absolutely. in prison i'm just yeah. i'm just throwing in a little curveball that one deal that one controversial. Is yeah. <laughs> that one really did yeah. so yeah so character you know it differs so i don't know so do we want to share about when an experience has actually trained each and every one of us to be you know stronger okay so i think for mine um because i i, 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 I can admit that i've i've been a bit sheltered like my upbringing and all of that um, but relationships, like Nancy mentioned in the, up, in the so very beginning, think, yeah. mentioned how like that's a huge factor. And I mm. think um, there was a relationship that I experienced, and I didn't know until that relationship that I had a codependent um, character where I would really infuse my life into that person, and you know I can't really do much. Or my I didn't know consciously, but the limitations were, I was limiting myself based on that relationship. So if the man mm. is not okay with it, I wouldn't do it. Mm. And some way I told myself that I can't really do it if my man and I are not doing it together. That kind of life. But I think mm -hmm. I've always done that until that relationship. And it was the first person to disappoint me. If anything, exploit me on a large scale. So that experience for me showed that I have to become really comfortable with myself as an individual. I mean, sometimes you don't always think that. But yeah, that has made me even a lot more confident. So I think that's a challenge alrighty, that alrighty, I'll guys, say, yeah. I really wish I could take everyone's experience of what made you stronger or what made you the better guy. But we, we sadly have to go. <laughs> oh. So yes, I'm sorry. I'm but sorry. it was fun. It was so much fun. We're going to do this again. Yes, We're going was. to bring Keep our friends yeah, once fun. again. And yes, of course, thank you, you know? so much for having yes. me. All Absolutely. right, so thank you everyone for watching. Join the conversation on social media with the hashtag Tea Time or tweet at us at Plus TV Africa. Remember, you can catch up on our previous episodes, including this one, and all our exclusive content by subscribing to our YouTube channel at Plus TV Africa. You can also watch Tea Time on Outer TV and in London on Ben Television. A big thank you goes out to my guest, Maka and Nancy, and of course, my co anchors, um, Ife, Ife Omai and Adiwali, and the entire production team of Const. Of course, thank you for watching Plus TV Africa's Tea Time. My name is Ife Oshunkeye. Politics has helped shape the decision of the polity from conspiracy theories to good old fashioned comic politics. These are the result of tomorrow's election. Yes. Tomorrow's okay, election. you have it already. Have you? I am not hungry. If I need appointment, all I need to do is to start praising government. Plus, politics will fill the polls of the country from friends to frenemies, even strange bedfellows to clones and stooges. We go beyond the rhetorics and the drama to analyze the story behind the story. <laughs> The moment we stop having charlatans occupy political offices, we will curtail hate speech. Plus politics, not just another political show. It's about putting you, the citizens, in the know. See, is it for upcoming artists to blow in Nigeria? Welcome to Plus Trending. I am Vicky November, your host, saying thank you for joining us on today's episode. Welcome back. It's Tea Time on Plus TV Africa. Practice makes me perfect. I'm not perfect yet, but I'm a lot better than I used to be. He's a king. He's entitled to marry a hundred if he wants to.
One woman tried to abolish this practice in Zimbabwe. It's widely practiced in Kenya. It can't be refunded in Uganda, but a modest amount of money and a cola nut is acceptable in Senegal. We're talking about the customary practice of the dowry and bride price, both highly regarded in many cultures across the continent, but also seen as vessels that reinforce negative stereotypes. So which one is it? Well, that's the topic of this episode, and we're glad you can join us. I'm Ayan Bior, along with my colleagues Ariane Itangishaka and Haiti Adams Fitzpatrick, and we're joined by Aisha Moazu from the House of Service and Marvelous Nyahuye from the Zimbabwe Service. Welcome, ladies. Welcome Thank to the you. show. So, ladies, first things first, there's a lot of confusion between the terms the dowry and the bride price. So, by definition, the dowry is a transfer from the bride's family to the groom's family, and the bride price is the opposite, it's a transfer from the groom's family to the bride's family. Now, obviously, this varies from country to country. In South Sudan, for example, we call it the dowry when the groom gives to the bride's family. But of course, in Nigeria, for example, there's, there's a lot of differences. To me, the bride price is a token, you know, um, that highlights the degree of commitment by the man to the woman. And in Nigeria, it differs. It cuts across the religious and cultural, um, you know, like barriers. Like, yeah, barriers. Okay. In the upper north, mm -hmm. you know, we have both Christians and Muslims, but the Muslim north practice dowry, right. which is guided by Islamic injunctions, and it should be nothing less than a quarter of a dinar. While the Christian north practice something similar to what they practice down south and the east and the west. There you have the traditional uh, uh, marriages, the woman is sorted for by the groom-to-be. Mm -hmm. You know, his family, you know, presents some gifts that cuts across all cultures. Now, they have kola nuts, they have yams, symbolic items that represent uh, their token, asking for the girl in marriage. And I think, you know, basically that tradition is a wonderful tradition, but because of the way we do, you know, people practice it these days, it brings about all the issues, challenging issues up north. Mm -hmm. We have issues of modernization, mm -hmm. where you have, you know, you, you have seven days, you know, um, going from one kind of ceremony to the other, mm -hmm. and this, you know, weighs a lot of burden on the groom. I see. And then it brings about issues of uh, men not getting married. You have uh, ladies. Um, and we're right. absolutely going to get to all of those issues. Uh, but Marvelous, I want to hear from you. You're from Zimbabwe, yes, and I know I it's multifaceted there, too. In Zimbabwe, I think we also have uh, similar traditions to what is actually practiced in Nigeria. But uh, in our customary marriage, you, it's called Rora in Shona, which is uh, one of the tribes there. And in Debele, it's called Lobola. And I think it's the same in South Africa. But basically, it's the coming together of two families. It's a symbol of the love between the, the groom and the bride. So what happens is when the man decides that he wants to marry, he finds a negotiator called Munyai. And that negotiator will literally negotiate on his behalf on uh, how much monetary compensation he's going to pay to the family because he's given a list where he has to buy groceries that are eaten at the event and also some clothes and some cows. But really, it's just a symbol of the love and unity between the two families. Absolutely. Well, this is a multi-layered conversation, and we want to hear from you at home. What does this practice look like in your country and your culture? Let us know on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Our handle is at VOA our voices or send us a message on WhatsApp. That number is on your screen. And Ariane, I want to bring you into this conversation because these are practices that you hold very near and dear to your heart. That's right. That's right, Ian. I grew up here in the U.S. I've been here for 20 years. But about eight years ago, I went back to Burundi to get married in a five-step ceremony that took several days. Five steps. Five-step ceremony. But, you know, in those ceremonies, one of them is called Gukwa, where they give Inhuano. That's the dowry. Mm -hmm. And I would actually trade my white wedding for that dowry ceremony, simply because of the meaning of it. The meaning of it is two families coming together, not mm -hmm. two people, two families coming together to make a covenant, to make a covenant to help these two people who are in love to stay together and to be nurtured in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. And so when that celebration happened, I really, really was so proud of the culture, the Burundian culture. And that's why I really admire the fact that there is such custom. And I think that 
the, the covenant comes with gifting. And I appreciated the fact that there was gifting. Like in this picture, you will see my husband giving my mother a, a, a gift. And in this other picture, you will see myself giving my mother-in-law a gift. So we are exchanging gifts. We are showing humility. We are showing respect. We are showing love. And so that custom is the very The foundations of a, of a healthy marriage. Exactly. Well, you know, what, what's so interesting, of course, this isn't something that is part of my culture. But, of course, living and being in South Africa and being South African, I'm very aware of, as, yeah. as uh, Marvellous said earlier, of Lobola culture. Um, and that was, that to me is somewhat still controversial mm -hmm. amongst people. Mm -hmm. but, but as an outsider on this, I... What I love about Labola, the idea that, you know, it's a show of gratitude mm -hmm. to the bride's family mm -hmm. for raising an upstanding exactly right. um, woman, for the investment yeah. that they have put. I think no matter what culture you're it's from, and we all are from some tribe or other. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting right. how similar they are. Right. And that, you know, um, that you talked earlier, Aisha, about symbolism. Mm -hmm. And I, I think you, we can take many things away from this, but the symbolism, I mm -hmm. think, is, is what it was intended to be. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an interesting debate going on around the where the woman is the person um, who pays the husband's family a, a dowry. In India, in Indian culture, there's an interesting debate going on about what the dowry was meant to be and what it has become. Um, the dowry was actually, when I was looking at this, it actually seemed to me, I'd like to think of myself as very progressive and, and very liberal in my thinking, and I could see that, you know, it started out as actually something that had very progressive intentions, mm -hmm. that it was meant for the woman to enter into a marriage with financial security mm -hmm. and financial resources, you know, in case of an emergency, so that she set up, you know. But it's interesting, because in India, it's the women who control the dowry. Mm -hmm. it, that that is how it used to be. Um, there is a professor of history at Baruch College in New York. Her name is Vina Talwa Oldenburg, and she has written a book called Dowry Murder, the Imperial Origins of a Cultural Crime. What's so fascinating about this is she talks about dowry crime these days where women are now um, victims of domestic violence um, because of a dowry, dowry dispute. Mm -hmm. you know, yes. And what's so interesting about this, she says that the dowry was, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. something that was managed by women for women, mm -hmm. but that with British colonial rule, that really, the social and the, the economic upheaval that came with that, women were stripped of their economic resources, women were stripped of their rights to inherit, mm -hmm. and that is where this now became this issue where greed to Day has seeped into the culture. Families are demanding more and more of the bride. Mm -hmm. And if the woman's dowry doesn't live up to the, the, ma the man's family's demands, they can keep making demands on her, and that makes women vulnerable. They become oh, the um, they can become vulnerable to domestic all violence. Cultures. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and that is just one example of the evolution of the dowry and the bride price. And we're going to have a lot more on this conversation coming up. But we do have to take a short break. We have a lot more coming up, including the devastating details of a bride price story. It took a life-ending turn for one young woman. But first, we asked our Africa Division colleagues how these practices vary in their countries, and it turns out each culture has its own spin. Take a look. Well, I'm from Ethiopia. The dowry process is called is delosh, and it's, it's usually given by the groom for the bride. The groom will send his friends, the neighbors, and some elderly people, along with a, a luggage full of um, gifts. Well, back in the days, or in rural uh, cities, they send the cattle, sheep, or goats, um, a certain amount number of uh, cattle. But in the city, they send like luggage, and then they'll they'll show you, they'll show off, saying that we bought this clothes, we got this from uh, some like expensive store, and we're uh, bringing this for the bride to have it, and then they'll show off uh, jewelries, a lot of jewelries that are made from gold and silver, and then all the her neighbors, her dad, her uncles, her aunties, they will sit around and they will clap, and if they as they'll say we have accepted this and they will they will take it and take it to the room and usually the the groom and the bride are not allowed to be there and then after that at the end everybody will feast they will throw like a, a feast there will be music food it's so beautiful i'm from rwanda and in my culture bride price is ingwano and the ceremony or the process of uh, uh paying dowry or bride price is called gukosha 
and it's a day of celebration. Uh, we usually gukwa, quote unquote, uh, the bride price is in form of cows. We hold cows as a, a, a very important symbol in our culture. And so the always um, the families of the girl and the and the boy will negotiate uh, on the amount of cows that uh, uh, this girl is worth, and that is always based on um, usually based on some factors, including her education, her background. But it's not really about the money or the number of cows. It's about these two families coming together uh, to celebrate the union. Uh, my tribe is called Zagawa tribe and we live in the desert side of Darfur, North Darfur. The bride price we call it uh, Sidak or Tagi. In mo local language they call it Tagi because they give it to the girls. So uh, most of the tribe they keep camels and uh, and some of them they do cows but mostly camels. So it depends on the, like, what uh, number they negotiate, like 100, 50, they have to give it to them. So in my tribe if you have girls that mean you're going to get rich because they will give you like a lot of camels. So if you have boys that you mean, you will be broke because you have to pay a lot to get them married. But the price is also had effect because as a girl, if you got married, uh, you will never get divorced. We don't have divorce. You never get divorced because the divorce, uh, they already paid your price. So you cannot divorce. Even the husband is passed away, you will marry the brother. If the brother passed away, you marry the other cousin. You just stay in that family forever. <music> is about more than just sitting here and talking about women's issues. It's about listening to them and bringing their opinions to the table and making sure their voices are heard. Because our lived experiences, our stories, and our voices will help shape the next generation. You're with our voices. Welcome back. Despite claims that the practice of bride price degrades women and a recent diary case in Nigeria that tragically ended in a suicide, the tradition is upheld as a cherished culture and religious symbol of marriage. Many Nigerian scholars say that Western world has misunderstood the concept of diary or bride price and that it actually honors women. Chika Odowa has this report. Sadatu Ahmed Manga is having a dye called Lale or henna painted on her body because she's about to get married. It's part of the wedding custom in northern Nigeria, which is largely influenced by Islam. But the most important marriage custom is the bride price, a payment of cash that the fiancé gives to the bride's family to show how serious he is about the marriage. In Islam, bride price has to be paid before the wedding. Bride price started since the days of the Prophet Muhammad. May peace be upon him and we continue it. But more Nigerians are condemning the bride price as a degrading practice that requires payment for marriage and places a monetary value on women. Women are largely left out of determining the bride price, which is negotiated between the male relatives of the bride and groom. In October, a 17-year-old northern Nigerian girl burned herself to death out of shame because her boyfriend could not afford the agreed-to bride price, which was less than $50. Initially, this issue of dowry and bride price was more like a pleasantry being exchanged between the husband-to-be and the in-laws-to-be. And uh, when it all started, I mean from various cultures, it were little things that everyone can afford. But as time goes on, it became so big that most young people cannot be able to afford. So it's a thing of concern. So it's like business. And using it to put people in classes. But African literature scholar Dr. Agatha Ukata blames radical feminist ideology for the rising criticism of bride price. She also says the tradition is misunderstood by the Western world. There is a cultural shock for the West, for them to say that there's something called a bright price, because this is quite different from what is obtainable within the Western culture. 
Getting married in Nigeria is big business. In fact, the wedding industry here generates millions of dollars. But for many people across Nigeria, it's not the fashion or the glamour that symbolizes a wedding. It's the payment of the bride price. And if the bride price is not paid, then the couple is not married. Paying a bride price is the opposite of paying a dowry, which is wealth transferred from the bride's family to the groom or his family. The majority of Nigerians across all religions uphold the tradition of bride price and say, unlike a dowry, it underscores the value of a woman. I think it's right. I think that's the only way you can show a lady you to appreciate the love for her, like, to show how much you love her. And for families like Mangas, the marriage is not truly valid and celebrated until the bride price has been paid. Chika Odua for VOA News, Yola, Nigeria. Well, this is a tragic case and one in a million, I will say. And she acted on impulse, you know, that second when you just lose it all and you don't know what to do and then she just did what she did. Mm -hmm. And then it ended up in a, that tragic situation. Mm -hmm. But there are other ways she could have gone about it. Because back in uh, Kano State, when they started marrying off unmarried women, widows and spinsters, mm -hmm. the government organized weddings. And then that state where she comes from, Zamfara State, also said they were going to burrow into that and then adopt that same thing. If she had spoken to someone, probably she would have had someone to come in, step into her. But come to think of it, why should I marry my daughter off to a man who cannot even pay 20,000? 20,000 naira is less than $50. Mm. That's what they were asking for? Yes. Mm. That's, that's, you know, the highest she could pay in a rural community like where she comes from, 20,000. But it doesn't just end at the dowry. Mm. There are other things involved, and I think modernization come into play mm. here. Yeah. Because you have, like you said, five steps of wedding, you know, yes. ceremony. Sometimes you have seven steps, different days, and you have to provide for the, you know, you have to provide for her for the clothes she wears, for the food to eat and everything, and then the gifts to accompany her with it. And t going to her own house, the lady also has to come into the marriage with something, mm -hmm. like you said earlier in Heidi. The dowry. The yeah. dowry, and then something to uh, give her some financial mm. um, support when she, right. you know, she, so, so that she can pressure. stand up. Yeah. But in she Zimbabwe, just, I would like to just come in and say, you know, this is the situation now where you have the negotiator coming in mm -hmm. to speak to the family of both the bride and the groom. Mm -hmm. right. If they had Talk, you know, spoken as families, maybe they could have resolved the issue. So, so, so marvelous, this makes me wonder, uh -huh. is, are these cultural practices hurting or helping the institution of marriage? helping and hurting at the same time. Yeah, I, I think so. I would say that they are helping, they're helping in, you know, in making, making the two families come together. And also when, you know, you have problems, as two couples, you can go in there and go back to the family and get them to talk to you. And the negotiator comes in again and tries to negotiate for for a settlement of, you know, how you can move the love forward. Mm. But it also hurts now when we get to the situation where yes. the family asks for an exorbitant amount. That's right. Right. They will be like, she's a doctor. Right. We need to get all the money right. that, that we... That's so the more accomplished the woman is, yes. the more her that's, dowry that's is. That's what happened to her friend of mine yeah. who could not afford yes. to marry, to pay mm. Lobola yeah. to, um, for a woman who was so educated mm -hmm. and who he saw as his intellectual equal. Yeah. But she was a doctor and the father kept reminding him that, you know... I invested in my daughter, so mm -hmm. you've got to come up, put, put, put up, you've got to put up all this money, and, yeah. and that worries me. You start out your life with so much debt, and just yeah. trying to afford the bride. But even he's saying he's considering marrying outside his culture, mm. um, or outside his race. What does that then do at the end of the day for the culture and the tradition, and for making sure that yeah, it, families it, are now looking it at it as on. a source of income, which is very sad because initially it's just supposed to be a symbol of right. unity, right. Yeah. but it becomes a symbolism. source of income. But, like but, but I, that is exactly the, the problem is that you have a lot of poor families who mm -hmm. see the husband as a potential mm -hmm. income generator. Yeah, exactly. Unfortunately, like in my yes. culture, like, you have the five ceremonies, mm -hmm. and in those five ceremonies, they say, we're going to get something out of it. And when they start to look at the money, and it's unfortunate because, you know, these ceremonies are, uh, are well-meaning, mm -hmm. but the negative part, as you said, the consequences, as you said, Ayan, is when they start to calculate, calculate, calculate everything. But, you know, in the past, 
um, we never used to hear the complaints about the price of the weddings right. because they used to just use the minimum that they had. And I because think they also they the used to go back to the room. tradition mm. to say why exactly are we doing this? What's the symbol? So families have, mm. have to sit down together and really discuss why are we doing this? Whether your daughter yeah. is a doctor. And, and also the question they do, but modernization mm. plays a very key role here. It does. Yeah. But these are things not just that... modernization. Mm. I think we talk about modernization and this is true, yes. But also our, at the same time that our economies are modern Modernizing, our yeah. economies are also in decline. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about income generation. People are looking for this as a money-making scheme. And money young people scheme. in particular. Um, a history professor, I'm all getting all academic here on the <laughs> subject, but um, Jabalani Mapalala from the University of Zululand, according to his estimation, about 60% of black couples in South Africa are preferring to live in sin mm. because they simply cannot afford mm. to get married. Mm -hmm. uh, which again brings the question, what does it do then for the culture if then children are seen um, as being born out of wedlock or even as illegitimate, mm -hmm. um, yeah, regarded sure. that way because the parents never got married. Mm -hmm. So that just that and the fact that I, I worry that young people are sitting with the, this, this concern that we cannot get married, mm -hmm. how legitimate is our union going mm -hmm. to be? and also starting out their life in debt. I think when money comes into it, yeah. at the same time, though, if young people um, in an economy like South Africa's where there's so much inequality, people mm -hmm. are either very poor and extremely wealthy. And Heidi, we're also seeing a lot of very powerful and, you know, like independent women also coming into with a new practice that we're seeing. Right. They help the groom to pay the bride price, wow. yeah. so to speak, that's and that's yeah. taboo. And, and to, and and to and speak about so modernization. Sure. Even in Burundi, if you help your husband, husband. to be, mm -hmm. pay for your bride price, it's very shameful. And but I personally is, is don't see anything that? wrong with that. And I, I'm speaking as a young person who is not married yet. Um, but for me, these are issues that we really think about. How much is it going to cost me? Mm -hmm. Would you um, want a dowry to be paid for you? You know what, I'm of two minds of this, because okay. you talked about the evolution of marriage, mm -hmm. or the evolution of the dowry, and that's something that I think about a lot, because I think that it has created a lot of negative consequences for women in particular. But at the same time, I do see the cultural aspect. I think for me, if I were to if I was to be the negotiator, mm -hmm. I would ask my groom's family to build a school, something that would last long within. But I know you I'm don't think that's a good idea. I'm totally that, because I would <laughs> still want, if I were to ever remarry again, I would like my family to receive some kind of gift to my because husband. Because right yes, not to the hurting. community. The government can take care of the community. Mm -hmm. So when people see government? the symbolism, mm -hmm. right? People Why? love yes. the symbolism. Why government? You don't. You, you think that? Why should government take care of uh, that? The community. No, the community like a boho, a school, like a yes. school but or something. For me, my family has to get something well, from my husband to be. Thing. Mm -hmm. That's the for thing. It's a generational thing. Mm -hmm. I would and still want to go people, back. People, you know, a bit older. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think I think that it definitely yeah. is generational because to be honest with you, people but, my age are the ones who have had to sit with the consequences yeah, that were created by the older generation. That's and true. I think and you also, know, Ayan, I, that, I agree with you 100% because in my culture, mm -hmm. there are certain ceremonies that you're not even supposed to speak nor be seen. That's, and in some of the to feed the But in some uh, ceremonies, I showed up. We need I was more present. awareness. We need more awareness. Mm -hmm. We need to now talk to the younger generation the to see this is the pros and cons mm -hmm. of the culture. And then so that they know that it's yes. our heritage uh -huh. and then we should hold on to our heritage it's mm. deeply rooted in our cultures mm. and but we can lose some of the ones that are not good but also yeah, we can, that we can at the end of the day it doesn't set women up for a life of abuse and a life of disempowerment not really so men no. think that they that own the women Right, that, that women aren't, and, and I'm going back to the, to the dowry issue, where a dowry dispute can, at the end of the day, take a woman from something that was meant for her to be empowered mm -hmm. to a point where she becomomes um, a, a victim but I think also it's, of there is a domestic violence. social media has sold this custom as being break up buying the woman. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. And maybe we need to go back and explain that, no, this is our culture, mm -hmm. and we are for and against some of the practices, but for me, it should stay. Well, there's a woman in Zimbabwe who disagrees with a lot of us here, actually, and we're going to introduce you to her after the break. She is a vocal woman who is challenging the legality of the bride price custom in Zimbabwe. Stay tuned.
is about more than just sitting here and talking about women's issues. It's about listening to them and bringing their opinions to the table and making sure their voices are heard. Because our lived experiences, our stories, and our voices will help shape the next generation. Welcome back. Each week we feature African women who are disrupting the norm and creating positive change around the world in a segment we call Women to Watch. Our woman to watch comes from my home, Zimbabwe. Priscilla Vengesai filed papers to argue in the country's constitutional court that the bride price tradition amounts to discrimination based on gender and sex while perpetuating inequality. Alternatively, she wants parents of both the bride and the groom to be thanked for raising their children well through Lobola in the spirit of gender equality. A lawyer by training and former Chitungwiza Municipality Chamber Secretary, Vengesai was uniquely positioned to present her case. Vengesai was bold enough to take her fight to the highest court in Zimbabwe, and that is why she is our woman to watch. Sounds like she was very bold, huh? Well, be sure to watch our voices on the VOA website where you can catch up with the latest episode. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media where we have live chats on Twitter. Our handle is at VOA Our Voices. And we now leave you with a quote from South African documentary filmmaker Sikhle Klope, who used her voice to say, We have the power to make decisions and we respect our culture. When we question our culture, it doesn't mean that we want to do away with it completely. And that's all from us today. I'd like to thank Aisha Moazu from the Hausa Service and Marvelous Nyahuye from the Zimbabwe Service. Ladies, it was a pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us on the show. Thank you for inviting us. Absolutely. As always, thank you for watching. Good day. can't talk about education reform if we don't decolonize our education system. What we do not understand, we will stigmatize. Because it's just cultural. It, it's, and I think it's just human nature. They stop paying no salary. I don't like remembering it. I am angry at Nigeria. I'm angry at this government which seems to be letting us down. I'm angry at us as a people. In the process of struggling to free myself from his hand, he tore my pants and jumped in with me. Yes, I commit the first truly. Young girl, do you know where you are going? I say, I'm going to America. I say, oh, now so that they talk, you are going to Libya. Which America? As it then do match our place, some people, they die now. 
This is PLOS TV Africa. Big stories live here. Our focus on one-on-one -on -one today is mental health, and my guest is Bukala Lamid, fondly called the Therapy Queen. She's a certified cognitive behavioral chain therapist, emotional intelligence specialist, a child mental health practitioner, and one of Africa's leading family mental health coach. She provides relatable solutions to preserve the mental and emotional wellness for every member of the family through counseling training therapy and advocacy interventions. Bukala is the founder of the Safety Republic International, an organization that is using the best 21st century skill set to influence healthy narratives in family, life, parenting, and childhood development. Thank you for joining us. Thank, Thank you, you very much for having me. Okay, so um, my first question, I'm going to go straight to it and ask, look, depression, anxiety, mental health, it has become like the 21st century buzzword, everybody's using it. And everybody, you know, talking about it. I just want to think, oh, I'm depressed. And, you know, can you just break it down for us? What does mental health mean? What does depression uh, mean beyond just the fact that it has become now? Okay, thank you so much for that question. You know, every time when we have opportunity to talk about mental health, we try to break it down to the basic, you know, definition so that people can relate with it. Everybody has mental health. Just like the way you have your physical health, you have your spiritual health, whatever health that you have is just the same way you have mental health. Mental health is like the state of your mind. Hmm. How does your mind work? How do you regulate it? How do you manage it? What goes in, what comes out? That is just a basic meaning. So everybody has mental health. According to World Health Organization in 19, 2005, they define mental health. I hope I'll be able to define it word to word. They said mental health is a state of well-being. Okay. Where someone can relate with themselves, relate with the environment, cope with the everyday stresses of life. Mm. So we should be able to understand that life comes with its challenges. And you must recognize these challenges. Then you have the capacity to face the challenges and bounce back because there will always be challenges. So that is mental health. That means you have a good, if you have the capacity to cope with everyday stresses of life, mm. okay? And you have the capability, you know, to give back to the society. That's another part of a good mental health. Once you're able to take care of yourself, you can cope with the everyday stresses of life, then you can now give back to the society. So we consider you having a good mental health. When those things are not in place, then it becomes a mental illness. So mental health is more or less like your emotional well-being, your social well-being, your spiritual well-being, your physical, whatever well-being, everything, well, yes, to one. to one. Once everything can work, then you'll have a good mental health. Okay, I, I wanted to find out, it seems like in this time that we're in, there's, there's a lot of um, awareness about mental health, but there's still a lot of stigma despite the awareness. Why is that? Yeah, you know, we've come a long way and yeah, mental health has been stigmatized right from the beginning. So nobody wants to uh, f you know, face the reality that something is wrong with them. You know, we have lived for over so many years, we have lived in a society where people have been trained not to express how they feel. People have been trained to suck everything in. You know, people have been trained to wear what we call mask. So you're not feeling fine, but you don't want people to see your vulnerability. We were not trained to accept our vulnerability. So if you now cannot manage that, those vulnerabilities and they come out, it's a bit weird for people. Then they think that something is wrong with you. Okay, so now this leads me to my next question. How do we begin to change that? Because I find that it's a very, um, I'll speak for Nigeria, I'll speak for, it's a very cultural thing to want to say, you see, um, you know, don't tell your problem to somebody, don't share this, you know, be a man, be a woman, you're not the first person that it has happened to. 
So how do we now begin to draw the line to, okay, I'm not going to share my problem with anybody, but this thing is driving me crazy. I want to man up, but at the same time, I just sometimes just want to be vulnerable. Is it something in our culture that we have become, um, that we have trained ourselves that we can be vulnerable, um, you know, and open up when we have problems? How do we begin to, you know, solve this? Yeah, we, we need to ch start changing our mentality. How? How do we How? do that? We need to understand that vulnerability is strength. Then we need to understand that every emotion is valid. Because people believe when you are sad is a, is a bad sign. I mean, it is okay to be sad. What is not okay is to stay sad. There are two different things. So when we start changing this, um, this mentality, this stigma around, oh, you're not supposed to, like what you said, man up, suck it up, uh, it's over. You know, I tell people in mental health, we don't believe in forgiving and forgetting is a scam because you see the way god you know wired the brain you can't forget but you have the capacity to forgive but once an event comes that triggers your memory there's somewhere in the brain where every event of life is stored so once you are triggered it comes back to your memory but because of the environment that we stay people would rather not want to talk about it that is the mentality, that is the conditioning that we have lived with so, for so many years. That's why it's strange for people, for, for me to come and tell you, that, oh, I think I'm not feeling fine. And the next thing, the, the person will say, no, no, it's okay, drop it, is that all? No, forget about it. You can't just forget about an emotion. You have, you must express an emotion. You must feel an emotion. If you don't feel it, it won't go away. What you only do if you don't feel it is you repress it. And one thing about emotions is emotions that is stored up for a long time becomes toxic. So that's why you see emotions can be in your system for several years. But when it comes, when it's coming out that time, you will not have the ability to manage it. It will just burst in your face. You, you could do something you can't manage. So what we are trying to say now to change the narrative is, once you're feeling something, recognize it. Very, very important. If you are sad, recognize that you are sad. Understand why you are sad. Look at it. Once you're trying to dissect that emotion, it becomes powerless. Mm. But that is the opposite of what we were taught. So when, when we have a feeling, we were taught not to think about it, to push it aside. But you see, emotions don't go away, like I told you. They stay in, can you, you, would, you would believe that recent studies even show that emotions, our emotions are linked with medical health. So sometimes when you are so stressed, you could have headache. Emotions has been linked to have people having diabetics. Emotions have been linked to people having stroke. Because those things are chemicals in your system that goes to disrupt the normal function of the body system. So now, the narrative, how do we go about it? We need to change the mentality, the mindset around sadness, for instance. Every emotion is valid. Like I said the other time, I said, if you feel happy, you should be able to regulate happiness as well. There is no good or bad emotion. We are the one that gives interpretation to emotions. I give an example, I'm, I'm angry. My anger may be a positive emotion. How? I failed an exam. And I'm so angry and disappointed at myself. Instead of me translating that anger into something negative that can injure me, I could translate it to a positive anger that will help me to pass my exams when, when next I'm writing. Okay. So there's nothing like good or bad emotion. What we have is healthy and unhealthy emotion. Uh, we'll take a short break. And when we come back from the break, you tell us more about our emotions. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this break. There has to be a decision point. Um, the way your baby's presenting, we have to rush you in. And my partner at the time was like, you going to cut her? Are you going to cut her? Is it going to leave a scar? And I said, <laughs> what? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I'm not a belly dancer. What is the problem here? No, 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 I'm vulnerable about the future of the children, the future of mine and the future of the generation of my children. I want to have nude pictures taken. Of you, yes, yeah, but without showing my private parts. I, I want yeah, to put it someone. in my front room. And yes. they said, you can't do that. People yes. would be embarrassed when they came into your house. I said, mm -hmm. well, it's my body and it's my front room. All the things that we do, what is the purpose of it? I just realized that I was more trusting 
before I was six. So many women, they just feel like I have to cook for my husband, I have to breastfeed my children, I have to pick them from school. Because society expects Then you go to. home and you cry and you stop your career, you can't do anything, then you blame everybody. You took that choice. You're still watching one on one, and our focus today is on mental health. And we still have Buki Lamid here with us. You're, so you're talking about the emotion that no emotion is good, no emotion is bad. So um, now let me go back to the home or to raising children, because you know we tell them, oh, it's not good to be sad, it's not good to be um, angry, it's not good to be. How has a parent now, or has a teacher, as a caregiver, what do I need to? know and learn in simple terms in teaching children that okay like you said that being sad is not a bad thing sometimes so how do i begin to teach this to a child and then it becomes part of his or her life as they grow older all right thank you so from the very basic emotions are just our messengers a lot of people don't know that we are the master of our emotions but when we don't have the cap capacity to manage it they become our masters so right from when children are quite young, you let them understand that emotions are your messengers. But how do you send them on an errand? Is when you feel, when you express them. Mm. So you are not supposed to hold a particular emotion just because you don't want people to for you don't want to see you in that particular state. I mean, when you want to cry. A lot of times, crying is therapeutic. A lot of people don't know. The glands that secrete the water for crying actually is therapeutic to the system. There's an hormone that is released. Oh, really? Yes, there's somewhere in China where if you're feeling very overwhelmed, yes. you go there, they call, they call the place a crying temple. So you go, you find a place, you sit and cry. Oh, wow. You would notice that sometimes when you cry, you feel a bit of ease. Yeah. So there's a science behind crying. But because there's a label to cry, in this part of the world, that when you cry, men. you show you show vulnerability weak. or you're yeah. weak. And like I said from the beginning, vulnerability is strength. Mm. In fact, for you to have the ability to express yourself is strength on its own. So while we grew up as children, uh, adults killed that part of us. So that's why you see a lot of people cannot even stand up for themselves. They can't make decisions on their own because those emotions are supposed to build up those things. So what should the killed. adults begin to do now? What should parents and teachers begin to do now and differently? Every emotions are valid. Okay. When I on. do training for teachers or parents or whatever, when we're talking about emotions, I make them write some things out. Those things are those statements are very, very important. Emotion, every emotion is valid. It is okay not to be okay for some time then there are no negative or positive emotion. It's only healthy and unhealthy emotions. My emotions are my messengers. You know, those are the statements you, you create around children so that whenever they are feeling what they are feeling, they have the ability to express it. Then you as an adult should now become, I tell parents that you don't become a thermostat, you are a thermometer. What that means is that for children, particularly, children hasn't really developed the capa capacity to regulate emotion because their brains are not yet developed, fully developed. The brain is fully developed between the age of 25 and 30. Oh, okay. So you can see that children are still emotions and emotion. They're still moving. They're still trying to understand their world. Yeah. So you as an adult have the responsibility to help them regulate. So when they're on 100, you try to bring it down for them. When they're on the 50, if it's too low, you, you, you hype it for them. So you are like thermo, therm, thermometer. You are not a thermostat that once they throw their tantrums or what they begin, you, too, you just add your own and everything. So before you even have the capacity to regulate another person's emotion, you have to regulate, regulate your, own your own emotion, emotion as well. Emotion. You must understand, you must learn. It's, it's a learned behavior. You must learn how to regulate your emotions. The first thing is for you to understand that, see, how am I feeling? That's first. Why am I feeling this? What can I do as I'm feeling this? By the time you start thinking like that, you have won with your emotions. Okay, so now let's go to, because I, I saw a recent start about how the numbers, more women are depressed um, than men. So why, what, in Nigeria, the, uh, the thoughts I saw, well, why is this so? Why? Because you would have thought that because women are more expressive, we cry more, we talk more, we, 
just more we gossip more that you know that we will be less depressed than you know than the men why why is this um, so? okay so um i will talk i will talk about this from neurobiology so there is a research that has uh, be, that has confirmed that the brain of the man is a bit different from the brain of the woman and most times it's by nurture you know as human beings we come into the world by nature then nurture now comes in so when we are growing up there's this particular part of the brain of the female that is being raised or that is being nurtured more than that of the male. I hope I'll be able to explain this in a very basic form. What I'm trying to say is, you know, in our nurturing, parenting, society, environment, nurture the logical part of the brain of the male okay. more than the emotional part. And it starts with as simple as colors. When you we give birth to children, mm. there's this stigma, or this stereotype of giving young girls pink. Pink and then boys give, blue. Yes, and there's a psychology behind colors. If you don't grow with some particular colors, you may have little emotion. Let me give you pink an example. Uh, yes, pink is a very energetic emotion, and it brings sympathy. So if you are not raised with a pink color around you, you might not necessarily have sympathy for people mm. because colors have energy. So that is nurture. And there's a way the brain communicates with things around it. So if the brain doesn't see something that will nurture that part, then that place be becomes dormant. Do you understand it now? So, and as uh, the male is growing up, the female is growing up, mm. there's this way, there's this um, double standard that we do. There's a particular way we raise the young mm. girls and there's a particular way we raise okay. the... It has an effect mm. on the brain as well, and which in, in, in its own has an effect on the emotions of the male. That's why you see that women are more nurturers than men because there's this uh, attention on, you're going to your husband's household, you have to take care of your fire, your in-laws. They never tell that to men. You have to do this. And that helps the you know, emotional part of the brain of the females more than the men. Yeah. Now, the statistics that you have said is quite right. It's because most of the time, men have been conditioned to mask their emotions. I tell you, as a mental health practitioner, that men are more emotional than women in a lot of things but they don't show it they hardly show it it's it's strange for you to see a young man on the road and the young man is crying in fact you are the president that says, ah and you're a man what's wrong with you so he knows your response he would rather not talk about it but if you see a young woman everybody will come and they'll start saying oh no you know say you'll be woman you know that kind of a thing and that has really not short that um, neuro pattern we call it neuro pattern of the brain so much so that women are more emotional than physically emotional, you would think, but more so men are more vulnerable and they are more emotional than men, okay. the girls. Okay, so we have to go on another quick break. It's funny how you, you know, you have an interesting conversation like that, and time is not your friend, but we have to take um, another quick break and we'll be talking about, and when we come back from this break, we'll be talking now about the barrier entry into your field everybody now is a mental wellness expert mm. go online do something short so how do we begin to um, differentiate and know that okay this person this person is certified person i can speak with a trusted person i can you know relate with we'll be right back after this <laughs> Thank you. You're still watching one on one, and our focus is on mental health. Okay, so now let's talk about the entry barrier for um, mental health. It's a good thing. I like um, the how there's a lot of awareness now. How there are a lot of coaches because I can remember a few years down the line, I had 
also experienced um, depression at some point and there were not very many counselors and coaches like we see today so i had to go to the federal um, hospital at um, yaba but there's a challenge with that because i feel like because of this now a lot of quacks have come into the industry so when everybody's a mental wellness expert everybody's a coach and then they can deal with this how are you um, the experts in the industry how are you trying to regulate this what how do i know for example that this person okay i don't want to go to um the psychiatric hospital in yaba but i want to speak to a wellness coach how do i know that this person is a certified person and not a quack yeah you know for every field we it's not surprising that you always get people who leech on things like this and all that but let me quickly educate people you see we have the academic part of mental health and we have the professional part so for instance you could just decide to say okay you want to do some um, courses in counseling so that you could do basic counseling help people around which is fantastic okay so a counselor is different from a psychologist it's different from a mental health practitioner and it's different from a psychotherapist you know we, they all have their um, area of specialty depending on if it's academic or if it's um, professional okay. okay but the holistic or the the umbrella of everything is psychology so the mother of them is the psychologist and the psychotherapist they have everything so it's under this psychology that you now have all the um, counseling the coaching everything bounces back to helping people right and to a large extent we have professional bodies we have professional bodies in nigeria we have um, professional bodies in counseling where you have the names and numbers or the details of everybody who is certified is everywhere on 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 the internet where you just okay. type in you want to you know they will bring it out you have okay. professional mental health prof uh, practitioners they are there you have professional coaches because coaches too are quite different from um psychologists and they're quite different from counselors but somehow they all work hand, hand in, in hand. hand okay so it is not uh, unusual for you to get quacks okay and one of the things that we are, that's why we are trying to push a lot of awareness because, you know, we are not used to these things from the beginning. Most times when people have um, issues surrounding their emotions and mental health, the next place they go to is to seek spiritual because I think there is yes. this link between spiritual and mental. I to get to that because mental. many people just see a religious counselor and then we just, we, we um, demonize everything, you know, you reject it in the name Mm. of the Lord and mm. we do all sorts and then we never mm. really get to the core mm. um, of the issue. So because we really don't have so much time, I want you to tell us, maybe just break it down like three or four practical steps on how to protect our mental health. How do I protect my mental health in my home, um, in my workplace, and just everyday life? Just share with us some practical steps. Thank on. you. So there's this thing that we call good body image. Okay. You know, you have to be real with yourself. If you are not real with yourself, you can't get yourself. What do I mean by that? Always look at the bright side of life. Everybody has their issues that they deal with. It is just the normal stresses of life. So when you are going through issues, look at the brighter side. It's not trying to uh, switch on you or because you see the brain has a way of the brain has been wired to always look at issues okay you know like i said the other time that there's they, this thing in our brain called the amygdala it's like a fire alarm it, it, it's the one that catches all the issues of life and tries to magnify everything for you but if you're not if you if you don't have a grip of what is happening to you it magnifies it it makes it bigger then you may not be able to handle it and that's where you have mental health issues and that's why it aggravates to illnesses okay so you should have the capacity to look at yourself and look at your vulnerab vulnerabilities and your strength mm. and focus more on your strength everybody has vulnerabilities everybody have their strengths focus more on your strengths talk more to yourself in fact that's another myth people think when you talk to self yeah, is the, you need to talk to self you need yeah. to have like a meeting to yourself sit yourself that ask yourself questions look inwards I tell people that our work is not to find solution for you. You have to find a solution for yourself. But our work as psychologists and mental practitioners is to guide you. That's the skill that we have that you don't. You know, your, your uh, solution may be on this right side, but you are looking on the left side. So our own 
responsibility is to guide you towards that path where you will find self. We cannot find it for you. So always ensure that you manage your emotions. Never allow anything to, I mean, I'm talking about emotions that never suppress anything. If you feel sad, I tell you, oh, I feel somehow today. I don't need you to say, ah, uh, why? No, I just need to express it. Always make sure that whatever you feel, however you feel, you let it out. Mm. And you see, you must always find someone to talk to, no matter what. Find so Everybody needs a coach. You must always find somebody to share your uh, issues with. The back is a myth when people say, oh, uh, don't share your story with any. The worst people can do is to share it around, right? But the thing is, it, it's, not, it's not resident in you. You have been able to express it because you see, repressed emotion becomes toxic. So it is even more about you than whatever anybody wants to do or want to say about your issues. Don't let it sit with you because it becomes an issue. And that's where mental health illnesses comes in. So always let it out. Express, express, regulate, okay, talk so, about it. Um, I have, a, I have a, um, a question though, should I say more of like a concern? Mm. I find that sometimes some people try to manipulate you with their mental health or claim that they have this mental health issue to get away with situations or get away with some things to try and just you know so for example i could just give an example and say oh you know you want somebody to do some work and the person is coming every time like oh i'm just stressed oh i'm depressed i mean and this is like the constant excuse day in day out so how do you begin to uh, draw the line i know that look this person is truly just being a lazy person or, or okay maybe truly this person is depressed how do i you know, as a layman, I'm not an expert, but how do I begin to now draw the line? It's okay, this person's being manipulative here and just being plain lazy, or this person truly needs um, help. Most of the time, people who are depressed don't say it. Most of the time, from my experience in the field, you are the one that actually, so people cannot literally come to you and say, oh, I'm depressed, that's why I didn't come to work yesterday. No, it doesn't work that way. There are signs that you would see. They sometimes even they don't say it. You, if you are the one that is so observant that you will not notice it around them, because whatever they are doing is fantastic to them. That's the irony of it. They don't even know that something is happening. Most of the time, it's another person. That's why we are, we are creating the awareness that look out for people, reach out to them, talk to people, because most times people who are depressed don't say anything. Mm. So when people come to you and say, oh, yes, I was depressed, I slept off, like I said the other time, they, you know, bastardize the word depression. True. You will have to be, be clinically proven that you are depressed before you can say somebody is depressed. Okay, you can be in grief. You can be in sadness for over a period of time. But is it excessive? Is it consistent? Then we would now need to put some psychological assessment in place to now decipher. Is it mild? When we've understood that, okay, it might be depression. Is it mild? Is it moderate? Is it critical? Okay? So most times what people go through is just sadness. It's not depression. Mm. Depression has to be clinically proven by a certified psychologist for you to know that, okay, this person is actually depressed. So most times they don't even want to talk about it. You are the one that would see the signs, the symptoms, the behavioral pattern in the way they talk. For instance, yes, I'm just talking about heaven every time. Yes, I'm just talking about death every time. Yes, I'm just talking about their grandfather that has been dead for so, you know, they just talk about weird things. You know, you see that there's an antisocial disorder. They don't want to go out. They don't want to interact. Sleeping patterns has changed. Eating patterns has changed. Or they are unnecessarily too happy. Because that can be tricky. So it is not everybody that is happy that has a good mental health. So a lot of them use that emotion as a cover-up so that you don't detect. So most of the time, they don't even want you to know. Wow. So if somebody tells you, I'm depressed, that's I didn't come to the office for three days, know that that is manipulation. It's not depression. Okay, thank <laughs> you very much. Sadly, we've run out of time. We've run out of time. Oh. Really would like to have you um, again to you know, talk about our mental health because it's a very, um, in as much as a lot of people take it as a fad, but it's a very essential 
um, topic to have on. Thank you so much, Bukila. Thank you for having me. And sorry. that's all we can take on one-on-one -on -one this week. Please ensure to take care of your mental health, reach out to people, check up with your friends, see a therapist if you, um, if you need to, and ensure that it's a satisfied one. That's all for this one-on-one -on -one this week. I'm Fumi Unwa Jefe. Contrary to popular belief, Corona is not a hoax. The virus is real. Be responsible. Wear a mask. Wash your hands with soap and water and avoid crowded places. Maintain physical distancing. Be responsible. Together, we can overcome the pandemic. Southern and Northern leaders lay out terms to remain in the entity called Nigeria. And violence erupts in prior state as Christians and Muslims clash over raging wearing of hijab. Well, this is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anacone. Well, joining me to have this conversation is Ken Robinson. He is the Secretary General for Pandef in River State and, of course, uh, an attorney, Christian Mwoko. Thank you very much for joining us, Mr. Wanko. Good evening. Thank you, uh, viewers. All right, so I'm going to start with this um, Nines. Uh, this is almost like a replica of IPOB, if I'm not mistaken. What's the difference between their self-determination and that of IPOB? I'll start with you, um, I'm talking with you, Mr. Jocko. My point is that uh, the, demand, the demand by IPOL is not unreasonable. Now, if you understand the premise upon which this demand is made, it's saying, look, let some things be put in place. So it, it, it's saying, I'm sure the fundamental is that they are really the part of this nation. It's for the nation to also decide that they really want to accommodate them. Now, I hope it's not really the only uh, group that is asking, you know, the government to fully integrate the citizen. Let everybody feel like you are a Nigerian. Let everybody feel like this is a nation that you have a part to. But you see, when it's looking like that some part of the nation is having a larger hand and upper hand over the other parts of the nation. Some of these grievances will come up. So we I am of the opinion that the leaders of this country should actually engage these people. I think that is the bottom line. You know, discuss with them. You know, come to uh, we'll, we'll, come to we'll come to the legality. We'll come to the legality of you know this particular uh, uh, movement. But uh, with leaders uh, like uh, um, Nadi uh, Tony uh, as security uh, or secretary of the group, we also have Professor Maya Wak Ugirimbe and Chief Sunday Adeyemo, who is also known as Sunday Bohu. Um, Mr. Robinson, what do you make of this group of people and their demands? You know, with the four-point agenda that they have put together. Is it timely? Could we say that this is bold or is it just preposterous? It's, it's important to um, highlight that there is an increasing rate of uh, ethnic groups demanding for some kind of independence or republics or break away from the country. And um, we cannot uh, deny the fact that perhaps it, the major contributing factor is the very obvious evident bias in the, in the conduct of affairs by the government in the last um, six years or so. And, and so increasingly, Nigerians are disaffected, people are disgruntled, people are getting more and more incest as it were against uh, the government and dissatisfied with the way things have been carried out. And so people are asking for some kind of independence or break away from the country. But I would like to say that PANDEF, as we have stated always, is not a, a sessionist organization. We believe in one Nigeria, but we, we think that things should be done on the basis of principles of fairness, of equity, 
and of justice. And, and so we, we understand the feelings in the country. And, and it has never been like this before. It is, it's never mm. been like this before. Nigeria has never been this uh, divided. And people, uh, several voices from every corner of the country um, clamoring for some kind of breakaway or the other. But we think that that's not the solution for pandemics. Um, and this, at this time, you know, if we break away, we might see other, other splitter groups breaking away from other subgroups because the, 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 the issues and the fundamental biases and issues are almost everywhere. So what Pandev has been asking for and appealing for is the restructuring of the country so that we could attain true federalism and that um, the conduct or the affairs of state could be conducted in a more uh, fair manner. And I think that that's what all groups in the country should begin to clamor for, for the destruction of the country. Let's dig deeper into uh, this group of people that call themselves NINIS. Now, uh, the, the secretary of the group, Professor Akintoi, described the country as um, a distressed federation wobbling through what it seems uh, like a terminal thrall. Uh, he said that the people of the southern and the middle belt of Nigeria have been at the receiving end of the most vicious ethnic cleansing and an onslaught by um, heavily armed militia. In fact, they put they they called them Fulanin militia. Um, they put that in bold letters, um, and they, they're saying that these people are masquerading as herdsmen. Now they're saying that they they would rather not sit back and watch the government do nothing. Um, and watch these people continuously hurt the people of the, um, the southern and, of course, um, uh, the uh, middle belt. So I'm asking, what does the law say about this issue of self-determination? We all remember we were all part of Nigeria when IPOP was prescribed by the federal government under President Muhammadu Buhari. And, of course, we're seeing something else that looks like a self-determination group. Um, and with... with Figureheads like uh, the very controversial Sunday Boho, um, should we be worried? Barista. Now, the point is uh, people at the receiving end of certain governmental reforms. I think the answer is yes. People are dying. People are just, I mean, it's like something has to be done. Something has to be done. Uh, yeah, I thought that they prescribed. So again, these are two people. Uh, I think you come by way of organization and the people who prescribe. But the people who they represent, you know, how do they feel? So basically, like um, my friend um, mentioned, there's a need for us to sit down and actually discuss through federation. You know, let this, this country can work. I personally believe that Nigeria can work. But then it must not work at this cost of other people. Some other person doesn't need to pay a huge sacrifice for this country to work. We can all stick together and it's not the way forward to make this country work. And if ultimately determination, self-determination is the way to go, it will be part of the discussion. And by the time we are through with it, we can have a great and better nation. But really, I think we can all agree that the way this nation is configured currently, the way we are losing people, the way people are dying, it needs a very serious review. And there needs to be no grandstanding in this. Government doesn't need to uh, pretend that these people are not real. I think that government needs to engage in order for us to assuage some of these rising tensions before they escalate into something that may not be able to contain. Um, Mr. Ken Robinson, do you, we keep saying, I mean, I don't know if you agree with um, Barista Wogo, um, he's saying that government needs to engage. Has there been, I mean, this is not the first, first self-determination we've heard before, I and mean, there's so many, but do you think the government has done enough to blur these lines? Because I, I think we're beginning to sound like broken records. Nigeria is a country that has its issues with ethnicity, um, divisions everywhere. How well do you think that the government of Nigeria has, I mean, I'm not just talking about the Buhari administration, I'm talking about governments from 1999 all the way down to um, 2021. How well have they been able to engage Nigerians on these issues? Or have there been some shady no-go areas where we have rather, we would rather not talk about, and maybe that's the reason why we're here again today? It, 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 uh, I completely agree with uh, um, Barista Christian Wogu on um, his, his conclusions. 
this, the killings in the country cannot continue on perpetual. You know, um, something has to be done, and, and the onus is on the government. You know, we, we, are, we have situations where presidential orders are either ignored or treated with levity. A few weeks ago, the president ordered uh, to shoot um, on site uh, anyone that is seen in the bush uh, with AK-47 and other dangerous weapons. We've not had any report of anybody being shot at, and then the banditry in the Northwest continues. So, so uh, the government has a lot of work to do. And, and whether there has been sincere efforts to you know, stem these this, this disaffections and uh, demands for self-determination is, is, is another issue. And, but the answer is obvious that government has not done enough. And that's why we keep seeing these things reoccurring and coming up intermittently. And, and the way it is now, it's going to be worse. The truth of the matter is that we need to call a spade a spade that nepotism under this present administration has done more harm than anything else to Nigeria. And the call and the onus, as we have always said, rests on the president and commander in chief of the armed forces of Nigeria, President Muhammad Buhari. He needs to be alive to his responsibilities. He needs to put, command his troops properly and make them to obey his orders. These killings must stop, no matter who is involved. For Nigeria to, even for us to have a, a, a very peaceful conversation, a reasonable conversation, we can't be having conversations under these kind of conditions. That's the, that's the truth of the matter. Mm. Let me go deeper into some of the demands and the, you know, the, the, the things that they declared during the, the press briefing. Uh, Nina's declared a dispute with the federal government via the uh, Constitutional Force Majeure Proclamation of December 16, 2020. According to them, it is uh, the one in which uh, it gave a five-point demand upon uh, the federal government to formally commence a remediation of the grave constitutional grievances um, enumerated in the said proclamation. They said they want to extricate themselves from the death trap and bondage, this is their words, um, unitary Nigeria has become for their people. Now, this is a very worded and maybe a bit, you know, um, touchy for uh, people to listen to, but they're saying that um, they do not want to be part of Nigeria anymore, and that they had given government um, a, some time to think about it and address the issue. But something that stands out for me here, um, Barrister Wogu, is the fact that they're asking for a constitutional amendment. They're saying, we need you to revisit the 1999 constitution. In fact, I remember they called it um, something that was um drawn up side by side an apartheid government in south africa and that south africa has done away with that um, constitution but nigeria is still following through with it and they're saying that they want government to deal with the issue of our constitution because they feel that that might address some of our problems is it something that government can really do immediately at the snap of a finger because they're giving government an ultimatum of sorts yeah you see my thing is that the constitution is not working for us. It might be working for part of the nation, but really, uh, profoundly, the constitution needs to be discussed, needs to be reviewed, needs to be recalled, needs to be redone. You know, in such a way that everybody can feel the satisfaction of being a citizen to a nation. Now, some, if, if somebody gives you an automatic not one, and say, look, do this or else this. It means that profoundly, that thought is not the thought that was originally intended. You know, the intent of the one to pull out, not on the fact of what was the original intent. The people want to talk. And that is why they have put forward and said, look, this is where we are. We may look weak and we are doing some kind of um, mediation. Now, we don't neglect such things. Because you know, weakness or strength is actually a matter of perception. It happens all over throughout history. You know, the, the weak suddenly becomes strong and very strong. And then the strong becomes weak. Now, there is nothing is going to cause the, this nation, except if, you know, somebody is just being reckless uh, with you respect, to sit down and look at these demands and even discuss them. You know, look, they are not just in isolation. A lot of things have happened in this time of pandemic and uh, uh, 
and the like. Meetings like this now held in virtually, and it's becoming almost the normal. Before it, everybody will be in central places because we look at each other's eyes. There is no more happy place. Things are dynamic. Mm. Life is dynamic. Things is dynamic. Now, so if if there is a call and this call for continual review, it's been there. It's not just now. It's been there for decades. Now, of course, just before 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 uh, Nina came up the stairs, um, there was another group of people who I, I spoke with last week. Um, they, they were coming together also to ask for a constitutional review of sorts, and they're in collaboration with NSAS in collaboration with different pressure groups in the country because they're also trying to get government's attention. Uh, as, much as, as much as we would want to give government an excuse of sorts, why do you think it's taken so long for the Nigerian government to answer the call of a constitutional review? Could it be because it's benefiting them and they'd rather not change it? Or what exactly could be um, the challenge? Yes, well, what is taking so long is self-centered. It's self-centered then. Because they consider me starting a segment of the nation that is actually, I mean, so long as this person is good, there's a segment of the nation that will continue to enjoy even generationally to their generations uh, unimaginable. Now, there are other parts of the nation that is paying the price for the enjoyment of that part of the nation. And in the country, it will take the, the agreement, the northern, the consent, the collaboration of that part of the nation for the constitution to be reviewed. And so long as mm -hmm. they keep enjoying and they are not ready to be at risk to be self set then that is what is making it to be a delay. And um, okay. um, some kind of intervention comes and it usually comes. And part of that intervention is this call for self determination. That's okay. what I think. Back to you, um, back to you, Mr. Ken Robinson. Yeah. For several weeks, you and I have been on and on talking about the issue of banditry, people being killed. Um, you know, it's just been one issue after the other. Now, the most lucrative business in Nigeria, obviously, is ca uh, kidnapping, and it's happening every day. Um, one of the most saddening things that we've seen is the video of those students that were, um, I think, adult students. Uh, they were from the university. That, that was like a very terrible video that we've seen. So we keep talking about this. Government has read a riot act of sorts, shoot at sight, close the airspace over Zampa. But the people in the middle belt, who seem somewhat are the people who feed us most of the food that we eat comes from the middle belt, and of course, maybe some parts of the north. But the pe those people are feeling like they have not gotten government's attention as much as they would because they've lost a lot of people. Let's not forget, before banditry became a big thing, it, you know, that they're spreading all to, down to the south, they were dealing with the people in the middle belt and then of course the north um i'm wondering to myself why do you think mr ken that with all of the conversations we've had and not just on this platform we've been having it everywhere else all we have heard is government say they will do this but what we see every other day is more and more kidnappings do you think that these people have a right to do what they're doing? And if there be any reaction from the government negatively, like in the case of IPOP, do you think that there will be a public outcry uh, in support of these people and what they're asking for? Uh, it's, it's unfortunate that we see what's, what's going on daily. And it's obviously young men and adults, young adults who are involved in these acts uh, seem to think that they have a right to do what they are doing. And we've seen videos and pictures of claims that uh, they were procured to do some things for some politicians and promises uh, were not fulfilled. And so this is their way of saying, we'll pay you back. Having said that, it's unfortunate that almost everything in this country, almost everything, and I mean almost everything, is, is lopsided, is skewed in favor of a particular section. Even the numbers in the National Assembly, the National Assembly itself is a skewed National Assembly. Uh, and that's why we continue to see it being unable to stand by the generality of Nigerians on critical issues. Can so, I push so you a little? Can I, I'm so sorry. Can I push you a little on that statement you just made? Because you're saying even the National Assembly is skewed. Everything is um, you know, tailored to benefit a certain sect of the country. How do you mean? Absolutely. 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 That's, that's what we see, and that's what's going on. And that's why all these problems have continued, have persisted, in, in spite of statements by government from the highest level, from the office of the president, statements made, I have not, not, not carried out, 
we, we see people tolerating criminality in this country. We, we see people accommodating criminality in this country. Acts of terrorism are being tolerated and, 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 and accommodated by government or by officials of government, better put. And these things will continue until the government discharges itself from, from, from this, 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 this very obvious and apparent um, biases that we see. And, and that's, that's the only thing, uh, you, you, the, you talked about the, one of the conditions the act by the Southern Amido Bell Leaders Forum that they want constitutional amendment. That could tell that sincerely, um, they are not asking that they want to leave. They want things to be better. That is correct. And the Nigerian government must respond to these demands of the people. Let me go into um, something that you just said. And I, they, I want to buttress it with some of the things that were said by the group uh, Ninas. They also called out the government on its um, one -sided, um, one sidedness and, of course, their refusal to dialogue. Um, they referred to government's efforts in dealing with the issue of its security as knee jerk patch work. And they also said that um, government is is not looking for other options on how to deal with this issue. Um, again, they, they have a five point, five point demand. I'd like to go into it. Um, the first demand is that they ask that the federal government should formally announce that their constitutional grievances and sovereignty dispute declared by the people of the South and the Middle East is going to be addressed. Um, they should also give a commitment to the to the, by the federal government, by, rather, the federal government should give a commitment to wholesale decommissioning of the, according to them, 1999 constitution. They want it to be jettisoned. Um, and they're also asking that the government um, give a formal initiation of a time bound transitioning process to midwife the emergence of fresh constitutional protocols. I'm going to swing back to you, Dr. Uh, Barrister Wogu. Uh, this is a clearly stated, um, you know, step-by-step -step thing that they want government to do. In fact, they're also asking that people from different regions, constituents from different regions of the country, be part of this process step-by-step. -step. They will have to verify, they have to vet the things that are going to, into the constitution. If they're comfortable with it, if they're not, it should be struck out. Of course, that's going to be a big deal. Remember what happened in all of the confabs and the conferences that we've had. Nobody really agrees on anything, and then we now have no-go areas. Can that, I mean, do you see any agreement coming through on this issue uh, of the decommissioning, in their words, of the 1999 Constitution? Really, the point is, and this point has been several repeated, that the Constitution as it stands today does not start the generality of Nigerians as a whole. Now, these are demands, and you know, really, as we need to be, to be enforced that illegality of any type, even from the person demand, making the demand or from any other person, it's not acceptable. It will not take us to any way I would. But, but will the changing of the constitution solve the problem that we're having now? Because don't forget, we're having a serious case of insecurity in the country. People are being killed, not south, east, west, whether we believe, or believe it or not. Hence the reason for some of these groups rising up to call themselves names. But does a constitutional review of sorts or an overhaul deal with the immediate problems that Nigeria is facing, especially in the interim? All the problems Nigeria is facing fundamentally are traceable to the Constitution. And then uh, if we focus on the Constitution and get out a Constitution that is fully acceptable by everybody, you can be sure that possibly 90% of the problems of Nigeria will certainly abate. Hmm. Uh, finally, Mr. Ken Robinson, um, we're already a, a group of people that have been tailored to think and act a certain way. So as a Nigerian, when they ask you, I mean, you meet a person, the first thing they ask you is, where are you from? You know, they don't ask you, um, what's your name? They just say, so where are you from? And then, we, you know, I've lived in River State for a long time. We have the issue of indigenes. Uh, me, I'm an indigenous. 
you are not an indigent. And it happens everywhere, especially when somebody's trying to maybe run for an office or do some good. That's when the issue of ethnicity and the biases that come with it. And we, like I always say, we're divided along the lines of ethnicity and religion. Do you think it will be easy for us to jettison the, the way we think, the way we act towards our brothers and sisters because just a, a piece of paper has been signed and we've all given it a nod? Will it not take time for us to do away with that attitude or is it something that's going to happen overnight? De definitely it's going to take time. Change is a process. It, it won't happen overnight. We have been you know, living with these conditions and these biases uh, for a very long time. And it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's not just uh, about the federal government, but uh, what, what uh, I'm sure Nigerians are saying, the federal government is the central government and should lead by example. Let us start from there. If there is a constitutional amendment and there are enabling laws that would make um, state governments or the federal unions uh, begin to put in things some place. Uh, for instance, internal security should not be an exclusive, uh, it should not be in the exclusive legislative list. States uh, should be part of, uh, should be constitutionally empowered to, to take care of some internal security matters. Uh, and, and so on, on the issues of these biases and ethnicity issues, it will continue. But as, as the changes begin from, from the constitution to other issues, and then people begin to place less um, emphasis on where you come from, because what, what it is today is that even the government, you know, kind of highlights where you come from. Um, people are not appointed on merit. People are appointed on religion or ethnicity. And it's, it's across board. And so when government at all levels, I mean all levels, begin to de-emphasize ethnicity and where you come from and, and begin to project people based on merit, we, we see a Nigerian today uh, winning, or Nigerians, uh, Bonner Boy from River State and, and Biscuit winning Grammy Awards. Mm -hmm. If it were an ethnicity, they wouldn't have won those awards if it's, where, uh, it's based on where they come from. But the, the mm -hmm. world is moving beyond where you come from. The world is looking at what can you offer? What can you bring on the table? Okay. And that should be okay. the, the emphasis that we should begin to go forward with in Nigeria. Well, Ken Robinson is the National Public Secretary for Pandit River State. And of course, uh, we also had Christian Wolfe. He is a legal practitioner. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being part of this conversation. Thank you. It's a pleasure always to be here. And Ken Robinson, National Publicity Secretary, Pandev. Thank you. National Publicity Secretary. Thank you. Well, thank you for staying with us. We'll take a short break. And when we return, uh, the prior state hijab crisis resurfaces as Christians and Muslims clash violently. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. strong women. May we know them, may we be them, and may we raise them. The progress of women is progress for all of us. The World Trade Organization has appointed a former Nigerian finance minister as the new head of the organization. I'm very proud to be the first African. I'm proud to be the first woman. My guest tonight is a critically acclaimed author from Nigeria whose most recent bestseller. Please welcome Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Giving priority to women is not an option. It is a necessity. So go, girl. Tell that story that has not been told before. Step into that spotlight and shine. Get up, get going. The world is waiting to be wowed by your very existence. Because when you go where no woman has been, you have no idea just how many will follow. We can't talk about education reform if we don't decolonize our education system. What we do not understand, we will stigmatize. Because it's just cultural. It, it's, and I think it's just human nature. They stop paying no salary. I don't like remembering it. I am angry at Nigeria. I'm angry at this government which seems to be letting us down. I am angry at us as a people. In the process of struggling to free myself from his hand, he tore my pants and then he left me. Yes, I commit the first truly. Young girl, do you know where you are going? I say, I'm going to America. I say, oh, now so that they talk, you are going to Libya. Which America? As it then do mark our place, some people they die now. 
This is PLOS TV Africa. Big stories live here. still plus politics. Now, Christians and Muslims clashed violently in Lori Kwara State over the raging hijab controversy as the state government reopened the 10 affected schools for academic activities. Um, well, we are having, apologies, we are having a difficulty with connecting with our guests, but we did have this similar conversation on February the 23rd on the same hijab crisis. We'll bring you that particular conversation. Hopefully we can get our guests to join us later on as the conversation continues. Stay with us.
So welcome back. We want to thank you for being part of the conversation this evening. Apologies for the technicalities that we had today. Unable to bring you our guests from Cairo State, but it's been an interesting conversation. I am Mary Annington. I'll see you tomorrow on Plus Politics. in Mende, Maryland, at the very popular Kane Village, particularly thrilled at the level of creativity being displayed in terms of the artwork here by the artisans. An array of weavers and sellers of baskets, chairs, and artistic household furniture made out of cane were all hard at work at the time of my visit to the Kane Village. The men, women, and children all seemed engrossed at their day's task. I was welcomed by the president of the Cane Weavers Association, Mr. Edward Apofure. According to Edward, the weavers and sellers were collectively relocated under this bridge in 2002, a hard miss for anyone coming from Ikeja or Ikurudu Axis. This is a fantastic, fantastic location. How long has this Cane Village been in existence? Well, the Cane Village has been existing for a long time ago. We rise from our forefather, who founded this uh, industry, uh, established for yet 1974. Mm -hmm. But we came to register this industry in 1986. It was registered as National Cane Association. So we have been existed for many years. Uh, before we came on board, we have been a roadside uh, seller, but uh, the government said that uh, we not, they don't want anything else. Anybody want to operate the system, we must come other union and register. From my observation, more elderly weavers were in sight as I pondered on the posterity of this age-long craft. What exactly does it take to learn this craft? How long would it take an average person to learn how to make something like this? If you want to learn this work, one thing you need to have is that you have to have patience. Mm -hmm. This work is not something you can just carry a knife and do. You go for process. You, know, you, you got the material which is called cane. Mm -hmm. And from there, you scrape it. After you scrape it, you tear it. After you tear it, then you knock carve it. And this chair you are sitting on today now, before we work on it, we have procedure go through before you come like this. We have the framework. After the framework, before you can whip on it. So learning this work is not a really a bad thing. And to know this work is not a bad thing. You know, I can tell you today now, we are this business. We have many graduates in this business. And those who, who finish secondary school are yeah, here. Yeah. Are they, are they, are they, are they, are they, And some of them can even, then they do, do this for and now making their life better by go more further their education more. So we create job opportunity. This job you see, is helping young people who are not lazy. I was eager to meet the university graduate who came into the business for what he described as a lack of jobs in Nigeria. According to the National Bureau of Statistics, the unemployment rates bedeviling the country as of the third quarter of 2018, 
stood at 23.1 percent, hence putting the number of unemployed at 20.9 million. I'm a graduate from the University of Port Harcourt. I studied pure and industrial chemistry. I graduated in year 2010, did my NYC and in Boeing State, Zia Girls Secondary School in Zangbo. I left the NYC the year 2014. So, but due to Nigeria and no job creation for we the youth, so we engage ourselves since Nigeria said that everybody should find themselves doing one or two things. However grateful for the good gift of education, which he said was sponsored by his parents, with hopes of being employed after graduation, he fell back to this craft, which for him portends a means for better livelihood. So I started doing it right from the year 1990. After my university, since there is no job, I have to fall back to what I know how to do best. So at least I can make money and take care of myself. He described the various weaving techniques associated with the creation of a variety of cane woven designs. As you can see, this one, the cane comes from Delta State. It grows within the river nine areas. There's one that comes from Delta State, Bayesa State, River State, Edo State, Undo State. And there are some in Lagos as well. But that in Lagos differs from the one that comes from Delta State. So they would prefer the ones that come from Benin and Delta State. So that is where we, we have our suppliers from. So now this one is the cane. It's also the same cane that we use in, that we use in caning kits in the school. So now for me to use this now, example, if I want to make these chairs now, like this one comprises of two materials. This one, there is the wooden part, which is the frame. Before you make the chair like this, you must make the skeleton, which is the frame with the wood. Then after the wood, then before you get your cane, then after the cane, you cannot just use the cane like this. If you can see that this, the color of this one and the color of this one, they are two different colors. Then when I get to this stage, now depends on what I want to use it for. Depends on what I want to do. If I want to do this chair, I definitely am to chair this into four pieces because I'm to use just the back of it. I won't use the inner of it. But if I want to do another design, maybe something like this, I'm going to use the inner of it on the outside. While this craft had transcended many generations, I could tell it consumed a lot of production time, which affected the ability to meet up with purchase order demands from customers. For this reason, some of the weavers have employed the use of rattan made from polyester, a more expensive but efficient material imported into the country. Macaulay, however, confirmed my assumptions. The manual processes delays the production. So, and that's the reason why these days we are now shifting from the cane aspect to, to the one we call the outdoor, the rattan process, which is now the one that has been done through polyester materials. But meanwhile, it's not been done in Nigeria yet, and it's more expensive compared to that of the cane. Like if you see these two materials now, they are different. This one is a rubber one. This, this one is made from polyester. Then why this one is a cane? So this one is faster in production compared to this. While the cane weaving procedure can be done in isolation of things like electricity, the rattan procedure may use an electric-powered compressor or one which makes use of fuel. But due to the inconsistent power supply in the country, weavers such as Macaulay settled for compressors which make use of fuel. I mean, while in doing this, there is no how I can do this without the help of this gun and the compressor. Meanwhile, there is a stapler 
we put it inside. Then with the help of the compressor, see, we use this to staple the rubber to it so that at least it can hold. That's of the cane. The cane aspect of this craft is already weaving out due to the factor of producing it and getting of materials from the forest. And the forest where they get this cane from these days, by the people that supplies us the cane are complaining that the bush are already being burned. Now people that plant these days are now burning the cane. So before they get before they get to the forest where they will get this cane now, it's very, very difficult for them. So now that's the reason why we try to advance into this new technology that the whites, the Americans, the Japanese, the Chinese, they are already using in their own country. And some Nigerians travel abroad and import this thing into Nigeria. If someone comes to me and said he wants to, he wants Dix one, he wants like 15 sets of Dix dining within one week, I can boldly tell the clients that he's going to, he's going to pick it up. But that of the cane, even one month, it won't be ready. Due to the process of making, preparing your materials, getting your frames ready, like that of the cane, a set of cane chair, please you get it for like 150,000, 170,000. But a set of rattan chair, the least amount you can get is 250,000. This market right here does have a high level of economic benefit for the country if issues such as financial deficit as well as a restructuring of the business can't be done by the government. The weavers remain optimistic about their ability to expand and possibly export their products someday. Edward says financial aid from the government would go a long way. If government shall now say, I want to give the individual like 500,000 to start, I tell you, when you invest 500,000 for this business by a year, eh, by the end of the year, you will make a return of even 300,000 on top of that 500, even a million. Because during December time, the period of December, when many companies want to do a pass gift, they come here to have a demand of basket, many. Even when you do not have money, you can never meet up there because they will come, they will demand more than you don't even have. So, but you don't have money to do this dinner. You cannot get it. But at that time, the price will be able to favor you because that time the price will wait up because there will much demand that time. So if the government help us, we use, we give us money, we do this business, we keep them toward the Zebata, we bring them for sale. You know, when you borrow money for buy, maybe some all these back macro finance now, you borrow today, tomorrow you are coming to collect the money from you. And this our business does not go like that. You see, you you we do the business, you you give us money, time. you give us time to work with that money. So by the time maybe seven more, eight more, we started to pay, you know, that we have produced something that by the time we carry the market, because where we want to say, return that money back, it will not be a problem at all. But when you give me money today, tomorrow you are coming to, you are trying to keep the business, man. You are not making my business to, uh, this, uh, we are not buying, uh, uh, buying and selling. It's not uh, this, uh, buying and selling this thing. So it's something you produce before you can sell. For Edward, financial aid from the government and a restructuring of their current location to take on a more tourist look would improve the shortfall in supply as well as make them more competitive in the global market, hence giving way to export. Like this place we, we, we come to dinner, go make a come to this place, I turn it to tourist center as King Drossi. So whereby they build a good structure and whereby people come and make their dinner better, whereby go make a guest sort of it out of it. It's the looks of this our work now. You have to finish there to export them. It's another problem because we don't have the financial background to carry this work aside for people to buy. We only look at this rata work now. Before we don't know how to do them. But now we are now named them and we know how to do them. So all those things that are able, we, we, we are going for abroad for, we have them. We have the, 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 knowledge, the people who are so intelligent to do this craft work here in Nigeria, in this industry. 
It's just what the government should come and ask us, how can we do it? And we tell them the other side of it, where we need their help. Macaulay was gracious enough to take me around the Cane Village on a tour. This is dining for four. One, two, three, four, four chairs. There's going to be a glass of 10 mm on it, which is this. This is a glass. This glass will be on it. If I'm to produce this one now, to do this one alone, it's going to take me about one week to produce just one of this. But if I'm to do it in the right hand, it's going to take me a maximum of two days. I'm done with this. This one cannot withstand the outdoor. It's not something that can withstand rain. And that one can withstand rain. This one is made with raffia. We call this one raffia. This material is so this material we get material from Kotunu. Something like this one now is about 2000 And how long would it take you to make it? This one. This one takes this one takes about one hour. So that's the reason why during the X-Mass period, people don't even do chairs. Amazing, amazing items. I certainly had fun here and I did get myself some take home as well. For Plus TV Africa, I am Irene Ubani. Welcome to What Are You Saying? Hashtag Ways, where we talk about topics in the news as it affects us all. I am Osaiwame Sali, and today I'm joined by Isi Ofodile again. Hi, hi. Hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Isi Ofodile is live with me in studio, and Uti Elu has joined us via Zoom. Uti Elu, how are you doing? I'm good. Hi, hi, Oa. Oh, hi. Oh, you look so hi, amazing. Uti. Ha, Uti. <laughs> It's our uh, 40th. We are not going to hear what, though. <laughs> no, I'm not chill. <laughs> and you know, like I always say, right, I feel like, you know, you don't want to look how you feel. There's this meme on social media that says, look good, do your nails, do your hair, because probably I'm not the finish. Like, I'm, I'm so there. tired. <laughs> I am so, so tired. Like, we have to be extra so that we don't look how we feel. But right now, I feel like I just need to get a call and say, Uti, are you available for the next two weeks? Um, we have an all expense paid trip to Barbados books for you. That's what that, that's like my dream right now. Like God, somebody needs to dial me and say, here's a trip to Barbados. Like we'll take care of everything. I wish. Just pack your life for two weeks <laughs> and then we join the world. I wish. So, Uti, you, know, you don't understand. Like I'm just, I I'm just literally, uh, Ethan, you know, so I chatted you and I was trying to toast Uti to come to the studio today. I would have just escaped. Ah, <laughs> uh, no. Literally, I have eye bags. So yesterday night I was going home. 
Mm. I felt a bit of chest pain. I didn't, I didn't understand what it was, what it was. you know, and all of that. And I now remember Jimmy, mm. our, our director that, that just collapsed. I said, ah, by the time you went to the hospital, blood pressure, this, I said, I don't exactly. know. Exactly. So this morning, I, I started exercising again because I think it's been a long time. Yeah, I do my normal walks. I eat healthy and all of that, but it's been long that my, my body actually, you know, emitted sweat, you know, from the sweat yeah. gland, like, you know, you're working out and all of that. So Excuse I decided, me. you know, to, to start the workout. Hopefully, I'll be able to keep it up. I wish I could do that, but I don't know how to do workout. <laughs> no, I don't work out. I have to. I have I've to. Never worked out. I just had to. <laughs> but I like flexible exercises like yeah, yoga. Yeah. Yes. All right. So today is um, so today I try to stay calm because we're talking about rape again. Um, the way to go. <laughs> yeah. I try to stay. I will be calm today. I promise to be calm today. All right. So, um, but here's what we found as today's quote. If you blame the victim because her clothes were provocative, hmm. you must also blame the bank that was robbed because um, its contents were provocative. You know, um, that's the quote for today. And it's very interesting, you know. Um, Uti, what do you think about the subject of rape before I come to Isi then? So, so for me, Uti, um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you faintly. Okay. So um, on the issue of rape, sad to say, I, I want to live in utopia, you know, in that dream world where something as barbaric as rape doesn't exist. But sadly, we are still in the world of rape. We're still in the real world. Um, and more painful, I think this quote is very apt, more painful um, are the remarks around... All right, Uti, I'm having a bit of difficulty justify. hearing you, but let me just uh, quickly... You know, on Tuesday, we discussed the story shared by Nollywood actress Yabo Ojo of how she was raped um, five, times five times and how often um, times you would find, you know, victim-blaming comments that almost look like a justification mm. for the rape. Now, this discussion isn't over just yet as we got and saw more troubling comments yesterday that we would like to address on tonight's Ladies' Night Out. So Uti, Isi, Jennifer is going to join us much later, and I will be discussing this as we continue to celebrate strong women this month. But first, let's take a break for what's in the news. Do not understand who was the matter. What you can see is the remaining of the tanker that exploded. The suffered equally confessed. A 500 that are the collector. If no talk, they will beat you. Now, two to other 500 feet. Thanks for staying with us. Um, I will go with OT first. What did you find for us in the news today? Um, okay, so uh, hang on one second. I need to try to remember what my story was. Uh, give me one second. Maybe you go to Issy. I'll come right back to you. <laughs> today is that day. Today is that day. Forgive me, guys. <laughs> Issy, so what did you find? I don't remember what my headline is. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. I remember now. So, can you still hear me? Okay, go ahead, Issy. So my headline reads, NDLEA seizes illicit drugs worth 60 billion in two months. Now this was, um, uh, this was a comment or declaration made by the retired Brigadier General um, Buba Mawa. And the interesting thing for me about this story really was the fact that where, as we know, most of the crime in this country 
a lot of the times with the robberies and things like that, you hear that the users were high on some drug or the other. And the fact that he is now saying that if we can prevent people from using drugs, that we would be able to cut criminality um, within the country by 50%. Now, for me, the, 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 the main thing that caught my attention with this um, headline is the fact that we've always had a drug problem, right? We've never ever addressed holistically how these drugs are getting into the country and what is happening, but it's getting worse. You remember back in the day, it used to be um, Ogogoro and Shekbe and all these different things. Now we've moved on, we've banned Codeine after that whole BBC um, expose. But we still, the government is not doing anything holistically about this drug problem. All these people, you know those vendors that sit on the side of the road that sell all sorts of funny, funny mixes. There was another article that I read that talked about how these, these vendors were blending all sorts of drugs into all sorts of different funny names. I think we talked about that at some point last year. And it's the same thing with our government. Every time something comes into the fore, we talk about it for five minutes and then we move on. So the fact that we can still be seizing in this economy up to 60 billion naira's worth of drugs in just two months. It's scary to tell you what the size of that industry is because you know that this 60 billion that has been seized, is not even 50% of the industry. So imagine how much is actually truly out there. It's quite a scary thought. Hmm, very scary. And you know, so, I mean, what hearing you speak, it just occurred to me what I noticed yesterday at the along the Lekki Ekpe Expressway. Yeah. Young boys, you know, broad day, like taking, um, what's it called? Um, weed and all of that. Tell me how these people, they will be normal. They can't be normal. You're talking about the, on, a, on a normal day. Even the, the drivers we have that are driving the commercial vehicles, they all are All of them. If I one driver, after well, drinking, he well. threw it off, um, from the window. I think they had, a, um, um, uh, what's it called, um, uh, some sort of um, um, evaluation carried out on the drivers recently or some years back and they discovered that 60% of, or what am I saying? About 80% of the drivers on the road were all high on one substance or the or other. The other. So it's, it's something that mm. we should look into, but how is it actually getting into the country? Oh, it is well. Yes. Um, what did you find for us, Lucy? Okay, um, the, my, my story is kind of related to, um, is related to our topic for today. And you know, in Nigeria, there is no penal, actually there's no penal uh, code for, uh, pu of punishment for um, those that rape, uh, or the rapists that actually rape boys or men, mm -hmm. because it's not recognized, okay? But in this case, we have a, a situation where a 40-year-old man was sentenced to life imprisonment for raping a, an eight-year-old boy, mm -hmm. okay? He had, um, he took advantage of this boy in his house and he was discovered by the lesson teacher but the thing here is not who or how he was discovered the thing now is that he has been punished and i don't think that punishment will be enough for what that little boy has encountered or gone through with this man because someday somewhere somebody might grant him some sort of um, um there's what's his name so you're thinking he should, he should just have sentenced him to death no, what? I'm saying that he should have been castrated. Okay, we are back to that. Yes. Okay, we'll continue the conversation <laughs> when we start the conversation. <laughs> ah, you see. Hmm. All right, so on those um, House of Assembly member hit by straight bullets. I, I mean, Uti shared this story and I thought, ah, I put my hand on my head. Hmm. How did it happen? Um, straight bullet at the Lagos airport. It says a member hmm. of the Ondo State House of Assembly was hit by a straight bullet at the local wing of the Mutala Mohammed Airport in Lagos on Thursday morning. That's this morning. Wow. So the a, intelligence that gathered that a security detail attached to Brigadier General Buba Marwa, the National Drug Le Law Enforcement um, Agency chairman, mistakenly mm. discharged four bullets while trying to conduct a safety procedure before handing over hmm. his firearms to um, FAN, that's um, the Federal Airport Authority, you know, the security operatives at about 7.30 a.m. this morning. So he said that the, a bullet shell hit the Ondo State lawmaker on his leg while some um, accidentally discharged bullets hit nearby walls and um, chaos within the airport, destroying some properties. Wow. Fortunately, thank God, no life was lost. But I'm, usually <laughs> when you're discharging bullets, aren't you supposed to shoot it into the air? And see, even that bullet into the air, I saw a documentary on, uh, I think I've mentioned this before, a documentary on um, Discovery Channel, that even yes. that bullet in the air is also as dangerous as shooting it, you know, because when Directly. it's coming back down, it comes back down with a lot of 
um, force. force. I'm just saying wow. that why do we always have these things happening? The, last mm -hmm. year, I think it was um, Speaker Guadabia Miller's um, aide that mistakenly was hit. And yes. yeah, he shot somebody to, uh, somebody to death, you know. Yes. A newspaper he died, or anything. Actually. Yes, that one yes. died. So let's just be careful, please. Exactly. Yeah. All right, so and we'll take a break. Yes, the way you've said, let's be careful. What did, what, what, what did you say? Like we're talking about, hmm, this is more than be careful. Like, you know, the, that, that's what really got me about the story. Like, let's just, you know, whilst he was carrying out safety procedures, I mean, first of all, why do you have to have a loaded weapon? And then you're not even trained enough to secure your weapon safely to the extent where you discharge four bullets. If those four bullets had hit four people, there'd be four families right now crying. So we can say thank you, thank God that, you know, no lives were lost. But it just goes to show the ridiculousness of what we do in this country. That somebody, and that's probably an automatic rifle. It's not a pistol. Yeah. And you hit four bullets in an four. airport. You could have just erased somebody's life like that. I mean, thank God nobody was killed, but it just... Exactly. Happened. That's just thank God. That's all we can say. Exactly. All right, so we'll take a break. When we return, we're going to be talking about rape, the justification, and the punishment. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Thanks for staying with us. So um, we got some comments from our viewers, and um, we'd like to just read those comments now. From comment one from an anonymous uh, viewer that sent in, he sent in yesterday. He says more Nigerians watch porn than other African countries, and even co uh, competing with the U.S. We think these things don't have effect. She, we have a pandemic we have refused to address. Um, the internet is facilitating desires that cannot be controlled, and these triggers explode at the wrong time. There was rape before the internet, but we import a lot of things that we are not built to handle. That's from commentor one. So the comment, the second comment goes, good evening, ladies. I actually want to comment on the issue of castration of men. If caught in the act of rape or if, uh, or if confessed to it, my comment is actually my question. Um, my comment is actually a question. A man... As, I'm sorry, as much as I hate to talk about rape because of how despicable the act is, I would like to say that rape should not be expressly attributed to men only. We've had cases of single or group of ladies raping men or having sex with minors as we recently had a case like that in South Africa. My question is, what should be done to a woman's private part? He, if caught raping a man or confessed to it, or if caught having sex with a minor. Ladies, raping is not one, a one-way traffic um, discussion for ladies alone as it affects both sexes. So in as much as I agree that it's more common amongst men against women, um, that's uh, from Enoch. I don't know where IB is, he said, but from IB. So tonight we're asking, if there's a justification for rape and what punishment should be meted on the rapist, um, be it male or female? 
right? So please let us hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join this conversation. Tweet at us at WeShowAfrica1 with the hashtag WeShow or send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 81 803 We're going to open our phone lines much later. But let me come to EC first. You know, I want to hear your initial thoughts on, you know, most times when we post videos, sorry, when you hear videos of people narrating their rape ordeal, the first question that always comes to mind is, what was the person wearing? So is this almost like a justification for the act? Totally no. Because let's look at, let's go back to when we were in the 60s when Queen Elizabeth came to Nigeria. People were actually walking along the streets without wearing anything. And nobody was raped. So a situation whereby you have individuals now saying that it was what she was wearing or how she looked. There was even a, st um, I actually checked something uh, out and I, while the cause of prepping up for this, and I discovered that I had to look at the mind of a rapist. One actually said that he was looking at this, um, his victim and he was getting angry because the victim was arousing him sexually. So he needed to pay her back for doing that. Um, so it's not, it's not her fault. She was just busy walking along the road, not even thinking about what he was even, not even, not even, no, she didn't even have any idea that there was somebody even looking at her. So a situation whereby that individual now said, okay, because she looks like this and she has aroused me sexually, I will take advantage of her and, and, and assault her. Hmm. So you, the mindset of a rapist hmm. is very complex. It's quite very complex. Warped. So there is, it's no totally, justification. There, there is no justification. All right, let me so come to ever. Uti. Yes. Okay, so um, first of all, comment number one, this is how we start to justify these things. When we try to directly link one act to another, um, it's like saying because I watch action movies and I watch people shoot guns, I can go out and stab people and shoot people. There's no justification. I don't care what you're watching. I don't care what you're eating. I don't care what you're smoking. I don't care what you're drinking. There's no justification for it. So let's first of all be clear that one problem has nothing to do with the other problem. Um, for the, the idea in itself um, that we... In this part of the world, let me stick to Nigeria, because the second comment talks about the fact that rape is a two-way street. Now, one of the things I think that is out of date in Nigeria is the definition of rape in itself, because um, rape currently, based on um, our laws, talks about um, the assault of a woman by a man. You know, And I, I believe in the North, it, it also um, talks about the same with, you know, age bracket. But two things that stood out to me is, yes, one, it's inadequate because it doesn't speak of rape of minors and of the male gender. Um, and also, it says that a woman cannot be raped if it is done by her husband and she's above age of puberty, which again... A woman has a right to say no, no matter what. Exactly. And it's shocking to me how many people I have met who have that same impression that a man is entitled to have sex with his wife at any time, whether she says yes or no, it's his right. So even in our mindset or in our laws around rape, we're still behind the times because there is all sorts of sexual harassment. There is, I mean, there's date rape. There's, there's all sorts of things that come into this massive cater it doesn't have to come to the culmination of you know penetration or whatever before you actually call it rape sexual harassment is a huge part of it and you know a lot of the times when you don't address sexual harassment that is being done by people they eventually progress into full-blown rape so when we also don't acknowledge that these things are problems we are also part of the problem in allowing this thing to thrive i mean forget the culture of silence forget the culture of familiarity you know shockingly for me so many conversations that i've had with people who were raised in the 80s when it was so normal to have aunties and uncles and all sorts of people going through your houses so many people were assaulted as children exactly. whether it's full-on rape or whether it was sexual harassment it's so prevalent amongst a lot of people that i know so we have a big problem 
And we have to start to pick apart those problems, starting first of all with going back to what our law says about rape. Because even when we come to castration, we come to, that's in the extreme. But what about molestation? What about all these other things? We haven't even addressed that. I'm happy you're talking so, about molestation, Utia. And I want to read the third um, picture that we have. That says 97% of young women in the UK have been sexually harassed. Right? When this picture was put up, we now got some comments underneath the picture. And somebody says, damn, I thought we got um, them all. Where is that 3% hiding? Oh my goodness. That was one, one person's comment. Um, somebody now says, almost 3% uh, to go, boys. Oh somebody goodness. says, oh, so there's 3% to go. Another person says, I don't care. I mean, um, I, so someone says, I mean, apparently, whistling is harassment, so whatever. Same for men. They just don't complain about it every five minutes. That's what people are saying. And he says, um, this person, Oli Shepard, says, don't know if I believe it or what are, are you classing as harassment then. Look at you or something, um, uh, looking at you or something weirdly. Then somebody says, um, this is clearly nonsense. What a shame. Uh, another person says, must be a clap to be in the other 3%. Um, somebody says they as as they deserve so they they are sexually harassed as they deserve and somebody says so means that 97 percent of young men in the uk are all rapists and 80 percent of adult men in the uk are also rapists that's what it looks like um, um addressing the paper that wrote this it says um so i so, so just reading through all of these comments i think there's one again that says the number is so high because nowadays Things like man spreading and ma man um, planning or commenting are looking at women as seen as, as um, harassment. So there's a thin line here because in the UK, I remember my son was telling me that when he, um, in school mm. that um, now they are said to them that you cannot put your hand over the shoulder of a girl yeah. because it will be considered as sexual har harassment. So there's a thin line between, you know, harassment, you know, and, you know, um, with the intent. I don't know how to explain it. There's an intent in the heart where somebody says, you know what, I want to deliberately, you know, abuse you. Exactly. And, you know, so how do we, because it's, it seems like these days, and I, I, can, I can understand the sarcasm of some men. Like the one that says, ah, they have 3% to go. You know, because it seems like everything now to a woman is sexual harassment. So did we go overboard? with the sexual harassment conversation, or it is just um, um, it is just what it is, that it is actually sexual harassment. But well, let me come to Jennifer. I think Jennifer has joined us. Yes, hi guys. Hi. Um, I think for, when we say, are we going overboard with the sexual harassment conversation, sometimes when you bring up topics like this, you hear men saying, oh, the topic is overflowed, we're talking about it too much and all of that. And I believe that the reason why the reason why we are talking about this so much now is because in time past, a lot of people have been silent about these things. So now women are saying, no, we don't want to be silent anymore. Men who have been sexually harassed and who have a voice and have found their voice are also saying, no, we don't want to be silent anymore. We need to talk about these things. We actually need to bring it to light. We need to start exposing people. And, you know, there were some things that a lot of people felt like, oh, it's not sexual harassment. Oh, I'm not harassing you. I'm just asking you if you want to do something. Or oh, I'm just coercing you and all of that. And till now, a lot of people still don't know that coercion is actually wrong. Like you said, there is a thin line between asking for something and pressuring somebody to do what they do not want to do. I think that, 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 that's, part of what, that's one of the things we actually need to start educating people on. Coercion, what sexual harassment means. And, and there is one thing that I, I found out in recent times. Now, a lot of men who are, um, who are speaking for 
rape, sexual harassment, who are saying, oh, it is not true. Women are over flogging it. Now, guess what? We know that homosexuality is now very prevalent in our society. It is out there. It, you're seeing a lot of people coming out saying, oh, I'm gay, I'm weak. Now, guess what? When a gay man is moving towards a heterosexual man, he finds it offensive. When a gay man tries to talk to a man who is straight, he feels he's sexually harassed. Mm -hmm. it was, they would not even allow him hug his, a, as, as a straight man, a straight man would not allow a gay man hug him because he feels like, oh, what is this guy is trying to touch me or what he, he's, he's trying to do something to me. Now, if you feel that type of way, then why are you why are you exempting it to women? Why do you feel like women shouldn't feel that type of way when you're coming onto them so strong? And I like I like people to I, I I would encourage people to try to put themselves in people's shoes most of the time because sometimes you don't know how the next person is feeling until you put yourself in their shoes until you can actually immerse yourself in their experience, in what they are feeling, in what they are going through. That's the only time, or that's the only way you can actually fully understand the, the gravity of these actions. But, but yeah. All right, so let me... I want to talk about... The, what she just talked about has given me an idea about um, a research I was conducted, and it, it talked about the types of rapists. Okay, and they said that the, we have the disadvantaged ones, those men or those individuals who feel that, oh, they haven't been given um, um, was, um, some sort of validation or some sort of uh, um, whatever in the society. So they are the downtrodden, actually. So they take advantage of those who they think are on top. Then we also have the specialized rapists. The specialized rapists are those that are sexually aroused. They just see the lady and they just all the, the victim and they just want to pounce. And they also have the opportunistic rapist. Mm -hmm. The opportunistic rapist is the individual who believes that I can do this and I can get away with it. So if he has that opportunity or she has that opportunity, she can actually, or he can actually take advantage of the victim. Mm -hmm. Then we have the partner rapist, where um, I think Uti says something about it. Husbands. Husbands or spouses mm -hmm. actually or come back yeah. or come back and attack the um, spouse or ex-spouse. Mm. So we, then finally, we have the high mating effort rapist. And these are individuals who do not, they have a problem with their esteem. They, they, they feel you can't tell me no. So the moment you say no to them, they, they just it's flip. Trigger. They just flip, hmm. you know. So these individuals, they are different. We need to encourage or en enlighten, let me use that word. Hmm. We need to enlighten people on the types of rapists, the signs to look out for, the people or the individuals that can actually take advantage of um, children or women or, or, or young boys in the process. The moment we, they, they, they touch them in a particular way, they, they look at them in a particular way, if for any reason you don't feel comfortable, step back. Absolutely. It's important. Okay, so we're going to just take a very short break. We hope we can open the phone lines today because we're having difficulties, but we'll open the phone lines when we return to continue the conversation. Stay with us. We'll be right back. We can't talk about education reform if we don't decolonize our education system. What we do not understand, we will stigmatize. Because it's just cultural. It's, and I think it's just human nature. They're stopping no salary. I don't like remembering it. I am angry at Nigeria. I'm angry at this government which seems to be letting us down. I'm angry at us as a people. In the process of struggling to free myself from his hand, he tore my pants and then he left me. Yes, I commit the first truly. Young girl, do you know where you are going? I say, I'm going to America. I say, oh, now so that they talk, you are going to Libya. Which America? As it then do mark our place, some people they die now. 
This is PLOS TV Africa. Big stories live here. Thanks for staying with us. Now, if you're just tuning in, it's our ladies' night out, and we're asking if there can ever be a justification for rape and what should be the punishment for the rapist. Please let us hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join this conversation. Tweet at us at Wayshow Africa 1 with the hashtag Wayshow or send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081 8038 right, so um, we'll try to open the phone lines, but we're having a bit of difficulty today. If we can hear you, fine. Um, Uti, we talked about that. I think we've all established that there's no justification for raping. So all those people that keep giving silly excuses like, oh, it was what she was wearing and all of exactly. that. Exactly. They are all thrown in the, in the totally. bin. Totally. No all right, so what should be the punishment? Because now this is a very dicey situation. We are all women. Mm. And we cannot ignore the fact that women actually do commit this crime as well. Totally. You know, raping young boys, raping older, older men, you know, gang raping a man. So women also... Um, um, carry out culprits yes they are well. culprits in the rape transaction mm -hmm. so I um, I am thinking I'm still processing what the punishment should be like for a woman see now they will not say it is woman matter now I'm laughing <laughs> but before it's a man and my face is strong but I I, I I want to understand what you think about punishment for both a man you know and if it is in the case of a woman what should that punishment look like you know for cases of rape mm. I want to make something clear, and a lot of people are not going to like me for what I'm about to say. When we talk about the issue of rape, I am not in any way failing to acknowledge the fact that men get raped or women get raped. But it's like taking an ocean, right, and picking out a drop and worrying about the drop. I'm sorry, men, forget it. Look, however you want to swing this conversation, I can't. Yes, men get raped, but in the grand scheme of things, in the problem of rape, I'm sorry, men stand aside. I can't. Let's be clear. When we talk about rape, when we talk about the travesty of rape, we will and continue, whether you like it or not, to focus on the women. Now, should there be consequences across board? Absolutely. Men that rape women, absolutely. Women that rape men, absolutely. Women that sexually harass women, absolutely. But let me be categorically clear. Women lose their lives every day. Girls, children die every day from being raped. How many times do men get raped and die? For a man to actually be able to be raped, he has to have an erection. They, look, I don't even want to have this conversation because it's going to upset me. So let's be clear that when Uti is talking about rape, I'm talking about it from the perspective of a woman. Be, I am biased. Take it however you want to take it, put it in your pocket and walk out. So let me just say that when you are going to talk about prosecution, when you are going to talk about the penalties, let's talk about the penalties for men because there can never be enough. When somebody now tries to tell me that, Uti, when you say you should kill them or you should castrate them, what about the ones that are falsely accused? Excuse me, the statistics I can find, unfortunately, I couldn't find the ones for Nigeria. 200,000 plus cases, almost 300,000 cases. Out of those, how many prosecutions? Less than just over 2,000. How many convictions? About 1,500 from 255,000. Maybe, maybe, if a couple of people, and this is not me saying go and kill people, go and castrate people, but in those percentages there, eh, even probability and statistics allows for error. If one or two get castrated by mistake, they will make sure their younger brother doesn't do it. So you know what? According to me, it's just fine. So let me make it clear because all people that keep saying, oh, men get raped. No, 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 no. It's story. Women are dying out there every day, whether they are wearing hijabs, whether they are wearing shorts, whether they're walking around naked. It's my body. I don't ask you to be indecent. Dress how you want to dress. That's the world we live in today. Don't touch me if I say no. Please, let's be clear. Because all these issues, men will be saying, eh, but this, but that. Even in common, ordinary law that has nothing to do with rape, whether it's stealing, whether it's murder, there is a margin for error. There are lots of people that are sitting in jail that are there that are innocent. It's not right. But please, when it comes to rape, let's not all sit on our high horses and say, you know what, uh, women accuse men. Somebody did this. Somebody did not do that. I don't buy it. Okay, if you, so if you men are so bothered by it, Fix the problem. Jennifer. Uti, they will you. come for you today. 
<laughs> Jennifer, let me hear she your thoughts. Biased, so uh, she has already said it. Yeah. We are women. Anybody that is coming, <laughs> no, but the truth is that the numbers are there. The statistic is really high. So, yeah, men get... But you know this thing, I was going to say this. Is it possible that over the years, right, men that get raped, mm -hmm. they right, they accepted it. You understand? They, you know, they accepted it like a no, thing no, of... Because yes. if they had complained about it, that this is painful, this is this, this is that, Maybe the way we are fighting for women, we'll be fighting for men because my cameraman is looking my, at me. My, Let me come to Jennifer. Me, but men really children, enjoyed it. It's for the children. Uh, the children, the children that have been violated are the ones see, that actually. All the boys that I know, adults, men, they'll tell you it was my house gay that first did it and, and it was good. They will tell you. So they did not, they don't consider it as a crime. Yes. So you you cannot help them because they mm -hmm. don't even consider it as a crime. Because they were women's informed. They were mm, so now that they, we are knowing now, we are coming, know. we are coming gradually to them. We don't have a, a formula yet for women. Mm -hmm. But let me come to Jennifer. See, with, with T has said, with T has said it all. And um, I really find it very problematic when women, when it's, um, it's, when women are talking about their issues, the, the challenges that we face in the society, that's when men decide to compare and contrast. We've been fighting for ourselves for a very long time. So I think that if men want a solution, they should stand up and fight for themselves. They are not fighting for us. We have been fighting for ourselves. We've been fighting for women's rights. We've been fighting for, for, for being safe in the society against domestic violence, against sexual harassment, against rape, against killing us. So if men want something to be done about their Fight for yourself. Stop waiting for women to actually fight for you. There should be a, there should actually, I, 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 I can't count how many cases I've actually heard about rape where the man was actually sent to jail. How many have we seen? The law is not on our side and it is so unfair. And I think we actually need to, actually, we need to fix the justice system. If, if, if a man commits a crime like that, punish him immediately. I don't care what they want to do. Just do something. Make an example of somebody. I heard of the case where a man raped a child. He went to jail for only two years. And then he came out. Why? Why are you out in society? We don't need you. Sleep there. Spend the rest of your life in jail and stay there. Do not come out. Because you come out, you're a menace. I don't think when they actually go to jail, they actually learn their lessons. I don't think they do. Because if you actually learn your lesson, all these things that we're seeing in the society will not be happening every day. It is too bad and it's terrible. They've not learned that lesson. But let me take some comments. Um, Benson says, explanation from Jennifer was quite deep and helped. it helped, um, it helped clarify so much. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, another uh, comment from Rafael Akori from Zaria. He says, topic of discourse always bring out the area of strength in life. When rape was mentioned some days ago, um, Sally was very crossed and her other side became visible. <laughs> and she is an advocate against rape. Rape must be condemned by all civilized people because it has destroyed many potential mothers in the world. Exactly. We need deep, proper orientation for men mm -hmm. and boy, boy child on self-control in the face of temptation and impulses. Yes, Raphael, this is very dear to me. I'm trying to hold myself today because everybody mm. kept saying that you were too, you were too, I mean, I, 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 I exposed my real self on yes. Tuesday, so I'm <laughs> trying to stay calm today so that mm. at least we can have a conversation and help people out there see what we are talking, what about. We're talking about. Yeah, but Isi, quickly take your comments because okay. we're even um, running out of time. My comment, um, this is from Mrs. Banjo. She says, thanks, ladies, for putting your voices on this sensitive issue. She's from Festac. Mm. She said this from Festac. Then we also have Wurola. Wurola said, um, individuals must have strength to get away from early signs of bad behavior. Mm. I totally agree with her because it's essential that we have a perspective of children. The earlier we tell our children that these are the kind of people that could take advantage of you. And most times it's even, it could be the ne next door neighbor. It could be your uncle. It could be a close relative. And the moment we advise our children on the little signs that if uncle touches you here, somebody touches you there, know that it is totally uncomfortable, is a no-no. And the earlier we tell our children this, 
the better for everybody. Mm -hmm. And the earlier the child will know the difference between right and wrong touch mm -hmm. and know that, okay, I'm safe with this person or I'm not safe with this person and be more vocal about I what she is I think it's even more about breaking the silence. More of mm. talking, more of breaking the silence. I yes. mean, I'm happy about the story I took in the news yesterday of the Covenant University lecturer. Absolutely. Yes, that was arrested and they've mm -hmm. taken him, transferred him to state CID for further in investigation. Mm -hmm. He raped a 17-year-old girl. In fact, yes. uh, what came to my mind, because I was having that conversation with my, my husband, and he was saying, you know, the relationship the girl must have with her parents must be a good one for exactly. her to have been able to tell to the parents because it was the parents you know mm -hmm. alongside the girl that went to lodge that complaint so imagine Fantastic. if she didn't have that explanation kind of backing exactly if she didn't have that backing what? so that's you know mm -hmm. that one tells me also that parents you know mm -hmm. you must build that bond with your your your, your children so mm -hmm. that they are able to talk to you when they have been touched inappropriately. And should be able to defend themselves yeah. even when they are not there. I'm so apt to, I'm so I'm so concerned about this particular part because I as a child, you have a little girl around of course, and you have individuals who would want to, you know, take advantage of that little girl. So what you should do, what my mom did was very fantastic from day one. And she didn't say it in nice in a nice way. She didn't coat it. She gave it to me a mano a mano, face to face, the way it was, there was no filter. So if I see an uncle or I see an auntie or I see a friend or I see a relative trying to, you know, talk to me in a particular way and I feel I'm not comfortable with that person, I, I quietly walk away. And that actually guided me. What Even is, you have met the same rapist now. What, is the, what about the ones that will put that a knife to your neck? That is what I'm saying. Neck? You look for the telltale ah. signs. Yeah, all right. Those so let signs me... will help the child. That's we... what helped me. We thought we had time, but we've actually run out of time. But let me just hear Uti's final comments and Jennifer's final comments on um, we haven't we still did not find the solution to the, the punishment for the rapist. We talked. I said castration. <laughs> yes, everybody's mentioning castration and slow, a very slow one, very slow. So they have. I said I was twisted in this aspect. I, I didn't want to talk about it in this context. But the key thing is that it should be very slow, and the earlier you do it, you know. You make make an example of an individual who, who has put taken, that picture up? who has taken advantage of a child or has taken Ew. advantage of a woman. It's <sighs> essential here. Hmm. Nobody deserves to be raped, whether it be a child, a man, or a a, a woman. Hmm. It's as simple as All that. All right, Uti, your final thoughts, please. Um, so if you left it to me, if I had to choose punishment. I'm sorry, I wouldn't even choose castration. I just hang you from your balls till you die. How about we do that? Just kill him. Simple. I'm sorry. You know, when you when you when you when you actually castrate someone, he still got life. He still might be able to find some joy in life. I don't even think that he's, he should get that. How about we just kill you? In a, in you know, I'm I'm with Issy. I don't think they should. They should poison you or they should, you know, just hang you from it till you die. So that whilst you're dying, you can think about the pain that you put her through, but you still get to die. So, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah. Very graphic, but that's me. Mm. Jennifer, do you agree? That was very graphic. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. You know. I don't know who put up that picture on, on, on the screen. It was oh, awful. Yeah. I, I actually, I actually, <laughs> <laughs> actually, I'm actually not the laughing matter, but I actually agree with the castration. Jennifer. I feel like, yeah. Well, go ahead. I said, I don't know who put up the picture as well. It was very graphic. <laughs> so <laughs> can you hear me? So what? what's your final take? Um. So I, I agree with the castration punishment because I feel like there is there is nothing else that would actually suit that crime aside from that. I mean, it's just a lifelong lesson. If you live to tell your story, then you tell them how you don't have your thingy anymore, and that's a good thing. I mean, at least they still gave you life. But if you don't have a life later, sorry about that. But you 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 took something away from. A human being you took something away from somebody that they would never get back the trauma is for life it never actually goes away and i i i i i, I don't know I, mean, I just stop ripping please 
stop it. Let, let, let's just kill it and let it end. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Oh. I don't agree with Iti. If you kill the person, that is fast. It is, in fact, it is merciful. When you castrate the person and you do it slowly, and that person lives with it, that person will, those that are coming behind will take a look at it and they will never try to do it again. Mm. It's essential. That's Some, slow, that's merciful. No. Someone says the solution is train the men, have the um, have family system, so train the men. Mm. That's what the person is proposing as a solution. That's a long-term solution. We are ah. looking for immediate solution. So this topic of rape is actually quite draining. It is. Um, the damage you do mm. to the psychology of any victim of rape, sometimes it leaves with them for their lifetime. The rest of your lives. You don't yes. want that. You exactly. know. So please, um, I also want the government to be seen to be responsible, taking it seriously. Because I think also, because over the years, there hasn't been serious show of, you know, um, punishment for crimes like this. And that's why it has escalated and has gone so bad. So um, we hope to fight this, this menace. We hope to fight it. Exactly. All right. So thank you, ladies. Thank you so much. Well, can I just thank say you, something quickly? Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so, Waze was birthed from the need to inspire, inform, and influence lives towards action. And this year, we started our CSR focused on curbing unemployment in Nigeria. If you're a company, please partner with us by allocating internship slots. And if you're a job seeker, keep watching Waze and follow us on all our social media handles, as this will be an all-year-round engagement. So, tell your friends to keep all eyes on Waze. In case you missed today's quote, here it is again. That tells you there's no justification. It says, if you blame the rape victim because her clothes were provocative, you must also blame the bank that was robbed because its content was provocative. We'll see you live tomorrow at 8 p.m. as we bring another great conversation to your screen. Enjoy. <laughs>
and a popular Nigerian actor, Arike Akinyoju, who has been vocal about her struggles with depression. I think um, it is. Yes, especially in this part of the world that we belong to, Nigeria, fame here, I think is a major cause of depression. Because human beings are unique and because human beings are, you know, um, they, we all have our personal journey, they are what we call vulnerability risk factors. People are already vulnerable in one way or the other, maybe from adverse childhood um, experiences and then with fame, which is somehow as you grow, it may be a childhood fame because sometimes you see some children, um, they go, grow into fame, while some people are deliberate and intentional into achieving fame. Famous people have to keep up with, you know, entertaining us. Famous people have to keep up with a particular personnel. Famous people have to keep up with, you know, um, with all the challenges, even if they are going through a lot. We do not want to see them down. We are following them for the things that we want to get from them. They are inspiring people, they are influencing people, they are empowering people, they are doing a whole lot. So whatever they may be going through, the society wouldn't want to see that part of them, even if they know they may be going through that, that is it. So they have to just keep on being, you know, that person we want to see. We should not be calling talents celebrities. Yes, they have become celebrities, but they became celebrities because of their talents, because of what they do. They are not just celebrities because they exist. So everybody, from my experience in life, all creative people have challenges in terms of putting together their process. And every time, it's like anywhere in the world, if you don't hear of your favorite actor for five years, it's one of two things. It's just A, they're not working, and B, they're not, at this point in time, getting offers. So what I would say is that a lot of people, if you work in the entertainment industries, if you work in those spaces, you will know that it is a high stress, high anxiety business. So therefore, the people who are working in these businesses are constantly seeking for affirmation and for support to see them through what they're doing. So in that regard, if you're in the public eye and you're constantly having to keep up appearances, it can become very, very difficult, especially if things are not going as well as they used to go in the past. There was a time in my life I, I, I passed through depression, but I think it's not because of my career. Because naturally, I'm not the type that, you know, things people say get to. Fine, I feel concerned when they say things or they expect me to live in a certain way and I'm not living that life. You know, I feel concerned and I feel like, but it doesn't really get to me. So if I, I ever had depression, it wasn't basically on, on my career level. That would be great if I, that would that would really, 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 you know, help in this advocacy that you know have been blazing the tree in Africa, trying to change the narrative and let the you know let it be a movement for people to understand that mental health is as important as our physical health, if not more important. And for the fact that it's intrinsically linked to our physical health, we have to guard, protect and prioritize our mental health at every given point in time. So if we start seeing the media and entertainment industry putting our mental health as part of their package, it may not necessarily be a department because that's a tall order, but ensuring that from inception when they are setting up that um, um, a business, they incorporate what we call an employee's assistance program. It's a subtle way of inculcating mental health services within your organization. What that just means is that as a business owner and having artists and producing whatever you're doing in media and entertainment, you and your employees or you and your gang, you and your group have a safe space where you have been able to build a culture of compassion 
that individuals in that organization can speak up, can speak out, can seek for help from professionals in rendering these employees assistance program. I, I don't actually agree that uh, record labels and statement companies or businesses should actually be having mental health departments. I think mental health is a very, very specialized issue. What they should be doing is being aware of mental health and have mental health professionals that they can relate to if they have issues with any of their talents or clients. Unfortunately, for many years, it has almost been stigma here. So people do not engage the topic and they don't discuss their problems. But definitely, a lot of talents and a lot of people in society have mental health issues and issues with depression and anxiety and other things of that nature. So it's important to relate to mental health professionals who can help when you have somebody or friends or family or clients or eight or talents who have any issues at all. You could refer your, you could insist that your eight, your clients and your talents do have regular counseling sessions, do have relationships with um, counselors and psychiatrists that they can have conversations and unload and unbundle any issues they might have. The best thing you, anybody can do is to stay engaged with the talent. So the talent, and that means that understand and know your talent very well. You know, understand what makes them tick, what makes them click, when they are happy, to be happy or to be in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a stable state of mind and frame of mind to enable them to produce their best work. And that normally is, if you're doing that, that means that talent has a strong manager. Know, strong management is key and that doesn't necessarily come from the label that could come from the artist side but the artist manager the person that really interfaces every day with the artist a lot of times the label is literally just there to provide distribution retail marketing and finance one dominant recommendation is for this artist to live in their realities and not all about impressing fans who change loyalty at slightest disappointment by their so-called quasi demigods whose foibles are as real as any man on the street. The story of Michael Jackson, who died in 2009, and later Whitney Houston in 2012, a few of the sad reminders that despite fame and pageantry, one's mental health must not be ignored. Reporting for Plus TV Africa, Ife Oshunkeye. Contrary to popular belief, Corona is not a hoax. The virus is real. Be responsible. Wear a mask. Wash your hands with soap and water and avoid crowded places. Maintain physical distancing. Be responsible. Together, we can overcome the pandemic. There has to be a decision point. Um, the way your baby is presenting, we have to rush you in. And my partner at the time was like, you going to cut her? Are you going to cut it? Is it going to leave a scar? And I said, oh, I'm a belly dancer. What is the problem here? No, no, I'm vulnerable about the future of the children, the future of mine and the future of the generation of my children. I want to have nude pictures taken. Of you? Yes, yeah, but without showing my private parts. I, I want yeah, to put it someone. in my front room. Yes. And they said, you can't do that. People yes. will be embarrassed when they came into your house. I said, mm -hmm. well, it's my body and it's my front room. All the things that we do, what is the purpose of it? I just realized that I was more trusting before I was six. So many women, they just feel like I have to cook for my husband, I have to breastfeed my children, I have to pick them from school. <laughs> because to, society Then you go to. home and you cry and you stop your career, you can't do anything, then you blame everybody. You took that choice.
Good morning and welcome to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. It's a Friday morning, the 19th of March, 2021, and we're extremely excited to be here again this morning. We hope you had a great night. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, Aneta Felix. Good morning, Osaragia. Good to see you this beautiful Friday. It's the wrap to the weekend, and I'm yes, looking forward to it. Yes, it is. Of course, you're looking great in yellow this morning. Yeah, someone told me I'm looking like a bridesmaid. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well. Trust Justin to have all the fun. <laughs> Good morning, Good anyway. morning to you. Thanks for joining us on The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. We hope you had a chilly night. It's, it's been hot this past few days, but the good thing is that, you know, the raining seasons are, are starting and setting in. So, you know, we can all enjoy that beautiful, beautiful chill of the night. It actually was a little chilly last night. I'm not sure why, but, you know, maybe because of the rains and yeah, the, uh, rains. the rains from Basically. yesterday. It, it, was, it was pretty chilly last night. So if you didn't have electricity, I'm sure you still were able to sleep yes, well, uh, last yes. night. Anyway, Certainly. We have a lot that we, of course, will be sharing with you this morning. Just before we get into trending topics, we'll, uh, of course, get into what we're going to be discussing, major topics uh, for today. Of course, we're starting a lot, a lot later with the uh, um, a possible strike, once again, by resident doctors across Nigeria. The National Association of Resident Doctors is saying that they might just go back on strike after failed promises and, of course, uh, neglect, that's what they've called, they've called it, by uh, the federal government. And so it's a conversation that we will be having this morning with the president of the National Associ Association of Resident Doctors. He comes up um, on the breakfast this morning. Yes, the, the list of the complaints is just three. I mean, the number that's saying they want this, this, this. It's out there for the public to see. It's out there for the government to see. There have been consultations with the Senate presidents before now, and that strike was shelved. But there's a warning strike again today is day five of that strike let's see how you know negotiations are going forward from this you know hopefully the doctors don't go on that strike because the government should be in talks to settle their demands hopefully absolutely and then after that we're talking youth in leadership we know the president signed the not too young to wrong bill in 2018 how far have we come from there a nigerian youth lady for ready for political leadership 2023 presidential election is just around the corner. There's lots of talks about zoning, but we want to bring the conversation back to youth in politics. And we're discussing that on The Breakfast this morning. Absolutely. The big question really is, are Nigerian youth ready? Um, you know, so when we move away from that question that we'll talk about, you know, does the system really, is the system set up to even allow Good. young Nigerians get into those offices? Mm -hmm. You know, the cost of running for elections is yes. not just here in Nigeria, across the world. You know, elections are really, really expensive. Do we have a, a structure that would allow a young Nigerian who can't afford the billions of naira that are needed to run for election, um, to get into those places. And also maybe, should Nigerian youth start from the grassroots, you know, uh, 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 parts of like leadership? Sounds like a good place to start, yeah. if you ask Should me. they start, you know, with being councillors? Should they start with being local government chairman before they, you know, uh, vie for the office of the president, before you get into our Rock? Mm -hmm. Should they start by trying to occupy those places and, you know, do the, the factors that currently uh, you know, make it difficult for them to get into those places. In what ways would they change? Uh, I know to get into a local government office is not one of the easiest things. You know, there's still fights, there's still issues with the government house and all of that. So those are some of the things that we will be talking about this morning. But our major trending topics that we start with, uh, Sunday Boho is in the news once again. And this time it is because of calls for a Yoruba Republic and, of course, calls for, you know, the, um, you know, the, 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 uh, for Yoruba land basically mm -hmm. to have their own uh, Yoruba space, nation. Yoruba nation. Um, a few days ago, we also saw that uh, there were flags hoisted. Sometime last year, the same thing happened, I think, in, uh, in uh, Ibadan. Um, but this one happened in Suruleri, where, you know, a flag, a, a so-called Odudua flag was hoisted once again. And there's a lot of, you know, these conversations springing up here and there. What do these things really mean? Mm -hmm. Is it illegal for anybody to hoist a flag? Because, of course, churches have flags. Uh, unions have flags, NGOs have flags, um, but you know what is what is the significance of you know the the flag and what exactly is pushing uh, the conversation from Sunday Igbo um, as it stands? Um, are there you know people who are there a lot of people who agree with him? Because I remember when uh, IPOB was very very popular in the news a couple of years ago. Uh, when they had set up a Biafran flag, when they were talking about secession and, and um, the right to self-determination, one of the conversations that a lot of people had in the southeast was how many people really agree with them and are, re uh, you know, and are willing to go on this same path with them. Uh, Nandikano was a big factor then, you know, mm -hmm. because of his tactics and the way that he presented himself and 
the words that he used back then. Yes. Um, and so it, it created, you know, that conversation of how many people from the Southeast really agree with you? Is this a personal interest, you know, agenda that you're pushing? Mm -hmm. Or is this for the interest of the whole Southeast? And so the same questions very likely would arise with Sonny Goho and the idea of a Yoruba nation. How many people from the Southwest really um, want that, you know, in, in agreement with your, with your tactics and with your narrative um, for a Yoruba nation? Um, <laughs> but it also should be a good time once again to bring back the conversation on what exactly is going on in Nigeria and what, what, what is the reason behind these little, little agitations for self-determination yes. uh, springing up here and there? Is the country working? Hmm. That's another question. Is Nigeria truly working? Yes, we always say, you know, it's, um, you know, indivisible, you know, and we are one united, big, you know, lovely family. But are we truly one indivisible nation? Is it time that we truly have that conversation? Why does the Nigerian government always shy away from having those conversations? Uh -huh. Um, there's nothing wrong with talking because we, at some point, we'll have to talk. It's either we are forced into the conversation or we realize that, yes, it's time to have the conversation and we, we get into it because there's a lot of, lots of reasons why these things are happening across Nigeria. I think because it's so close to elections and that's basically the big talk here now. It, it seems like it's so far away, but in actuality, it's, it's so close. 2023 is just by the corner. And uh, I think it was just last, over the weekend, we saw, um, I can't remember his name now, but he came out, he said he's now the self-appointed government, you know, for an Igbo, uh, an Igbo president. Asari, uh, Asari, Asari Dokubo, Asari, yes, 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 he, he was the one. So we saw him do that. He named officials who were going to be part of his government. We saw the reaction of Pandef, the reaction of Masob, some supporting him saying, yes, it's time for Igbo people to have their own government. It's time for them to have their own, you know, autonomy. And now we're seeing uh, Sunday Buhu come out to do this. I remember when the whole Sunday Buhu saga started, when he went to this community, uh, this Fulani community, and raided them, chased some people away. Some houses were burnt, some people were injured. And just the discourse we had, how people showed their affiliation to this man, saying he should be protected, he should not be arrested, he should be handled with care, and all of that. When it seemed like this was someone who was threatening the lives and properties of other people, and the law seemed to back him. I mean, why do we have security agencies if one man can stand up and prove to be the Lord and Savior of everybody? And when we're talking political issues here, there are ethnic considerations here, and there's always that tendency for ethnicity to spring into conversations like this. You know, so really, is it legal what Sunday Hukbohu is saying that it is time for them to have a Yoruba nation? I have quotes of, him, of his here. He's saying that the, the Nigerian state cannot work and it's time for him to actualize an evil nation. He says, quote, if any police attacks us, he said, starting from now on, we don't want herdsmen in our farms. If we see any killer herdsmen, we're going to face them and destroy them. Sounds very threatening if you ask me. If any police attacks us for that, we're going to fight them. We don't want Nigeria again, but a Yoruba nation. He says, there is no essence for one Nigeria when major resources in the country are in the hands of northerners. And this is Sunday Buhu speaking, not me, guys. I mean, the government needs to do something about this because this all brings us back to conversations that we've had on the breakfast about how it seems that the reaction of the government to some quarters doing some things are different when some other quarters are doing that same thing. We know how the government came down very highly on Masob, how it came down very highly on uh, IPOB, how it prescribed them, declared them a terrorist organization, said they were illegal, they were banned. And we're having someone like a Sunday Buhu. He is not given his organization or a group a name now, but we know the name Sunday Buhu and what it stands for, saying they do not want Nigeria. There is no essence for a Nigerian nation. If you're threatening the sovereignty of a Nigerian nation, then you should be checked. Yeah, I remember, yeah. excuse me, please. I remember when uh, Omo Yele Shore came out with his own agitations. He failed in the presidential elections and he started saying he wanted revolution. Now, remember how the police, the DSS picked him up, interrogated him, locked him up for days. And the statement from the presidency at that time was, if you want to be in power, there's only one legitimate way to do that contest and win elections. Sunday Buhu is not contesting and winning any elections. He's not even vying for governor. Well, so what are you have what what are these calls for a separate Yoruba nation and that there is no essence for a Nigeria anymore? So it's not it's not necessarily illegal to um, express 
um, yourself that way and say, I don't think that this is working anymore. It would be great we, if we have our country. Or it's have threatening our to nation. destroy people. Well, it, so well you know, you, you may not take those words, you know, um, ser seriously. Um, the the high handedness and the way that the government reacted towards IPOV was, you know, like you said, you know, because, you know, it seemed to be threatening the sovereignty of Nigeria. And of course, the, the government will always try to protect its sovereignty. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's a lot of opinions that will criticize the way that the government treated, you know, the IPOB. Mm -hmm. You know, I was one of them who felt like, you know, the government went too far um, with the IPOB. Um, and so the fact that those ones happen that way doesn't mm -hmm. mean, and of course, the same way happened with Omoyele Shoari, regardless of, you know, what the legal implications are of what he was doing, doesn't necessarily mean that the same thing should be happening to Sunday Bo or any other person who wakes up in the morning and feels um, uncomfortable or disenchanted with, you know, mm -hmm. the Nigerian state. Um, so so there, is, there is, you know, a lot of, you know, these things happening every other time. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, um, no matter how much, you know, how strong your military is or how much you try to, uh, to strangle some of all these conversations, it doesn't stop them from springing up every day. And so it's what I would think would be better is that the Nigerian government or the Nigerian state listens um, or at least has the patience to listen to some of these conversations and, you know, starts to, you know, make moves that act to at least make things better. Um, if the Nigerian state truly was working, mm -hmm. um, then, you know, the, we, we would, I'm very sure that we wouldn't have a lot of all these people uh, springing up and trying to be saviors of their own people. Their tactics and their, their ways, you know, which, which they go about these things might be a little wrong or might be, um, you know, a little harsh, or, you know, not seem very comfortable with a lot of people. But it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that they should be immediately, you know, uh, clamped, you know, and... and, and no, you know, we're definitely not saying that. We're saying that... We want to have the same energy from the government from here as we had from there. So I am looking forward to the press secretaries. I'm looking forward to the media advisors to begin to put out statements condemning this. Because if we've had condemnations, public condemnations from the government, from people who, who, who attempted such moves in the past, let's see that the government, you know, is is being fair and just to everybody because you know he was the one who said he's going to be a president for everyone well right? if, we if we criticize and this is what i was saying we need to move to off the press but mm -hmm. if we criticized the way the government handled ipob and so then said that this was maybe a little too much this all this wasn't necessary um then we should also have you know the same you know expectations from the government now um, if they haven't broken yes, any laws, if they mm -hmm. haven't done anything in particular that is illegal, then you, you know they, they, they are within their rights. So to you're saying we should themselves. basically hold on till they act on their words to destroy. Well, once again, you know, if they haven't done anything that is okay. necessarily illegal, and you know, we, the, the government shouldn't act based on oh maybe you know they might you know start doing illegal you know or you know destroying Nigeria or breaking the law. Okay, all um, right. There is there is we expect also that there is enough of intelligence agencies in the country to always be able to preempt mm -hmm. whatever actions come next. But yes. um, I hope that it comes up in the news this morning so we can talk about it. We're taking a short break. No, we're talking about Tanzania. Have you well, forgotten Tanzania. that? All right, so <laughs> the bad news broke. Uh, Tanzania's president, John Magufuli, he passed on uh, due to heart disease. And uh, some had said, you know, he had died of COVID-19, but that's not certain. We don't have uh, uh, that information in authority of the government, but we know that he died of heart disease. And his vice president, her name is uh, uh, Samia Sululu Hassan. She is uh, the vice president of Tanzania. And uh, the passing of John Magufuli uh, seems to, you know, open up the avenue for us to begin to have a conversation of, you know, the first, the possibility of the first president of Tanzania or of an East African country, for that matter. First female. First president. female vice president in, in the whole of East Africa. And I think that's a, that's a fantastic thing because I've been talking about women and politics and all of that. And uh, that's why we need to have more women in positions because things happen all the time. So if... Imagine if there was no, it was not a female in that position, we would not be having this conversation right now of the possibility of a first female president in Tanzania. And remember, this particular situation almost played out in Nigeria. Uh, we we're talking about uh, 2006, around then, when uh, Dame Virginia Ngozi Etibia, uh, she became the first female governor of Nigeria when Peter Obi at that time was. Uh, I think he was indicted for alleged gross misconduct. He showed for about four, she was governor 
first female governor of Nigeria for about four months until he was cleared of all the allegation. But the fact that she was in a position where she was a vice opened up the way for, you know, had to be in that position when eventualities occurred. So well, I think... Uh, um, we, we, we need to go to all the press, you know, yes. but I would just quickly mention that, you know, the, the conversations about women in leadership aren't necessarily with the hope that the president will die. No, or definitely. That, <laughs> definitely not. Or with the hope that, you know, But women need to be in those They spaces, need to be yes. in leadership, you know, you know, with, you know, its, its entirety. They need to, have, you know, advise for the seat of governor or president. Or and be voted in. And yes. be voted in. All right, a short break. We have Jide Johnson joining us next to, of course, go through some of the major stories making headlines this morning. Stay with us. A lot of the jobs that exist today will not exist in the next 10 years. Ten years. When I see people today shouting, we're not too young to run, we are ready to run. Ready to run to where? The people of excellence are, to a certain extent, being held in ransom by idiots and bandits. Once you are in government, you believe everything you do is right. Mm. And once you are in opposition, everything the government does is wrong. And so it's time for us to take over power. not understand we will stigmatize. What you can see is the remaining of the tanker that exploded. He suffered equally confessed. A 500 era de coleta. If no talk, they will beat you. Now do the other 500 feet. Welcome back to The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. It's now time for Off the Press. It's our segment where we take a look at the newspapers and, uh, you know, consider the stories making headlines and invite experts like Mr. Jide Johnson to analyze this for us, uh, make, help us make sense of it, you know, so you can make informed decisions. Good morning, Mr. Jide Johnson. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Anita, and good morning, Osaru. Morning to you, sir. It's Friday. Yes. <laughs> You're always excited on Fridays. <laughs> okay, let's begin with the Punch newspaper. We're discussing this later on on The Breakfast, and it's about the doctor's strike. It says, doctors threaten strike. Say, FG not paying dead members insurance. The writers read, families of our members killed by COVID-19 received nothing. We lost 17 of our members to COVID-19, 1,600 infected in the punch, and uh, doctors plan indefinite strike on March 31st. 
as well as cano vaccination suffers setback. Still on the front page of the Punch newspaper, Senate summons Attorney General of the Federation over on audited immigration's account. CBN defends Naira with $5.62 billion in three months. Throwing 2023 presidency open, despicable, Ohanese tells PDP. At last, Aisha Buhari returns after six months in Dubai. Six Super Tucano jets arrive July, says presidency. Quara mother, four children, burns to death, husband hospitalized. ex leader alleges Mackinley's loyalists threatening to kill her. And uh, how Lamido received 1.35 billion Naira kickbacks into personal accounts, and that's by the EFCC. Gunmen kill four naval men, three policemen in Anambra State. And uh, the, about the hijab controversy, uh, Tesco orders 10 shot schools teachers to resume today. Those are stories on the front page of the Punch newspaper. All right, uh, we'll move to the uh, Nation newspapers next and see what we can find. Insecurity, IGP accuses states of non-cooperation. Federal government says that only abnormal approach can end insecurity. And also, NSA pushes for traditional rulers' involvement. Also, Masari backs power shift to south in 2023. APC will retain power, he says. Uh, gunmen kill four policemen and three naval ratings in Anambra and Kaduna. We can also see on the uh, nation this morning, Aisha Buhari back home. External reserves dropped by $523 million in two weeks. Border closure failed to stop smuggling of arms. President Buhari laments. And, uh, good thing, you know, that this comes up, you know, so we can once again have a conversation about how uh, successful you know, we were with uh, closing the border for that long. Also this morning, spending $1.5 billion on refinery misplaced, says LCCI and others. Uh, I think also Atiko Abubakar also made a similar statement yesterday. 60 billion Naira drugs seized in two months, says the NDLEA boss, uh, Buba Marwa. And also, um, Obasaki cleared of certificate forgery and caught O.K. Zararume for Senate. Those are the big ones on the nation this morning. And uh, let's turn to uh, the Nigerian Tribune. AstraZeneca safe for use. EU, WHO declare. PTF engages ICPC to ensure vaccine accountability. Lagos vaccinates 12,720 people in 48 hours. IGP uh, and AGF fight over prosecution of Ohakim. Two years after APC, PDP, others snub INEX demand for audited report of election processes. And uh, INEX saying it will apply the Electoral Act. $1.5 billion to revive Port Hackett refinery. Suspicious, and that's uh, Atika speaking. And more reactions troll FG's plan to revamp refinery. Mother, four kids die in a lorry inferno. And uh, FBI lists Nigeria among top 20 countries that lost $44.2 billion to cyber fraud in 2020. $44.2 billion to cyber fraud. That's how much Nigeria lost. And those are the stories we're looking at this morning on the, the Nigerian uh, uh, newspapers. Mr. Judy Johnson. There's so much big stories here. We're looking at the COVID-19 pandemic. We're looking at insecurity. We're looking at vaccinations. Where would you like to start? Well, let's start with, let's start with the uh, doctor strike. They are threatening to strike because FG is not paying their dead members' insurance. If the living are seen, if the living are seen that their dead colleagues are not being adequately compensated and their family are not being taken care of while they are alive. What happens to their motivation? What happens to their morale? What happens to their commitment to their work? And don't forget that we are in the middle of a global pandemic and this group of people are essential to us having a safe and a healthy community and healthy life. And the federal government has refused to be there. The liberal deserves his wages. And I think that we shouldn't get to the stigma. 
you shouldn't get to the stage in which doctors only get their basic needs being met by government through strikes. I think that we should fire at this, we should throw spotlight on this, and then the federal government need to, to be proactive at dealing with this. If you just imagine the children of the deceased and doctors, their, their education, their welfare, and the rest of it is at a state of comatose as a result of federal government not paying the dead insurance of their members. These are areas in which the National Assembly should be looking into. That's why we have legislature. They should turn their eye on this particular issue because they're the representative of the people. These doctors are from one federal constituency or senatorial district or the other. So I think this is an area that we must throw spotlight on and government needs to, 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 to really do something quickly and, and fast. It's an insurance, it's an insurance claim. So why are they not paying it? It's, it's, it's important. Uh, Jenny Johnson also um, speak on the... Related to that is the situation... Go ahead, please. Just go ahead. Hello, I'm with you. Go ahead, uh, uh, Mr. Johnson. Yeah. Related to that is the story of the AstraZeneca um, um, vaccine. vaccine, which the European Union and the WHO has declared to be safe. I think one of the challenges we have with the vaccination drive in Nigeria is a lack of proper communication on the part of the government. And what do I mean by that? Um, communication precedes everything. It precedes even human creation. Because God said, let us make man. That's communication. Human beings are product of communication. I think in dealing with pandemic of this nature, the kind of communication we had during the mitigation and the lockdown, and the reason why government suggests for us to lock ourselves down to stay at home, to wash our hands, um, to keep social distancing, to avoid touching our nose and our mouth. The communication was massive, but when you look at the issue concerning this vaccine, people always have this conception concerning vaccine in the first instance. And government needs to do a lot of things in correcting this misconception. And that talks about public health communication. They need to look at that. Uh, um, until the United Nations came out, uh, European Union and EU, we are having different stories concerning the AstraZeneca um, vaccine being safe. And I think that's a welcome development that we increase people's confidence in taking in taking the, the vaccine. But I think government needs to do more when it comes to correcting the negative impression and attitudes that we naturally have towards vaccine in this part of the world. It's a natural thing, it's an inherent thing. And you need communication. If you ever change communication, um, to change to change that, I think the Ministry of Information, the National Orientation Agency, and all other public information agencies of government needs to put their eyes on the ball and educate Nigerians, edu inform them, educate them, inform them, communicate with them, and motivate them to take um, the vaccine. So we started on that uh, medical note. So let's go to the issue of insecurity. Now it's it is sad that the IGP will accuse states of non-cooperation. We accuse states of non-cooperation. When in the first instance, the IGP himself does not cooperate with the state. The commissioner of police is a member of the state security council. Is a member by, by design as a commissioner, he should attend the cabinet meeting of the state. But the governors on their own have come to that. Usually yes, because all commissioners, is there in the constitution, all commissioners are members of the state cabinet. You, so at the state level, the person in charge of the security is the commissioner. So by design and by extension, all commissioners of police should be attending the state executive council. They should automatic, their membership is automatic. But the reverse is the case. <laughs> but let's come to the issue of that of the IGP. He said that non-cooperation. When the commissioner is responsible, the commissioner does not even take instruction from the chief security officer of the state, who happens to be the governor. He takes instruction from the IGP. In a situation whereby I don't have control over you, and then we'll be having mixed messages concerning um, who is in charge of security, you will not have cooperation from the state, um, from, from the governors, or the security agencies within the state 
within the confines of the state. And 